It's half past eight. Tonight's Saturday Night Theatre is a play by Frederick Bradnam called Creepers, with Ian Holm, Jack May, Elizabeth Bell, and Philip Bond. All right, we'll be here, Minlight. Yes, sir. Last weekend. Oh, shut up, Charlie. She fell from where? You shine your torch out that wall, please, Constable. Yes. Uh, yeah. th th there you are. Now, that window, which is open. What window is that, sir? Mm, one of the attic rooms. Mm-hmm. Right, thank you, Constable. Would she have been there in the normal course of events, sir? I have no idea. With Julia, there wasn't any normal course of events, Inspector. What did you say her name was? Butler. Detective Chief Inspector Butler, sir. Excuse me. Well, can you tell me anything, Doc? Drink. Only that the injuries I can see are consistent with falling headfirst from 50 feet odd onto a hard surface, like this patio. She died immediately. Broke her neck, fractured her skull, came down like a diver. And gravity didn't obtain long enough to turn her. Can my chaps take the pictures now? Uh, do. There's nothing more I can do here. They found her dead at 11. Kent says she was alive at 7 when they left for their dinner party. Mm. At a guess, I'd say she died about 9. I'll do the post-mortem in the morning, let you know about drink or drugs or anything. Fine, thanks, Doc. All right, lads, you can take your pictures. Right, sir. Do, do, do you want us out here anymore, Butler? It's turning nippy. No, sir. Do take Mr and Mrs Cookham in, will you? And I'll join you in a jiffy. Hello. Who's this lady for? Me, sir. She's my detective sergeant. Good grief. Detective sergeant, I never would get. No, sir, she is prettier than most detective sergeants, but late. Uh, do bring her with you when you come inside, won't you? Come on, you two, him go and finish our drinks. Well, D.S. Rogers, don't tell me you were with a boyfriend or in the bath. Or both, sir? I was sent to the wrong address. Keepers, five miles away. Oh. A small cottage inhabited by two very sweet middle-aged theatrical gents. They thought it was a terrific giggle. So I called up and I was told the right place. Creepers. Oh, well, it's a good beginning. It's a good name for it, isn't it? Mm, covered in it. Mm. Somehow it's sinister in the moonlight, I always think. Dead lady, I see, sir. Yep. Julia Kent. Wife of... Captain William Kent, RN, retired. The, the big bloke who, after patting your bottom, has just gone in. Cut up about it, isn't he? Oh, his wife? Mm. Well, I've seen him around, sir, behaving like a punter. Well, it's the effect of your charm, lovey. Well, a few facts, all I have. Julia Kent was 40. Stayed home this evening when Kent and his house guests, the Cookhams, Charles and Mary, well-heeled, 30-odd, and either they're dim or they can't be bothered or they're scared. And they... Uh, where, where was I? Kent and the Cookhams went. Right. Uh, to dinner. Up the road, the Lawsons, leaving about seven. Oh, we must check that they were there. Well, I mean, I'm sure they were. And they arrived back here about eleven, poured themselves some drinks, and then Kent went into the conservatory and out onto the patio. Why, I didn't ask him. It being a fine moonlit night, he saw the lady at once, naturally. And rang us at 11.22. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, sorry, 23.22. Why did Mrs Kent stay behind, sir? No idea. No living in servants. She was alone. So she must have fallen. Yeah, the local PC tells me she was a, an unwise drinker. Lost her driving licence last month for two years. Oh, yes, and there was some lurid stories about her sex life going round locally. I've seen her with a horsey gent called Julian Marchbanks at Point to Point more than once. Oh, yeah. Good. Well, uh, let's go in and get it straight. 
Uh, when they've finished uh, whatever they're doing, Sergeant, you can uh, take the body off and all go home, right? Uh, right, sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. This is the conservatory. So I see. Somebody goes in for creeping plants, don't they? Yes, they do. In here, no on your left. All right, all right, Captain. You first, Raylene. Keep his attention. What a lovely room. Oh, glad you like it. Uh, what do you have to drink? Butler? Oh, I have a scotch, sir, thank you. Uh, Detective Sergeant Rogers. Damn silly, that sounds looking at you, you know. What'll you have? Oh, the same, sir, thank you. Can I have soda with it, please? Uh, why not? Anything for a lady. S sit down, Miss Rogers. Thank you. Just because the Chief Inspector prefers to prowl. This is a terrible business, Mrs. Cookham. Oh, uh, yes, I, I suppose it is. Uh, shocking. You any idea how it happened? Anything? Uh, don't ask down four questions, oh. Charles. Uh, scotch and soda, Mr. Detective. Thank you. Scotch and water, Governor. That's what they call you, isn't it? I don't encourage you, sir. No, all I meant, Bill, was has Butler here find anything? Like a clue. Have you, Butler? Are you, Rogers? Only an open window. And a wall covered in creeper. Parthenocissus and Campsis. Virginia and Trumpet. It holds the place up. Julia loved growing creeping plants. I find them rather sinister and spidery. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see that attic room tonight, Captain Kent. The mystery is, I mean, what was Juliet doing up there? Uh, finish your drink and I'll show you up. Thank you, sir. Uh, when you arrived back this evening, Mrs. Cook and Mr. Cook, did, did you notice anything at all out of place in the house? Mm. I can't say what sort of thing, but I mean anything that sort of, sort of struck you as odd or unusual. No, I'm, I didn't see or, or feel anything. Did, did you, Charlie? No, good Lord, no. Oh, you know, I wouldn't notice anything if someone moved the blooming door. <laughs> 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 and you, sir? No, I wasn't looking for anything except the drinks. Is the television set always at that angle? Uh, it is when Julia watches, then she can sit in that chair by the cabinet in which resides the booze and not have to get up. Mm -hmm. The set wasn't on when you came in, was it, sir? No, and I didn't test it to see if it was still warm. Right, well, uh, the attic room, I think, sir. And then we can all get some shut-eye. Right, you are. Uh, you don't want us up there, do you? No, sir, thank you very much. Thank God for that. Mm, and uh, thank you both for being so cooperative. Oh, jolly good. Uh, don't you think, Mary? Oh, yes, rather. Of course. <laughs> Go on, then, Chief Inspector. And you, girl. <laughs> up you girl. Oh, bloody stairs. The door on the right. All right, sir. Yeah. Uh, you said you uh, looked in, sir, after you found your wife. Did, did you expect to find anything? I don't know what I thought of time. Uh, signs of a struggle, maybe. Mm -hmm. What else? Oh, been no struggling in here, I'd say. Pristine tidy, don't you think, Raylene? Hmm. Mrs. Kent must have gone through it like a ghost. Hmm. Single bed, two tables, two chairs, one easy. Wardrobe. You got a cold coming on, dears? I was trying not to sneeze, sir. If somebody comes to stay and brings a personal servant, we bung the menial up here in the attics. This room first has a view which is considered stunning by those who are stunnable. Oh, yes. With this moon, you can see miles. Perhaps Mrs. Kent came up to see the view, would she? The landscapes by moonlight didn't turn Julia off, I'm sure. <laughs> oh. My Lord, yes, it is quite a view, isn't it? Like a parlour painting and not a fake. What did turn her on, sir? <laughs> you are too young to understand, aren't you? Try me, sir. I was in the Metropolitan for seven years. Uh, did you have experience of Julia's sort of woman? I have no idea what sort of woman she was, sir. And you would like me to tell you? Well, for instance, she didn't leave a note, did she, sir? A note? Uh, well, uh, no, 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 Julia wasn't a suicide, the last thing she was. I've known all sorts of wishes to emanate from the lady in all sorts of ways, but never the wish for her own death. May I make an observation about you, Captain Kent? The seeing it's from you, it's my pleasure. I know the English are good at concealing their feelings, but you can't really be so cold-blooded about your wife's death as you seem, can you, sir? I grew to hate the bitch. Although, as God's my judge, I can't dance a jig on her death. Going down like that from that window, bloody awful. But if you want to know, now she's dead, I can't feel anything except the knowledge she's no longer with us. And that's not so much a feeling as a knowing thought. That's all. 
Thank you, sir, for being so honest. She uh, didn't go with you to the Lawsons this evening because she didn't want to. There's no other reason. She may have had other reasons beyond not liking my friends. I don't know. I didn't ask. I was only too pleased she wasn't coming, and so was everybody else. Because if she ever did turn out with me, she was sure to get so boozed up she'd be a public disgrace. She drank quite heavily, did she, sir? <laughs> I thought every copper in the district knew that. Most of the time she drank casually and the rest of the time heavily. It's a syndrome not entirely unheard of in her sort of woman. Rich and spoilt. They're like some ships. They look top hole, but they, they need one hell of a lot of fuel to keep them afloat. Could anybody have called in to see her this evening, sir? Did you mean the ladies of the Women's Institute? I was thinking more of personal friends, sir. I thought you would be. Jesus, how I loathe this dirty linen stuff. However, somebody could have been in. Not the current boyfriend. He's in Ireland right in the GGs, and I hope he breaks his blasted neck. Anybody else in particular, sir? I don't know, Butler. She could have staggered down to the local boozer and picked up a farm boy. It depends on how she felt. And the attics would have been... Uh... The place to take a farmer's boy. Uh, shall I look at the other rooms, sir? Yes, do that, yes. You will, uh, you will have to look around outside, in the village and so on, I think. I'll do it gently, sir. It's snug and rustic around here, and everybody knows everybody else's business, I'm sure. It shouldn't be too difficult. I suppose things could have got out of hand for once. Uh, and there was the window. Perhaps it was open. Oh, can I ask you to see to it that nothing's touched in here, sir, until the fingerprint chaps give it a going over in the morning? By all means. Ah, here's our booty back. Nothing, sir. It's all ship shape. And Bristol fashion, I'm sure. All right, sir. No more tonight. I'll ring you in the morning and tell you when I'm coming in. All right, come on, Rogers. You've had enough flattering attention for one night. Good night, Captain Ken. Do you mind driving, Raylene? I want to think. Something's not quite right, is it, sir? Oh, say that again. That attic room. Somebody besides the dead woman was in it. It was so very tidy, wasn't it? I mean, do you dive out of a window and not leave a mark? It's like a ghost, you said. I did, sir. My second sight, or what have you, felt some ex-presence, male and not at all nice. <laughs> well, what did you smell? <laughs> a terrible nose for smells, you know. <laughs> Heavy aftershave or a hair oil. I can't quite place it, but I will. She made a go at hanging onto the creeper just below the window, so she didn't shoot out, but slid. Oh, well, we'd better drive on. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> And the Cookhams? Uh, not at ease, were they? Now, what sort of clues did he expect us to have, for God's sake? And, and why, how did it happen? Oh, just making conversation, sir. And watching the captain. Yeah, they were, weren't they? I'll tell you something, Raylene. The Cookhams were up the creek without a paddle. Lost in a situation they had no previous experience of. And what sort of experience did their sort ever get? <laughs> I'll tell you one day. And if Julia drank like a fish, did she swig it from the bottle? I saw no dirty glass. Well, she could have put it tidily in the kitchen before she went upstairs with the lover uh, boy. Uh, tidy, again, you see. I should have looked at her bedroom. Well, probably that would have been tidy as well, anyway. Now, can your second sight tell us what they're up to in creepers at this very moment? Sorry, sir, no. It doesn't travel well out on its own. No, oh, well. I don't imagine they'll be back tonight. Do you? Well, do you? There's no sign of a return. Probably not. But they took their time leaving, I must say. If I was butler, I know the first thing I'd do once I got that young woman into the car beside me. Really, Billy, <laughs> will you ever grow up so far as women are concerned? I doubt it. I seem to grow randier as I grow older. Oh, no, they've gone. They'll come away from the window, Charlie. You'll look like something out of a Hitchcock film. Hmm? Oh. Now, listen... Before we let friend Jenkins out... Let him out? I thought he'd done a bunk. You think he's responsible for Julia's death? Oh, oh. Uh, no, let's face that fence when we come to it. No, he's safely stashed away. I'll show you where in a minute. Oh. I thought they'd find him under a bed or somewhere. I was almost speechless with fright. He used to be an upstairs ducky in his room. Butler was x-raying everything with his eyes and the girl trying to smell things out. 
Uh, which reminds me, they're going to try for fingerprints in the morning. I wiped everything when I tied it up. That's when we noticed Jimmy's things are gone. So we thought he had to. <laughs> uh, we have a drill. Uh, he shoves everything in a box and takes it with him, and we keep it all to the minimum. So it takes ten seconds. Thanks for doing the room, Mary. All they'll find is Butler and Rogers and my own prints. Good. I haven't had time until now <sighs> to think about it. It's a shocking, terrible mess, isn't it? Poor, wretched Julia. Yeah, the ghastly way to die. I mean, seeing the patio come up at you. Uh, don't let's go on about it. Uh, what I want to say is this. We must ask Jimmy what happened, but for the future's sake, we must mind how we go. Well, we've suffered from Jimmy's temper too, you know, Bill. That is the common link among the man's friends. But there's more to it than bad temper now. There must be, of course, ever since... if it was him. You've only been here 24 hours, and he's been on his best behaviour. Pleased to see old pals, different faces. But believe me, there have been times these last six months when I... And Julia also have wondered if he wasn't a far-gone mental case. They always did have a bit of a screw loose, of course. Mm, he was an eccentric from a long line of eccentrics. But now he's something else. And being shut away for six months hasn't helped. It wouldn't help anybody, would it? So I beg of you, whatever he does, keep it cool. All right? All right. Well, where is he? Uh, just give the desk a push, will you, Charlie? Huh? Like that? Oh. <laughs> Don't know my own strength. <laughs> it's on cunning little wheels. The carpet comes up. Why, Joe? Have you done all this yourself? This house is 400 years old. This is a priest's hole. Ah, I'd like a fiver for every poor sod who's been under this trap door <laughs> and a few girls, I'm sure. Ah, there we are. Up it comes. Hmm. Magician's thread, does it, you know? See for yourself. A passage of steps goes down to a secret room in the cellars. Small and comfy. And we've improved the ventilation. There's a door at the other end, so it's all very soundproof. Did you know they used to find priests out by listening? <laughs> Evidently priests were very farty lot. I've <clears throat> I fitted a little buzzer. Three buzzes and the coast is clear. Once he goes dying, he can't put the desk back, can he? No, only close the trap door. And once the desk is in position, you can't get out, which is the one big hold I have over our gym. Once I found Julia tonight, I belted in here and put the desk back. I thought it safer. Shall we have him out? One, two, three. The coast is clear at last, old lad. Are you by yourself? No, Charlie and Mary are with me. Are they? I thought we agreed the less you know about this hole, the better. Ah, oh, things are not what they were, old scout. Charles and Mary need to know what to do. Oh, uh, so you've found Julia, have you? Well, it wasn't my fault. Help me out, will you? Otherwise, I have to shake... Hold up. on! Up we come! Oh. Oh, hello, Charles. Hello, Mary. Jimmy. Oh, boy. Tell us what happened, Jimmy. Where is she? In the morgue by now, I imagine. Oh, holy cow, you called in the authorities? I'm afraid so, old boy. What else could one do? A loser somewhere, dig a hole, drop her in the sea, anything. She would be missed sooner than later. She did have friends, you know, many friends. Not my friends, nor yours, were they? She's not the sort of woman you can sink without trace. That's all I'm trying to say, old scout. We're going to have the law all over us, crawling everywhere. For a week or so, yes. But it'll be nothing to what they would do if they decided she'd been done in. Then they don't leave a corner unexplored, believe me. <laughs> By the time they'd have cottoned on to anything, I'd be away, wouldn't I? It's been six blasted months now. It can't be much longer, can it? Whether you're here or not, I don't relish being suspected of killing my wife. I can't imagine why you didn't throttle her years ago. You know, Jimmy, bodies do have a nasty way of turning up when least expected. It always happens. Even from the depths of the sea, that man, the other day. Yeah. So uh, what can you tell the blue bottles? What have you told them? Have a drink. Hmm. The usual? I'll make it a stiff one. I ran out of the hard stuff down there. Now, old scout, before I tell you what I told the two police persons, you tell us what happened. Oh, I... I was down here looking at the telly with the sound very low, you know. I like to keep an ear on the outside world when I'm alone. 
when I I heard a, a scream and a, a thump. So, so I waited and then I sneaked out and saw her. And she was dead all right, so I... I thought, I thought I'd, I, I'd better go to ground, just in case an unexpected visitor turned up and found her. It, 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 it put me in a bit of a tizzy, if you want to know. A foul moment. What time was it? Oh, the BBC News was on nine or so. I, I went upstairs to get my things and saw the window was wide open, so I guess she'd jump. Earlier, after we had left, what was she like? She left me alone at first, then she had a few... Then she became spiteful drunk, the way she can be. Told me I was a, I was a damn nuisance, and she'd a good mind to hand me over to the Rosses there and then. I say, that wasn't very nice of her, was it? Oh, she'd said it before when she was cut. Bill knows. That and lots more. Only Julia never remembered when sober what the hell she'd been up to when drunk. Anything else, Jimmy? Oh, I was given the usual spiel about me and my friends and your friends. The, the Mayfair Mafia, as she calls us. Did call us, isn't it, now? And the usual stuff about us and her and how we only put up with her because she has oodles in the piggy bank and how we reckon we're a law unto ourselves and we don't care a cuss for anybody not like us. All I did was to agree with her and put the telly on. And then she went upstairs and threw herself out of your window. Of course, she could have gone up to do some damage. Well, throw your things out of the window or something, sort of gesture, and, and went out herself by mistake. <laughs> by girl, of course. That's it. Brilliant. Oh, girl. Oh, clever that, Mary. I bet you're dead right. Bill? That's a perfectly good explanation. I can think of no other. So, there we are. What explanation did you give the police? I gave no explanation. I only suggested she may have had a... A lover boy in and things got out of hand. Well, the hell didn't you say she just had had enough and jumped? It wasn't on. I won't be as unfair as that to Julia. <laughs> and I needed to keep to the truth as far as possible. Have the Rosers swallowed it? I've no idea. The man Butter doesn't give anything away. He'll check out the village lads, probably find nothing. What does one do if they, well, find somebody? Well, say a funeral. All being well, we should get a verdict of accidental death. And I'll grant you that alcoholics have been known to fall for the hell of it. I'll, I'll, I'll have to keep a very low profile, won't I? You will, Jimmy. But we'll do our best to keep you free from going down the mine. We'll just have to be quick on the draw, that's all. I, 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 I should have kept an eye on Julia, you know. I, I, I can't forgive myself easily, you know. After all you've done for me... Could easily hand me over, but pick pick up the phone and say I've got Jonah Jenkins here. But you, but you don't because you're a real old pal, Bill. Yes, yes, old oh boy. Real... I'm in the mood for love. Oh dear. A policeman's lot is not a happy one. Do you know, dear Sir Rogers, that the expression "pig" is 19th century? Second half, sir. Ooh. In particular, the plain clothes men, I believe. Hmm. I think we'll have to start being fairly piggy if we're ever going to discover who shoved Mrs. Julia Kent out of that window, don't you? <sighs> yes, sir. But piggy with whom? <laughs> Damn it, Moriarty, you've seen through to what I don't know. So, let's see what it is that we do know, shall we? Now, autopsy. Ignoring her fatal injuries, uh, starting to go to sea, but nothing serious. Inebriated up to the gills. Now, one thing oddish, a sort of wheel, reddish mark at the base of her back. Now, mm. give it thought. Fingerprints. <coughs> Yours, mine, Kent's, and some smudge ones. Now, if I had a suspicious mind, I think somebody had wiped the paintwork. Well, the lover boy would only have handled Julia, sir, so it could be natural. Natural? Hmm. Now, what about lover boy? Well, the horsey boyfriend March Bank season was in Ireland. Anyway, why would a lover push her out of the window? Uh, what sort of lover's tiff would come to that? Oh, Mr Butler. Mm -hmm. That perfume I could smell in the attic room. Yes. I had a sniff round the mail counter in that expensive store in town, and I'm sure it was honey and flowers hair oil. Honey and flowers. Very much Captain Kent and company, isn't it? <laughs> well, the inquest is tomorrow. I suppose we could have one last chat with Kent about Julia's friends. I suppose one of them could have driven down and done it. And the Cookhams still worry me, you know.
Oh, is uh, Captain Kent at home, Mrs. Cooker? Uh, n- no, he stepped out for a breath of fresh air. He, he, he won't be long. Or all this rain, you know. Oh. Do you mind if we wait? No, 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 of course not. Um, do come into the drawing room. You look cold, Miss Rogers. Well, Mr. Butler, we'll drive with the windows open. We'll go into the drawing room. I'll get some coffee. Thank you. Oh, Charlie. Uh, Mr. Butler and Miss Rogers, they're going to wait for Bill. Yeah, yes, of course. Come in and sit down. Thank you. I'll put the old uh, electric fire on. We've had the windows open in here, airing it out, oh. you know. <laughs> it's nasty weather for the time of year. Yes, isn't it? Soon warm up. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cookham. Yeah. Smoked a few cigars in here last night. Now, Bill and myself. <laughs> Not your wife, I'm glad to hear. Oh. No, women have been known to. Anyway, you've got rid of the smell, Mr. Cookham. There's not a trace. Yes, my DS has a very highly developed olfactory sensor. Which is mostly a damn nuisance. Yes, I bet. Besides the airing, have you dusted and hoovered, Mr. Cookham? No, actually, I... (laughs) I see what you mean. No, no, the captain keeps a couple of domestics who uh, come in. Mm -hmm. Local people, are they? I don't know. I suppose they're local. Oh, he was married. Oh. Heard the coffee was hot. Uh, milk, Miss Rogers? Oh, please, and um, black for the DCI. Where did the domestics come from, Mary? Do you know? Oh, from the village, I gather. I think Bill really needs to find somebody younger if he's going to stay, that is. Mrs. Batty and her sister are very ancient. <laughs> oh, that coffee smells good. And I shouldn't think they're much good at moving this furniture around. Each piece must weigh a ton. Oh, or am I being rather rude? <laughs> no, you're quite right. Um, Thank you. I thought the old lady said that you'd seen them and asked them questions, Mr. Butler. Well, oh, no, 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 not me. No, the village PC. But I'll tell him he's been promoted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody's left that desk over there a bit askew, haven't they? <laughs> oh, dear. Coming on to rain again, I see. Yes, yeah, there it is. The doll. Oh, how the desk got like that, I mean. Uh, mm. Bill was moving it around looking for something that had fallen oh, I shouldn't him. worry, Mrs. Cookham. Mr. Butler has an awful talent for spotting things out of place. Awfully <laughs> <laughs> useful in the detective, what? Well, most things out of place, as Raylene puts it, are so by chance and disappointingly unimportant to a detective. Oh, <laughs> yes. Captain Morning, Captain. Butler. <laughs> I see you brought the desirable detective sergeant with you. Couldn't keep her away, sir. Aha. Yes. Just having my morning constitutional between the cats and dogs. <laughs> what can I do for you? I wish I knew, sir. But tell me who was in the attic room with your wife, because I can't tell you. I thought you two were the detectives. Uh, we can't detect a single culpable fact. Not a sniff in the village. What about outside the village, Captain Ken? I gave you a list of the people we were on visiting terms with as part of the county. No good at all, sir. A more innocent collection of non-clandestine visitors I have yet to meet. Uh, Dallas Ditchwater, most of them. I was thinking of London. One can drive from the south of the river to here in a couple of hours. I think all Julia's friends live south of the river. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You wouldn't know if any one of them would have caused to come here on that evening. My dear fellow, I gave you her address book. You can check them out. The inquest tomorrow, are you going to ask for an adjournment? Well, we check out 200 names. I think not, sir. No coroner would stand for it, and certainly not ours. I think she must have fallen. It's accidental death. Well, that's what I came to say. Um, well, and to ask for the last time if you've remembered anybody who could have been a violent enemy of the dead woman? Uh, no, no, but uh, the answer is as previously. My friends didn't like her, but they didn't hate her. Mm. Her friends seemed to like her, but I knew none of them very well. Yes, well, I'm afraid, sir, that uh, there's no rational or logical explanation for Mrs. Kent's death, but then death is sometimes like that. Well, uh, we must be away. I'll see you at the inquest. Thank you for your help, sir. Uh, come on, my girl. I'll see the mic, Bill. No, thanks. See you tomorrow, Butler. Roger. Thank you for the coffee, Mrs. Cooker. Not at all. Oh, <sighs> you and your wife are going to return home. The file is coming. What the devil happened, Mary? He wouldn't go to ground. He opened the windows and went out. Why don't you get on with it? I'd go upstairs and see they'd depart properly. Right. Bill, did you find him outside? I did. You thought it was funny, you did. He's in the greenhouse. It wasn't funny. I thought he was going to brain Charlie with the door stop. The idiot. I'm beginning to lose patience. We must get him out of the country. Hold everything. They're coming back. Oh, what? no. Oh, that girl. Mm. She's left her bag. I'll take it. Come here, Charlie. I'll cope with it. 
Did she do it on purpose, you think? Wait for them to ring. Where the hell is Jimmy? In the greenhouse. Now, I know who oh. that is. Oh, stop fidgeting, Charlie. I guess it was you. Yes. So I just asked you now. Thank you. So sorry. Must rush. Bye. Bye. Uh, <sighs> now, I wonder... Alarms and excursions, and did she leave it on purpose? Aren't we being all too suspicious? Do you think they have any idea? Might someone in the house, I mean. Oh, that'd be altogether too far-fetched, surely. And are they still looking for Jimmy officially, Bill? Surely not. No, officially they aren't. Unofficially, they reckon he's dead by his own hand. There are times, like now, when I wish the idiot was. What did he think? Because two coppers come to the front door, there won't be two at the back. What were they on to you about? Domestic star situation, and oddly enough, the size and weight of the furniture in here. Huh? And Master Butler noticed the desk was askew. Oh. I'd moved it to put Jimmy down the hill, and I didn't put it back squarely. Sorry. Mm, there's something bugging Butler about this place. I'm not sure about the girl, but Butler is a sort of instinctive bloke. I get the impression that he's aware something's not quite straight here, don't you? He always makes me feel bloody uneasy, like my housemaster used to. Now, I think the girl is quite as sensitive to things as he is, only she doesn't show it. They're really rather a good team, you know. Now Julia's gone, I think I shall sell this house. So we'll have to get James away, or somebody else hide him. Shall I get him in? Where's Mrs. Batty and Sister Hilda? I sent them up to do the bedrooms. Hmm. Let the beggar stay out for a moment. It'll cool his ardour and my temper. That's another problem that's getting worse, dodging Batty and Hilda. Well, I'm going to be thankful that they're so decrepit and short-sighted. <laughs> Only one is short-sighted. I can't remember which. The other's just stupid. <laughs> the trouble is that our James is becoming careless with them. And I wonder if they've seen anything and made anything of it. And I've had to put up with Julia's cooking, so there's always enough for Jimmy. Well, we, sh we should go, go, go back after the inquest. So what, what can you do? Give me a few days to organise Adrian and Sarah. They did promise. Of course, Phil. Oh, I shall be happy when the inquest is over, and I think we all will be. Yeah, yeah, old girl. Good morning, Mr Butler. Good morning. The first day of summer. Is this... I thought the inquest went smoothly yesterday. Did you? Well, the lecturer's captain and the cookums didn't actually cheer when the accidental death was given, but only just not. So I thought. Oh, I can see you have a lot on your desk, sir, and on your mind, so shall I get on with something else? Uh, no. You'll sit down and listen. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, have you ever read Simonon's Maygrave stories, Rayleigh? Chief Inspector Magray, hmm. some years ago. One of the things Simonon makes him good at is getting at the centre of the puzzle, and that centre is as often a person or a place as it's a situation. So Magray works his way inside a person's skin or prowls around a place until it reveals something to... You see what I mean? Creepers, you mean? Yes. Creepers. Now, from the very first moment I entered that place, I felt it was the actual house that held the secret of how Julia Kent died. Oh, I know, it sounds melodramatic, doesn't it? No, not really. I felt things about that house myself. Hmm. It's there, isn't it? Among those smooth, cool, rich people. The outward manifestations are obvious. I mean, furniture out of line, windows open, Cookham looking out from the landing window to see us leave, Kent out for a constitutional in smart town shoes in the pouring rain. No outward signs of Julia's drinking that night, but in her stomach. Mm, honey and flowers in the attic, no cigars in the drawing room. Yes. And after the inquest yesterday, I called in at the county archives room. Now, all, look, all this on my desk is the result. It's a very old village, full of antiquities, including creepers which is a 14th century foundation and up to 20 years ago had one of the finest authentic priest's holes in England. Up to 20 years ago? Well, that's the last time that its existence was recorded. Now, there's more than a good chance that it's still there, the priest hole, and the present owners know about it. I've got some plans of the house here somewhere. Wait a minute. It's under all this lot. Somewhere. Yeah, look, here we are. You see these? Look, see for yourself. You are trapdoor at spot mark T. Three feet from the south wall of the drawing, drawing where the desk was askew, remember? Beneath it is a passage down to a secret room in the cellars, eight by eight. That's it. So who are they hiding? Something Kent is ashamed of, do you think? It can be this in these cases. 
I mean, a, a monstrous child, a lunatic brother, the, the sort of thing gothic novels were full of. Or is it something criminal? It could be criminal, sir. Do you have a reason for that statement? The other day I remembered where and how I knew about the Kents. It had been worrying what? me for some time. They'd been in the press all over the front pages of the popular press six months or so ago. Now, I dug up the newspaper file on them. And after I'd read it, it didn't seem to have any bearing on our problem. But I'm perhaps wrong. The Kents and the Cookhams come to that were members of the set to which one James Jonah Jenkins belonged. Uh, my dear girl, how very clever of you. Now, we, we've got a file on Jenkins. Um, was it somewhere next door? I'll get it, sir. Here we are. Oh, hell, bulky. I should have remembered. <laughs> the Met kept it strictly to themselves, otherwise I might have. 14th of November last. Uh, Mrs Jenkins found dead in her Cadogan Place flat, strangled after being knocked around. Tenants of flat below heard banging and smashing, rang 999, went out to see and saw Jenkins coming down the stairs. He ran out, was picked up by a passing cabbie who noticed from his face that his, he was bleeding and from scratches, that his shirt torn, took him to the 500 Club in Curzon Street, Dorman confirmed he looked as if he'd been in a fight, went into the club and has never been positively seen again. He must have had very good friends. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, it seems Mrs Jenkins wasn't of her husband's set and, like Mrs Kent, was disliked by them. Um, what else? Yeah, Jenkins. Two previous. Assault on person. Fined. Fights with wife on three occasions, reported by name as the police. <laughs> Jimmy Jenkins would have been quite at home in some of the nastier parts of Glasgow. Hmm. Wealthy, Eton and Household Cavalry, Social, Horse Racing Set, Mayfair, New Market, and so on. Uh, well, what you, look, I quote, Jenkins has some 20 close friends who stick together like toffee. Not a word out of place, not a word too much. Mayfair Iron Curtain. The law, something that's no concern of theirs. May I see, sir? Yes, do. Thanks. Mm, a warrant out on Jenkins for murder still. Not surprising, no. Do you think if he pushed Julia out of the window, Kent would still protect him? Kent's stuck with him, isn't he? Hmm. He can't hand him over now without being charged himself. Can't get rid of him. Probably that's proving very tricky. And like us, he could assume she fell. The Kents were seen, I see, for the last time three months ago. I say, sir, did you what? know they had creepers under surveillance up until that last interview? I didn't. I bet the village did, though. <laughs> the chaps from the Met didn't get very far with W. Kent. He was very uppity. You did a lot better. I had something on him, and he wanted to impress you. Yes. He's invited me round for a drink. Oh. Well, put on your tin knickers and go, then. Well, that's what I thought. <laughs> I see they reckon Jenkins has done himself in. No idea where. Somebody thinks his pals would bury him. But they have in a way, haven't they? We must be right, you know, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, only no by flushing him out. Well, we could get a search warrant, surely. Oh, not to look for Jenkins. I couldn't, not without the Met backing it up. And I've no other reason to search the house, have I? Anyway, I might still find Jenkins elusive. I mean, the wretched house is probably a warren of hiding holes not in the archives. And it'd be more fun flushing him out, squaring up to Kent. Yes, sir. Well, what next, sir? Well, let's see. Yes, I'm going to talk to the two old biddies who clean creepers. You go and talk to Kent. Gin in the private bar for me and champers in the drawing room for you. Huh? <laughs> Come on, Jimmy, off your bed and on your feet. Our radiant will be here in 50 minutes, and I want you right out of the way. I don't feel like going down the mine tonight, Bill. Oh, uh, no, what do you feel like? A night out somewhere? Oh, why not? Nobody remembers me. I've grown a beard. Nobody's looking for me. So you keep telling me. There's a warrant out for your arrest on charge of murder, so come on, old scout. Now isn't the time for argument. Well, now's the time for action, I grant you. I've never had it off with a policewoman, nor have you, I'd say. It is always a first time. Have you got the things you want? Book and booze are down there. Oh, come on, then. She's not staying for supper. This is just a preliminary skirmish, is it? Has to be, isn't it? With Charles and Mary here. When are they being relieved? God alone knows. Adrian and Sarah have problems. The poor cuckoos are getting twitchy, and I don't blame them. Come along, boy. Oh, sorry, I, I was just thinking how nice it would be... Uh, what? What would be nice? To escape. Oh! You silly bloody oaf! Charles, Mary, stop the idiot! Blast and damnation! My knee's gone! Charles, Jimmy, on his way out! Charlie, quick! Oh, Jimmy, please, don't be such a fool! Oh, please keep 
keep away from me, Mary. I'm going to have a little drive. Back later. I was, uh, what, what's going on? Give me call, mate. Let's hope he breaks his bloody neck ten miles away. What did he do? Shove me down the stairs, cunning bastard. This knee goes easily. It's our car he's taken, Charlie. I suppose he will come back. Oh, where can he go? I doubt if he's got more than a fiver on him. Harry oh, Smug, it's a night nightmare, isn't it? Our peace girl will be here in a moment. I twisted my knee in the garden this afternoon, right? Yes. What? She can't stay long, so she said. So she'll be given a couple of snorters and show the door. Well, what if he comes back while she's here? I'll go out. If we hear the car, you two stay here. Good on you. Bloody Jimmy. I'm going to carry my service revolver on me in the future. And if there's any argument, he goes down the mine at gunpoint. And if I shoot him dead, who's to know except his poor blighters of friends? And we won't shed tears, will we? Come on, we better try to seem normal for Miss Rogers and thank our lucky stars that that gimlet-eyed butler bloke is elsewhere this fine summer evening. Oh, well, what are you both having? Uh, uh, Mrs. I, I, Spatty, Miss... Uh, uh, no, she's Hilda. never called anything else but Hilda, Mr. Butler. Oh, right. Hilda. Now, uh, what is it to be? Well, uh, Hilda will have a stout. I, I always say she's stout. And if you don't mind, I'll have a gin and it. All right. <laughs> right, thank you, lady. All the stout, uh, gin and it, and uh, quite the proper... Uh, um, a young policeman came and talked to us. Had a cup of tea, he did. Had a uniform. Why, Sean? Oh, Mr. Butler's plain clothes, Hilda. I used to have a uniform once, you know. Uh, did they take it away because it was bad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think that's right, landlord. Uh, something for yourself, huh? You, sir. Here we are, ladies. Ah, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, And you're very good health. Uh, and you, sir. And a terrible uh, thing, poor Mrs. Kent out of the window like oh, that. Oh, we don't never go up there. They've got spooks. Mm. But the attics, you mean, uh, do you, Hilda? Oh, the attics. Ghost of a young girl, so they say. And a fella. I see the fella. No, no, he's not a ghost. Ah. He's the unfortunate creature left behind. Ah. ah. Uh, how long have you worked there at Creepers? Oh, only five months now, and Hilda too. Uh, Mrs. Kent had living in servants what went, they uh, did. Uh, there, there was a row, was there? Uh, we heard uh, there was all sorts of things. Uh, they had one living in first, been with them for years. Nurse, respectable lady, only, only uh, she uh, had a son out of wedlock, so uh, it was said who was funny in the head. Not all oh, that. He huh? were a bit balmy, yeah. Uh. Ah, oh, he's the unfortunate creature, is he? He's still there in the house. There's no knowing. He could be. Hmm. What was this housekeeper's name? Uh, Mrs. Cobbler. A cook general more than housekeeper. Oh, I didn't know there were such things left. Oh, yes. She left, did she? Yeah, uh, and the captain got in a, a piece of stuff from the continent. Mm -hmm. and What's uh, known as an au pair, I believe. Oh, yes. From Denmark, mm. she was. Very handsome girl. Oh, she had flat all down her back and, and tight trousers all over her, you know what. Uh, she and Mrs. Cobbley <laughs> didn't knit it off, not at all. I mean, Mrs. C, she'd sit here in this very seat and she'd tell of the goings on at the house. Shocked she was. Well, very respectable she was, but for her laps. So one day she packed her bags and she went. And, and you think that she left her laps behind her? Uh. It's like they say, Mr. Butler, nobody saw him leave. Uh, I, I do like me drop a stout, I do. <laughs> oh. Oh, you'll have another, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure, <laughs> too, yes. And you, Mrs. Butler? Oh, very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, All right, uh, thank you, landlord. Uh, same again, please. That was a stout uh, the gin in it and a pint for you. So Mrs. Cobbley left and then you joined the staff, did oh. you? Oh, Mrs. Kent. Oh, she asked us to come and work there. The girl did nothing, so it seemed just lay around on her bed all day up in the attics. Oh, and the captain would go up a lot. That girl? She was just a cucumbine for his pleasure. Oh, here we are, ladies. Oh, thank you. Uh, she, I think you. But she, she didn't last long, this Danish girl. Oh, but... bottoms up. <laughs> As one of the captain's expressions. No, no, the captain went up to Scotland for the shooting, yeah. so Mrs. Kent, she jumped at her chance, and <coughs> out she went overnight, belongings and oh, all. Nobody saw the going of her, but, but gone she was. Uh -huh, but that, that left the pair of you to run the house. You do everything, do you? Oh, not the top rooms. We don't go up there. We, we've heard No, so things. we said, begging your pardon, madam, but we'd rather not do out there was old rooms. And she said it didn't matter, not at all. Nice as anything she was. Uh -huh. Did you do the cooking, too? Never allowed to, Mr Butler. 
And she said when she engaged, you can cook, Mrs. Batty. Oh, oh Hilda prepares. Uh, yeah, uh, vegetables in delight. Uh -huh. Do you reckon that Mrs. Kent was uh, cooking for an extra mouth? Well, I seed a man up the top of the stairs looking down, and I seed him once in the garden with the captain, hurrying like to the greenhouse. What was he like to look at, Hilda? Oh, uh, shorter than the captain, broad, though, a long hair and a big beard. Was he fair or dark? Oh, fair to yellow, white skin, but what could be shaved. Uh -huh. Have you ever seen this man, Mrs. Butler? No, can't say I have, Mr. Butler. But then I'm as blind as a bat, no, but, but I heard things from the attic. Oh, yeah, such as? Bad language, shouting, uh, uh, yeah. and, and the poor thing had a shocking cough when we was first there, and, and that's when I asked Mrs. Kent... To, did did to, you? To, yes. was, well, what did she tell you? Well, that's when she said Mrs. Cobbley left her trouble who was weak in the head behind, but we weren't to say anything. Oh. Not even the captain was to know we'd been told. I heard her on the phone going on about him who had a screw yes. loose. <laughs> I'm told there's um, a secret hiding place in the house. Oh, I once looked through the windy and got a fright. There I see the captain coming up through the floorboards. First the top of his head, then his head and shoulders, then half of him. Then I couldn't stand no more and run off. We tried to find where he came up, but we couldn't. Oh. I thought Elva had an illusion, but, but she swears. I see them coming up through the floor, like a jack-in-the-box, only slower. I'm sure you did, Hilda. Uh, there, yeah, you see, he knows. And where is our Mr. Butler this fine evening, ready? Oh, we may call you ready, may we? You may, Captain Kent. Mm. And I'm Bill, and she's Mary, and <laughs> that's Charlie daydreaming at the window. Oh, sorry. Awfully rude of me. That's uh, Mr. Butler's having a nice, quiet evening with his family. No, he hasn't a family. Oh. He's not that villain catching and such like, I hope. I hope he's having a quiet pint in a pleasant pub, but you can never be sure. I suppose you're never really off duty, are you? There isn't exactly Chicago around here, Charlie. No, I don't often work much after six any evening, and I do keep my weekends free, mostly. Uh, but with Butler, you could never be sure, eh? I meant not only with Mr. Butler, with any of us. But you're not on duty now, are you, what? No, I've left my handcuffs at home. I brought your handbag instead. <laughs> uh, Mary, fix us all another drink here. Yes, of course, Bill. Uh, same as before, really. Thank you. I'll give you a hand. Oh, thank you, darling. How did you do your knee in, Bill? Hmm? Uh, in the garden. Don't tell me you garden. Oh, I do a bit. Why the hell shouldn't I? Naval men hardly ever do. Don't grow things. And you've had an extensive knowledge of naval men? I once knew a chap who was a commander in the Irish Navy. Uh, did he command the big growing boat or the small one? <laughs> Here we are, Aileen. Uh, thank you. Bill? Oh, thanks, I've much. been told that the Irish make excellent sailors. You try saying harder stern to a paddy and see what becomes of you. <laughs> I say, I've suddenly thought. Are you Irish, Raylene? My father comes from Cork. <laughs> I, I, I think Bill Kent has dropped out of his better clatter. <laughs> My dad owes a Patrick, but he'd forgive you. How did you do that knee, though? I stumbled. Dead sober, too. And it went. It's a week and I ruined it playing polo years back. Oh, yes, of course. What does, oh, yes, of course, and that look mean? I remember once reading about some of your pursuits in a paper. At oh, that time... We're all of us plastered all over the papers. Awful it was. Do you know, somebody actually wrote a whole column about our new bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and I suggest that they ought to do something to fight the loo. <laughs> <laughs> Seems years ago, but it can't be. About six months ago, wasn't it? Yes. Six months, or just over. I suppose you know all about Jonah Jenkins. Oh, only what I read up. Like every other copper, I was meant to be looking for him. Ah, oh, poor old Jimmy. He seemed a bit of a thug to me. Oh, he was. But he was a friend. Must stick by your friends. As a copper, you should know that. I know, I thought at the time that Jenkins was a pretty dangerous sort of chap to stick by. Mm, he was never easy. You mean, really, in that he wasn't to be trusted? More or less, yes. <sighs> it doesn't matter. I really didn't mean to bring the subject up. I say, are you still looking for him? Not very actively, but officially he's still wanted. Well, his body will turn up someday, I dare say. Uh, uh, Carl. Mary. Yes, dear. Uh, do excuse me, Raylene. It's the garage. They very kindly brought my car back. No, no, it's all uh, right, Charlie. I have some cash. Oh, uh, jolly good. Um, uh, 
decent garage they are. Around here, you are lucky. Which one is it? Oh, uh, uh, uh what, what's it called, Bill? The Mayflower. Bloody awful, usually, but Mary's charmed them. Well, I must be off in a minute. Oh, do have another drink. No. No, thank you all the same. I'm driving, and if I get caught over the top, I'll be sent as a filing clerk to somewhere like the Outer Hebrides. Oh, do wait for Mary to return. She won't be a moment. I, I think I will go and see if, if she's all right. I mean, I mean if, if, if the car's all right. I shan't be Jeff. Oh, Charlie. Does he always go on as if he's just committed the crime of the century? Come to think of it, yes, he does. He probably was bullied no end at school. He's a natural fag, is Charlie. She's nice, Mary. Ah, oh, bright girl. But you'd have to be, wouldn't you, with poor Charlie? No, I can't see myself putting up with him. <laughs> no, nor can I. You would need a man who's about as independent as yourself, I dare say. Possibly. And one who doesn't mind jokes about detective sergeants in nighties. Try me. Thank you. Well, what are you going to do now? Um, at this very moment, you mean? Uh, remember your knee, my man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, are you going to stay on here? It's such a wonderful house. Oh, it's not my business. Uh, why shouldn't it be? Uh, to be honest, for once, I don't know. I need a moment of time to make up my mind. You should take a holiday, perhaps. Get away from it all. I know I'd want to. Would you now? Where should we go? <laughs> oh, somewhere. Lots of sea. Only I'd need a little notice so that the great crime wave can be attended to while I'm away. Oh, that's easy. There's quite a bit of unfinished business to clear up here before I can get away, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. The Cookhams will stay to help. Mm, for the moment. Very decent of them. I hope the garage isn't being difficult, or Charlie isn't checking on their handiwork. The longer, the better to have you on my own. <laughs> I think you're the first ex-customer who's ever made a pass. Good grief, am I an ex-customer? In a way, yes. Yes. Bloody odd, I never thought of it like that. Did you reckon I'd given the little woman the fatal shove? A dead wife suddenly dead always makes a copper glance at the living husband. Glance as much as you like. As long as I can glance back. Of course, you weren't seen running from the house in a dishevelled state. Your eyes are what's called cornflower blue, do you know? Like one Jenkins. Cornflower blue? It goes with the hair. Corn blonde. Do you believe, even as an old pal, that Jenkins did it? My family say straw blonde, Dolly with straw plaits. Oh, you've known Dollies with plaits, straw plaits. You're not them. Oh, of course he did, it was only a matter of time. Dolls aren't dark. Takes a bit of living down in a blonde, the doll image. If he's alive, do you think he's racked by remorse? Oh, good old our James, remorseless type. How could you be a doll with such a skin? Peaches and cream, or oh, spotted pig. Terrible in the sun, freckles appear. But you reckon he's dead? Just tell me, and I'll take you to where the freckles will appear. <laughs> oh, yes, he's as dead as mutton. Go! Oh. All settled. Ah, oh, I, I am so glad. And the car really goes? Yes, yeah, like a bomb. Doesn't it, Mary, old thing? Doesn't it what? Car. Go like a bomb. I don't think that's a very tactful way of putting things these days, do you? Oh. Well, I must go also. Unlike a bomb, I hope. Uh, do, do come again. You, you've done my near power of good. I never touched it, believe it or not. Of course <laughs> not. It's a psychosomatic knee injury. Kindness cures. Can't get up to show you out there. No, oh, I'm housemaid for today. Well, I'll say goodbye. And uh, thank you for the drink. Has she gone? Really gone? I watched and waved as she drove off. Ah. My hair turned white. I swear Jimmy will send me to an early death. I feel quite done in. I really fancy that girl, you know. I know. But I still don't entirely trust her. She would keep hammering on about Jimmy, in between being sexy. Well, it could be just a normal police person's curiosity, couldn't it? Mm hmm. Got to get rid of Jenkins. Charlie, you go to London tomorrow and pay a visit to our old pals. Tell them I'm being buzzed by the blue bottles much too closely and I must have out. Yes, right, yeah. I'll do my best. Out of the country with him. Out of this house. Somebody else must do the minding. Tell them that, Charlie. I've had six months and I don't want another six days even. Enough. He's upstairs. Shall, shall I... Uh... Did he go quietly? Oh, yes. He was positively contrite. That's the usual pattern. After he'd killed that poor bloody wife of his, he was a bag of blubber for days. 
We're not fat or the good, it does any of us. <clears throat> Shall I... Uh... Get him down, please. Better to have our eyes on him. Uh, yes, yes, I couldn't agree more. I suppose you have tried reasoning with him. Oh, yes, no end. So did Julia. He listens and agrees, or won't listen and he's sulk. Guys, it's clear, Jimmy. Come Depending on how the mood him. takes him. Either way, it makes no difference. He can't change his spots, He's a he? dyed-in-the-wall leopard and the spots go beneath the skin. Give us another drink, old thing. Oh, yeah, I don't think I've ever drunk so much there as here are. recently. That's a good chap. That's a nice and bloody twerp. I say, look here. We've changed our mood to one of bravado, I hear. Come in, Jimmy. Oh, you won't... I'd like a brandy and... Holy cow! Yes, Jimmy. It's my service revolver in my hand. And it's loaded. And I do know how to use it. And I have used it in anger. And unless you stop this farting about, I will use it in anger again to shoot you down like a mad dog. Give him his drink, Mary. Yes, I'll just pour it. Sit down, Jimmy. Over there. Oh, all right. It's a rotten thing to say to anyone. But I'm going to say it to you. You're not sane, you know. You should be in a place where you can be given proper attention. Somewhere like Broadmoor would be ideal, but not possible. Here's your brandy and soda, Jimmy. Uh, what about you, Charlie? Large scotch, please. What, what are you going to do, Bill? I don't know, Jimmy, because I'm going to behave just as I feel at any given moment. Indulge my every mood, as you do, old scout. So if I just happen to feel like pressing the trigger when you're not looking, then I shall. Or if I don't want to see you for a few days, I'll put you down the hole and not move the desk away. How's that? Well, uh, not the hole. It's, it's bad enough after a couple of hours. I, I, I'd go mad. You are mad. So all you do will be to exhibit your madness to an audience of one. Shriek and scream to yourself. Mary, don't let him do it. Charles! Does it jolly well right the way you behave? I quite agree. It may teach you a lesson. I, 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 I'm sorry, Bill. Really, I am. I'll, I'll try to take a whiff of myself. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> not possible, is it? You don't know yourself. You think you're one person one moment, another the next. You have no real self. Nothing to take a grip on. I, 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 I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I wish I did. I do well. Really. Oh, don't start blubbering. We won't take any notice anyway. You posed the question when you lost your cool and murdered roof. The answer so far has been a sort of agony for your poor blooming friends who hide you, put up with you, indulge your moods and make ourselves part of a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. And whatever we think of those laws and that justice, it's by them that we'll be tried and sentenced. So we can't hand you over now. Even if we pretended you'd only just arrived on our doorstep and like decent citizens, etc., etc., none of us could trust you not to say the first accusing stupid thing to come into your mad head. Why can't you get me out of the country? Oh, let us hope we can very soon. Otherwise... If you shot me... Nobody would know, would they? Charles and Mary would. I don't want to shoot you, Jimmy. For one thing, I don't want you on my conscience for the rest of my natural. You're, you're, <laughs> you're not worth it, old son. But if you don't do as you're told in future, if you put us at risk, as you've done today, once more, then I'll put a bullet into your heart. Savvy? Savvy. Uh, Charlie is going up to town tomorrow to try to get you off our trembling hand. Is it still Switzerland? I don't know. Timbuktu, for all I care. Now you must go down the hole, just in case our friendly police persons decide to pop in again. I'm hungry. Can't I, can't I stay and eat? No, you can have something later, when I know there's not the buzz of a blue bottle for miles. Uh, go on. Down you go. I'll move the desk. Uh, don't let him keep me down there too long, Mary. I beg of you. Until we're sure the police aren't around. I can't think why they should be around suddenly. Because you've been travelling the country, old scout, and the female fuzz was here when you decided to return. I swear nobody saw me. They know it wasn't me driving the bally old car. And they all know the bally old car, it being the only one of its sort in the district for sure. Where did you go, by the way? I don't know. How could I bally well know? I just drove it in a sort of circle. Luckily, I remember the name of the village, otherwise I should have been totally at sea. I say, that's a thought. You could have driven off without the first idea of where you were going. Indeed you could. So we are lucky to have you back, aren't we? And without a police escort. Fool. Down the hole, fool. And when I'm quite certain that the coast is clear, I'll bring you up. I wish you'd use the gun. I'm better off, dead. Stop the amateur dramatics, Jimmy, and go down the mine. I'll blast you, Bill. 
May you rot in hell one day. Join your lovely Julia there. All right, Charlie, let him get to the bottom. He's a monster. A monster. Don't be surprised if I decide to hang myself. Shut the chap door, Charlie. Put the desk back so it can't be moved. I say, he's wearing your belt. He could... If I thought he would, I'd supply the rope. But Jimmy is not one of those. No more than Julia was. We must get him away. We can't go on keeping him like a prisoner, can we? And us as well. Prisoners keeping a prisoner. I know. This could only ever work with his cooperation. He did cooperate before. Before Julia died. Which makes me wonder, as it must make you wonder. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Good morning, Mr Butler, sir. Everything about this business, if it is creepers you're wondering about, makes me wonder. What in particular? Oh. Yes, you don't know, of course. Mrs. Bassey and Hilda. Bassey, by the way, is as sane as we are. <laughs> no comment. Only a bit slow. Hilda is a bit batty. <laughs> but she's seen a man. And Batty has heard one. Up in the attics. Oh, Batty's a bit blind. Could she describe him? Bearded, but it fits. Oh, uh, there is a pre-sold, by the way. Hilda peeped through the window one day and she see Bill Kent coming up through the floor like the Demon King. He gave her quite a turn. Yeah, it would me. Oh, yes. Well, how are we today, Raylene? Very well, thank you, sir. Mm. Slept like a top. Go on, then. Tell me. You make a pass? As best he could. He was rather restricted. What did you do? Put the bracelets on him? <gasps> he twisted a knee gardening. What? An old polo knee that's weakened. Kent gardening? Don't believe a word of it. Did he talk of his polo friends and others? He did, and they included Jimmy Jenkins. Kent wouldn't give much away, I'm sure. Well, was there anything? Not a sausage. One must admire him for his nerve. And you do? Oh, yes, he's quite a chap. What about the other two, then? Well, she was as calm as the goddess of calms. He gave a terrible performance. Jumped up like stung, rolled his eyes, was <laughs> furtive, had kittens, found a silver lining, thought the ceiling was about to fall, and had certainly robbed the bank that afternoon. What, all this at the mere mention of the name Jenkins? No, actually, it was to do with the garage. Or rather, his car being returned from the garage. What, on Sunday evening? So they said. Mary Cookham charmed them. That Cookham car, that fancy foreign job? Italian, sir. No, it wasn't in the drive when I arrived, but it was there when I left. Did you hear it being returned from the garage? I did, sir. It hooted. The Cookhams went out to deal with whatever situation there was to deal with. They said to pay. Kent, remember, was incapacitated. So mm. we were left alone to have a sexy five minutes until Charlie came in, looking as if he'd been successful in the lavatory for the first time in weeks. Well, it all could be true. I called at the garage, the one they said it was, on my way in this morning. Do you work on Sunday? They suggest that was balmy. Not yesterday, not ever. Sacrilege in the trade. Somebody borrowed the Italian job and took it for a drive when they shouldn't have and got back at the wrong time. I suggested I should go at that time. Kent and Cookham wouldn't hear of it. Mrs Batty and Batty Hilda were told that the previous housekeeper left her illegitimate idiot grown-up son behind the creepers when she left. <laughs> oh, we wondered, didn't we, about an idiot kept out yeah. of sight? No, not even Batty and Hilda believe the idiot man's story. Must be Jenkins, mustn't it? Hilda's actually seen him. And Mrs Batty has heard him, coughing, swearing. We should tell the Met our tale, shouldn't we, uh, sir? I, well, I want the glory, girl. They missed him. He was there. He must have had something to do with Julia's fall to death. He's killed one woman. Why not another? I wonder if Bill Kent knows the score. I wonder if Kent got Jenkins to do it. Oh, that's a nasty thought I hadn't had. Probably Kent is none the wiser than we are. But he must at least suspect Jenkins. And if he knows that Jenkins did it... On Jenkins' admission, then he's right slap between the devil and the deep blue sea, isn't he? Oh, the poor wicked old sailor. Don't sound sorry for him. He's had a good run before the consequences snapped at his heels. Perhaps Jenkins will never come out of that house alive. I had thought of that. If he becomes a bad liability, then I can imagine he'd be for the chop. So what do we do, sir? I need to put a mouse in that house. What about Mrs Batty and Hilda? Well, I've asked them to report on anything out of the ordinary, and what that means to them is another matter. Well, who could we get into the house? Who, oh, indeed. For long enough to bug the whole place. Um... I suppose we could flush him out? Well, a discreet surveillance for starters, but not too discreet. Let them see enough to make them worry. Oh, yes, and some terror tactics. 
The front doorbell, Hilda. Yes, Mum. Do you want him in? Want him in? Well, who is it? Him, watch outside. <sighs> Do open the door, Hilda. Yes, Mum. Morning. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, flowers, Mum. Sign, please. Thank you, Hilda. Uh, Look, this is a picture for a funeral. Lilies. What is this? Reese madam. Name of Jenkins. I think you're mistaken. There's no one of that name here. Oh, it's in the book, madam. Creepers. Jenkins, deceased. Well, what's on the card? Uh, here we are. To Jimmy Jenkins from those who know where he is. <laughs> Heaven, I suppose they mean. It's been paid for, madam. I'm so glad. I'm afraid this is a joke in bad taste, although not your fault. There is no funeral and no Mr. Jenkins here. Hello, two two five. Hello. Yes. I said two two five. And Cookham's my name. Yes, Cook and Ham. Who are you? Are you? Uh, Captain Kent's not here. He'll be back later. Yes, for lunch. Yes. Can I what? I uh, take a message. Oh, of course. Yeah. Let me get pencil and paper. Yes, that's right. I don't know, far away. Tell him of the world outside. Waiting for Jenkins. Hey, what the hell? Hey, look here, who are you? No longer a bally joke. Captain Kent! Captain Kent! Oh. Mrs. Batty, what's up? Oh, he's read me. We had to run, yes. sir. Run? What, was somebody chasing you on the premises? There's men out there. They stared at you, so we run. Men out <laughs> where? They're behind the hedge, sir. Opposite the drive. Lurking, lurking. Lurking, they yes. were. And their heads in the... They're in, in the, the hedge, yes. yes. In the shrine. They never took their eyes off us as we came up the road from the old bus. Muggers, that's what they were. Muggers from London. How many of them? Oh, three, I think, sir. Big mm. man. I don't think much of this post. Oh, uh, no, me, mine. Even a ballet bookmaker wants his pint of flesh. It's a letter for Julia, Bill. Typed. Open it, please, Mary. I abominate the job. Hmm. Something else awful. What? What was Jenkins up to on the night you fell from the attic window? What a pity you can't say. I better let me go, Mary. It looks like a taxi. It is a taxi. Yes. You've probably got the wrong house. Creeper, sir. And a phone call saying to come up here and pick up a Mr. Jenkins. Take him to the police station. Mm, sorry. Wrong house. Where's Jimmy? Having some sun on the terrace. I see he doesn't move, will you? What is it this time? At the end wood, a chappy up a tree with binoculars. Very well hidden, and just caught a glimpse of it. Well, hadn't Jimmy better go in? No, no, he's got the highest between him and the tree creature, but don't let him get around in the garden. I'm off to tell Bill. How much longer can we stand this, Charlie? I don't know, old thing. I don't know. So what else are you going to do to them? What else hey, can hey, you do hey, to them? Hey, hey, not so loud, please, Raylene. If any of this gets out, I'll be scrubbing floors in the local nick faster than next week. Mr. Butler, you deserve to. I didn't <laughs> think you could be so awful. Awful? Is that all? Only awful? Oh, it's not difficult. Oh. You just let the imagination flow free. Directing it at the same time with malicious glee towards a particular object or target. A free-flowing imagination is a load of cobblers unless there's a point of flow. You really don't like that crowd, do you? Kentonese chums. No, I don't. Without a doubt, I don't. I mean, I don't actively dislike real villains, do I, with a few exceptions. Oh, there'll always be a game of cops and robbers going on somewhere. Some of us drift to one side, some to the other, and most stay in the middle. But Kent and his chums are different. I mean, those we don't know. 
Oh, Charlie's pathetic, and she's, well, better than most, but the crowd Kent stands for who've tried to keep Jenkins beyond the law. They're a right lot of toffee-nosed bastards. Oh, I've had dealings with their kind when I was a young copper, and I discovered they were real rubbish, dressed up to resemble people. Things went deep, didn't they? Were you hurt? Probably. Deep? Oh, well, deeper than most experience, because it was unique. I mean, just think, Raylene. What it would have been like if Jenkins was a small-time, common villain. Wife murdered, he wanted for the crime. First off, I doubt if any of his pals would have touched him with a basketball. Not through any uh, altruistic motive, but because they'd have known it was a dead loss in the end. Second, they and everybody near Jenkins Mark II would have been turned over until it hurt. And there wouldn't have been any of the Mayfair man outwits police stuff in the press. None of the spurious glamour of the Mayfair Scarlet Pimpernel headline. Probably only something like, what, scrap metal dealer wanted for wife murder. Bleak stuff. <laughs> and the Jenkins set get the soft hand in the velvet glove treatment, don't they? I mean, the Met didn't even see fit to tell me they were interested in Kent. And if I let it out now that I think that Jenkins is there at Creepers, you know what would happen as well as I do. They'd knock on the door, cap in hand, and ask nicely, and while they wipe their big feet on the doormat, Jenkins would be off on the way to another chummy's lair. Do you think they'll try to get him away, sir? Yes, I do. So I have to play this dirty. Not the dirty way they play it, but the way it hurts them most. How do you see it ending, sir? Well, they'll be forced to try and get Jenkins away. And if they can't quickly, Jenkins and Kent will fall out badly enough for one or other of them to run out screaming. By tomorrow, I'll know what's happening anyway, as if I was there. How are you going to get this bug inside, sir? Down the chimneys at dead of night. Have you seen these things they used to listen with? Small microphones and such like. Yeah, listening devices. Superb technological toys. Fiend's ears, I call them. Place a device the size of a lead pencil down a chimney, and we have four. And there's hardly a word in the house you won't hear clearly. Yeah, gives me the shivers. Now, where do we listen? In a van, 500 yards away, with some very beautiful equipment, which an expert works for us. Tomorrow. I don't suppose they'd bother to light a fire at Creepers this time of year, would they? I was 13 hours down that hellhole yesterday. 13 hours. Well, you're in the garden now. It's got so count your blessings, however small. Oh, I won't be allowed out here very much longer. You wait and see. Some idiot will ring the alarm bell and it'll be Jenkins. Perhaps. Uh, let's hope Mrs. Batty and Hilda have time to clean the drawing room before it rings. My cellar cell needs cleaning. I have to do it yourself. Can't Mary? Why should she? Oh, my God. I could do with a woman. And I don't mean only to clean my lair. Yes, six months nearly for you, isn't it? Six barely months, as Charlie keeps stressing. Unless Julia obliged you. Charlie at the mowing? He is. Didn't he have any luck at all in town? I told you very little, so I have to force their hand. And how the hell are you going to do that? Dump you on a doorstep and kiss my hand goodbye. Just like that? More or less. <laughs> well, then you may as well turn me over, give me up. God, I, 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 I'll, I'll do it for you myself, if you like, here and now. Here I am. Here I am. Come and get me. Jimmy the Jank is here. Oh, Jonah Jenkins. Oh, shut up. Shut up, you bloody fool. They seek me here. What the, they seek what the me hell's there. going on? Poppers seek me. Oh, we should have had a mic in the garden. Am I in heaven or am I in Try the drawing room mic now, will you? That damned elusive... Uh, he he sounds drunk. What was he babbling on about? I hope they've Can't got him by now, sir. Some poor lost soul, but they ought to put him in a court. Lose the drawing room, Gibbs. Try the study now, will you? Nice empty room noise. That's a door. Mm -hmm. Hold it. Footsteps. Going upstairs. A lot of them. Master bedroom, sir? Yeah. Good. Oh, thank you very much for that, Jimmy. For you to have one of your blasted freak houses was all we needed. Mrs. Batty and Hilda must have heard you. And all the gents lurking in the shrubbery with their notebooks. We should stop waving that blooming revolver around, Bill. Where's Mary? Shooter. Hadn't Why thought of that. Shopping? When Where she comes Mary? back, we'll have a confab on you, old lad. Nothing to talk about, is there? In the meantime, you will stay in here, Sammy. Not all alone, I take it? All alone. But I'll turn the key. Have a sleep. 
You said you were ever so tired. Uh, look, let me sit in the garden. I'll be good this time, I promise. No, Jimmy, and I'm not even sorry. This afternoon, yes, when we keep an eye on you and on the snoopers. Come on, Charlie. What in sod? I'll get my own back on you one day. You wait. You're sailing off like some snivelling schoolboy. That's what I thought. Hey, it won't be long. Up we go. Don't point that toy pistol at me, do you hear? shoots himself with it. You want to stay with him, sir? Yes, uh, but I'd like to hear what Kent and Cookham have to say. I have to put the other receiver on. There's no way that I can take any more of this, Charlie. You don't have to tell me. Well, what to do, then? Drive him out somewhere and leave him. Maybe hell to get there. Absolute valley hell. Uh, tell him we arranged a pick-up. It could work. Is, is that Jenkins whistling? Yeah. What will Big Bill do? Put me out somewhere? Like you throw a dog you don't want out of a car? You haven't had any funny things happen for a couple of days. Well, I should imagine bloody butlers run out of ideas. No, he bloody hasn't. Playing? That would be his idea of a joke. I won't go. I won't. We're not actually hearing uh, Jenkins' well, thoughts, are we? <laughs> Bless you, no. He thinks aloud well, though, doesn't he? It comes from being locked up a lot. I don't understand why he hasn't walked in and said, hand him over. Because he's not... Go on, sure Big Bill, he tell him. And he's <laughs> not sure that he'll be able to grab him if he wants. True enough. <laughs> what? Jenkins? <laughs> Laughing? Oh, uh, it's like a child crying. Uh, Mary's right, I suppose. Uh, War of nerves. Indubitably. Until we get him up and ourselves. <laughs> I never considered it. <laughs> Myself, brother. Who was very out in a different camp. Now that's true. <laughs> No, because I, I lost my temper. I didn't mean to kill a silly cow, but she shouldn't have done it. What a silly cow. Which silly cow? She would struggle with it. Oh, nothing's true. None of it, none of it's true. It's all... It's all a nightmare, and Nanny will come and, and, and wake me up from it soon. It, the good old Nanny. Oh, it's awful <laughs> listening. Round the twist. <laughs> Lose him for a moment, will you, Gibbs? Car arriving. Have you got a mic near the front door? Yes. Hello. There's Mary back. Good. When she's part of the shop, you can bring her out to the garden. Yes, all right. Why the hell did I forget the garden? Because you were too enthusiastic about the chimneys, all sir. Right, all right, all right. Hello, Charlie. Anything happened? Not much. Jimmy's up to his usual silly buggers. Oh, I'm so tired of it. What this time? Oh, shiting and so on in the garden. We locked him in the bedroom. The batteries were doing. I'd be drawing them. Well, it could be worse. Just. Bill wants to talk. He's in the garden. I think he's going to take some bally tough action today. Oh, thank God. Well, let me put the shopping in the kitchen. Have a pee, and I'll join you. Hey. Why the garden? It's full of biting insects. Does he think the house is bugged? Hello? Hello? Oh, <clears throat> I say, don't give me the creeps, old darling. Creepers for the creeps. I was only joking. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be with Bill. Try Jenkins again, please, Gibbs. All right, Mr. Butler. Good. He's asleep. I think there could be a showdown, sir. Soon. I think you're right, Raylene. Let's warn the boyos, shall we? Uh, this is Butler to the pantry. Pantry one, move forward carefully now and take up position. Understood? Understood. And have the fireman's net ready for use? Will do, sir. Uh, pantry two and three, stand by to move in on the signal knives and forks. Butler, out. Fire drill, sir? Do you think they'll set the place on fire? A net for catching bodies. Somebody might throw somebody out of a high window. It's like having second sight. I'm supposed to have that. Well, some of it's rubbed off on me. But it could happen. Put your second sight to work and tell me how. Uh, Julia. Julia. Jenkins. Somebody called Julia. Uh, I can't hear her presence. Holy you... smoke, I should hope not. Well, oh, Shh, listen. Uh, come to bed. Good girl. Talking in his sleep, isn't he? Oh, that's it, of course. Uh, uh, don't say that. Don't say that, you bitch. Uh, laugh at me, would you? Uh, I'll teach you a lesson, my fine lady. Come here. Is this the night in question? 
uh, the more you wriggle, the more I'll hurt you. Hold on, hold on. Be still, Julia. Still. They must have heard the screams. Which they wouldn't if you'd been down the hole. Jimmy. He's asleep. Where is he? Uh, uh, I know. I was, uh, I was asleep. You, you woke me. You were screaming and shouting, old boy. Uh, I was a nightmare. I, I, I wake myself. Sometimes down that hole, it, uh, it's on my conscience. I can't forget it. What can't you forget? <laughs> As Julia, that night. When she fell from the attic, you mean? Yes. Uh, I don't remember what happened with Ruth. Ruth is his wife. It's gone. It, but with Julia, it was a mistake, Bill. Uh, it was all a mistake. Tell us, can you? Try, Jimmy. You were all out. She, she said yes, all right, but she wanted to go up to my room, not hers. She, she was a bit tiddly, but that was all to the better. Got up there and she started to play hard to get. I, I said, stop it, you old tart, and get on the bed, but she wouldn't. Turn thoroughly nasty, said I was a murdering pig and other things. Told me to clear off there and then, and if I didn't, she'd dial 999 and get the wazzers in and tell them who I was. I wasn't going to let her do that, was I? So I grabbed her, opened the window, and shoved her head out to cool off. She started to shout. She called out for help, and she shouted, Jenkins, the murder is here, over and over. So... I bought the window down across her back, so only her behind was in the room. I, I, I thought I'd teach her a lesson, so I got behind her and took up her skirt when she kicked me. It's like a horse kick right in the ghoulies. I, I, I went over, let go of the window, and she shot out. It just shot out. I, I was on the floor holding where she'd kicked me. I, I couldn't stop her, Bill. It, it was all an accident. Get on your feet, Jimmy. Oh, right, right away, Bill. What are you going to do? He's coming upstairs with me, and he's going to look out of that attic window like Julia did. No, you can't, Bill, you can't. Right, that's it. <clears throat> Butler to pantry, knives and forks. Come on, Rayleigh. Thank, Thank you, Gibbs. Bill, I, I can't move. I'm mad, you know. Shut up, houses always look so sad. Well, I think so. Yeah, no, don't be so defensive. They do. Even Creepers does. Well, now it's finished. I wanted to see the place, didn't I? Like some sentimental old lout. Come on, let's walk around. And that poor garden. That's sad, too. Gardens have a way of returning to life. Once they're given a helping hand. Do you mean anything by that? Only what I meant. Look, there's the attic window. This is where we found Jenkins snared in our net, alive and kicking. And this is where we found Julia Kent dead. Would have been clean if Jenkins had pitched up and died here on the same spot. <laughs> Poetic justice out of some ancient Greek play. Does it ever happen, sir? Oh, I'm sure it used to, if in another land. Instead, Jenkins will live out the rest of his natural, probably, in one institution for the criminally insane or another, costing, what, 3000 odd a year? Will they accept he's insane, do you think? Nah, he's unfit to plead. I suspect he always was. Only the smart suit, the expensive shirt, the correct tie, the handmade shoes, the barber's attentions, the 
stand-up straight background and the paper stuff he could flash around, stop most people from looking at him objectively. Well, you can't blame them. Madmen are supposed to look mad. Wild of dress and eye. Kent got to know Jenkins was beyond redemption. What will Kent get, do you reckon? Huh. Well, they can't prove he tried to kill Jenkins, and I gather they're not going to try to do so. So, for harbouring concealing... He'll go down well with the jury, won't he? He went down well with you, didn't he? <laughs> yes. The jury will be impressed by the loyalty to a poor, mad friend he's shown. There's the dead Julia. Hasn't he paid the price, suffered enough? Eighteen months suspended. Will you be cross at not nailing him to the doorpost? I'm no longer cross, as you call it. I, I mean, I beat him inside the distance. I took the champ down a peg or two. I still don't like what he stands for, but uh, that's another matter. He's laughing at the system, really, isn't he? The Bill Kents always have. They don't belong to it, which helps them when it doesn't help the ordinary villain. Ah, it's unfair. Something to do with society's packing order, I imagine. When Kent discovered that Jenkins was raving, and what he'd done to Julia, why he didn't put a bullet through the chap's brain, I can't imagine. A villain would have done, or had it done. But not Kent. His kind may well laugh at our system, but they go in for one of their own making, which is pretty difficult for us to understand. Well, it's over. I'll miss the game. Yes. Back to a comparatively quiet life, girl. Still, we annoyed the Met no end. <laughs> Fancy not finding him when he was under their feet. Wait. Hey. What is it? Huh? Well, look. What? Well, somebody's opened the curtains. <gasps> so they have. My God, it's Mrs. Batty and Hilda. They come in to keep the place aired. If they see us, we'll be here all day. <laughs> I look forward to hearing Hilda tell the court what she seed. <laughs> I do hope she gets some new teeth before then. <clears throat> come on, Raylene. Let's tiptoe through the trapoleum and <laughs> get back to the beach. <laughs> In Creepers by Frederick Bradnam, the part of Detective Chief Inspector Butler was played by Ian Holm and Detective Sergeant Rogers by Elizabeth Bell. Bill Kent by Jack May, Jimmy Jenkins by Philip Bond. Charles Cookham, David Savile, Mary Cookham, Francis Jeter. Mrs. Batty, Catherine Parr, and Hilda, Gladys Spencer. With Neville Jason and Alaric Cotter. Technical presentation by David Greenwood, assisted by Penny Lester, and Richard Beadsmore. The play was produced and directed by Jane Morgan. And now, with a look forward to next Saturday, here's Harriet Cass. Easter Saturday on Radio 4. And as usual in the morning, Margaret Howard looks back over the week's broadcasting to make her selections for Pick of the Week, while Science Now looks forward to what's new in the world of science and technology. Then at lunchtime, you can listen to an hour of music in the company of Robin Ray. A seasonal edition of Weekend in the afternoon takes us to Jerusalem for the Easter celebrations. Joining in the festivities is Shushu, the loquacious camel. May I speak to him? Good morning, Shushu. He didn't talk to anyone except his master. Right, will you make Shushu say good morning okay. to me? Okay, Shushu, say hi. <laughs> well, there's no answer to that, but there'll be lots more colourful conversation, human or otherwise, when Weekend visits Jerusalem and Rome. And we're still travelling in the afternoon theatre play. I'm not certain one can get into the Gobi Desert. Oh, I think so. Things are loosening up everywhere. You don't hear of many people going there. All the more reason we should. That's true, very true. <laughs> we like being pioneers. In the evening, comedian, scriptwriter and emu owner Rod Hull is Roy Plumley's castaway in Desert Island Discs. And later, the Saturday night theatre play turns back the clock to the Elizabethan period and centres around the Queen's favourite, Sir Walter Raleigh. Some of your Easter Saturday programmes here on Radio 4. <laughs> And now, here's the weather forecast for tomorrow. Southern districts of England and Wales were bright and dry at first, apart from showers near western coasts. 
Rather cloudy weather with showers or longer outbreaks of rain, sleet or snow over Scotland, Northern Ireland and northern districts of England will spread southwards. Northern districts becoming brighter, though with further wintry showers. It'll feel cold with a strong northerly wind. Central areas of England and East Wales may have a frost at first. And the outlook for Monday and Tuesday, bright in the south at first, rain preceded by sleet or snow will spread south to all areas. Mostly rather cold with night frost. Radio 4. After Big Ben, the news read by John Marsh. BBC Radio News at 10 o'clock. Red Rum has made racing history by winning the Grand National for the third time. The first woman rider in the National gave up after her horse refused at the fourth fence from last. It's now clear the Liberals will not vote against the government on Monday over the budget increase in petrol tax. Instead, they'll try to get the increase taken off by the summer. Nearly all British Airways domestic flights from Heathrow to Morrow have been cancelled because of industrial action by maintenance engineers. The opposition spokesman on Northern Ireland has called for a special anti-terrorist brigade to be set up in the province to catch what he calls the big fish. There's been more trouble with football hooligans. 36 people, including two policemen, were injured during and after Manchester United's match at Norwich. Red Rum has become the first horse to win the Grand National three times. His victory at Aintree this afternoon is the culmination of five extraordinary years in the National. He won in 1973 and 74 and came second in 1975 and last year. Written today by Tommy Stack, he came in at 9 to 1, 25 lengths ahead of Churchtown Boy at 20 to 1, with Eyecatcher third at 18 to 1. Pill Garlic was fourth at 40 to 1. Peter Bromley describes the final stages of the race. It's the local hero, Red Rum, with one more fence to be jumped in this Grand National. Here he comes into it. He's risen. He's over safely. He's on the run in this two riderless horses coming at him. The riderless horses are going to run away from him, I think. And Tommy Stack sets his heart for home. In behind him, about eight lengths away, is Churchtown Boy. He's not going to catch Red Rum. Here comes the greatest horse of Aintree. Red Rum has 200 yards to run to make history. Two riderless horses are there in front of him. Tommy Stack is pushing Red Rum. The excitement here is tremendous. Red Rum has done it for a third time. Well, there's jubilation after the race as the Liverpool crowd acclaimed Red Rum. His trainer, Ginger McCain, was almost overcome by the 12-year-old horse's victory. I think it's bloody marvellous. <laughs> Super. Brilliant on both the horse's part and Tommy's part. Absolutely. Never in doubt the way I saw it. He's a very, very exceptional horse. You know, I came here today and I thinking I was probably one... I thought I was a week short of peak fitness. I really did. Um, I want to cry for him. I'm sorry. <laughs> And another piece of history was made at Aintree by Charlotte Brew, who became the first woman ever to enter the Grand National. Riding Barony Fort, she got as far as the fourth from last fence when her horse refused. How did she feel about the race? Fantastic, you know. I, mean, I just wish we completed, which would have been the sort of ultimate, but um, he went superly, really did, and, and we didn't cause any trouble, which is what everybody was worried about, I think. I mean, what a thrill it is. It's the most fantastic race to ride in. I mean, I hope I'll be back next year. On a more sombre note, two horses were killed during the race. They were Winter Rain and Zeta's Sun. It now seems virtually certain that the Liberals will not oppose the government in Monday's vote on the higher petrol tax. However, they're still opposed to the five and a half pence a gallon rise announced in the budget. They say it will cause hardship to people in rural areas without adequate public transport. Christopher Jones reports on how they now plan to express this opposition. The Liberals have come down instead on the side of getting the government to make some sort of concessions later on when the finance bill, and that's the bill that actually brings the budget into law, when the finance bill goes through the House of Commons. There had at one time appeared to be a real possibility that the government might suffer the major embarrassment of losing the petrol increases because all the opposition parties are strongly opposed to them. But Mr John Pardo, the Liberal economic spokesman, has been talking privately with Mr Joel Barnett, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and this compromise seems to have been worked out.
Mr. David Steele, the Liberal leader who's in Lancaster today, explained their present attitude to me when I phoned him this afternoon. Well, we certainly, certainly will not be voting in support of it. Uh, whether we uh, abstain or vote against this is a matter, of course, for the parliamentary party as a whole. Now the time is half past eight. Saturday Night Theatre. We present, in stereo, Peter Woodthorpe as Tony Pirelli and Trevor Martin as Detective Commissioner John Kelly in Edgar Wallace's most famous play, On the Spot. Chicago, 1929. Chicago, 1929. Father? Yes, Doctor. Will you hear me if I pray? No, Father. You can pray as loud as you like, but he can't hear you. He'll be conscious again in a little while, but not for long. Where have you put Sean O'Donnell? He told me he was still alive in the casualty ward. Is that right? Quite right, Mr. Kelly. Where is he? Oh, he's here. He's in the bed here. Well, uh, Sean's got his by the look of him. Have you any idea who did this, Mr. Kelly? Yeah, I have, Father. He's one of Mike Feeney's gang. Gang shooting, eh? These crimes are terrible. Every week I read in the papers somebody kills somebody. But Sean O'Donnell here, I knew him. He was an altar boy at the Holy Name Cathedral. Was he, Father? He was also Mike Feeney's lieutenant. Where do you find him, Mr. Kelly? Find him, Doctor? Not me. One of my motorcycle patrols heard the shots. By the time they got to him, the killers had gone. It was on the outskirts of the city, corner of Atlantic and 95th. Queer place to bump him. I wonder if Mike Feeney put him on the spot. Put him on the spot? How do you mean? We're sending him to his death by his own gang. But why? <laughs> well, well, sometimes it's the price they pay for peace. Gang leaders can't always control their own men, and if one of them starts shooting up a rival gang, the leader can put him on the spot. Send it to some place where the other gang can get him. Holy mother. A human sacrifice. <laughs> Mr. Kelly is moving. You won't have much time. Oh, Sean. You know me, boy? John Kelly, chief of police? John Kelly. Yeah. You're old Jake, boy. Now, I've been a good friend of yours, Sean. Good friend. Sure, I have. Looked after your mother the first time you went to stir, didn't I? Now, you're going to tell me who did this, aren't you? My wife. Sent for her. My wife. Sure, I've sent for your wife. I rushed my own car for her. She's Mike Feeney's sister, isn't she? Yeah. But Mike Feeney never gave you a chance, Sean. He put you on the spot, didn't he? Didn't he? Now come clean with it, kid. No. Not Mike Feeney. Oh, it wasn't Feeney. Two men. Two. Two of the Pirelli gang, wasn't it, Sean? <sighs> Tony Pirelli's gang got you. You're not going to dart with a lie on your lips, are you, Sean? Now, for God's sake, don't go out without telling the truth. Pirelli's gang got you. Wasn't it Con O'Hara bumped you? Con O'Hara, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Now, I'm waiting, Sean. <sighs> you won't speak? <sighs> all right, Doctor. That's how they all are. True to the gang tradition. Dumb. Father, he's going fast. I think it's Requiem time. my turn on Dona Ace, Domini. It looks perpetual lucid as the detched hymnos deus in Zion, the TB redditor votum in Jerusalem, exaudi orationem me, ad the omnis caro peiit, requiem eternum. 
Sancta Maria, ora pro nobis, Sancta Dei, Genetrix, ora pro nobis, Sancta Virgo, Virgo, ora pro nobis. You like when I play the organ? You like it, little Minley? I like it very much, Tony. <laughs> Guno, what a pity the damn fool wasn't born an Italian like Tony Pirelli, eh? But he was educated in Rome. You wouldn't think I knew that, huh? You know everything, Tony. Oh, music? Yes, my little Chinese ape. Perhaps if I'd uh, stayed in the orchestra at Cosmolino's, I'd have been a swell musician. Antonio Pirelli, the maestro. Huh? But I was ambitious. And now I live in Chicago, in the most beautiful apartment in the world. Is not this room just like the Doge's palace in Venice? Better, eh? And you, Minley, mm -hmm. the most beautiful China lady. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, what is it? Good morning, boss. Do you want me, Angelo? Yes, I've been out since early checking the real stuff. And there are all these papers. Uh, come along, Minley, another day begins. You'll come back by and by. Yeah. Tony, you said you would come and sit in my room. I said I will see you by and by. Oh, but... Tony, you said you were coming. Damn it, can't you hear me? Yes. So, well now, Angelo, what is it? That train's through from Canada. But one box car was opened and half the booze was gone. Hi, yeah, but I know all about that. It was the police in Michigan. I told them to help themselves. Well, they have. And here are the papers. Uh, yeah. I paid $500 to the railway clerk mm. and $2,000 to that prohibition officer. Hey, they've stopped going out of the yard. Eh? He's worth it. We don't want no trouble. Right. Then we'll start tracking it tomorrow. It's all the best stuff. Yeah, yeah, but be careful, Angelo. That Judge Colson gets that good champagne. Last time, he got apple juice and he raised Dell. I don't want no trouble with them Supreme Court judges. Maybe. Yeah, and if that's all, I'll play the organ again. Oh, yes, and uh, Angelo. See? Si? Watch out for Mike Feeney's gang. Ah, forget it. Mike Feeney would be like a cat on wheels now that Sean O'Donnell's got his. Sean was the brains of that outfit. Ha <laughs> ha! That's the worst thing that's ever been said about poor Mike Feeney. <laughs> O'Hara's a loud talker, ain't he? Oh, Hara's Irish, and he's from New York, so he can't help being a lousy talker. As long as he don't talk about last night. He won't, he won't. He might talk to his woman, and he's got some swell woman. Ay, ay, ay. Ah, I'm a bonehead to talk about women. Mm. That's your trouble, boss. Why can't you keep your mind on business for a few years and then take a holiday? About this stuff for the judge. She's hmm? really nice, eh, this uh, O'Hara woman? <laughs> yes, but what need we talk about, I don't know. It, it, it is the first time since Min Lee has been uh -huh. here. Leave her out. Tell me about uh, this girl. Uh, is she a uh, soigne, huh? What the hell that is, I don't know. All that I can tell you is that she's tough, but she's classy. Beautiful mother. Mm. Oh, God, why did I ever bring up this subject? Mm. But O'Hara, that pig, how could he get a fine girl? Listen, if you start wondering what girls see in guys, your mind is going right off your business. <laughs> well, look who's here. Mm. Good morning, Con O'Hara. Morning, Angelo. Morning, Mr. Pirelli. Oh, no, <laughs> Just the man I want to see. Yeah, yeah everyone <laughs> wants to see me. They always do. And some more than others, see? Eh? Yeah, well, that lets me out. I've got work to do if you haven't. I'll be next door if you want me, boss. <laughs> oh, Hara, yeah? uh, have you read the, the papers this morning? Well, I don't take no notice of newspapers. Full of god-awful lies. Well, here's the tribute on the top page. Please. Look. Well? 
Ridi to ara, ridi tik you can read. Sean O'Donnell, booze racketeer, dies at hands of gunmen. Dead gangster is Mike Feeney's chief aide. Put on the spot, Detective Commissioner Kelly thinks. <laughs> Put on the spot? Say that and make Mike Feeney mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on, read then. Uh, uh, last night at 12, Patrolman Ryan heard shots and running in the direction found the body of Sean O'Donnell. He had been shot. Oh, how? Wasn't I there? Yes, I believe you were there. That is why it is also very interesting for me. The yes. kid gave him two shots, and I give him one. Yes. I don't waste no time, Tony. It was all over, and we was heading for Michigan Avenue before that bull was in sight. That was fine. Yeah. And he was dead? <laughs> was he dead? Listen, when I pull a rod on a guy, his front name's late. And yet, uh, he was alive when he was found. Uh, How's that? He was alive and taken to the Brothers Hospital here in Chicago and saw Mr. Kelly. Go on. <laughs> La. Oh, oh. oh, it was that college kid. I told you I didn't want to take him along. Say, that boy fell apart the minute he pulled his rod. I've never missed my man. I see. He missed him, but you killed him. And that was why he was alive at one o'clock at the brother's hospital with Mr. Kelly saying, Come clean for your old mother's sake. You're kidding me. You come to me from New York, a swell killer from the Pie Pointers gang. In New York, we do this. In New York, we do that in Chicago, sweetheart. I send you out to do a little simple thing on what do you do? The kid got me rattled. Sure he got you rattled. You're a swell fella, eh? All brains, eh? Well, old Donald's dead now. Sure, everybody dies sometime. But when I mark a man, he is not to die of old age. Say, now, listen, Mr. That is all. I'm not annoyed, but... Uh, Mike Feeney will be calling. I've been expecting him all morning. Oh, I'll answer it. You? Oh, no, Harry. You're going to answer the call of one man and find yourself talking to another. Oh, well, oh, well. Yes. Is that you, Pirelli? Uh, Mr. Pirelli is not at home. Now, listen here, Pirelli, you bloody son of a bitch, you Italian bastard, you Sicilian sod, you... Don't I use such what... language, Mr. Mr. Michael Feeney, I may be all these things, and yet the lady at the center exchange might not like to hear you say in them. Pirelli, look at Now listen to me, I tell you. Yeah, you tell me what you've done with Sean O'Donnell, you bastard. What has Sean O'Donnell ever done to you, you swine, that you and your mix should bump him off like that last night, you son of a bitch. Listen, you silly Irish. Why did you call me then? I'm trying to tell you, Mike. I don't know anything about Sean O'Donnell. In the Tribune, it says, you put him on the spot. That's a bloody damn lie, Pirelli, and you know it. Sean O'Donnell was bumped off by your two killers. Arrgh and him. one of them I bloody know was that son from New York, Conor O'Hara. Conor O'Hara, do you hear me? Poor he was one of your killers, Conor O'Hara. Oh, O'Hara. my friend, you are like a German opera. I tell you, I do not know. I swear to you by my blessed mother of God. And I cross myself with a telephone. I do not know O'Hara. Conor O'Hara, don't be silly. Listen, Tony, tell him from me. Shut up. Uh, are you still there, my queen? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, and I'm telling you that Con O'Hara will pay for Con it. Con O'Hara is too big a fool. Hey. I wouldn't trust him to kill a cat. He's one of those guys who shoots out his mouth. Yeah. Now, uh, listen to me, Mike. You and your bunch of mix have been muscling in on my territory. Uh, that's yes, the you have. Sean was the guy who shot up one of my speakeasies the other night and who hijacked the car load the liquor from the ear yards. Yeah, but Sean is dead. Look, I, 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 I tell you what we do. I, I don't want no trouble. Let's meet and discuss our business. Hmm? Meet me at the corner of Michigan the 25th. <laughs> I meet you at the corner of Michigan the 25th and where do I go from there? To the Undertaker's bar. <laughs> Say, you're not going to put me on the spot. Uh, listen, Mike... Uh, I've an idea. Why don't you uh, come in? Listen, Tony, don't you trust that guy? Shut up, O'Hara. Are you still there, Mike Feeney? Yeah, I'm still here. Good. So uh, you'll uh, come here, uh, but I'll meet you opposite the Tribune building and uh, bring you back with me here. Yeah, my 
Mind your step, Pirelli. That's okay by me. There'll be a machine gun covered in you. Who says? I'm saying that. But don't, don't, don't you want to talk? Sure, I want to talk, and we'll come back here, you and me, without rods. Without rods. And the time? Eleven o'clock. Okay. Eleven o'clock. Now listen, Tony, I'm telling you something. You want me, boss? Yeah, I do. Listen to me. Vado a incontrare Mike Feeney. Mike Feeney, ma dove? Da faccia al Tribune Building, alla undici stamattina. Mi copri con la machine gun, va bene? Say, I'm in his tour, eh? You don't need to reveal no one. You got a good guy. Ma Tony, è troppo pericoloso per me. Ascolta, ascolta. Non ascolto più, io vado. Nothing will happen to that domani. I will meet him, it will be very interesting. I'm Carl O'Hara from New York, you know? Hey, Tony, you're not treating me square. Huh? Hey, O'Hara. Yeah, what is it, Angelo? Want to see your woman? Huh? She's out in the hall here waiting for you. Oh, oh I'll be right Your home. woman? You have a woman, Carl? Sure. Ain't I a human being? Nice, huh? Ain't you never met her, Tony? No, no, I have not seen her. She's pretty, eh? Uh, she's dandy. <laughs> yeah, say, Tony, hmm? I can't understand you running around with a chink. I don't speak that language. Chink. Uh, listen, I'm not saying anything against Min Lee. She's a swell-looking kid. Sure, sure, but not so nice as yours, huh? Oh, well. <laughs> Bring her in. Uh, oh, you mean you'd like to meet her? Sure. Uh, then I'll bring her. Uh, on the level, Tony. Sure thing. I know what you waps are. Nice word, that waps. <laughs> I make plenty of money for you, Con. You're a swell feller. Eh? Go on, fetch her now. Eh? <laughs> okay, Tony, I fetch her. Con O'Hara, Firia de una putana de New York. Oh. I'll meet Mr. Pirelli, Maria. I've heard a whole lot about you, Mr. Pirelli. <laughs> you have. Sure. Eh? <laughs> I'm always talking about him, and I can't. I'd like to know Mrs. Pirelli. She's a Chinese lady, isn't she? Chinese lady. You hear that, Conoara? She didn't say chink, she said Chinese lady. Will you remember that, please? No. Yes. Mrs. Pirelli is a 50-50 Chinese American. And now, let me take your coat. Uh, huh? We'll step out now, if you're ready, Maria. Do you like Chicago? Oh, it certainly is a swell place. Better than New York, eh? Mm. We have beautiful stores, good furs, sables on chiffon, exquisite. We will go shopping someday. <laughs> Perhaps we shall see some sables. Huh? Sables? Yeah. Say, what are you handing me? Con, your friend Mr. Pirelli is a swell kidder. Why, well, I've worn this fur of mine for two years. That coat set me back two thousand dollars. Two grand? <laughs> I'd pay that for the collar. <laughs> uh, gee, you look at the time. Uh, come on, kid, we shan't make that appointment. Okay. I heard the buzzer. Did you ring, boss? No, Angelo. You must have been the telephone. <laughs> Oh, yeah, of course. Yes. <laughs> it was for you, O'Hara. For me? I wanted on the wire. Well, can't you put it through here? Who is it? Police department. Huh? Well, that's what they sounded like. Maybe Kelly knows you're here. Kelly knows everything. Go on, O'Hara. Don't keep that policeman waiting. Oh. Uh, you stay here, Mrs. O'Hara. You see Chicago from my balcony. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, come on, Angelo. Show me the phone. <laughs> 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 what do you think of my apartment? Gee, ain't it a swell dump? It's just like being in a church. Does it remind you of the Doge's Palace in Venice? Maria. Hey, what? You, you've got a nerve. I've never seen you before. You like this place. Where do you live? We've got an apartment off stage. Yeah, four rooms and a bath. Oh, huh? That's good enough for me. Nah. Nothing is good enough for you. Oh, mm. God, you got a nerve to kiss me like this. I Con knew what you did. I would do it before his eyes. I would want to do nothing better. Are you crazy? He'd kill you. <laughs> if he killed me, he would be crazy. Hey, you see this diamond on my finger, eh? Huh? Here, you have it. Oh, I couldn't. Uh... <sighs> Ain't it just lovely? Put it on, go on. Put it on, quick, quick, quick. There. <laughs> oh, Mama, that's well. Uh, tonight I give a party. All of the best people will be here. You come, huh? If Khan comes. Khan? Oh, yeah, yeah, he'll come. And uh, 
You'll sleep here. Is there plenty of rooms, eh? You ain't gonna talk to me like that. You've got a damn nerve. <laughs> well, what's the idea? Hey, Qantas didn't want me at all. Hey, Maria, what's the matter with you? Look what Mr. Pirelli gave me. Oh, he gave you that, did he? Mm-hmm. Why? I give her two more if I wish. She's your wife? That's why. He's a swell fellow, your husband, Maria. Yes. I'll call you Maria. <laughs> and you must call me Tony. Eh? <laughs> and I can trust Con O'Hara. Nobody else. Eh? <laughs> He's a big shot, you, huh? <laughs> now, that's all right by me, but... <laughs> yeah? There's a call for Mr. Pirelli. Let me put him through. Pronto. Maria, here. Did that wop get fresh with you? Try to kiss you or anything? Oh, I know, Con. I'd like to see him start. And that guy goes plump crazy over a skirt, if it's the right kind. Not everyone's his kind. You ain't. I should say not. Oh, Min Lee. He's mad about her. That is good news. Hey, look, she's here. Uh, Maria, meet Mrs. Pirelli. Glad to know you, Mrs. Pirelli. You are very pretty. Very lovely. Why, Mrs. Pirelli, if it comes to that, I've got nothing on you. I do admire your wife, Mr. Pirelli. Ah, pretty, eh? Madam Butterfly, eh? Hmm, is that so? <laughs> then I've heard about her. Oh, don't be dumb, kid. Madam Butterfly is a dame in a book. Madam oh. Butterfly was Japanese. Yeah. It is Italian opera, Puccini. Tony will play on organ. Maybe tonight. Maria, what do you think of Minley? Cute, eh? Show Maria your rings, honey. There. $20,000, that baby, huh? Sure. It's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, well, Maria and I will be stepping out now. Oh, Tony. come. I want you. Go and get that boy, Jimmy Magat. Tell him I want to see him. Your wife can stay here till you come back. Uh, Minley, you show Mrs. O'Hara the Winter Garden. That's uh, where we have our parties. <laughs> Through this way. Uh, some out of time, I guess. Mrs. O'Hara's got an appointment. Uh, Maria, snap into it now. Oh, well. Well, goodbye for now. Arrivederci, Maria. And you will come to my party. Oh, yes, I hope so, Tony. <laughs> she is lovely. Very lovely. Eh? Yeah. She's so You going to the opera tonight, Tony? Tonight is got the diamond, and I'd rather go to the zoo than hear the argument. Maybe you will stay with me sometime tonight? Huh? I never see you, and I don't know where you go. Oh, little darling. How often have I said that you think if you must think? Speak if you must speak, but never let your thoughts and your tongue come together, silly little devil. Yeah. No, that hurt. And that? Oh. That hurt more? You know. Why don't you cry when I hurt you, you heathen? You know what I am afraid of? What every woman is afraid of. Another woman. There is another woman? To me, all women is another woman. I get a little scared sometimes about you, Tony. When you go out, I never know if you will come back. Is it the way I have? That night they shot at you. I thought I'd die. What is more important, I thought I would, but I didn't. And where is Camorna? And Scalese? And clever Max Sweeney, you shot me all in hell. That is theologically accurate. Tony, I have been thinking. Huh? Can't we get away from Chicago? Sure, you can go by the 20th century. You have time to make the reservations. I said we. We? We is not me. You are just you, understand? Nothing but. You are like the beautiful Venetian furniture in this apartment. You are pretty, charming, and lovely to my eyes, but so are all the things in this palazzo room. They do not say, Tony Perelli, take us back to Italy with you. Oh, lovely, darling. So stupid. You damn fool. Tony... Who is coming to the party tonight? You shall see them when they arrive. It will be a lovely party. Will that be women? I said it would be a lovely party. Is she coming? Who? Mrs. O'Hara. Sure. Why can't she stay away? She has her own man. Did you see the man? Sure, I saw him. <laughs> well, wouldn't you go to a party if he was your man? Jimmy says Jimmy. that... Jimmy. Ah, <laughs> Jimmy McGarth, you like the college boy. He's nice. Yes, he's nice. 
He is like a little baby to me. Yeah. You take him in your arms like a little baby, like this. Why, Tony? And you kiss him, eh? No, like this. Tony. No, no. Like a little baby, huh? Such things I have heard. Why do you look at me like that? Listen, somebody is coming. Huh? Why, hello, Jimmy boy. Hello? And O'Hara, too. So you uh, found Jimmy boy for me, huh? Sure. I it, met him on the uh, avenue. Uh, you said you wanted to see him. And I want to talk to you, Tony. Ah. Good morning. Minley. Run away, sweetheart. Me and Jimmy's got something to say to one another. I want to see you, Jimmy, before you go. He wants to see you. Uh, take a seat, will you, Jimmy? I guess I'll walk around. Sure, that silky carpet sent me back ten grand, but what's the use if you don't walk on I mean, it? The boy uh, wants to have a little talk. Sure, O'Hara, my ears are very good. I heard him say so quite well. Uh, yeah, Jimmy. I made a damn fool of myself last night. No, no, that was nothing, boy. You're a swell fella, don't you worry. You see, I knew Sean O'Donnell. I, I rather liked him. Mm -hmm. and, and when I pulled my gun on him, well, he looked at me kind of hurt. You know, like killing a dog you're fond of. I know just what you feel, kid. But it's nothing. Well, if Con hadn't been there, I guess I'd have got myself bumped off rather than do it. But I fixed Sean O'Donnell good, Chief. I see the kid was nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I listened to you, Con, plenty. In a minute. Yes, Jimmy. Well, I, I haven't slept. I, <laughs> I haven't seen Sean all night. His eyes. Look, I... Uh, oh, can it, Jimmy? You ain't yellow, are you? Jeez. Hara, you are dumb. Be it. You're okay with me, Jimmy. Sure, I know how you feel. You're a college boy. And all that raw stuff don't look good, but we got to do it, Jimmy. I don't want no trouble. I'd, I'd work this booze racket without hurting a fly if they'd let me. There's no sense to it, Jimmy. Killing and killing. Who the hell wants to kill anybody? But they won't leave you be. You get all set and working fine and dandy and smooth and friendly and everything. And then one of them north side guys, Mike Feeney's gang, comes muscling in and you got to tell him. you got to tell him where he gets off. Say, that's the strength of it, Jimmy. If yous haven't bumped him, he'd have bumped you. I've wised you up to that, kid. Con, 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 I do not like guys who talk such a hell of a lot, especially when I'm talking. Jimmy. Have you seen Mr. Kelly yet? Ah, oh, don't no. worry about the cops. They don't mean a damn thing. Let me talk to Kelly. He'll let you talk, and very soon O'Hara listen. That's his car out there now. O'Hara, have you ever met the man? Who, Kelly? Uh-huh. No, but listen, they're all alike, Chief. Don't call me Chief, damn you, O'Hara. Listen, Jimmy, you got the brains. Get this and get it quick. Don't let this guy, Kelly, ball you up. Just say as little as you can. He's going eh? to ask me questions. He, he doesn't know it's me. Not unless you tell him. Don't stand for his bluff. I'll talk to him. You will, eh? Con, you're a grand spieler. I like you. You're swell, but don't talk. And don't get fresh. This ain't New York. This is America. That's the warning. He's on his way up now. Shut it. Morning, Mr. Gay. Morning to the three of you. Having a party? <laughs> a little early for a party, Chief. <laughs> I went to a party this morning. There was me and the coroner and Sean O'Donnell. Oh. Me and the coroner did all the talking. Poor old Sean. When I read the papers and saw it gone, it, uh, it spoiled my morning. It spoiled his. Is this boy McGarth? Mr. Uh, James McGarth of Harvard. A college man. <laughs> I know. Expelled me his first year for theft from another freshman. Is that right? He seems to know it all. He's a making a fresh start, Chief. <laughs> if I ever laughed, I'd laugh. Fresh start? <laughs> What's he doing? Painting lilies on bottles? That's not what you're doing, is it, kid? Uh, look, it wasn't what you were doing last night. I, I don't know what you're aiming at. How long have you been in this racket? Which racket? Jimmy, it's okay. The chief knows we're running booze. The state of Illinois never voted dry. He's been three months with me, Mr. Kelly, a nice boy. Did you know Sean O'Donnell? Yes, sir. Uh, I I've seen him. No, he's dead? Yes. Know that he was chopped down last night by a grand American sportsman? What? I don't know what brothel his mother came from, no. but she bred on out now, bastard. 
Like mother, like son, huh? What in hell have mothers got to do with it? Mothers have a lot to do with it. I'd like to bet she's been through my hands. I ran the vice section for a year. Only a son of that kind of woman would shoot the man down out of here. God, have you? Jimmy, why can't you take his little joke? Huh? Borelli, you're a big noise in this city. <laughs> You've got juries in your pockets and judges eat out of your hands. But if you interfere with me, I'll make trouble for you. Interfere, chief. Why, I won't leave. I know, I know. You've done what you wanted to do. You've given the boy time to take hold of himself. <laughs> All right, kid. You just tell me something and come clean. Where were you last night? At the, the theater. Which theater? Oh, why, at the Blackstone. What was the number of your seat? Oh, say, how in hell can Oh, Harry, keep your goddamn face shut till I speak to you. Go on, boy, what was the number of your seat? Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't keep a check on numbers. What was the play? Well, I, I guess it was the, the Broadway Review. Yes, that's what it was. Is that so? That happens to be the name of a picture. Well, yes, th th that's what I saw, a picture. At the Blackstone? Well, I, I don't know Chicago very well. Maybe it, it was another theater. Rialto. It was the Rialto. Oh, almost sounds like Blackstone, doesn't it? What time would you come out, Mr. McGarvey? Oh, say, have a heart. Oh, how'd I? What time would you leave the theater? Twelve, I guess. Fine, fine. There was no performance at the Rialto last night. The projector room blew up. Don't you guys ever read anything but funeral notices? I don't know what theater it was. Say, Chief, the kid's a stranger to Chicago. Oh, and you're an old-timer, huh? Well, no, I'm new on it, too. I'm from New York. Never heard of the place. Look. You could find your way about Chicago, though. Sure. I take a taxi. Did you take a taxi to Atlantic Avenue and 95th Street last night? Me? I was in bed at 10. You did, though, McGard. No. You did, too. No. Listen. I saw Sean before he died, and he blew the works. He said he was shot by you and Con O'Hara. <laughs> he died without speaking, I know. Oh, you know, huh? Sure, I know. Well, go on, go on. Why don't you arrest him? You huh? know why, too. When I get him to the station house, I'd find your tame lawyer there with a writ of habeas corpus. That's why I don't arrest him. I don't answer any more of his questions, kid. Oh, you come to life, O'Hara, have you? Sure. How long are you going to stay that way? A pretty long time. Right, we'll see him a long time to your wife. But why, you son of a goddamn... Get back, O'Hara! God damn you, stick him up! Oh, no, O'Hara, I've got you covered. Come on, give me your rod. <laughs> you haven't got one, huh? <sighs> hey, you thought you had one. But I'll keep you covered just the same. Though I think Mr. Pirelli has taken your gun <laughs> in case you lost your temper. <laughs> I'm showing you the door, Mr. Gary. Uh, Pirelli, I hand it to you, you're clever. <laughs> The day I hang you, I'm gonna get drunk. <laughs> oh, look at the time. You'll be late for your appointment, Pirelli. Don't keep Mike Feeney waiting. <gasps> Who told him that? Angelo! Angelo! Coming, boss. Gee, get me Mike Feeney on the telephone, quick. Okay, what's the number? Loop 12754. The number, please, caller. Stop Loop 12754. And... Make it quick, please, ma'am. You want me, boss? Yes, Angelo. You know I'm meeting Mike one block away. Did you arrange to get the place covered? Sure, machine guns. Uh -huh. Hello. Here's your call. Ah, that's you, Mike. You know damn well it's me. Say, what the hell do you mean keeping me waiting, you son of a Sicilian? Go but... steady, Mike. The wires have been tapped. Kelly's been here. That's why I'm late. Ah, uh, uh, but you're meeting me, like you said, and I come back to your place. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come right back here. I'm bringing five. Yeah, me too. And no shooting, see, you bastard son of an eye. Yeah, 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 all right, Mike. All set, huh? Got the boys outside, Angelo? Certo. Fine, fine. You come along a harder, too. I'm right behind you. No, Jimmy, you stay here, huh? Oh, yeah. I'll be back in three minutes. Angelo. Mm-hmm. Did you go over to chauffeur to the funeral <laughs> store, huh? Yes, they got it already. I phoned them, and the poetry is grand. All right. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Why, Oh, hello, hello, Minley. What is the matter? Aren't you well? Uh, I wish I were, were dead. Oh, Jimmy. I told you to go away. Go away, go away. Where? Oh, Jimmy. Oh, I wish that you weren't in on this. In what? In this racket. Can't you, can't you get out? You've no business here. My business is every woman's business, Jimmy. When you are in it, you're in it for life. But doesn't it make a difference to you, these these rackets and, and murders? No. 
If Tony were a stockholder, it would be no different for me. Minley, I wanted to ask you this. Did, did you go to college? I went to Columbia. University? Gee, well, how in the name of Mike did you get here? Oh, well, you know, love, art, not knowing what to do about it. And here I am. I'd give anything to get you out of here. Get yourself out. No, Soon. No, I can't. I'm in this for life. Jimmy, I... Yes? Who killed that man last night? I, 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 I don't know. Who killed him? <laughs> oh, God. Don't. Don't, Jimmy. I did it. I don't, did it, please. I did it. I tried to, to get drunk to do it. With every drink, I got more, more sober. I killed him. I killed him in cold blood. Well, I've got to pay. I know that. But I, I want to pay soon. I want it to come now. I want it to come now. It will come very soon for you. And for me. For you? Well, nobody would, would hurt you. I am being hurt all the time. By Pirelli? By me? Oh, no. I love you, Emily. There's nothing worthwhile but you. I have nothing to give you. Nothing. I am waste. No good for anybody. Look, couldn't we go away? Leave Chicago. Get across to Canada. Nobody could trace us. <laughs> a Chinese girl and a white boy? Oh, Jimmy. No. I have nothing to give. My body belongs here. To Tony. I want no other man. I have not enough to give him. I love him so. Finley, other women have lived in this apartment. I know. And they've gone. You know where? I know. Aren't you afraid? No. <laughs> My God. If you stay, Tony will be good to you, I think. I wouldn't stay a day if you went. I love you, Minley. And I love only Tony. My sweet. <gasps> I heard what you said. Oh, Mr. Pirelli, I... Ah, oh, Jimmy, no, no. You're not to feel damn foolish. It was nice. Oh, so nice. Now, run away now, you two little babies. Take him to your apartment, my pretty flower. Tony, oh, I'm... Shh. Go quickly, quickly. Nice. So nice. Okay, you guys, pack your guns. That's the arrangement, isn't it, Pirelli? Sure thing, Mike Feeney. Shut the door, huh? Uh, now, uh, lay your gun on the table, huh? Yeah. There's mine. And there's mine. <laughs> Where's Angelo? I sent him down to Schoberg's, huh? Ah, sure. Sure, that's a grand idea. Ah, you're a wonderful guy for thinking up notions. The boys will be pleased at that. <laughs> hey, what that? Have a draw where I keep my cigars. Have one. Ah, no, I don't smoke. It's bad for the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> now, see here, Mike. What I said over the wire goes. We're both making money for a few dollars one way or the other. Why all this trouble? Ain't huh? that right? Yes. yes. I've always said you have more under your hat than any college professor. But, Tony, I'm giving you this straight. Huh? I've got a pretty tough lot of hoodlums, and half the trouble is Sean O'Donnell. Yeah, yeah, but listen. I know, I know. Sean didn't like you. He went after you, and I might have done the same. But I've a sister who married him. Well, you know what women are. She's out to get the birds that got her man, and my gang is with her. Your sister is a very nice woman. Not your kind, Pirelli. She never had no sex appeal for anybody except Sean, and that's the trouble. What do you want me to do, huh? We know the guys who got Sean. That kid McGarth and Con O'Hara. Now, one of my boys saw them smoking back to the city. The kids yell at you. I'm sorry for Con. I knew him in New York. But he's certainly a loud noise. Have you seen his woman? Yes. Yes, I have seen his woman. What do you want me to do? Put them both on the spot tonight. Eh? Eleven o'clock at the corner of Michigan and 94th. I'll have a couple of boys there and that'll finish it. I wouldn't do that to a yellow I dog. I respect you for it. But those guys are... <laughs> 
Certainly a lot of trouble to me. Ah, there's yellow guys in every outfit. You remember Vincetti? I knew him, yeah. He was yellow. Tried to take a powder on you, didn't he? He was talking to quitting. He came to this apartment, was never seen no more till they picked him up on Lake Shore. I read about it. Yellow guys are no good to you nor nobody. I don't want no trouble. Okay. I'll put them both on the spot. Ah, that's bully. Shake. What's that? Come in. Ah, <laughs> why, look. It's Angelo, back from Schoberg's. And look what he's carrying, huh? huh? A beautiful, beautiful floral hat. And Schoberg, the swellest florist in Chicago. That is for sure no ah, That's mighty thought. <laughs> Gee, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I thought you would. Lift the black-bordered card and read Angelo. Angelo has a beautiful voice. The angels heard the voice of Sean and said, another good man gone. Deeper sympathy from Antonio Perelli. Ah, jeez, that's lovely. Sorry to drag you away from all the boys and girls dancing in the winter garden, but there's work to do. Huh? That's all right, boss. It's quieter here in your gold parlor mm. and in the radiance of amber lamps. <laughs> Quite like Venetia. Okay, okay. Who's been at the hooch? Yeah, not too much, boss. Not good, much. good, good. Now, listen, Angelo. Mm -hmm. I'm sending Con O'Hara and Jimmy up on the west side. Oh, yeah? Spotting them? That O'Hara shooting off his mouth. Yeah, he's better, dumb. He's only a big noise, but the key... Angelo, you saw him. He fell apart. If Kelly ever gets him to headquarters... Well, of course he fell apart. Didn't I tell you not to send him? He may have been useful, but no. Yes. Shh, shh, shh. There's someone out on the balcony. Huh? See who it is. Okay. Why, it's Min Lee. Uh. Hello, Min Lee. You've been listening, eh? I only hear the sound of traffic. From the balcony. Go back to the dancing, Angela. I'll call you when I want you. Yes, boss, yes. Minui, where have you been all the night? In my room. When I have a party, you go to your room? And has Jimmy McGarth been in your room, too? Yes. Oh, and I suppose you locked the door, eh? Yes. <sighs> Ain't you got a nerve? You told me to get him away from the party. Well, I got him away from the party. Sure, I told you. But did I tell you to stay with him in your room and lock the door? Tell Jimmy I want him. Are you going to do anything to Jimmy? It was my fault. No, 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 no. No, Jimmy's a nice fellow. I'm fond of Jimmy. You go and tell him I want to see him, huh? Yes. Very well, Tony. Oh, Minley, I want to see Connor Hara, too. Come here, come here. What is it, Tony? Don't uh, take any notice of me. I'm worried with business. Don't be um, you. I know. Nah. Oh, and Minley, mm -hmm. you look after Mrs. O'Hara. Eh? She's a swell woman, but, uh, well, she's not in your street, Minley. If Con asks anything, um, <laughs> say you're, uh, you're looking after her, eh? You can't tell him that, Tony. Go and get those boys. Why did you lock that door? I didn't want anyone to come in. Oh, was Jimmy crying or something? No, he wasn't crying. Not crying, eh? And what? Eh? Hello? Is that you, Perelli? Yes, Mike. Look, your boys ain't appeared yet. Is there any change of plans or what? You come clean with me, Tony. Don't Perelli. start pushing me around, Mike. I said 11, it's quarter of now. They never could have made it at 10. Yes, they can. Only don't start pushing me around. That's all when I give my word. Your goddamn word ain't worth much, I'm telling you. All right. You want me, Tony? Yes. Hello, Jimmy. Sorry I'm breaking the party here for you. Uh, Jimmy boy, yeah. Uh, you know uh, Captain Strood, huh? Uh, no, I've never met him. Not the police captain. No? Ah. 
That's all right. We call him Lefty, and that's the name he'll be calling himself tonight at the corner of Michigan and 94 at 11 uh, o'clock. You want me to find him? He'll find you, but don't let that scare you, eh? All ready, boss. They told me you wanted to see me. Yes, come. Do you know Lefty through the police captain? No, I don't know any of these guys. But believe me, I won't be here in Chicago long You take this I... package, Jimmy, put it in your pocket and be careful. Okay. There's $30,000 in that cover. I've got the cargo and liquor coming through the Erie Canal, but that's nothing to do with you, boy. You take that packet to the corner of Michigan and 94th. Right. Strood will drive up in his car around about 11. you will say, lefty, and that's all. Hand him the packet and get the right back. Sure. You ought to be back here, well, quarter past 11. Hey, hey, what's the idea of sending me? You don't want two of us to carry the packet, do you? Two's not too many to look after $30,000, and I'm not trusting Mike Feeney further than I can throw him, and he knows. He knows the money's going forward tonight. Okay, okay. Well, then I'm going to call Mrs. O'Hara and drop her at my apartment on the way. Drop Mrs. O'Hara at your apartment? What's the big idea? She's staying the night here, and you also. Hello. Here she is now, Maria. This husband of yours wants to spoil your party. I'm taking you home now. I'm picking you up on my way back. Wait, wait a minute. What the hell am I? Something you bought at Marshall Fields? Where are you going anyway, Con? <laughs> That's one question you must never ask. Uh, is Jimmy going with him? It ain't one of those stick-up jobs, is it? No. No, no, don't talk such things. Well, I'll go alone. I, I guess I can look after myself. Yeah, sure you can. What's all this, huh? Do I ask you to pick and choose what you shall do and what you shall not do? Con, are you so yellow that you're afraid to go with this boy, Jimmy? No. If there was any danger, should I send Jimmy, who is like my own brother? All right, all right, I'll get my coat. Come on, Jimmy. Now listen, Maria. Mrs. Pirelli is looking after you, kid. Understand? Say, who's been telling you I want a chaperone? <laughs> You've said that so long, Jimmy. Come back soon. I'll hey. do my best. Oh, Jimmy. Come here. Yes, Tony. What you got there, huh? What? In the left-hand pocket of your waist. Well, this, oh, <laughs> oh, this is a, a silver cigarette case, my uh -huh. love. Oh, well, somebody gave it to me. Somebody nice, eh? You wear it over your heart. Well... <laughs> It happened to be there. Uh, don't wear it there, Jimmy. It don't look good. Um, put it uh, on your head. What? Yeah. Oh, oh, why, of course. It'll be in the way, won't it? Shake it, Jimmy. We ain't got all that time. Yes. Yes, coming. Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy! Oh, you were going without saying goodbye, Jimmy. I'll never say goodbye to you. Oh. Think well of me. Yeah. Are you happy? Oh, by God, I am. Oh. You don't know how happy. Oh. Well, I'll be damned. Oh. Hey, 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 what's this? He's gone. Goodbye, Jimmy. Hey. Hey, hey. Millie, do you hear me? Huh? Yes. I hear you. Huh? You come up and dance with me, Tony. I will be the prettiest woman in the room. Jimmy told me so. She locked the door, for God's sake. She's got a sweetie. Yeah. I like that kid. Hey, where have those two men gone? Con and Jimmy McGarth. Hmm? Mr. Tony Pirelli, are you dumb? She'd be the prettiest woman in the room. Jimmy said so. Are you going to dance or just talk to yourself all evening? Hey? How long will Khan be away? What's that? How long will... <laughs> just... Long enough, eh? Oh, you're damn sure, aren't you? <laughs> Come and shake a leg. Don't go up there oh. with all them bones. You've got mean ideas about yourself, haven't you? Suppose, suppose somebody comes in, your wife... <laughs> Come on and dance before Maria. I get another part. Maria, Maria, Maria! Okay, boss, I see who it is. Who is set the alarm going at this time of night, for goodness sakes? Oh, it's you, Inspector Kelly. Yeah, it's me. Where's Pirelli? He just stepped out to see a friend. 
He doesn't step out to see anybody without his armored car, and that hasn't left the garage. You must know he's gone up to the Winter Garden with a dame, and that's the truth. You know what Tony is with a skirt. <laughs> Help yourself to a drink, Chief, as you see plenty of champagne. I'll get him down. Mike Feeney was around here today. Yeah, Mike and us is like brothers. Where's that boy, McGarth? He's around. Nice kid, that Chief. Find Pirelli. I want him. Sure, sure. I'll get him. Oh, good evening, Mr. Kelly. I didn't know... Oh, that's all right, Minley. Go on, fetch Pirelli, Angelo. You'll find him dancing with Mrs. O'Hara. That will be interesting. All dressed up for the party, Minley? Yes. Is it pretty? It's grand. <laughs> and I've never seen you looking so cheerful. Say, I dreamed about you the other night. Oh, Mr. Kelly... I thought you dreamt only of presents and ropes and gunmen. <laughs> well, you're on my mind, young woman. When are you leaving here? Who told you I was leaving? You're about due for a move. I've seen three girls sitting in this apartment and looking like a million dollars, and I've seen them go. I know. Poor girls. Perhaps you know how your man got the money for all this. Well, booze. Yeah, and something else. Yes, I know. I am not a child. He's got three houses in Cicero and two at Burnham. Forty girls in each house. Two thousand dollars profit every night. Two grand a night out of women. But I know this. Why do you tell me? The head girl at the swell house is in bad with Pirelli. She's been snitching money. Somebody's going to take her place. That doesn't mean anything to me now. You should have told me yesterday. Then I would have been sad. Today nothing will hurt me. Nothing. What time is it? Mm, Eleven. Why? Eleven. Oh, oh, that's nice. What the mischief's wrong with you? Have you been drinking? Yes. Don't talk for a little moment. Oh, yes. Why, Min Lee, you look like the queen of China. Kiss my hand. I am a queen this minute. For the first time in my life... Queen of myself. This is a grand ring you're wearing. I've seen it before. Every girl who has lived here has worn it. Yes, I suppose so. One day Pirelli will tell you that he wants it back, and you'll give it to him, and you'll never see it again. I don't want it. What is it? It means nothing to me. Someday he'll send you out to Cicero. No. To take charge of the big house where the swell fellas go. No. And then, after a year, you'll go down to the second house where they drink beer and bad hooch. And then, by and by, you'll have a room in the third house where there's no color bar. No! That's the road they went, Minley. All of them. But I can see a way out for you, kid. Yes. So can I. There's a hundred thousand dollars unclaimed reward for the Vincetti murder. The money's deposited at the Union Bank. Tony Pirelli did that solo. You know it. I thought you were going to be so interesting. But you aren't. You're just being a policeman. And I like you so much better when you're human. You've nothing to be afraid of. None of the gangs would touch you. The only thing we hang them for in Chicago is killing a woman. Our juries may be yellow, but by God, they're sentimental. Look, I'll guarantee your safety if you'll tell me. My friend Angelo has told me you want to see me, Chief. Uh, that's right. And in the meantime, Min Lee has been entertaining me. Ah, a runaway little Chinese sweetheart, huh? I'll see you present. Yes. Goodbye, Mr. Kelly. Shake hands. Goodbye, Min Lee. Hey, that's the first time I see you shake hands, Mr. Kelly, huh? Maybe it's the first time I've met anybody in your apartment that I wanted to shake hands with. <laughs> You're poison, all right, Pirelli. <laughs> I thought it for a long time, and now I know. Sit down. Sit down in my own apartment? My apartment at police headquarters is not so comfortable. The last eight gangsters who sat down in my office are dead. They should have stood up, huh? Oh, Mr. Kelly, you have a bad view of me, eh? If anything is wrong, find Tony Pirelli. If the mayor makes a bum speech, go find Tony. Vincetti disappears. Ah, search the apartment of poor Mr. Pirelli. Vincetti, huh? He drew $300,000 from his bank. He came here and was never seen again. Yeah, and you trailed him all day. He was with you all morning at headquarters squawking about his friends, the great big 100% squealer. He came into this apartment. And I kicked him out, huh? 
I don't want no trouble with them kind of yellow guys. He came into this apartment and never left alive. Say, Chief, that's all wrong. You was here. You was here ten minutes after. Was there blood on the floor? Was there a body? Did anybody hear shooting? Nobody would hear that. I know all about that silent pistol of yours. Grand for close quarter work. <laughs> I kill everybody. Tony Pirelli, Tony Pirelli. If it wasn't for me, there'd be no newspapers. And if there was no Tony Pirelli, they'd invent one. Well, Tony, what's the news tonight? Nothing. Everything is quiet on the Western Front. I thought you looked happy. You and Mike Feeney are all buddies now, huh? Sure. We've had our little misunderstandings. Was Sean O'Donnell one of them? I know nothing except that everything is fine and now. And what price are you going to pay for everything being fine now? Mr. Kelly, you talk sometimes like a piece of German music which I cannot read or play. Is somebody going to be put on the spot? Good God, no. I wouldn't do that to a yellow dog. You believe me? No, you goddamn bit of yellow dirt. I don't believe you. Answer it, Pirelli. I told them I'd be here. Or would you rather I picked it up? I heard the telephone. All right, I'll answer it. Yes. Is that Mr. Morello? Yes. Please set quarters here. Oh, please set quarters. Is Mr. Cully there? Yes, the chief is here. Hello? Is that Mr. Cully? Yeah, Cully speaking. There's been a gang shooting. When did it happen? 11 o'clock. One man dead. Uh-huh. Know who he is? Yeah. Jimmy McGarth. The boy McGarth. Dead, is he? Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy! Where did it happen? Corner in Michigan in 94. Anybody else killed? Nobody. Only McGarth. You sure O'Hara wasn't with him? No. I've got a squad car downstairs. Don't touch the body till I get there. Pirelli, report at police headquarters at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> You heard the way he spoke to me, to me, Tony Pirelli. He said I were a dog, huh? I knew. As soon as I heard the phone, Jimmy, oh, Jimmy. He's in hell. He was in heaven tonight. You're fancy, man. You're a lover, eh? I love you, Tony. I didn't love him, but I gave him everything he wanted. Everything. Mm. He knew he was going to his death, and he was glad. He knew. Who told him that, eh? I told him. <sighs> he was glad. After he loved me, we prayed together. He loved you, my woman. His woman. You, you. Ah, oh, that's you. Where is Khan O'Hara? Yeah, yeah, where is Khan O'Hara? I'm going to my room. Go to hell, you damn chink woman. Go to hell. Angelo Verona, where is he? You should be here. And Kelly, did he speak to you, huh? Yes. And you spoke to him. You told him something, eh? Two faces, you have six. You locked the door, eh? And you told no, Kelly. No, no. You're a liar, you small, dirty little beast. You know hell a lot, don't you, eh? I know you killed Ben Seddy. Oh, yes. You know. You talked in your sleep. I'll kill you. You don't kill me. I'm not afraid. But Kelly said they hang you if you kill a woman in Chicago. Yeah. He wanted me to tell him the truth about Vincetti and take the reward. But I told him I loved you. Oh, Angelo, is that you, huh? Yes, boss, you rang? You're swell, Mindy. All right, all right, you can go. I'll go and join the others. Are they dancing still? Hey, what's wrong? Send them women away, the whole party. They can go down the north elevator. It's Tomasino up there, yeah? Uh -huh. Who else? Tony Romano, Jake French, Al Marlo. Send them right away. They're to take machines and scorch the town and get Con O'Hara. But... Uh, he turned yellow and let the kid go by himself. They got Jimmy all right. Now listen, Angelo. Tell the men, no shooting around this block. Do you get that? Put a man downstairs to watch for Con and give me the signal if he comes here. I'll... Fixing. Okay, and you want all the women to go? Yeah, yeah, oh no. O'Hara's woman stays here. Do I go with the boys? No, you stay also. When you got rid of the others, uh, I shall want the couch in here. You understand, Angela? <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Yeah, and tell the boys there's a grand for the man who gets O'Hara, huh? We can do with a little less light, I think. Now, my gun. Silencer. Nice 
quiet Italian moon in the sky outside. Everybody's going home. This is certainly a party. Ah, my dear Maria, you see, we are business people. Oh, I'd like to meet a few drinking people. Why are they going home? They are going home, but I want you to wait. How long? All the night. Without con? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else you'd like. I mean, don't miss something because you're too bashful to ask. I want you to stay. <laughs> something slipped. What is it? Yes. There's been a terrible thing happened. Jimmy is killed. Oh, I love that boy. Jimmy McGarth? Yes. Yeah, but he went out with Khan. They went together. <sighs> Did somebody bump him? Yeah, some of my Feeney's gang. Well, then what's happened to Khan? Ain't you got a tongue? I'm going to find out. No, you're not. <laughs> Let me go, you dirty wop. He's all right, I tell you. Khan got away. Kelly was here and got it from headquarters on the wire. But where is Khan? Don't keep hold of me. You want him back right now, do you? Huh? <sighs> You wasn't feeling like that an hour ago, hey? Wow. He'll be out all night, I tell you. He's dodging the police. They think he killed Jimmy. Oh. Going back home to wait. You stay here. Like hell, I will. Yes. No! Oh. 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 I'll kill you. <laughs> Are you staying, man? Huh? No. Staying. Yes. Yeah. Till Khan comes back. You know your own? <sighs> I showed it to you. Comes over the Indiana line by now. He'll not come back tonight, huh? Tony, nothing's happened to him. Not a damn thing. You sure? Sure. You've got a mean opinion of me, but I'm not so easy. Sure you're not, Maria. I'll be in my room when you want me. Yeah. Angelo. Okay, Tony, yes. I've got the couch out here. Give me a hand over get it in. Yes. Does this couch remind you of someone, huh? We'll check, do you mean? Yeah, that squeal the last time we used it, eh? But Khan won't come back here. Romano will get him anyway. You fixed the alarm? Yeah, the alarm's okay, but I'll just go check it once. But he won't come back. Who tipped him off? The kid. How come? Why, the kid was bumped. He didn't know or he wouldn't have been. He knew. Knew he was being put on the spot yeah. and went to it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't ask me any more questions, Andrew. Is that so? I'm not in on this. Who told this kid that he was being put on the spot? Min Lee. For the love of Mike. She took him in a room, Angelo, you understand? While we were all here, she took him in a room and locked the door. By God, she shall know something about this. I guess she knows enough to keep her mind occupied. <sighs> He's been sighted outside. She I didn't think he'd come back. They ought to get him in the hall. This block belongs to me. I built it. I want no scandal here. He's inside. You clear, Angelo. Okay, okay. If I miss him, you'll get him through that door, huh? Through this door? Yes, but I want everything quiet. Quiet. Afini, clear. But hold the door just a little open. Like that. Yeah. Come out of those shadows, Tony Porelli. I got you covered. Hello, Con, you're back. Yes. All the party's gone home. One of the party's gonna stay right here, and that one is you, you double-crossing strup. You drunk or something? Did Jimmy give the cover my letter? Yeah, and he's dead. I watched it. I didn't believe that crazy kid that you was putting us on the spot, so I watched, and a car drove up, and they poked a machine gun on him. Then they waited a while, looking around for somebody else. Me. I don't understand. I'm bewildered. You think I, Antonio Pirelli, put you on the spot? Yeah. My best man? And Jimmy, my best friend? Where's my wife? She has gone on. Yeah? I think she's still here. What? Over there, you mean? Well. Right there. <sighs> Don't soil my carpet, you bastard. Quickly, Angelo, quickly. Leave it. The couch is open, Tony. In with you. <sighs> Just once more to make sure that you're quite dead. Close the lid, Angelo. You know where to take that couch. Yeah, okay. Okay. Hello? Can I speak to Mr. Parolli? No, Mr. Parelli is not in. Well, I must speak to Mr. Tony Parelli. Who's that speaking? Well, I'm from the Chicago Daily News. Well, get the hell out of this. All of my head We've got many to tell newspapers. We don't know nothing, see? Eat in. Oh. 
Now, who the hell's that at this time of the afternoon? Oh, it's you, Maria. I thought we'd lost you. Come on in. Was that Khan on the phone just now? Not unless he's joined the staff of the Chicago Daily News. He hasn't been back? No. Now, let me get on with these papers. I've been sitting waiting at home for him since 9 o'clock this morning. I guess he took the limited last night. He was talking about going up to Detroit. Oh, he didn't talk to me about Detroit. No message. No. Oh, yes, they phoned up for you from police headquarters. For me? What did they want? They just said, is she there? And I said, what a question. And they didn't ask no more. <sighs> oh, I wish I'd heard from Khan. Now, listen, Mrs. Zahara, I'm going to tell you something. Khan came back here in the middle of the night. What? You saw him? Uh-huh. And it was very, very awkward. He came here? Did he ask where I was? Had he been home? Well, no. I told him you were sleeping with Min Lee. Uh. And that Tony was out looking for him. See? He, he didn't want to come upstairs or anything? I wouldn't have let him do that. Oh, gee, Angelo. That's mighty swell of you. Not at all. I would have died. Somebody would have died. But you don't look a die to me. No. Angelo, on the level, where has he gone? Well, I said Detroit. The Bulls was after him for a racket that happened in New York, see? They saw him on the street and he just ducked in time. Uh, tell me, Maria, did you have a marvelous time last night, baby? Oh, keep your paws to yourself, will you? <laughs> where is Mr. Pirelli? We call him Tony around here. He's at police headquarters, been there all day, him and his lawyer. You'll, um... You like living here. It's the swellest apartment in Chicago. More like Italy, really. Oh, why, Mr. Pirelli, I haven't seen you oh, since last night. Oh, I've a hell of a time at police headquarters since nine till an hour ago. Oh, poor boy, are you tired? Mm -hmm. Tired. Did Chief Kelly do the entertaining? I'll tell you how that pig entertained me. Shall I get the mayor on the line? No, Angelo, get Supreme Court Judge Raminsky and get him in either way. Okay, okay. I'm gonna make that... Get Damn, complete out of my hand. Supreme Court Judge Romanski, my. He's the great white chief of Chicago politics. Yes, he is, and I'm all in. They drove me here and they drove me there till I was dizzy. Police headquarters to City Hall, from the City Hall to police headquarters, from police headquarters to the morgue. Then, to the place where poor little Jimmy was found. Tony, your call. Uh, is that Supreme Court Judge Raminsky? Uh, yes, Raminsky speaking. This is Antonio Pirelli here. Why, hello, Mr. Pirelli. How Say, what the you? hell do you mean letting Kelly push me all over the place? You're supposed to have a pull, ain't you, eh? Quite sure, Mr. Pirelli. Maybe I, I didn't give you 50 grand for the election fund, eh? You did, Mr. Pirelli. You did, I know. I know, you know. I know you'll talk. To Kelly, you'll just talk to him. I am always talking to Kelly about You're supposed to be the big noise at the city hall. You're a grand dweller. You'll be, um, senator someday, you will. A senator? Yeah, you will, by God, you see, huh? You get Kelly fired first, though. That's what you do. I'll fix that guy, that damn girl. Say, talking to a judge like that. You ought to hear him talk to the president. Don't be smart, Angelo. Get me a drink quickly. As quick as I can, boss. You must be thirsty. Uh, well, uh, my beautiful girl. You miss me all the day, huh? Do you still love me? I thought of you all the time. All our rapidness. No, oh, oh, leave me be. I, I don't want that stuff now. I'm all nerves. Where's Khan? Khan? Uh, didn't Angelo tell you? Yeah, he told me, but you didn't. Could yeah. I know that I saw Angelo on the square? Oh, I crossed my heart today. <laughs> Maria, honey, listen. I've just remembered them. Um, Kelly may be wanting to see you. Kelly, the car? Yeah. What? What does he want with me? I don't know a thing about your racket. It's nothing, honey. Maybe he wants to talk to you about Jimmy. I mean, you met him. I met a whole lot of people. Or maybe he'll talk to you about Khan. But anyway, let him do the talking. Why, if he thinks he can make me look foolish, Don't he's... get mad at him. That's his speciality. Making people mad. Oh, good, how he makes them mad. And that's when they talk. Well, he'll be in jam before I'm through. And don't him. get Khan O'Hara's complex for the love of my oh, Khan. Boss, here quick. What is it, Angelo? Not Kelly. No, no, no. Mike Feeney's outside. Can you see him? Mike Feeney? Mm -hmm. Where? Right here. With his gang? No, no, no. I guess he left him outside. <laughs> Sean O'Donnell wouldn't have let him do that. Sean had brains. Not much, but some. 
What's he come here for? Maria, I want to see a gentleman, huh? You're suing me off. Oh, it's all right. I'm a businesswoman. Uh, where will I go? Through there, in the salon, huh? Now, Angelo, cover all ways out in case of accidents. I've got to settle my queenie sooner or later. Did you fix he got Berlinis for his birthday party? Huh? Sure, he fell for the menu. There was Irish stew in it. Uh -huh, grand. <laughs> I've got a gun, yeah. Bring him in, Angelo. This way, Mr. Feeney. Ah, uh, you can call me Mike. How are you, Mike? Fine. Have you got the Bible, Angelo? Here it is, boss. Open it on the table. Ecco. There's my gun, Mike. On the holy book. Now yours. Hey, wait a minute. Is this Bible Italian or Irish? 100% American. Last time I done this, I didn't get a square deal. The crooks who provided it left out the Ten Commandments. They are all of that. I paid $100 for this Bible at Leithby and Gothenstein. Uh, well, them guys are square dealers. They get me shirts there. There's me gone. Okay. I'll be seeing you soon, Angela. Sure thing, boss. Mm. Been to headquarters, haven't you, Pirelli? Yeah, putting up a squawk on the high price of alcohol. You mind if I look around your room just a little bit? <sighs> what have you got behind this door? Nobody that'll do you any harm. And beyond out there? Mostly women at the moment. That's all. Nothing hidden in this organ? Music, Mike, but you can't get at that. Oh, it's terrible to be so suspicious. Ah, well, I'm throwing a birthday party next week, and I'd like to be there. Many happy returns. Thanks, but I don't want no presents from you. Say, listen, Tony. Mm. You ducked one last night. Not on your life. Con O'Hara did all the ducking. My boys are sore about it. They say you tipped him off. Wouldn't they say that? Why should I put him on the spot and... Tip him off, eh? Now, what about Kanahara? Now, come clean, boy. You needn't think about Kanahara. I took care of him. You too. So, that's all. I don't allow no guys to do me dirt, and he did me dirt. Ah, you took him for a ride. What the hell's that? Uh, stick him up. Mike, Mike, put your gun back on the Bible. Don't get excited. Yeah, but what was that? That is Mr. Kelly. The janitor sent me a signal at all. Why is Kelly coming here? To see Mrs. O'Hara. Why is Mrs. O'Hara here? Because she's my woman. Why is she my woman? Mind your own damn business. Yeah, well. Well, I am sorry. You don't trust me, Mike. That's what hurts me. Look, I don't want to see this guy, Kelly. Do you suppose he don't know you're here? Go, go into the salon. Am I through here? That's it. Mrs. O'Hara is the lady in there. Don't flirt, huh? Oh, and Mike. Yeah? You'll never know how you hurt my feelings. Uh, gee, don't take it to heart, Tony. I got a birthday next week. Okay, Angelo. The chief can come in now. The chief, Tony. Come right in, chief. I've seen you before today, haven't I? We have met. <laughs> oh, a Bible, eh? Uh, have I interrupted family prayers? No, uh, we have just finished. Why, Angelo, you're all spruced up. Jeez, I hate to see you looking happy, chief. That's bad for somebody. Is it, Angelo? Now, where is the beautiful lady? She's in my uh, salon. Salon, winter garden. <laughs> you guys certainly know how to live while you're living. Uh, would you be kind enough to ask Mrs. O'Hara to see me? Uh, there's a friend of mine in there with her. I yeah. know, Mr. Michael Feeney. I'd love to meet him, too. You want anything from him? Yeah, his autograph. I'm collecting him. <sighs> Fetch, Mrs. O'Hara, Angelo. Yes, I hate you cheerful, Mr. Kelly. I'd rather you'd come and push everybody around. I'll push you around, all right. Now, Mr. Pirelli, we didn't tire you this morning at my headquarters or say anything to hurt your feelings or make you look undignified or anything. I, I'd have had some flowers on my table if I'd only thought of it. That is very amusing. It seems I've got to be polite to you, Mr. Antonio Pirelli. That's what he called you, my friend, Mr. Antonio Pirelli. My friend? Who are you speaking about? Supreme Court Judge Raminsky came on the wire. He thought we hadn't treated you right. I don't complain of nothing. It sounded that way. We will get some cushions in for you the next time you come. Here they are, Chief. Why, look who's here. The lovely Mrs. O'Hara. And the not-quite-so-lovely Mike Feeney. Hello, Mike. Uh, 
Good day, Mr. Kelly. Oh, don't miss that to me, Mike. I'm just a copper who's due for a jolt. Uh, may I be permitted to ask why you're endangering your life in this uh, ecclesiastical brothel? Nah, Tony and me is just good friends. Oh, that's why the flags are flying on Michigan Boulevard. Do you want me, Chief? Oh, I want you like hell, but I can't get you, Mike. Tony Pirelli here will get you. But by then, you'll be no good to me. So you've lost poor Sean, eh? Yeah. Too bad. There's another bastard that'll never hang. And you've bumped off one of the men who did it, and Tony bumped the other. How's that? No, no, Maria, don't take no notice of the chief. He's always pulling things like that. You, Mike, got Jimmy McCarth. And Tony got Kanahara, hmm? Well, that's a damn lie. Tony didn't go out all night. You're in a position to certify that? Yes, I am, Mr. Smarty. And if you want to know where my husband is, you better ask the New York bulls that chased him out of Chicago. The New York police chased him? Why? You know. No detective from the New York Police Department is in this city. Besides, he wasn't wanted by the New York police. Who told you he was? That's all. I know who told you. The man who bumped him off. It's a damn lie. Con O'Hara is in Detroit. He's here in Chicago, in the lakeside Marjorie. What? He was dumped God. on the beach sometime in the night. They found him ten minutes before I left my room. No. Oh, no, no. It's not true. Angelo. It's not true. Take Mrs. O'Hara into the other room. <laughs> Come on, Maria. Oh, leave me alone. I can go by myself. So that's how it was. Well, that's... All square, eh? All right, Mike Feeney, you can go. Say, I know nothing about it, Chief. Oh, you wouldn't. You know all about Jimmy McGarth, though. I never met the man. Never met him, eh? Oh, oh you're a big shot now. You got somebody else to do your killing. You better go, Mike, while the going's good. Yeah, perhaps I will. I say, Chief, wouldn't you? you wouldn't like to come to my birthday party, would you? At the Bellini restaurant? There'd be a swell crowd there. Judge Gritson, Judge Lazenhans. Supreme Court Judge Atchison? No, thanks. I'm not studying law. Yeah, well, uh, I say goodbye to you. Oh, Mike. Yeah? I wouldn't have my birthday party Bellinis if I were you. Hey? Eh? Well, that's all. Try some place uptown, and then maybe you'll have another birthday. Thank you, Chief. Oh, don't thank me. I want to see you croaked lawful. Got a big interest in that restaurant, haven't you, Tony? <laughs> I may be dumb, but I ain't above learning. Well, Tony, it's a waste of time asking you about Connor Harrow, I suppose. So I'll see his woman again. Oh, Mr. Kelly. Why, if it isn't little Min Lee. I was just saying I want to see Mrs. O'Hara again. You can't see her, Mr. Kelly. She's like someone insane. Oh, well. Like someone insane and you left her? Did you leave her there just by herself? Get a nurse from the hospital, a doctor or something. I'll, I'll go to her. Well, that's the trouble with Tony Pirelli. He's got the heart of a child. To you, Mr. Kelly, he can do nothing right. And to me, he can do nothing wrong. If there's one thing he doesn't deserve, it's that. And you're still here, Minley, I see. Yes. I don't know whether I'm glad or sorry. Be sorry today and glad tomorrow. Come here, Minley. Now listen. When the patrolman got to Jimmy, he was just going, and Jimmy said two words. Min Lee. Min Lee. I thought I'd like to tell you that. <gasps> and now I'll be on my way. Oh, Mr. Kelly. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, you, you mustn't kiss my hand like that, kid. An old Chinese custom. Is it? Well, goodbye, my dear. Goodbye. Mr. Kelly. Oh, is that you, Minui, huh? Go quickly, get my poor Maria some wine, and tell Angelo to come here quickly, eh? Yes, Tony. I fetch the wine, and I tell Angelo to come. Oh, my dear, my dear. Mm, so sorrowful and so lovely. Goddamn hoodlums to kill my car. You shall have a swell funeral, Maria. I'll show Mike Feeney and his bum what a funeral is like. Twenty grand. I don't care how much I spend, Maria, and I play the organ myself. That's his funeral, huh? You've got the dirty rat who bumped him, Tony. Sure, there won't be no Mike Feeney in the next phone book. Here is the wine for Maria. Give me the ear. There. No. Maria, there. Drink that, huh? 
<laughs> oh, this ain't champagne. It's Tego Red, ain't you it? You drink it, it'll do you good. Oh. You want me, Tony? Yes, Angelo. You fix poor Kanahara, the swellest funeral ever. Spend money, roses, lilies, orchids, everything. It would pay us to grow our own flowers. And the silver casket. Get it from Philadelphia. Better than Sean's. Much better. We had angels on these. Get better. What the hell's better than angels? Archangels. Oh. Do it at once. Oh, God. Oh, God. Minnie. Yes, I know, Tony. Yeah? You must take her back to her room. Ah, come with me, Maria. Oh. You get that feller, Tony. You sure. get him good. Sure. You get the yellow dog who done sure, it. Sure, I'll get him. Don't worry, baby. You leave that guy to me, honey. I look like hell in black. Oh, the way she's been missing Khan since last night is something awful. Oh, you don't know, Angelo. She may love him. No, loving men is foolish, Min Lee, and she's anything but. <laughs> it's a grand life. What will you do? Where will you end, Angelo? Me? I never think about it. I may be hating this gang one of these days if somebody don't bump me off. As it is, Min Lee, uh, Tony was saying yesterday there's likely to be some changes at Cicero. There is a new manageress. A madam going in. Is there? I hope he don't think up somebody I know for the job. He'll find another woman. I surely hope he picks the right woman. He won't pick me. I surely hope he won't. For everybody's sake. Angelo, you wouldn't do anything if he... If... I shouldn't do anything I was sorry for. We got the grand business, Min Lee. Well, we turn over millions of dollars, but there's too much skirt in it. And Tony is getting careless. Look. Look, he's even left his gun here on the table. <laughs> on the Bible. <laughs> Are you like Tony? Sure. He's a swell fella. But he's got all wrong with Kelly. Kelly ain't so hard to get on with either. You must trust me a lot to tell me this. Yeah. If Tony knew how you felt... Tony would be dead before he could pull a rod. Oh, poor Mary. Poor, poor Maria. Mother and child doing fine. That is too fresh for me, Angelo. You're a swell fella, but there is a place for everybody in this outfit, yes? Why didn't Maria drink this wine? Well, you have needed that. What will Maria do? She will stay here. Well, hasn't she any friends? Yes, me. She stays here. Angelo, I am... Um... I want to talk to Minley, if you know, man. But of course, Tony, I go. And Angelo, I want Minley's car in front at uh, six. I mean it. He's too fresh, that fellow. One of these days. Come here, little Minley. Uh, I've just remembered something. Give me your hand, huh? There you are, Tony. Swell ring, that Minley. But it ain't uh, up to the minute. I will get it reset for you. I know a guy at Tiffany's who would do it swell. You give it to me. I'll have it done right now. Yes, Tony. There they are. All my rings. You'll get them back, Minley. Don't you worry. I will make them sparklers. Look like a million dollars while you're away. While I am away? Yes, for a little time. This has upset me, you know, but... Uh, Mostly what you told me about Jimmy. I love you too much. Hmm? When you come back, I will forget. Where am I going? I will tell you. You want to help, Tony, don't you, my pretty? Huh? I have had a lot of trouble at Cicero. Those damn girls have been robbing me, so I've hired the girl at the big house. Eh? She was no good. <gasps> you want me to go there and take her place? No, for a little while. You're a swell manager. I mean, Lee would put everything Jake for me. You should have a grand suite. Better than the Blackstone servants, car, and your friends. No. I mean, Lee, I've been very good to you. Yes. Now, you will be a darling, and so good it is for Tony. Hey. So, I tell you what. I will play you something. What shall it be, eh? Yes. Play to me, Tony. I, I want to write to my dressmaker. Sure, you sit there and write. I will pay all the accounts. Put them on the table for Angelo, huh? You like this nice Italian aria, huh? Shall I write on this piece of paper? Tony! Here's your gun. You must have left it here when... Tony! 
Oh, well. When you finish writing, come here, Minui, and uh, talk to me, huh? Yes, Tony. Dear Tony. Uh -huh. I am here, beside you. Ah. Do you think you'd better pack your trunk, huh? Oh. oh, never mind. There is plenty of time, huh? Yes. Yes, Tony. Plenty of time. What's the matter, Minli? You're not ill. No. No. I just sit down a minute. You, 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 you look so white. I've got a little headache. This will stop it. Ah! Minli! What do you do? Why do you get my gun, Minli, you damn fool? Minli! All right, I go, thank you. What the? God almighty. Don't move, Pearly. I've got you covered. No, no, Kelly, I didn't kill her. I didn't. Suicide. There is a letter there on the table. She wrote it. Suicide. Don't be a damn fool. Suicide. This letter? Yes. Goodbye, Tony. This is better than Cicero. God bless you. You see, she wrote it while I was playing. I didn't know you see, huh? Yes, I see. And now no one else will know. Twenty men you've killed and got away with it. No. And now you're going to croak for something you never did. No. Jeez, that's funny. All right, men. Take him away. Radio 4. Today's afternoon theatre celebrates the centenary of the birth of Edgar Wallace. The Calendar by Edgar Wallace Dramatised by Barry Campbell With Philip Bond, Sylvia Sims, Peter Jeffrey and John Hollis Darling, you are an idiot. <laughs> Gary, mm. do you like me well enough to let me use your name? Use my name? I don't know what you mean, Wenda. <laughs> Willie is terribly jealous of you. He's ready to believe almost anything about you. And if I went to him now, today, and told him, well, you know... You mean he'd believe it? Wenda, your husband is a blackguard. Oh, don't be stupid, Gary. Why shouldn't he? We've always been close friends. Why shouldn't he believe? <laughs> I nearly said the worst. Would it be the worst? You mean that I should let my name be used as... correspondent? <laughs> oh, Wenda, my dear, I like you too much to allow your name to be dragged through the divorce court. Never mind my name. Will you let me use yours? Of course. But the whole idea is monstrous. Isn't there any way of... Oh, dear, you're terribly anxious for me to stay with Willie. If you want it, I'll do anything. You know that. And when it's all over, possibly you'd... you'd care to marry me. Marry? Well, you needn't, of course. That isn't obligatory. Oh, we'll see. Are you going to Hearst Park today? We're all going. I'll see you there. But, darling, listen. Is Willie being awful? I know he's an awful lout in some ways, but there's an, there's an awful lot of good in old Willie. Don't let's waste time discussing Willie. Good old Willie and I, and of course his little sister, good old Molly, we're leaving for Italy on Tuesday. And when we come back, I, I want a really serious talk with you. I see. I was sorry to see your uncle died last week. Poor old man. Did he leave a lot of money? The general, buckets full. I say, there's Molly. She's waving to you. I'd better go home. I'll see you at Harris Park, darling. Bye. Bye, Wanda. A room with a few and you and no one to worry about. Go, no one. Benny. Hilkert. What you doing lurking in the bushes? Nothing. Yes, you were. 
You were having a quiet smoke. Loafing. Oh. Well, perhaps I was. Is uh, Lady Panipin staying at breakfast? No, she just walked over to Welbury. Yeah. You heard about his nib, Sir William Paniford, to you. What about him? You got soused down at the Blue Pigeons last night with a lot of clodhoppers. You will oblige me by not discussing my friends, Hilkert. Oh, well, if you don't like my style, you better get another servant. I'm a human being, I'm entitled to me opinions. I doubt very much if you are human, but you're what? certainly not entitled to express your opinions to me about my friends. And you can leave at the end of the month. That'll do me. Now, are we going to Hurst Park this afternoon? Yes. Right then. Better dig out your field glasses, ain't I? You running your horse? Yes, why? I just asked you. I thought of giving Ephidos a run, but I can't beat yours. I wonder if I can beat yours. The form book gives you an outstanding chance. Am I not rowing with me? With your horse out of the way, mine is a certainty. You'll get three to one for your money. All right. I won't run mine. Oh, don't be silly. Of course you'll run him. Otherwise, we'll get rotten odds about mine. What's the idea? That I should run mine and tell the jockey not to win the race? Why not? We won't discuss it. <laughs> what a self-righteous chap you are. There never was a racing crook who didn't die broke, Hibble Wayne. I can't say I like the word crook. Anyway, suit yourself, old man. Suit yourself. Oh, she's looking absolutely Oh, it's the most Hello, Wendell. Hello, How are you? Fine, Gary. Nice to see you. Where's Brother Willie? Yes, over there at the bar. I met somebody who knows, no hunting crony or someone. I better see how he's getting on. Bye. See you later, Molly. Bye. <laughs> Sounds as if he's enjoying himself. Um, Gary, I did tell you we were going to Rome on Tuesday, didn't I? Well, I forgot to ask you this morning. Do you mind if I delay sending you a cheque for a week or two? No, of course not. I wanted you to have the whole income from that little nest egg. You know that. Oh, you are a brick. £250 doesn't mean anything to you, but it, it means an awful <laughs> lot to me. Now, you will write to me, won't you? Of course. By the way, I, I wasn't terribly sympathetic about your uncle's death this morning, was I? I'm sorry. He really was a fine old soldier, you know. I admired him like anything. Oh, here's your boyfriend. Henry Lisson? A joke, surely. Hello, Henry. Hello, Wenda. You gonna watch the race? No, I think I'll stay here. Do you mind, Henry? Well, I'm off to watch my horse. Oh. Uh, not exactly polite. <laughs> yes, Gary's manners are deplorable. They say he's betting like smoke. <laughs> well, why shouldn't he? He's terribly rich. You know, racing's a fool's game. Why, well, I've seen more fellows ruined on the turf and than... on the stock exchange. Hello, Henry. Slumming? Uh, hello, Molly. Can't you be allowed to say so? Which you are. It's absurd to compare legitimate investment with... They're all. Let's go and see the race with Gary. We may as well. Oh, yes. 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 Get on the rails! Nine third! And he'll finish first! <laughs> He's got it, I think. The only danger is Epidos, but... Come on! <laughs> oh, you say that's wonderful, really wonderful. I had a hundred pounds on. Four ponies? But surely you're not betting in hundreds. Oh, don't be absurd. You're back to yourself. More than a hundred pounds, I bet. Well, I did have a monkey on it. But I shouldn't have won that race so easily. There'll be trouble about it, you'll see. Trouble? You don't think you'll be... Di Disqualified? Oh, no. But Ephidos should have won. He wasn't trying. If the stewards didn't see what happened, they're blind. And stewards are never blind. There! The flag's up. I told you, steward's inquiry. Big slip places. Why the oh, Hibble Wayne's in for it, I'm afraid. What a brute you are, Gary, to have a winner and not tell us to back it. Oh, nice business racing, I must say. Did we hear what they're saying about young Hibble Wayne? Stopped his horse from winning. Disgraceful. By Jove, they ought to warn the beggar off. Willie, darling, you're talking very loudly and very stupidly. Well, if I'm not allowed to express my view... Not just, in what? public. Beggar ought to be warned off. What a bloody fool.
Oh, I beg your pardon. No, not you. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. It's young Hebblewain. He's been warned off. It's announced here in the calendar for that business to Hurst Park the other week. Uh, just goes to show. What? Oh, nothing. Well, stop chippering. That's nice talk, I must say. Uh, Hellcat, I suppose you realise that one of these days I shall be married. Oh, congratulations. I always thought that was a match, if I may be allowed to say so. I don't know what you're talking about. What a young lady, sir. Miss Molly. Well, I'll be damned. What an idea. Now, look here, Hubert. I'm going over to the stables to see Mr. Ray. Oh. If anyone calls, I'll be about an hour. Oh, and don't forget that Mr. Dory's coming to dinner tonight. So lay on a good spread. All right? Okie dokie, Gav. Well, what do you think, Mr. Ray? You got the Ascot stakes in your pocket, sir. Oh, I thought that before and had my pocket well and truly picked by another horse. Isn't there an animal named Silver Queen running as well? Silver Queen? She won't see the way Rangemore goes. Don't be too sure. She's a flyer. Anyway, it's still not certain that she'll run. Her owner's a Frenchman, or a Belgian, and he's out of the country just now. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. I hate to see a man betting like you are, Gary. Ah, oh, don't worry, John. I shan't go broke. When I reach my limit, I shall... You'll get out. Well, don't sneer, John. I'll get out, all right. How's Lady Paniford these days? Oh, very bright, I believe. She's in Italy. Yeah, she's coming home next week for Ascot. Oh. You don't like Wenda, do you? Oh, I don't know. You don't understand her. There's nobody in the world like Wenda. How she came to marry Willie, heaven knows. People often wonder why you didn't marry her yourself. You don't understand friendships of this kind, John. We grew up together. Marriage would probably have spoiled everything between us. Do you know the most beautiful girl I've seen for years? Molly Paniford. Now, why the devil did you say that? The Paniford's come home next week, sir. Hillcut. Well, I've just been over to their house. Lady Paniford's had a new safe put in her bedroom. How do you know? <laughs> well, I've seen it. Ah, uh, you know, I'd be glad to see Miss Molly back. That's a nice young lady, if you like. Of course she's a nice young lady. Good. Oh, here's a letter from her. I forgot it. Thank you, Hillcut. Wenda! Gary. Wenda! Gary, darling! Oh, how nice of you to come and meet me. Oh, no, no, I'd be on this trip. Well, Molly wrote and told me. She's a grand girl. Where is she? And this way I brought the car. She's staying over in Paris with Willie. Well, come on, what's the news of the great range war? <laughs> oh, fine. In great shape, in fact. Oh, by the way, Henry Lassane is coming down to spend Ascot week with us. And I've made rather a muddle of my invitations. Would you put him up? Me? I know he bores you, but... Oh, of course, he can stay at Danham. I'll wire him if you like. But why he can't stay at Welbury with a house full of servants, heaven only knows. Oh, Willie's so difficult. <laughs> and perhaps I am a little proper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I've been reading about your good luck. It's all over the paper. You haven't seen my betting book. Came a cropper last week. When's Henry arriving, did you say? Friday, I think. Right, oh. I'll have Hilkert prepare for his stay. Gary, you are a darling. What's the matter, all asleep? <laughs> Here's your letters. There's one registered to sign for. All right, give it here. Don't you Londoners get up in the morning? My wife's out in the garden every morning at five. So would I be if I was married to you. You know anything? Everything. No, I mean about the race. Is your governor's horse going to win today? You buy the sporting life and find out, mate. Blue and handy man. Claude Hopper. Uh, is that the post? Uh, yeah. Uh, nothing for you. No, my letters from the data gone on to uh, Welbury House. Uh, will you send my things there after breakfast? Why are you leaving us, Mr. Lassane? Mm. Oh, that is a pity. You needn't go over there to breakfast, you know. They always come here on the first morning of Ascot. I see. Is it a ritual? No, it's habit. Yeah. Uh, where is Captain Anson? Oh, he's playing golf on the lawn. Yeah, do you want a paper? Catch. I say. Morning, Hillcart. Oh, morning, miss. Uh, will there be anything else, sir? No, there will not. Ah, oh, well, uh, I'll go then. <laughs> well... <laughs> 
I must say, Molly, you're an early riser. When did you and Willie get back? This morning, 1 a.m. We caught the 4 o'clock from Paris. Well, how are you? How did you sleep in this house of sin? Oh, quite well, really. How curious. <laughs> it really was very good of Anson to have me here. I say, Anson's really quite fond of Wenda, isn't he? Awfully fond. My dear, she's the world's only woman for him. You're not suggesting that Anson... No, I'm not. One of these days, you'll let me finish what I'm trying to say. Oh, Henry, you so seldom say anything that's worth finishing. Gary! Morning, Molly. Gary's looking well, don't you think? I can't say I really noticed. What are you doing out here? Now, come inside, both of you. Ring the bell, will you, Molly? There's a dear. Right here. Come on, Henry. Breakfast won't be a moment. How was golf practice? Rotten. Did yeah. you ring? Yes. Did the calendar come? You're looking at it on a table in front of you. Well, go and hurry up breakfast. Cool. I don't think you could live without the calendar, Gary. What is it? Oh, there are only two calendars, old boy. The Newgate calendar and the racing calendar. The losers of the past and the losers of the future. The calendar, or the racing calendar, is a sober sheet which few but racing men ever see. Wars may be waged, earthquakes occur, all manner of disasters take place, but you'll find no reference to such unimportant happenings in the calendar. You going to the races? I hope so. Good. I'll give you a winner. <laughs> I don't bet. Good. I'll give you two. In fact, I don't know one horse's name from another. <laughs> You're going to have an interesting week. I say, um, that fellow of yours, he's rather, rather unusual, isn't he? He's damned impertinent. Have you noticed that too? Uh, well, um, yes. That's right. He's not a good servant, that's why I keep him. He's a sort of war relic. I'm not sure that he shouldn't be in the Imperial War Museum. A war relic? I don't quite follow you. <laughs> of course you don't. I mean, he was my Batman. You don't approve of my gambling, do you? Well, it's not my worst habit. He is. Was he a butler before the war? No, a burglar. A burglar? <laughs> You're pulling my leg. Of course he is. Anyway, he's not a very bright butler. No, he isn't. But I believe he was a scintillating burglar. <laughs> Psst. The telephone. Uh, to me? Yeah. Will you speak here or in the hall? I, uh, in the hall. Just coming. Right out. It's, uh, Lady Paniford. Really? Hmm. Hilkert, don't go. What? How often have I told you not to mention the name of the person who is calling anybody in this house? Oh, I don't seem to be giving much satisfaction here, Captain, do I? I think I'll hand him me notice. Nothing I'm doing is right. It's not your turn to give notice. You'll leave at the end of the month. You <laughs> gave me notice last time. Did I? Oh, I don't remember. Very well, I accept your notice. Thank you. What a child you are, Gary. I'm sure he gave me notice. He's so dashed unfair, that fellow. What do you think of Henry? Oh, not much. What's he do for a living? Nothing. He's at the war office. Oh. One thing's certain, he's not a racing man. He's rather rich, isn't he? Yes. That worries me slightly. Why? Why should Mr. Henry Lassan's prosperity ruffle the brow of pretty Molly Paniford? Oh, I don't know. Good Lord. So the Queen hasn't accepted... I should be asked. Oh, don't be silly. I mean the horse. She hasn't accepted for the Northumberland plate, which means I shall win it. Good. <laughs> By the way, Molly, can't you stop Willie drinking so much? Perhaps he drinks to drown his sorrows. Sorrows? Rubbish. He's got the best woman in the world for a wife. Wenda couldn't make a man unhappy. You adore her, don't you? I believe I do. Well, you can't expect any woman to be enthusiastic about her sister-in-law. Gary, you're a darling, but do you really think you know Wenda? And what do you mean? You think she's everything that's wonderful. You think she's big and generous. Generous? What is she to be generous about, poor darling? Has Willie got a lot of money? She has. Wenda has, I mean. Wenda has lots of money. You sure? She has dividends and things. Trust Wenda to feather her nest. Uh, darling, you're a cat. I don't like to hear you talk about Wenda in that way. Honestly, it rather hurts me because I'm... I'm very fond of you. Are you gay? Now you're annoyed with me. Not really. Yes, you are. I'm lecturing you. And nobody likes to be lectured. Forget it. Lord, that big post you get. <laughs> Begging letters, mainly. The luck of Gary Anson. 
I saw it in the newspapers when we were in Italy. Eh? Your uncle's will. Oh, that. <laughs> oh, the papers got it all wrong. How much did he leave? Five hundred thousand pounds, I think, and the Hereford property. A nice old boy, but he didn't like me. He didn't like you. Why did he leave you his money? Oh, the newspapers said I had the money, but they got it all wrong. I thought you knew. He didn't leave you anything. Not a bomb. But my dear, everybody believes you came into money. Then you aren't half a millionaire. <laughs> oh, Gary, I've been so respectful to you. Have you? Ah, oh, here's Winder and Willie coming across the garden. Open the French window, Gary. They can come in this way. All right. Gary, it's nice of you to put Henry up. You got a prudent wife, Willie, old boy. Mm. I jolly nearly went over to Welbury and slept there myself. Then you jolly nearly had an unpleasant shock. I shouldn't have opened the door to you. <coughs> Well, do I have a whiskey and soda? Oh, very well. Before breakfast? Oh, don't be stupid, darling. I can do almost anything before breakfast except eat. Willie. You ring. Get Sir William a drink, will you? Oh, all right. Um, whiskey and soda. Oh, I know what you want. Uh, why did you stop over in Paris, Molly? When does Ascot close? Uh, you're going to be a swell, are you? Heaven knows I can't afford to be. Here's your drink. Thank you. In fact, we're quite broke, aren't we, Willie? Never mind, my dear. We'll win a fortune today, and tomorrow I'll run away with you. Some people don't have to run very far. That's a very cryptic remark, Willie. Willie's always cryptic after a bad crossing. That isn't terribly clever, Wendell. I mean, I can stand a joke against myself if it's clever. A joke against you doesn't have to be clever, Willie. Breakfast is ready. But the milkman ain't cold, so there's only one egg each. All right? Lovely. Well, it'll have to do, I suppose. Oh, uh, Mr. Ray's here, Captain. You'd like a word. He's in the study. You've Andy Lynn. Well, in you go to breakfast, all of you. I'll, I'll, I'll join you later. Oh, bloody breakfast went wrong with whiskey and soda. Good morning, Mr. Ray. Good morning, sir. Morning, Andy. Good morning, sir. Well, how did Rangemore go this morning? I never saw a horse look so well. Strolled out like a lion, didn't he, Andy? He did that, Captain. Everybody on the course is talking about him. No, that's not too good. We don't want the whole world talking about him. It'll cut the price. Oh, I don't know, Captain. They'll go six to one the field. There's half a dozen fancied horses. All right, you are then. We'll have a dash. Can you do the weight, Andy? Yes, Captain. I was in Turkish bars all last night. I lost about a pound and I'm not having any breakfast. Well, that's one egg saved. All right, it looks a good thing. You're on the odds to 50 and you too, Mr. Ray. I don't see what's to beat us. Mm, what about the filly, Silver Queen? Is she running? They think she'll walk and if she runs... Hmm. She's becoming something of a nightmare. Funny thing, you know. For some reason, I hadn't expected Silver Queen to be running in the Ascot Stakes. Now I see why she wasn't entered for the Northumberland Plate. Are you sure she'll be running today? I was talking with her trainer this morning. He can't get in touch with the owner. But he's going to run her today. Then she'll beat us. Oh, I don't know, with a bit of luck. No, when I back horses, I don't rely on luck, but on judgment. I don't like it. They tried her last week and she ran a blinder. Harry Dark told me about it. Well, please yourself, Captain Anson, but if Rangemore was my horse, I'd let him take his chance. If it was my horse... I'd give him an easy race today, finish fourth or fifth, and win the Northumberland plate with him. Can't see him losing that. No. I don't like the idea of not trying. I don't know what you're worrying about, Captain. You'll get a stronger market for the Northumberland plate, and you can back range more to win a fortune. And of course, I, uh, I needn't run him today. Then you'll have everybody waiting for him at Newcastle, and you'll be lucky to get six or seven to four for your money. I don't like it, but... Well, as things are... Uh... All right, I'll leave it to you. In that case, Captain, I should have a good bet on Silver Queen. Gary, where have you been? We've finished breakfast. Oh, sorry to be so long. That was my trainer and jockey. Wendy, you look miserable. What's the trouble? Oh, Willie, he's impossible. Just saying the most appalling thing. About me? Almost everyone. Especially young Hippleway. What did he say about Hippleway? He said all owners of racehorses were as bad as he and that racing was crooked. Did he? Willie said that, eh? Yes, I'm afraid there was a scene. I'm afraid the turf isn't very popular with Willie just now. Oh, nothing's very popular with Willie. Least of all me. Are you unhappy? Oh, not particularly. By the way, Wenda, does Willie know anything about our little financial arrangement? No. I don't mind you telling him. No, he needn't be told that. He, he wouldn't understand. Oh, we shall be late. What's all that, Harry? I haven't finished my drink. Oh, Willie, come along. Oh, all right. I'm just finishing my... Ah, Anson, there you are. 
Hmm? I'm going to give you a tip, Anson. Well, you're a bit of a tipster yourself, aren't you? Why, Anson, you're getting very formal all of a sudden, Willie. It's about time we had a little formality, I think. There's a lot going on here, and I don't understand. Naturally. Oh, go home and dress, you quarrelsome old devil. Well, what I mean to say is I'm not such a fool as I look. Hmm? I find that very difficult to believe. Come on, Willie. Yeah. Willie is rather... Isn't he? Gary, I... Uh... Well, Molly? Gary, some things aren't worthwhile. You realise that? I don't quite see you. Yes, you do. There are things that aren't worthwhile and people who aren't worthwhile. Unfortunately, they're the sort that get everything. Do you mean Willie? I'm going to change. I'll see you in your box. I'll walk you down to the end of the garden. Come on, silly. One day I'll find you, moonlight behind you. Hello, the... Gary. Uh, All alone. Just as well. I wanted to see you. Are you backing, Rangemore? Uh, no. Why not? Morning, Gary. Oh, no. Trouble? No, it's just that I can't stand up. Morning, Henry. Have you ever met a bookmaker? No, I... Oh, I thought they were... Vulgar, loud fellows with check suits and red noses. Henry Lassan, meet John Dory. How do you do? How do you do? Ask him what's going to win today as an authority on the thoroughbred racehorse. Ah, he's pulling your leg. I don't know two horses apart. They all look alike to me. <laughs> <coughs> I've, uh, I've sent your clothes over to Wilbury. But I'm dressing here. You said you wanted your case sent over after breakfast. It went over ten minutes ago. Oh, tons of time, old boy. Five minutes walk. Good for the figure. Pardon? He'll get... Show Mr. Lassan over to Welbury. Aye, aye, Captain. See you later, Henry. Oh. Come on, John. Let's go inside. I don't understand this. You aren't backing Rangemore? No. Well, you are running it. Yes, Rangemore's running. Ah, thank you. Bung ho. Chin chin, old chap. By the way, I met Lady Paniford just now, and she's had 50 pounds on your horse. Oh, Lord. Well, you can cancel that bet. I'll send a note over to Wendell. Well, why not phone? Oh, I don't want all the girls at the exchange to know my business. No. Note paper. Ah, in luck. Just one sheet left. I must tell Hilke to... Well, let me see. Darling, I've cancelled your bet. My horse isn't trying. Mm. I... Mm. You can't send a note like that, Gary. Are you mad? Well, don't be silly. It's only to Wenda. Well, look, why send any note at all? I'll cancel her bet. But you may have put some of her friends onto it. But you can't write things like that. Now, don't worry. I've added a postscript. Listen. Please burn this note unless you want me to be warned off. How's that? You know, your trouble's mental, Gary. I tell you again, you cannot afford to send that note. Oh, there's Hilkert. Returning as slowly as he can across the lawn. Hilkert? We're in here. Oh, coming. You're what I call a clever mug, Gary. I've only met two men like you, and they both died broke. Thank you for that encouraging remark, John. Uh, what do you want? I want you to take this note over to Lady Paniford. Well, if I just come back. Well, go again. Oh, I don't know. The more you do, the more you might. Well, I'll give it here. <sighs> you know, Gary, I wouldn't have sent that letter to my dearest friend. Well, Wenda falls into that category. Do you mind if I'm very frank, Gary? Are you going to talk about Wenda? I am not. I'm going to talk about that letter you sent. Now, you've been racing for years. You know the game and how it's played. Now, there are certain people who'd rather make a crooked bob than an honest quit. You're not complaining? Me? No, I'm not. I make money out of them. Now, tell me, how did you gallop this horse of yours? I galloped him at a stone with Lansford. What? Did he beat Lansford at a stone? Rangemore beat him by miles. Well, what are you afraid of? Silver Queen. Silver Queen? Well, there can't be a pound in it one way or the other. When I bet, John, there are to be no ifs. I can't afford to take a sporting chance. You losing? Well, I'm not doing too well. I was wondering. Do you know what you've lost to me in the last two months? Eight thousand six hundred pounds, and you aren't betting with me alone. You're trying to depress me. Gary, did you ever do what you said you were going to do? Put some money by that you couldn't touch for betting? Good Lord, you've got a good memory. Yes, I did. I bought a few bearer bonds in there. I uh, put them in trust. And you can't touch the money? No, not until I finish with betting for good. And that's going to be pretty soon. Well, there's no need to play the fool, Gary, eh? 
It rains more on a good race if it's only for the stake money. But I'm bound to win the Northumberland Plate with him. I can't lose my money in that race. Back him today? No. What's the matter with you, Gary? You've never done these monkey tricks before. What tricks? Well, you've never stopped a horse from winning. Well, I... Well, I suppose I... What about it? Gary, you've... Well, you've shocked me. <laughs> oh, marvellous. I've shocked a bookmaker. Yes, well, I've had my shocks on the race course, but I've never yet been shocked by seeing the best man I know thieving. Thieving? Yeah, sounds a bit ugly, doesn't it? It's thieving all the same. Look, Gary, I know you've had a run of bad luck, but surely things can't be that bad. No, can't they? I don't believe it. Here, listen to this in today's sporting life. Well? The betting public have two great incentives to back this horse. The first is the knowledge of Rangemore's own sterling qualities, and the second is that Rangemore's owner is the popular Mr Gary Anson, and people who know his horses know that they're on a trier. He's the type of owner who is an acquisition to the turf. Ah, well, it just shows how little these writing fellows know. Oh, hell, I don't know that. Perhaps you're right. Oh, Gary, what's it to be? All right, John, you win. I must have been mad to ever consider it. Yeah. Will you see Andy Lynch? Yes. Show him in, Hilkett. All right, I'm just going. Yes, well... Oh, I'll, I know, uh... I'd like you to stay, John. You you, you may as well see the John? reformation completed. Right, thank you. Here you go, <coughs> Cock. <coughs> now, about this horse, I... Hilkett, out. All right. Oh. Oh. Well, I had to see you, Captain. I'm a bit worried, uh... That's putting it mildly. <clears throat> oh, it's all right. You can say what you like in front of Mr. Dory. Why are you worried? Well, I don't know. I'm going to ride range more. I've been thinking out a dozen ways, and I can't find one that's satisfactory. It's a very difficult horse to drop out. Well, don't drop him. Well, I couldn't do it, honestly. You, you know the horse, Mr. Dory. Well, he isn't the sort you could put in behind something. Indeed. At the moment some horse in front of him fell away or laid off, he'd pull himself through, and I couldn't stop him. Then let him run his own race today. Oh. <gasps> Oh, you're trying with him, then? Oh, that's a load <laughs> off my mind. All right. Tell Mr. Ray that I've changed my mind. Hey, he's been a bit nervous and all. Well, off you go and have a good day. Ah, thank you, sir. I should win the last race. Win the second. That'll amuse me much more. Huh. Uh, goodbye. Thank you, Captain. Bye. John, old son, you've saved my soul. No, don't be an ass. I've given you a bit of advice that'll cost me a lot of money. Now, what about Lady Paniford? Lady Paniford? Yes, if I remember rightly, you sent her a note. And so I did. I'd forgotten... I'll send Hilgen over with another one. Ask her to destroy the first one. It's already burnt. Did you ring? Yes, there's no note paper on this desk. Go and get some. All right. Oh, no, 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 hang on. I've, I've got something here. Oh, no, make up your mind. Don't be impertinent. Give me a pencil. Oh, uh, here you are. Thank you. Now, that should do it. Now, an envelope. There. Rush this over to Lady Paniford and don't pinch it. Oh, talking about pinching. What about my pencil? Here you are. Ta. Now, what have you done now, Gary? I wrote and told her it was a joke and she could back range more. What was that paper you wrote on? It looked to me like a fiver. It looked to me like a hundred. Oh, Gary, you're crazy. Oh, I owe her that. I won some money for it, Newbury. Oh, well, I'm off. See you later. Right you are, John. Daddy wouldn't buy me a bow wow, bow wow. Daddy wouldn't buy me a bow wow, bow wow. What? Wenda! Why all the cloak and dagger stuff? I was on my way over when Hillcott gave me your note. I saw Dory going out of the front door, so I thought I'd come in this way. So you got my expensive note? Yeah. That's why I came. What was the idea of the first note? Why the mystery, Gary? What mystery? Why did you say your horse wasn't going to try? Oh, I was only joking. I changed my mind. Aren't you dressing? It won't be long before the first race. I thought I'd take you with us. You'll be crowded. My little rolls will just hold me and my thoughts. Where's Willie? He's picking me up. Gary, I want you to be awfully patient with him today. Oh, is he really suspicious of me? <laughs> yes. What a stupid fool. Darling, do you remember what I asked you once before? Would you? Uh, would I... what? Would you let your name be used? 
Oh, don't tell me you don't want to drag my name through the court. You've already told me that. Oh, Gary, will you? We could go away somewhere till it was all over and then settle in the country. At your place. In Hereford. But I haven't got a place in Hereford. I didn't come into that half million. It was Jack Hanson. My cousin. Oh, but the papers My said... dear, the papers, as usual, got it all wrong. Oh, dear, but I... Ah, there you are. How much longer are you going to keep me waiting? I say, old boy, you couldn't come over to Welbury and see Wendell whenever you like. You needn't spend so much time here, I mean. It's not at all necessary. Don't make a fool it... of yourself, Willie. I'm letting other people make a fool of me. That's my role, old boy, silly Billy, hmm? I'm not blind or deaf. Oh, now. shut up, Willie. Well, it's got to come out and might as well come out now. A Delphi Hotel, eh? Oh, my God. Yeah, does that seem familiar? Not particularly. You don't happen to know the lady and gentleman who are staying together as Mr. and Mrs. Sundridge at the Adelphi Hotel? Willie, what's going on? Now, you keep out of this, Molly. You don't deny it, Anson. You were with Wenda last month in Liverpool before she went abroad. Liverpool? Good God. What a place to commit adultery. You don't deny it. You were the man. No, I don't deny it. Uh, no. That you were the man and Wendo was the woman? Yes. No. It's a lie. Uh, it's a lie. All right. It's a lie. If you want me to say it's a lie, I don't care. Look here, Anson, I've a damn... Oh, well, for God's woman. sake, don't make a scene. Now, come along now at once. All right, I'm coming. But I'm through with you, Anson. I never want to see you again. If you come into my house, if I ever find you here, I... God, I'll kill you. Hello, Wenda. Any more scenes from Willie? No, he's tamer now. <laughs> it was rather an amusing morning. Did, uh, did I make a fool of myself, too? I'll talk to you later. If you see Willie, don't hit him. Honestly, he's very penitent. Where's Molly? With her brother. Well, Mr. Ray, how's Range Moss? Smash him. Not an extra ounce of flesh on him. Ready to run for his life. He'll never be any fitter. And if Silver Queen's better than he is, then she's a cracker. Honestly, when I can't see I've done anything to apologise for, and I won't. As for lunching with Madame Blight Ranson, well, I ask you. Very well, I shall go straight home and then to London. Oh, uh, well, I mean to say I'm only human when I, 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 I lost my head, that's all, and... Well, damn it, I'm jealous. I mean, it's, it's a compliment to you, really. I'm not asking you to apologise to me. You've offended me beyond forgiveness. Well, there was a woman at the Adelphi Hotel. I won't even discuss it. Well, Anson did admit it. Oh, you know, Gary, it's probably his idea of humour. Now you'll see him at once and apologise. Do you understand? Oh, all right. Here he comes. I'm going to talk to Molly. Now remember, Willie, this is your last chance. <laughs> Hello, Willie. Are you sober? I, I say, Gary, I'm... I'm sorry about that business this morning. You are sober, you wicked old devil. See, I'm terribly fond of Wenda. Yes, I've noticed, and I hope she roasted the soul out of you. All right, I'm sorry. There's no need to rub it in. Now, you go into the luncheon room and have a nice glass of milk. <laughs> I'm off to back my horse. Well, don't put anything on for me, old boy. <laughs> Gary, just a minute. I've got 1,200 pounds to 200 five times, 14 to 200 twice, 1,300 pounds to 200 three times. I think that's about all you want. It's more than I thought you wanted. 2,000 pounds. What price is the horse now? Well, Jackson's offering five to one. That means you could get 1,100 pounds to two a dozen times. I'll go and get it to 2,000 pounds. Steady on, Gary. We'll have a flat air. Well, they're backing Silver Queen. Why don't you have a saver on her? No, this is my swan song. They're on their way to the post. Look. Silver Queen looks well. I've never seen her look better. And look at Rangemore. Nothing wrong there, eh? Now, go and get that money on. You're neglecting your business. I'm off to watch the race. Cherry right. Whiskey Skipper is 14 to 1. Cherry Whiskey is 107. Here you are at last. Why so sharp? Are you annoyed with me? Is there anything you wouldn't do for Wenda, Gary? What do you mean? Why did you admit you were the man? Oh. I'm blessed if I know. Because she asked you to and then changed her mind. Why? 
were you talking about before Willie and I came in? Did you tell her that you hadn't come into the Anson money? Well, yes. How did you know? Well, there's your answer. That's a horrible thing to say, Molly. I'm going out to watch the race. Oh, that's all right. What is it? There was a postscript in a letter on the back saying you wanted to see it, Ah, uh, yes, I, I, I may want to see it. Why? Why? I'll tell you later, after the race. What's happening, Gary? I can't make them out. A mine's leading from Lord Kelly's horse, then there's a gap, then comes Silver Queen, Waterfield, Patan, then the Belgian horse. Gary, have you backed your horse much? A modest fortune, darling. I hope you win. Race war's going well, Gary. Well, hello, John. Yes, he is. That Belgian stays forever, I'm told. I'll win nothing today. Oh, Gary, there'll be no tax on those bets. I had to do them that way. Some of the dodgers made the best prices. Well, I, I don't care much for the tax, but I, I'm not keen on dodging. Oh, there! The Belgian's beaten. Here they come. Waterfield's going well. So, Silver Queen. What's the water in front, Gary? That's mine, you old ass. You're winning! I think you've got it, Gary. No, I've lost. Never. Oh. There. The number's going up in the frame. Number nine, Silver Queen. Hurrah! I won. I'm going to drink. Hard luck. Short head, eh? Nearer than I thought. Yes, yours ran gamely enough. Oh, Gary, how rotten. Isn't it, darling? Poor old Rangemore. She was just too good for him. Run along, Molly, dear, dear. Must I? Don't be trying, darling. I want to talk to Gary. Is it something that a young girl shouldn't hear? Darling, you're getting more like Willie every day. Oh, Wenda, how can you? Willie adores you. Come along, Mr. Dory. You can tell me how to make a book. Do you still want to see me tonight? Yes. I'd better walk across to you. Will you be alone? Yes. About ten o'clock? You sure it won't make trouble with Willie? No. Me, Molly? Yes, Willie's going to the bar. He wants you to join him. He's getting rather restless. I'm coming. I see you at ten. Bye. I feel responsible for all this. <laughs> What's your name? Silver Queen? Oh, yours ran gamely enough. Oh, come on, let's get to the paddock. Are you betting on the last race? It's the race Andy Lynn told you he'd win. No. Well, God knows I don't want to advise you to bet, but this is a certainty. The price is short, but I have taken £1,500 to a 1000 about it for you. I don't want it. Oh. Well, then I'll stand it myself. Ah, oh, no, 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 don't. I'll have it. <laughs> oh, let's watch the last race together and I'll drive you back home for a drink. Well, you won on that one anyway. So, Gary, what's it to be? Are you through with racing or not? Half an hour ago, I should have said I was. But that's stupid. It's in my blood and I can't get it out. I'm not broke except for immediate ready money. No, I shall race tomorrow. Gary, you've got some money put by, haven't you? 20,000, isn't it? Yes, I've still got it. it. It's with a friend. Lady Paniford? No. Oh, I see. What are you worth, do you think, with all your bills settled? Oh, about 40,000 pounds, I suppose. Well, there you are. You can live on that if you don't bet. Yes, but it's not enough to... To get married on? Well, quite a lot of people get married on four pounds a week and they live very happily. Now, let me ask you a question. Who cast up your accounts? Oh, I'll tell you later. When you've got a large scotch handy. No, but don't worry. Nobody will ever sympathise with you, Gary, because nobody will ever know what you've lost. Oh, do you mean the tax dodges? But if I ever had to show a record of those bets... You couldn't. But what would you have to show them for? Oh, you never know. Oh, it's you. Ah, Hillcott. But the captain's not back yet. Actually, it's you I wanted to see. Um... Did you pack my things this morning? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I looked after you. Do you uh, remember seeing a red pocket book in my room? No. You sure? You couldn't miss it. It's red. I'm colour blind. Well, hang on. Perhaps the maid found it. Well, I'll allow myself to ask her. Would you like to come in and wait? Uh, yes. Thank you. I well, shan't be long. Oh. Oh, St. Oswald plate of 200L. 
of which second read 20L and third 10L for three-year-olds and upwards. Enter a 4L and two if deck. Seven first straight could be. Sir Hugo Cunliffe Owen's dancing partner and Monsieur Boussac's new partner Spike Gray. Hello, Miss... Henry. Oh. Improving the mind. <laughs> it's all Greek to me. I wish it was Greek to me. I should have a pretty good knowledge of the classics. <laughs> well, how are all the good people? Willie made money, I believe? Yes. Yes, he did. He's gone up to town tonight to celebrate. I'm glad. He was in rather a sour mood. Gary, don't forget your glasses are in the... Co oh, sorry, am I interrupting? Oh, you've met my bookmaker, haven't you, Henry? Oh, uh, yes. You'd almost think he was a gentleman, wouldn't you? The way these fellows get themselves out. <laughs> she ain't seen it. Who ain't seen what? Oh, oh, it's nothing to bother about. A red pocket book. I ain't seen it. Uh, well, not to worry. There's nothing yet of any value. Well, I'm off back to Welbury. Good night. Good night, old boy. Give my love to Wendy. Well, come through, John, and let's hear the worst. Drink? No, thanks. Well, I'm going to have one. Yes, I should. Now, what's the damage? Four thousand seven hundred pounds. You're betting like a drunken sailor. Oh, by the way, I had a word with Ferguson on the course. Ferguson? Yeah, Silver Queen's trainer. <laughs> How could I forget? He's wired the news to the owner in the Congo or somewhere. Fancy a fellow having a big winner and not knowing it and probably not even backing it. Having a big second, knowing it and having backed it is worse. I heard a rumour about you selling your horses. Yes, I offered them to Harrigan. What sort of day did you have? Oh, good God, you startled me. When will you learn to knock? As it happens, I had a rotten day. Well, you can't both win, can you? I had a couple of bob and range more. Bless your life, I never win anything. I don't believe in horses or jockeys or anything. You're an atheist. Oh, no, I'm not. I believe in the totalisator. That's what I call being an atheist. Oh, well, uh, uh, by the way, Hubert, uh, I don't know whether I should be able to keep you after this month. I'm broke. You can't keep me. I'll keep myself. You mean you pay me wages. And that's the worst of the capitalist classes. They think wages is charity. I beg your pardon. Granted. Yes, well, I must get back to my hotel. It's getting late. Good night, Gary. Good night, John. Hubert, see Mr. Dory out, will you? All right, oh. Then I'll put things away and go to bed, if you don't mind. Not at all. Good night, Hubert. Happy dreams. <laughs> Come on, me old China. Happy dreams indeed. Brenda, my dear, come on in. Well, what has happened? You look worried. Nothing's happened. Are you sure? Well, Gary, well, what did you want to see me for? Well, what did I want? I. Uh... Um, what's all this talk I hear about you selling your horses? It's true. You mean you're broke? Well, not dramatically ruined, but broke. How stupid. If you can't afford to lose, you shouldn't bet. <laughs> now, how often have I heard that old phrase before? It's hardly original, darling. I've lost a lot of money myself on the stock exchange. It's awfully unfortunate this should happen now. Naturally, I'm sorry you've lost so much. If I can help in any way... Well, what on earth are you talking about, Wenda? <sighs> Gary, what did you want to see me about? All right, I'll be businesslike. I'm chucking racing. I've reached a point where I've got to stop, so I shall give up racing for good. I think you're very wise. Well? Well, sometime this week, I'll ask you to arrange with your bank to let me have back my little nest egg. I don't know what you mean. Mean? I mean, I shall want my money, darling. What money? Darling, the money. My money, you know, the 20,000 pounds. You remember I bought four bearer bonds of £5,000 each and asked you to keep them for me until I came to you with a solemn promise that I wouldn't bet again. I remember you gave me the bonds, yes. That was a gift to me. You know it was. Wendy, you don't mean this. You can't. I'm sorry now that I ever asked you to come over tonight. I'm not. It's terribly embarrassing, but evidently it has to be got over. You really mean, then, that you thought that that money was a gift? Yes, I do. Then why did you send me half the first year's interest? I don't want to discuss it, and I won't be cross-examined like this. Look, I want that money. Have you lost it? Has Willie had it? I'm not going to answer any more questions. 
Anyway, it's none of your damn business. But, Wenda, what's happened? Why, this morning you practically begged me to take you away. You wanted to go to that place in Hereford. You remember you thought my uncle had left it to me. The place in Hereford? Yes. I had a narrow escape, didn't I? So it was true. You really had thought I'd come into the Anson money, and when you found I hadn't, you... Now, look here. I don't know what proof I have that I gave you the money, but I'm pretty sure I have proof of some kind. Surely you're not going to sue me, Gary. I shall do everything that's possible to get that money. I don't think you'll sue me. Don't you? Then you're in for a shock. You'll have a shock yourself if you threaten me. Oh, good God, Wenda, you're a thief. Don't you understand? You're not so damned honest yourself. You were going to pull your horse this morning and you hadn't got the courage to go through with it. I shall ask my lawyers to write to yours in the morning. You'll be sorry if you do. I'm sorry you're taking this badly, Gary. You're not a good loser, are you? I've never had anything stolen before. Anyway, Wenda, I warn you, I mean to have that money. I shall see my lawyer first thing tomorrow. And what the... You'd better see who it is. I'm going. But, Wenda, I... Oh, hell. Why, John, what brings you back? I've a great bit of news for you. The most amazing thing's happened. It's all over the hotel. Your luck's in, old boy. Luck? Yes. Gary, what's the matter with you? Wake up. You remember the owner of Silver Queen was shooting out in Africa somewhere? Well, he died last week. Poor chap. But don't you see? Silver Queen is automatically disqualified. What well, bad luck. Bad luck be damned. It makes over £20,000 difference to you. Do you mind telling me again? The nomination of Silver Queen became void on the owner's death. And so the race goes automatically to Rangemore, your horse. I say, Gary, are you all right? No, I, uh, I, I don't want to discuss it. Gary, old son, you've had a smack in the eye. Don't deny it. Yes. I think that describes it pretty accurately. I say, Winda, must we go to Anson's box today? You don't like him? Not terribly. There's a touch of the cat about that fellow. And he's a socialist. I mean to say, queer, isn't it? Making a friend of a bookmaker of all things. I don't want to see Gary today. I had a little trouble with him, and he's been, uh, to say the least, offensive. The Wilmots aren't coming, and they've offered me their box. Who go there? It's at the other end of the tier. Nothing would please me more. To tell you the truth, Wenda, I've been rather dreading today. I mean, it's good fun, yes, but... I mean, the racing's a bit of a bore, but I, I mean to say... Shut up. Well, Gary, how are you feeling today? A little better, I trust. Oh, I'm all right. That winner I had in a second made the sun shine a little brighter, thank you. Oh, just as well. I say, we're not exactly a festive party today. Where is everybody? Excuse me, sir. Yes? Captain Anson, sir. That's right. Oh, the stewards would like to see you, sir. And what on earth for? I haven't got a horse running today. The stewards would like to see you, sir. Wouldn't they? Well, lead on, old son. Sit down, please, Captain Anson, would you? Thank you. I say, what's all this about? I'm afraid that rather a serious complaint has been made. It's to the effect that your horse, Rangemore, wasn't trying in the Ascot Stakes. Not trying? You saw the race? Oh, yes, we saw the race. The point is, a complaint has reached us, supported by evidence which is beyond question, that you told your friends yesterday that your horse wasn't trying. After racing today, we'll have to hold an inquiry, I'm afraid. Stewards of Ascot inquired into the running of Rangemore, and not being satisfied with Captain Gary Anson's explanation, reported him to the stewards of the jockey club. Well, there it is, John, in black and white, in the calendar for all to see. Where's the meeting to be held? New market, I suppose. What does Molly say about it? No, nothing. She hasn't heard. She had to go off to Italy. Oh, that... She'd do it. Wonder? Mm. Who shall fathom the heart of a woman? You had a row with her, I suppose. Well, in fact, I know you did. Just peak, eh? It's a pretty big thing to do for spite, wasn't it? I don't understand it. Then don't come to me for an explanation. Well, she'll give evidence, of course. She'll have to. They'd hardly convict you on that letter. But what about the second one you wrote on the back of the £100 note? That's my only hope. I've notified the Bank of England, and they're keeping a lookout for it. Unhappily, I don't know the number. Oh, there's, there's only one thing, John. When Molly comes back, I don't want her to know that Wenda was responsible. Why on earth not? I just don't want her to know, that's all. 
With a bit of luck, she'll stay in Italy until the whole bloody business blows over. Good morning, Captain Anson. Morning, Rainby. The noble lords assembled? Yes, sir. Lord Fallingham, Sir John Garth, and Lord Innsbruck. Oh, a pretty formidable crew, eh? Tell me, is Lady Paniford here yet? Yes, sir. Is she alone? Yes, sir. I met her at the station myself. She is quite alone. Now, if you'll just wait here. Yes, of course. Just to let you know that Captain Anson has arrived, my lord. Oh, thank you. Ask him to make, will you? Was this case being held over so long, Sir John? The case was held over because the principal witness, Lady Paniford, went to Italy in a hurry after Ascot Week and showed no urgent intention of returning. Uh, now, let's see. The original communication we received was anonymous, wasn't it? Yes, it was. She didn't put her name to the covering letter, but we traced it easily enough. She was very sick about it when we insisted she must come and give evidence, and we had a devil of a lot of trouble to get her here. However, she's here now. Just as well. If she hadn't turned up, we'd have had to drop the whole business. Oh, I should have thought the letter would have been sufficient. It's a beastly business. There's quite a lot behind it we don't know about. Yes, there's a lot of spite in this. Spite? Oh, she been his... Now, keep the party wholesome, old boy. This is a meeting of the stewards, not the judges of the divorce court. Let's just say she used to be a great pal of Gary's. What a stupid ass the fellow's been. Oh, you can't get over that letter. Say what you like. Yes, it's all very unpleasant. Well, let's make a start. Oh, I suppose we shall have to see Lady Paniford. Well, Lady Paniford is the one person we have to see. Come in. Everyone connected with the inquiry has arrived, sir. Good. Well, we may as well begin. Oh, ask Captain Anson to come in, please. Yes, sir. Captain Anson, this way, please. Captain Anson, this way, please. Oh, sit down, Anson. <clears throat> now, you know why you've been called here. It's a matter which has been reported to us by the stewards of Ascot, and it concerns the running of Rangemoor in the Ascot Stakes, the race which you eventually won on the disqualification of Silver Queen. The stewards of Ascot received a complaint on the day after the Ascot Stakes that your horse hadn't been trying, and that was supported by a letter which you had written, or which it was stated you had written. I will give you an opportunity of seeing this letter. Possibly you may wish to deny its authenticity. You know, of course, of the charge. Yes, sir. Now, listen to me, Captain Anson. I have a letter here, written in your own handwriting on your own notepaper. It is addressed to a lady. I'll read the letter. Darling, I have cancelled your bet. My horse isn't trying. Love, Gary. P.S. Please burn this note unless you want me warned off. Well, what exactly does that mean? I don't know how far frankness is going to help me. Well, the right kind of frankness will help a lot. You're not on oath, you know. I wrote that letter. Oh, it was a, a mad thing to do. I, I wrote it to a lady who was a dear friend of mine. I'm not going to tell you it was a joke. Honestly, I meant to stop Rangemore in the Ascot Stakes and win the Northumberland plate with him. As far as my original intentions were concerned, I'm guilty. We are not here to consider your intentions, good or bad, except insofar as they relate to the act. It's not what a man intends, but what he does on the race course that counts. Did you change your mind about stopping the horse? Yes. What made you change your mind? The advice of a great friend of mine. Yeah, when was this? About breakfast time on the Tuesday. That is to say, the first day of Ascot. What procedure did you follow? Did you tell your jockey to stop the horse or your trainer? No. On your honour? He is not on his honour. If Captain Anson had told his jockey or trainer to stop the horse, I should be very surprised if he were to incriminate them now. Now, when you changed your mind and decided to run the horse, what did you do to correct the impression you'd given the lady? I sent her a message. A few lines I scribbled on the back of a hundred-pound note. A hundred-pound note? I owed the lady this money. I won it for at Newbury. But why not a piece of notepaper? Well, it was a sort of <laughs> whimsical impulse. <laughs> Do you know the number of the note? No. And what did you write on the note? Now, as far as I can remember, that she wasn't to take any notice of my previous letter and that she was to back Rangemore. I thought it was going to win. Well, of course, that would put a different complexion on the story. Have we any previous mention of the second note? Yes, there is a reference to it in the statement made by Mr. John Dory. You realise that this means we shall have to bring the lady before us? I'm afraid you must. You say in the statement you made to the Ascot stewards that... You backed your horse. 
Well, that should be a simple thing to prove. Whom did you back it with? John Dory. He's not here, but we have a statement from him. He underwent an operation for appendicitis yesterday. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Dory is a personal friend of yours. Uh, yes, sir. And the only proof we have that you back the horse are his books. The books of a personal friend. Yes. Yes, I... I suppose he backed the horse with other people. I... I don't know how he arranges these things. You know, I suppose that Mr. Dory states that he's unable to tell us the names of the people with whom he backed the horse. I presume that his explanation would be that he was betting with people who were evading the payment of a betting tax. You do realize, Captain Anson, just how important it is that you should produce evidence that you backed your horse. I can produce evidence that I received over £8,000 from John Dory at the end of Ascot Week. Which proves nothing except that you won on the week. Yes, sir. Mm, I see. When it comes to this, then... But you can't give us any detailed or convincing proof that you're back to range. Only the proof that Mr. Dory can supply. And he isn't here to give evidence. You'll agree, Captain Anson, that if there is anything fishy about this transaction, Mr. Dory's appendicitis is rather convenient. It could be put that way. Yes, it could. So, your story is this, that on the morning of the Ascot Stakes, you intended stopping Range Moor, and afterwards you repented and backed it. You backed it with Mr. Dory, and you're unable to tell us any other bookmaker with whom his bets were placed. That you had no intention of pulling your horse when you arrived on the course, although you'd previously informed Lady Paniford that you weren't trying. Now, is that a fair summary? Yes, sir. Very well. Well, we'll have Mr. Ray in, Rainby. Certainly, sir. Mr. Ray, would you come, please? <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Ray. Good morning, sir. This, as you know, is an inquiry into the running of Range Moor and the Ascot Stakes. Now, what do you know about it? Nothing, sir. Uh, except that the horse did his best. You gave no instructions to the rider except to win. That's right, sir. Well, did you hear of any suggestion made by Captain Anson that the horse should be pulled? Oh, no, my lord. Or that he should be given an easy race at Ascot and go all out for the Northumberland Plate? Oh, gracious no, sir. I never heard of such a thing. Now, Mr. Ray... You are sure you never heard Captain Anson suggest that the horse should be pulled in the Ascot Stakes? No, sir. Mr. Ray, you saw Captain Anson on the morning of the race, I believe? Yes, I did, my lord. Did you go to his house? Uh, yes, uh, after the gallop, my lord. I, I went in and I told him how well the horse was moving. He was delighted. He said, oh, I'm going to have a big bet on that horse, Mr. Ray. Was anything said about the Northumberland Plate? Uh, why, yes, sir. I said he'll win the Northumberland Plate with his penalty. Is that all that was said? Nothing about stopping the horse? Oh, no, sir. Um, Captain Hanson said, I'm going to have a big bet on range more. And I said, you'll win the Northumberland Plate with him now they haven't accepted with Silver Queen. Um, I see. Oh, well, I... Uh, you were uh, afraid of Silver Queen beating your horse in the Northumberland Plate, and you were rather relieved when you found it wasn't running. And yet you weren't afraid of it beating you in the Ascot Stakes at the same weight and distance. Well, uh... Mr. Ray, in your desire to help Captain Anson, I'm afraid you've said a little too much. I knew I'd say something. Do you wish to ask any questions, Captain Anson? No, sir. Well, that will be all, Mr. Ray. Oh, ask Lynn to come in as you go, will you? Yes, sir. Thank you. Right. Here you go, Andy. Yes, sir. <coughs> now, Lynn... <coughs> You rode range more in the Ascot Stakes? Uh, yes, sir. What were your orders? Uh, sir, uh, to, to jump off in the front and uh, make the running. And if I couldn't do that, to lie up with the leaders and take a steadier somewhere near Swindley Bottom. Sir, uh, I was to keep the rails if I could and wait on Silver Queen in the straight and get first run on her. You had no other orders? No, sir. Who gave you those orders? Mr. Ray, my lord. And you carried them out? Well, as best as I could, my lord. Now, listen to me. Did you receive any orders to stop Range Moor? No, sir. I, I, I did everything I could. That is not the question. We are quite satisfied that as far as you were concerned, you were trying. What I want to ask is this. Was it ever suggested to you that you should stop this horse? No, sir. Did you see Captain Anson before the race? Yes, my lord. I saw him twice. Twice. Oh, did he send for you the second time? No, sir. I called in. Well, did he tell you on that second occasion that he changed his mind and was going to try with the horse? No, 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 my lord. I see. Well, thank you, Lynn. Uh, do you wish to ask this boy any questions, Captain Anson? No, sir. Very well. You may go. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, 
We'd better have the date again. Oh, Rainby, show Lady Paniford in, will you? Certainly, sir. Lady Paniford, uh, would you come in, please? Mm. Yeah. Uh, excuse the door, Melvin. Thank you. Now, Lady Paniford, do you know this letter? Yes. It was written by Captain Anson to you? Now, Captain Anson was, I understand, a very great friend of yours. I should like to make it clear, sir, that my relationship with this lady has been of a most correct nature. That's very generous of you. And generous to me. I wish to retain just a little self-respect. Now, about this letter, Lady Paniford, did you think it was a joke? No. Did you back the horse? I had already backed it. Captain Anson saw the bookmaker, John Dory, and asked him to cancel the bet. Perfectly true. I did cancel the bet. Now, you received this letter on the morning of the Ascot Stakes. Did you receive any other letter? Yes. There was a note from Captain Anson saying he wanted to see me that night. And nothing more? No. Lady Paniford, Captain Anson says that he sent you a message written on the back of a hundred-pound note. No. You say this isn't true? Yes. This letter, purporting to be written on a banknote, said the earlier letter was a joke. No. You didn't receive the £100 note? No, I didn't. I see. Now, in Mr. Dory's statement, he says, I was present when Captain Anson wrote to Lady Paniford, telling her to back his horse. This letter was written on the back of a £100 note. You still say that you didn't receive this banknote? Why should he send me £100? He says he backed a winner for you. He never told me anything about it. I'll ask you once more, and I hope you do realise that Captain Anson's whole future probably depends on your answer. Did he send you a subsequent note telling you that the first letter was a joke and that you were to back his horse? No. Good God. Captain Anson. Sorry. Lady Paniford, it strikes us as remarkable that you should have gone out of your way to denounce Captain Anson to the stewards. We are not concerned with your motives, but we do like to know, when we are to judge between two witnesses, what personal bias there is on one side or the other. I didn't know you were judging between two witnesses. You have his letter. We were good friends, as you say, and I admit I do have a personal bias. He behaved very dishonorably to my husband and myself. I do not wish to say any more than that. Do you wish to ask the lady any questions, Captain Anson? Yes. I should like her to tell you in what way I have behaved dishonorably. Well, that's hardly a matter for us. Thank you, Lady Paniford. That will be all. Thank you. Uh, uh, Captain Anson, have you any witnesses you wish to call? No, sir. I have no witnesses. Very well. Would you be good enough to wait outside? Uh, what a business. Yes, unpleasant. Still... However you look at it, it's almost identical to the woven case. Yes, I'm not too sure that it is. Oh, you can't make flesh of one and fish of the other. There's the letter. Jockey was probably lying. Old Ray certainly was. Yes, there is the letter, as you say. If only he'd brought proof that he'd backed his horse. I don't know. That business of the hundred-pound note almost convinced me. And that woman's... Uh... Well, still, it's the woven case all over again. And on the Woburn case, we must judge. Captain Anson, will you come in, please? Thank you, Rainby. Gentlemen, Captain Anson. Captain Anson, you have committed a very serious offence, and we must decide on the evidence upon which we can rely, the letter which you admit you wrote. I'm terribly sorry. You've been very, very foolish. But we feel that in the interests of the turf, there is only one decision to be taken. You are warned off Newmarket Heath and all courses under the jurisdiction of the Jockey Club. Dynam Lodge. Hello, yeah? Hillcott, this is Miss Molly. I've only just arrived home. Hillcott, where's Captain Anson? Was in town, miss. He's coming down later today. What's all this in the papers about an inquiry into the running of Rangemore? Yeah, that's right, miss. Warned off. Hillcott, this is Miss Molly speaking. What did you say? No, warned off, miss. Oh, not Gary. It's impossible. Warned off, miss. Hello? Hello? 
Uh, Miss Molly, she sounded upset. Yeah. I like to have had a word with them stewards. They wouldn't let me go in. Do you know what I'd have said to them stewards? No, you'd better tell me. I'd have said, I understand human nature. And if you believe a... a, a lady like that before a man like the captain, you want your head shaved. Well, they wouldn't have given you a medal for that. What? Where did you say you left, Captain Anson? Hyde Park Hotel. He said he'd be down later. How did he take it? <laughs> like I used to, smiling. I used to say to the judge, you can't hang me. And it's true. They can't hang you. Yes, but they can mess you about. Jockey club. Well, there ain't a jockey that's a member of it. They wouldn't join it. Gilcott, it's not true. It can't be. Oh, hello, John. Is it true? I'm afraid it is. <sighs> no. Hillcock, close the front door, will you? There's a dear. What? I'm afraid it was open and I just barged in. Oh, all right, miss. All right. I know when I'm not wanted. John, warned off. I mean, what will it mean? Well, Gary will go broad, I expect. You mean become a social outcast? Well, that's rather dramatising the situation, but something of the sort. But how could they? I mean, the horse won or nearly won. Yes, but unfortunately, Gary wrote a letter. But anyway, you know all about that. A letter about the race? Well, he didn't write that the horse wasn't trying to win. I'm afraid he did. But he must have been mad. What on earth did he write it to? Well, don't you know? He wrote to Lady Paniford. To Wenda? My God. Anyway, how did you hear about all this? It was in the papers, just a paragraph saying it was an, there was an inquiry. I read it on the boat train. Warned off. I can't believe it. Oh, Gary. Gary. There, there. Oh, shut up, you silly old thing. Oh, Carrie, you won't do anything stupid, will you? Not likely. Hello, John. How's the appendix? Look at him, Molly. He had an operation today. That was the only laugh I got at the inquiry. Oh, Gary, how could they? No, darling, they were very fair. They couldn't go behind the letter, and that was the beginning and end of it. Well, now, who wants to buy a cottage? With or without Hilkett? You're not selling Damon. Have to, old thing. Where will you live? I mean, what are you going to do? Oh, get away out of the country, grow oranges in California, or cattle in Alberta. <laughs> I know a man who has a ranch for sale. Well, don't be silly. I was only speaking figuratively. No, I should go to the continent. And in the years ahead, you'll meet a strange, old-looking gentleman in rusty black babbling about Rangemore and Ascot, and you'll know it's poor old Gary Anson who's gone off his chump. <laughs> oh, Gary. <laughs> uh, excuse me a minute, will you? I, um, I, I've left a book in the car. <laughs> Dear old John, ever tactful? But look here, Molly, you mustn't worry about this business. I'll clear things up. Gary, I don't want you to go abroad or anything amongst strangers. Oh, not without taking someone with you, at least. Not anybody you love very much, but somebody you like. Someone who do things for you, who won't bore you, you know. I mean, you haven't got to be in love with them or anything. You, you know. I, I... Yes, Molly, I know. <laughs> now, off you go, my darling. And we'll talk about it tomorrow. All right. I'll go out this way across the garden. I couldn't face your cop like this. Hide. Good night. Come in, John. Oh, it's been an interesting day. Was my statement any good, Guy? You nearly got me warned off without Wender's letter. How's the bank balance? What there is, is good. Oh, thank God for that. You still got your little nest egg? My dear fellow, I wish you wouldn't ask questions. Oh, sorry. Oh, don't forget I owe you five and a half thousand. You know, wicked old devil. No, thank you. You're not making me a present of five and a half thousand. Well, don't be ridiculous. Who ever heard of a bookmaker giving money away? Now, Gary, is there nothing I can do? Nothing. I'm warned off. It'll be in the calendar. The stewards of the jockey club held an inquiry into the running of Rangemore in the Ascot Stakes, and having heard the evidence, have warned Captain Gary Anson... Oh, shut up, for God's sake. It was all my fault. If I hadn't said... No, John. It was the letter. Wenda swore she'd never had the second note. That settled me. Do you mind if I ask you something? This isn't a case of spite, is it, because you've dropped her? <laughs> oh, she was never mine to drop. No, it's hatred because she played me a dirty trick, and she hates herself for it. Ah, uh, your money. She had it, and she's gone back on you. No, she uh, lost it. 
Now, don't let's talk about her. She never lost anything in her life. She's in my book for 600. She owes you 600 pounds? Well, not only me. She's known as Mrs. Neverpay. Good Lord, she's a remarkable woman. God, the pluck of it. Well, what are you going to do about it? What can I do? I threatened to sue her, but uh, of course I couldn't do that. Oh, she probably panicked and sent a letter to the stewards. And there was never anything between you? No. Oh. If only I'd taken the number of that note. Do you think it's gone back to the bank? Why not? She could easily have rubbed out the message. The more I think about it, the more I think I was a fool not to call Hilkert to give evidence. That's what I say. Oh, damn it, man. When will you learn to knock at doors creeping about? I'll have to make you wear army boots. Oh, well, if you're not satisfied with my uh, service... Hilkert. The... Hilkert. Do you remember my writing a letter on the back of a banknote? Yeah. The first day of Ascot? Yeah. I'll edge you the pencil. Uh, this one. I marked my shirts with it for years. Marked your shirts with it? On the collar. You know what happens to a shirt of the laundry, don't you? You send out a new shirt, you get back a pair of old drawers. It's a copying pencil, then? Yeah, that's right. It's indeliable. Good Lord. Then the message on the banknote won't rub out. And if she couldn't rub it out, then the chances are that the note hasn't gone back to the bank. Cool. What's the matter with you? I'll bet it's in that tin pot safe of hers. Safe? What safe? She's got a safe in her bedroom. I've seen it. You mean you've been in Lady Paniford's bedroom? Yeah, that's right. Her housemaid showed me round the house. Mind you, I mean, I've seen hundreds of them safes before. Jag, jog, jig, jug. What exactly does that mean? Bag, beg, bog, big. Are you drunk? Oh, I wish you meant it. No, I'm talking about a safe. Sit, sot, set, sack. A combination safe of three letters. <laughs> Do you get there in the end? Yeah, you've only got to try 30 combinations. Did you ever open one in your professional career? I've opened a dozen. Well, uh, that'll be all, thank you, Hubert. Uh, bring some more whiskey, will you? Oh. Well, well, all right. Well, what do you think? It's pretty desperate. It's a pretty desperate situation, old son. Is she staying the night? As far as I know. Is Willie there? I don't think so. He's gone to town. You think she's still got the note? Yes. Yes, I do. She could no more destroy a £100 note than I could smash this decanter. Then there's nobody in the house. Not really. Although it'll be a tricky business. I don't even know which is her room. Still, not to worry, Hilcutt does. Are you sending him to, um, do the job? Send Hilcutt? Of course not. That would be a dirty trick. He's got two convictions already. Oh, I don't suppose he'd do it, then. Do it? He'd jump at it. No, I'll, I'll do it myself. Well, I'm not a very good burglar. But... You're a bookmaker, and that's the next best thing. But I am very good at holding ladders. Here's the whiskey. Finish your chat, have you? Helcott, which is uh, Lady Paniford's bedroom? But don't you know? Helcott? It's uh, in the left wing, looking towards the lawn. It has two casement windows. There's a little dressing room built out in the front. And there's a gardener's ladder hanging against the potting shed. It's easy. How do you know all this? Well, it's a matter of habit, you see. Yeah, not I ever thought of doing anything wrong. And your <laughs> sentiments do you credit. Now, where is the safe located? In the wall, between the bed and the window. Do you want me to do a bust? No, Hubert, bless you, I do not want you to do a bust. I'll do all the busting that's necessary. Now, you just show me the layout. Well, look here, um, roughly, um, there's the front of the house. Mm -hmm. There's uh, another bedroom there, and the dressing room is there. Mm -hmm. Now, there's the window. Now, inside, there's the bed. It's a very nice bed, too. It's all covered with cupids. Uh, and, um, uh, and there's a safe. We can't see it, mind. It's hidden behind a little picture. Picture of what? Young women. They've got no clothes on. It opens on a hinge. Now, listen, Captain, I could do this job for you. You're going after that hundred, aren't you? No. Well, it's not a job for an amateur. Now, Hilcott, you know nothing about this. About what? That's the idea, Hubert. Now, then. What do we need in the way of clothes? Hmm? Rubber overshoes, thin gloves, a torch, and a thick pair of socks to put on top of the ladder. Makes less noise. Do we want, um, oh, what's it, uh, what do you call it? Jemmy. <laughs> do me a favour. You don't even need a paper knife. Now, um, I'll go back to the kitchen and sort out that combination. Well, when do we do the deed? Now. It's got to be. I've got to get to Garth and Innsbruck in order to stop that notice. The calendar's due to be published tomorrow afternoon. I've got to stop that notice. Uh, oh, I forgot about this. How many times have I told you not to come in with that... What is it? Well, I found it in the cupboard under the stairs. It's old Hassan's pocketbook. You remember? 
He lost it, ask a week. No, thank you. I'll give it to him tomorrow. Here we are. Oh, look out. You, uh, you dropped something. Oh. Oh, it's a hotel bill. I don't know. You've been looking through this? Well, I had to, didn't I? I mean, uh, how else did I know who it belonged to? Well, I'll be damned. Yeah. What is it? Oh, uh, oh it's nothing that need concern you, John. Uh, now, let's get started, shall we? Hi. Hi. Don't go flashing that light about. Well, anybody about? Nobody. There's a bloody great newest sort of park in the lane. And it's got no lights either. Who's got any sutter around here? Johnny Lassan. That's a funny place to leave a brand new car. With no lights. I say, there's another car over there. That's Willie's. Now, what the devil? Well, everyone's leaving cars about tonight. Come on. I've got the ladder out. It's all clear. It wasn't changed or anything. And I've got the socks on the end for you. Right. Off we go. <laughs> Damn. Oh, what a bloody silly place to leave a thing like that. Oh, oh, oh here. Well, let me give you a hand, John. <laughs> oh, what's the use? You two ought to be on the halls. Anson and Dory, a laugh, a song, and a cucumber frame. Burglars? <laughs> I've shot them. Hubert, home. Now, at once. Go on. Some blokes have all the fun. Anyway, the ladder's up against the wall. You can't go wrong. Or can you? Good luck, Captain. Thanks. Now, off you go. Ready, Gary? Yes. Up we go. Uh-uh. Not we, old boy. You. I'll stay here and hold the ladder. Anyway, we've probably woke my whole household by now. Is the lady a light sleeper, by the way? I wouldn't know. Oh, really? Well, come on. Up you go. Let's get the whole thing over with. to open my safe. Yes. What do you want? A certain £100 note. Get out of here before I call somebody. You needn't bother trying to telephone. I've cut the wires. Now, open that safe. You get out. I'll call Willie. I shouldn't if I were you. Just open that safe. Gary, don't be a fool. You're drunk. Look, come over and, and talk about it tomorrow. No, by the morning that note would be burnt. I want the £100 note now with a message written on the back. I'll see you dead before I give it back to you. Will you open that safe? I'm damned if I will. What's happening at four this morning? I don't know what you mean. I notice that your alarm clock is set for four o'clock. Will you go? I'll, I'll call Willie. Call him. You're blackmailing me. Yes, I am. Now, to see this? What is it? Something to go in your safe when it's opened. A pocketbook containing an hotel bill. The Adelphi Hotel, Liverpool. Mr. and Mrs. Sundridge. Somebody kept it as a souvenir and then lost it. Oh, you beast, how could you? And the combination of the safe? S-I-N. S-I-N. Well, I should never have thought of that. Now, let me see. S-I-N. There we are. Now, what have we here? No, you don't. What? Now. Oh. Well, well, what do you have to say now? <laughs> Here's 15,000 pounds of the 20,000 you lost. And the banknote message you never received. All right. Give me that book. Oh, Wenda. How could you do it? Give me that book. You fool. If you'd wanted money. If I wanted money. Who are you to sit in judgment on me? I hate you. I've always hated you. You had no right to give me the money. You knew I was poor, that I that I hated poverty and had a sort of a husband. You tempted me. The only kind of temptation a man like you could offer me. Now, will you 
Will you give me that book and get out? Shh. Where does Willie sleep? He's in town. He's not. His car's in the drive. You, you're trying to frighten me. Oh. Window! Window, open this damn door, you. You've got a man in there. I know you've got a man in there. Open the door or I'll break it in. What are you going to do? Nothing. I'll do it. I'm going to open the door. Oh, you can't. Ah, Hanson. I guessed it. Willie, what is it? What's going on? I've known this has been going on for some time, and I've caught you now, Anson. Now, don't make a fool of yourself, Willie. You thought I'd gone to town, didn't you? My God, if I had a gun, I'd shoot you, you swine. And as for you, you lying little... Oh, Willie, when you've quite recovered from your hysteria, will you see that a burglary is committed? <laughs> don't tell me a lot of it. Oh, shut up! There's been a burglary. What? Burglary? And I'm being a good neighbour. He's right, Willie. Really. Look, the safe's been opened. What? Well, are you satisfied? But, 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 but what's Anson doing here? If it comes to that, what is John Dory doing here? John Dory. He's going on. I say, You're John, just step up and meet a friend of mine, will you? All right. Oh. That's that, then. What do we get? Tell me, oh my God! It was John that spotted the ladder and suggested we came over to investigate. Uh, yes. Uh, I... Any sign of the burglar, John? What? Oh no, no, none. Oh, I've been an ass. I'm, I'm sorry, old girl. I'm, I'm sorry, Anson. Molly, I, I shan't see you in the morning. I, I've got to make a long journey tonight. But will you dine with me tomorrow night? Of course. Come along now, Willie. Let me get you a drink. Yes, well, I'd better cut along. Are you coming, Anson? Oh, I'll go down the ladder and help John put it away. Oh, yeah, yes, of course, good idea. I don't want a fellow coming back, do it? Well, uh, good night. Come along, Willie. I'm terribly sorry about all this, Gary. I, I really am. I'm afraid you'll just have to put it down to panic and hysteria. You'll marry Molly, of course. I always thought you would. <laughs> I'm sorry you haven't got back all your money. But our friendship was worth £5,000, I think. <laughs> anyway, I've taught you something about women, haven't I? Well, goodbye. And, uh, good luck. Here you are at last. I've been waiting ages. Sorry to be so late. I stopped off in town. And you won't have heard. About Wenda. What about her? She's gone. Left with Henry Lassan early this morning. They must have gone straight to the continent. Poor Willie. He was heartbroken for almost an hour. There'll be a divorce, of course. Good Lord. What's that you've got there? Oh, it's the very latest edition of the calendar. And here, you see, this blank space? The printers had to saw off the tops of the type with a chisel. Well, that's my warning off notice. Oh, how marvellous. But how, but how did they do that? <laughs> it's a long story, but I advise you never to get a jockey club steward out of bed. But all's well that ends well. Oh, darling, I've just thought of something awful. What is it? Wouldn't it be too frightful if we were to meet Wendra on our honeymoon? <laughs> darling. <laughs> now, who the devil? Come in. Do you want dinner now? Hellcut, you gave me quite a start knocking on doors like that. What's come over you? You never used to do it. Oh, well, if you don't like what I do, I'd better give my notice. I've been thinking about it for some time. Uh, you the... can't. It's not your turn. Oh, can't. Uh, now, yeah. look, stop arguing. Take this and put it somewhere really safe. What's that, then? Well, that's what should have been my warning off notice. Do you know, Molly, I've just had an idea. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have this calendar framed. Oh, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> like the cucumbers, eh, Gump? <laughs> In The Calendar by Edgar Wallace, dramatised by Barry Campbell, the part of Captain Gary Anson was played by Philip Bond. Lady Wenda Paniford by Sylvia Sims, Sir William Paniford, Peter Jeffrey, Hubert Hillcott, John Hollis. Molly Paniford, Joanna Wake, John Dory, Stephen Thorne, Henry Lassan, Nigel Lambert, Mr. Ray, David. This is our first play in the Murder for Pleasure series, 
We present The Case of the Frightened Lady by Edgar Wallace, adapted for broadcasting by Cynthia Pugh. And as I was saying, Totty, I don't like the look of it at all. Oh, blast. Tanner speaking. Oh, good morning, sir. The Marks Priory case. Yes, I'm working on it now, sir. Sergeant Ferriby has just come back from his preliminary inquiry. Uh, have I seen what? Oh, the piece in the paper this morning. Yes, I have indeed. Well, sir, we're doing our best. I can't say more. <laughs> Complicated, I'll say it is. All right, sir, I'll come and see you as soon as I've had Ferriby's complete report. Thank you, sir. Uh, goodbye. Oh, damn these press busybodies. Been on the chief's tail, have they, Inspector? You're yeah, right, they have. Now, where the hell is Ferriby? I thought he was coming straight up. Probably stuck in the lift. Oh, there you are, Ferriby. Well, come along inside. Oh, I'm sorry if I'm late, sir. I caught the first train, but it wasn't all that early. I thought country folk got up with the lark. To milk the cows, my good Totty, not to travel by train to the wicked city. <laughs> all right, Ferriby, sit down and tell me how you got on. Uh, Totty, you can take notes. Very good, sir. Well, sir, I spent a couple of days in the village and did a bit of snooping around the park where the murder was committed. What you mean is where the body was found. Huh? Well, it's not necessarily the same thing, my lad. All right, go on. At the same time, I checked up on Briggs' statement. Briggs? Oh, the leg who said he knew something about the murder. That's right. Says he was in the village on the night of the murder and that he actually saw the victim. Have you seen Briggs yet, sir? I'm having him sent over from Wormwood Scrubs. He should be here any moment. All right, go on, Ferriby. Who else is in the picture? Well, I didn't actually go up to the Priory, sir, but I met Miss Crane down in the village. Oh, Miss Isla Crane, Lady Lebanon's niece. Uh, yes, that's right, sir. A very pretty, charming young lady. Uh, and frightened out of her wits, if you ask me. Frightened? Why? Well, your guess is as good as mine, Totty. But one reason may be that she's got to marry young Lord Lebanon. Got to? Who says so? She told me so herself, sir. It's obvious she can't see anything in him. Well, nobody could. He's such a little weakling. There's the title, don't forget, chum. Title? Well, that wouldn't influence a girl like Miss Crane. No, oh, charming, intelligent, beautiful. It looks as if you've fallen for it yourself. All right, that'll do, Toddy. Kind of keep your wise cracks for when you're off duty. When? And let's stick to the point. So, Miss Crane's frightened, is she? Of someone or something. All right, note that, Toddy. Yes, sir. We've got to get a move on over this case. The chief's been on to me already over this newspaper article this morning. Did you see it, Ferriby? Uh, no, sir. My train left before the papers arrived. Oh, where did I... Ah, here we are. Uh, read it out, will you? It'll help recap what we've got so far. Uh, uh, there is no further development in the Marks Priory mystery. Those seven weeks have passed since the young chauffeur, William Studd, was found strangled on the lawn not a hundred yards from the house. Stud had evidently been returning from a fancy dress ball which had been held in the village hall that evening. He was dressed in Indian costume. Uh, this is the 15th crime since the beginning of the year that the police have failed to solve. You can skip that bit if you don't mind. What puzzles me is why the Indian get up? He'd been to a dance, Totty, a fancy dress affair. But why Indian? Why not a Piro? Something original. Why was he killed at all? Well, it wasn't a jealous husband or anything of that kind. I checked most carefully. He hadn't even got a girlfriend. The body was found by Dr. Amersham. Yes. What was he doing in the Priory Garden at two o'clock in the morning? That's what I'd like to know. Ask me, why don't you? You? I've been doing a bit of research on my own account, rooting about in the files and so on. And what have you found that we don't know? The doctor's been to India. <laughs> My good Totty, even the village policeman knows that. Yes, but Dr. We... Amersham went out at Lady Lebanon's request to bring her son back to this country. Young Lord Lebanon had had a serious go of fever. Ah, but here's another thing. Well? Amersham's got a record. What? It's on the file. Drive into the public danger, find ten pounds, license endorsed. <laughs> that doesn't make the man a hardened criminal. But uh, if you really want to make yourself useful, Totty, take a look outside and see if there's any sign of Briggs yet. Very good, sir. Hmm. Thomas Henry Briggs, alias Walters, alias Thomas, alias Smith. That's the fellow. He's done time all over the world, and now he's serving the first part of a sentence in Wormwood Scrubs for uttering forged banknotes. Well, what on earth was he doing in a little Sussex village? I'd have thought his kind of racket went better with back streets in big cities. Mm, maybe he was on his way to Brighton, or even the continent. Oh, yeah. Anyway, he must have had some reason for making this statement. Well, he may have read about the case in the paper. They do see them inside, don't they? Oh, yes. 
He asked to see the governor and made this statement, which I've got in front of me, but I have a feeling it isn't complete. Briggs is here, sir. Oh, right, bring him in. Okay, Constable, we'll take care of him. Come along, Briggs. But don't hurry me, Constable. Oh, I've had enough to put up with what with these early stars and all. Oh, I feel quite faint. Could I have some brandy, do you think? Never lose hope, do you, chum? You can have a cigarette, Briggs. Uh, unlock those handcuffs, Totty. But I'm afraid that's the most we can do for you. Oh, that's better. Here, have a light. Oh, tar, Governor. Now then, Briggs, I want you to expand a little on this statement of yours. Expand? You were in the village of Marks Thornton on the night of the murder. I was, sir, more's a pity. That's what I made a statement about, see? Always been on the side of law, I have. All right, all right. Get on with your story. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I went there for a few days for a change of air. Oh? I'd been poorly, see. I'd been that way once before, and it's a nice little place, I thought. I put up at the White Art, and a gentleman called in his car. Now, if he put them counterfeit notes in my bag, sir, he put them there without me knowing anything about it. Innocent I am, innocent as an unborn babe. Nonsense. You went down there to collect some notes from a snide merchant. Don't know what you're talking Listen, about. Listen, I haven't brought you here to discuss the rights and wrongs of your sentence. I want you to tell me what you know about the Marks Priory murder. If you don't know anything about it, you can go back to the scrubs. Well, sir, after this gentleman had called at the White Art, I went for a bit of a stroll. It was late at night and pretty dark. I was sitting on a stile smoking my pipe when I saw a figure come along. And it gave me a regular turn. Oh, why? All in white it was, dressed up like an Indian. Yeah, that'd be the man who was murdered. Was he alone? Yes, sir. He passed me by without a sound and then turned off up a little lane. It ran along beside the field where I was sitting on the stile, if you follow me. I do, just... I right, go on. About five minutes after, I'd finished my pipe and I was just knocking it out when I heard a scream. It made my blood run cold, it did. Where did it come from? It seemed to come from the wood at the far end of the field. I hopped off the stile and looked around. And I saw a man coming towards me across the field. The moon had come out through the clouds and I, I could see him quite plain. And what did he look like? Mm, about my age he'd be, with a little brown beard and he was puffing rather, as though he was out of breath. I shouted, who's there? And he called back, it's all right, it's Dr. Hammersham. Here, could I have another cigarette? Have one of mine. Oh, thank you, uh, Sergeant. Just a minute. There's nothing in this statement of yours about Dr. Hammersham. Ah, oh, well, now, sir, I didn't put everything in my statement, sir. Why? Because I thought if I did, you wouldn't want to see me. And I had never seen Scotland Yard before. What you mean is you wanted a day out? Oh, no, sir. Well, go on. What about Dr. Amerson? Uh, the thing is, I've got a wonderful memory for voices. And as soon as this chap spoke, I remembered him. You'd met him before? That's right, sir. In Calcutta. We was in the same prison together. Dr. Amerson was in prison? Yes. Uh, I suppose you mean he was the prison doctor? No. No! Him and me was awaiting trial together. He was an army doctor, see, and he got into trouble over a check. A little matter of forging another officer's name. <laughs> Talk about coincidence. Oh, what do you mean? I was up for the same sort of thing, only he got off. I did hear the authorities squared it to avoid a scandal. You're not inventing this by any chance? True as I'm sitting here, sir. Lester Charles Amersham, that was his name. He was dismissed from the army. A cashier, do you mean? Oh, have it your own way. Don't know what became of him after that. Some said he'd gone off to Madras and married a half-caste woman. But he was all lashed up, like I said. But he was guilty, all right. And that's the fellow I saw on the night of the murder. I see. Well, thank you, Briggs. That's all very interesting. If you'll go along now with Sergeant Totty, he'll see you've got a cup of tea before they take you back to the scrubs. Tea? You talk about gravity. That'll do. Come along now. No justice, no sense of common decency. Well, he's given us food for thought, sir. He has indeed. Oh, Lord. I've got a lecture to the new recruits in 20 minutes' time. The super asked me to talk to them about a typical case. <laughs> As if any case was typical. Well, why not talk to them about the one you're on now, sir? It'd be a change from ancient history like Crippin. My dear Ferribe, I wasn't quite old enough to be on that one. Uh, no, no, of course not. Uh, but wouldn't it be more, well, interesting for them to be in on one that isn't solved yet? Hmm. Uh, you could call it the case of the frightened lady. 
Uh, that'll make them sit up and take notice. Uh, I believe you've got something there. Yes, it would refresh your memory to recap what we've got so far, and they might even have some ideas of their own. <laughs> I doubt it. Got a dim-looking lot if ever I saw any. But I haven't had time to prepare anything else, so I think I'll take your advice. Come in. Excuse me, sir. Could you see Lord Lebanon? Lord Lebanon? Is he here, then? He came into the superintendent's office, and the super asked if I'd bring him along to you. Very nervous, he seems. What does he want, do you know? No, I don't. I gather it's private. Oh, all right, show him in. I expect you and Ferriby have got plenty to do. Okay, sir. Would you come in, sir, please? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, oh, good morning. Oh, how do you do, Lord Lebanon? How do you do? Oh, Ferriby, take his lordship's hat and stick, put them in the outer office. Uh, certainly, sir. Sure. Good Lord. That chap doesn't look like a detective. No? I'd have taken him for a gentleman. Well, very likely he is. Oh. Uh, sit down, won't you? And tell me what I can do for you. Thank you. I, I take it you are the fellow in charge of this case. I, I seem to have seen you before. You have indeed, Lord Lebanon. I met you when I was down at Mark's Priory. Uh, my name's Tanner, Chief Inspector Tanner. Oh, yes, of course. I, I remember now. I say, do you mind seeing if there's anybody outside that door? People don't listen outside doors of Scotland Yard, you know. Oh, really? How on earth do you find anything out of them? We have our methods. Uh, why do you ask? Well, well, people listen outside doors in your home. Is that what you mean? It's not altogether unusual. Um, oh, this is very embarrassing. Embarrassing? Well, you see, I, I only made up my mind last night to come to Scotland Yard, and I'm here. I, I don't know how to begin. Well, let me begin, then. I certainly never expected to see you here, but since you are, I hope you'll be able to help me clear up one or two little mysteries which puzzle me. Oh, but you understand I've no right whatever to question you, but, well, since you've come of your own accord, I hope you'll help me. Go on. Well, now, there are quite a number of people at Mark's Priory who are under suspicion. Including my mother? In a sense, yes. I think she must know a great deal more than she's told us so far, but I'm thinking more particularly of a guest in your house, Dr. Amersham. Yes, he's a mystery man to me, too, to be frank. I detest him. Oh, why? I dislike him so much, I, I find it difficult to be fair. Somehow or other, my mother has got herself involved with him. Involved? Well, all this goes back a long way, you know. Oh, yes. Things were different while my father was alive. He was a hopeless invalid. I'd heard that, yes. Never left his room for 15 years. Dr. Amersham was his medical attendant. I see. Well... I knew he'd been in India before that, but I, I didn't know then that, that he'd left under a cloud. Oh? No. At first, he, he used to strike me as rather sycophantic towards my mother and myself, but gradually a change came over him, and he became very domineering. You know, interfering in things which didn't concern him. Yes, I understand. Well, go on. Uh, owing to my father's illness, uh, the things were pretty quiet at home. In fact, deadly dull. I, I used to dread my school holidays. I'm afraid I... None of the family pride that both my mother and my father had. Mother in particular. To her, every, every stone of the priory is sacred and family tradition. Well, I believe she'd die in defense of it. Well, that feeling's not unusual in old families. But to live with it, I tell you, it's stifling. Uh, so, when my regiment was, was ordered out to India, I was delighted to go... And uh, I had a wonderful time out there. Well, when Father died, I suppose I ought to have come home, but I was enjoying myself, so I didn't. Then I had this bad attack of fever, and Mother sent Dr. Amersham out to bring me back. Did you find things very much changed? Terribly. Amersham was practically the master of Mark's Priory. And there were two great American toughs who were supposed to be footmen. One's called Gilda, and the other Brooks. Whatever they are, they certainly aren't footmen. Mm. Uh, what other changes did you find? Well, there's my mother. She seems to be entirely under the domination of these two fellows. I can't imagine why. And finally, there's Miss Crane. Oh, Miss Isla Crane? Yes. I see. Uh, isn't she some sort of relation of yours? That's right. Uh, a distant cousin. She's lived with us for years. Her family is desperately poor, and Mother has always made her some sort of an allowance. As a matter of fact, I, 
I'm going to marry her. Really? I don't particularly want to. Oh? Oh, she's very pretty and all that, but I, I don't want to marry anybody. Uh, but Mother says I've got to. Got to? Why? I don't know. She, she's a very nice girl, but there's something odd about her now. Well, how do you mean? Well, she's frightened, Mr. Tennant. Terrified. Ever since that infernal murder, she'd been scared out of her wits. Well, it's not altogether surprising. She walks in her sleep. I've seen her. I was, I was having a quiet drink in the hall before going to bed, and, and suddenly, there she was, walking slowly down the stairs in her nightdress, and her eyes wide open, staring at nothing. It was terrifying. What exactly is she frightened of, do you think? I don't know. Perhaps it's those two American fellows. They certainly give me the creeps. You know, if I go out of my room at night, I don't sleep very well since my illness. There they are, hanging about in the corridor. It gets on my nerves, I can tell you. And uh, what about Dr. Emerson? I loathe him, as I said before. Apart from the way in which he seems to dominate my mother, there was that scandal in India. Uh, something about a forged check, I believe. No, it wasn't. Oh? No, it was to do with a Eurasian girl. I said, do you mind seeing if there's anybody outside the door? My dear Lord Lebanon, I assure you there isn't... Oh! And who might you be? You must excuse me, sir. Who killed her? Uh, his lordship left home without his cigarette case. I took the liberty of bringing it to him. How did you know I was here? Oh, I happened to be passing this building. I saw you going in. Why were you listening at the door? And who allowed you to come up? Well, the policeman on the door said his lordship had gone to see Inspector Tanner. Well, I guess I didn't remember which room he said, so I was trying to recognize his lordship's voice before disturbing you, sir. Uh, your case, my lord. Good day, gentlemen. Well, talk about cool. Give me a reception desk. Uh, Jackson? Inspector Tanner here. A man just left my office, a big American chap. Have him followed and report to me where he goes. Oh. Which one was that? Gilda. I tell you, one or other of them is always following me about. Well, we've disposed of him for the moment. Let's go back to what you were telling me about Dr. Amersham and the Eurasian girl. Well, she was... Found in his bungalow. Strangled. What? It's true. And what's more, there was a piece of red cotton cloth round her neck. Just like the stuff they found round my poor chauffeur. Stud. Hmm. Very interesting. And is that why you came here, to tell me this? Partly. And also, I don't particularly want to die, Mr. Tanner. Do you think there's a chance of your being killed? Eh? I don't know, but there's something going on that I don't understand. I mean, Stud's death, he, he was really my only friend in the house. These two American thugs, my fiancé, who was obviously frightened. It all adds up to something, but I don't know what it is. Who's the heir to your property? Well, I always thought some cousin in America, but not long ago, Mother told me that, in fact, Isla is the heir. Miss Crane, that's right. I see. Mr. Tanner... There's a whole lot more I could tell you. Couldn't you come down to Mark's Priory yourself? I mean, I've got diaries and notes I could show you. They'd give you much more detail than I've been able to remember. Besides, you'd feel the atmosphere, and you'd know I wasn't exaggerating. I'll come down at the end of this week. Oh, thank you. You won't breathe a word to my mother about all this, will you? I don't want her to think I've been disloyal to her. Probably she's as much under Amersham's thumb as I am. Don't worry, I'll be the soul of discretion. Yes? Excuse me, sir, but the men have gone into the lecture hall. I thought I ought to tell you. Right, Totty. Well, if you'll excuse me, Lord Lebanon, I've got to cope with a bunch of new recruits. Ah. I'll see you at the weekend. In the meantime, try not to worry. Thank you, Inspector. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, so much for the household at Mark's Priory. <laughs> now, I want you to listen very carefully. On the night of August the 18th, there was a fancy dress ball down in the village. Stud, the chauffeur, and three other servants attended that ball dressed in homemade costumes. Stud chose that of an Indian. Why, sir? Why? Well, he'd been a soldier and had served in India. He, he may have brought back an Indian costume. Anyway, he knew how to make himself look like an Indian. Okay? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. 
A stud left the ball rather late and was seen by the village constable. He was also seen just before he went into the field by a man whom I interviewed this morning. Stud was found next morning strangled with this. Now, as you can see, it's a piece of red cotton cloth of Indian manufacture. Now, notice the little metal tag in the corner as the trademark of the maker. Now, the body was found between two groups of rhododendrons and had evidently been dragged there by the murderer. Now, the only other person in the field that night, and why he was there, nobody knows, but I'm going to find out, was Dr. Amersham. He had also at one time served in India. Yes, what is this, Sergeant Totty? Big pardon, sir. Urgent message. Well, he can wait a minute. Amersham had a bad record. And when you come to examine the murder of Stud, you have to realize that not only was the doctor in Mark's Thornton, but that he was actually in the field and seen there a few minutes after the murder was committed. In fact, everything points to him. Not now, it don't. Will you shut up? Now, the body was discovered in bushes about 50 yards from the west wing. Almost exactly where they found the body of Dr. Amersham half an hour ago. What? He'd been strangled. All right, quiet. I'm, I'm sorry to have to break off here, but you understand the position. Disperse as quietly as you can. Totty, get Ferebeer and meet me at the car. We must go down to Mark's Priory right away. Hey, Brooks. Yeah? How much longer we got to hang around here? I don't know. All I know is Lady L said to repair to the scene of the crime and wait and see what happens. <laughs> Wants us to keep an eye on the text from London and then report back to her. That's right. From London. What I wouldn't give to be there. This place gets me down. Oh, we're paid well to be here. Anyway, we couldn't go back to the States. You know very well there'd be a hot seat waiting for the pair of us. All right, still... After all these years? Uh, you know the FBI. They never let up on a case. God, the police are just the same in England. You can be sure of that. Well, that's what I don't like about it, Gilda. There's such a thing as extradition. And if we're caught over this little oh, affair... pipe down, can't you? Here. Here. Have a cigarette. Oh, thanks, chump. Beats me, you know. What does? His lordship running off this morning like that. Lady Hell was mad as hell when I told her. Yeah. It's lucky we spotted him making for the station. You know, I only just managed to nip into the train as it was pulling out. He, he nearly spotted me at Victoria. And I had to pretend to be tying my shoelace. What made you think he was going to Scotland Yard? I didn't know where he was going. He got into a taxi. Well, luckily, there was another one on the rank, so I hopped in and I said, follow that cab. I thought that only happened in the movies. Yeah. Well, I nearly dropped dead when I realized where we landed up. Scotland Yard. I sure didn't want to go in there. Well, I pitched a yarn to the fellow at the desk and he swallowed it. Well, you followed back here, do you think? Nah. I told you before, these guys, they're pretty slow off the mark. Well, look at the time they're taking to get here. Well, I wish they'd step on it. It's cold hanging around in this wood. You got cold feet. That's what's the matter with you. Is that a car? Listen. No. Now you think too much, Brooks. All you got to do is keep calm like me. Don't shake like that. Nobody's going to kill you. That's a car coming now. Yeah. yeah I'll take a peek through the hedge. See if I can see them. Yeah. Yeah, this'll be them. It's a big black sedan with a wireless aerial. If they're cruising slowly along looking for the gate, it, we better get under cover. Stop out your cigarettes, you fool. They might see the smoke. Yeah, okay, yo. Come on. Come on in here. Yeah, the cover's, cover's nice and thick. We can get out through the wood when the coast's clear. Nip back to the house. Well, this is the place, all right. You got the gardener's statement with you, Totty? Yes, sir. The back gate leading to the greenhouses. That'll be this one. About 50 yards in by some rhododendron bushes. Over there, sir. 
Look, there's a chap waving. Oh, one of the local coppers. All right, officer, we're on our way. It's a clear case of strangulation. You got the photographs, Trotty? Yes, sir. Made a good job of them, that local chap did. Could you come over here a moment, sir? Uh, what is it, Fellaby? While you were seeing the doctors off with the corpse, I was having a look round. Do you see these wheel marks? I do indeed. Looks as though the car had been driven off the gravel onto the grass for quite a distance. And then look, you, you can see where it came off the grass and back onto the gravel again, pointing towards the house. There's a patch of oil along the road, sir, and I found a couple of matches and a broken cigarette. Look, an American cigarette. Now, keep that, Totty, and the matches. Yes, sir. Now, let's go up the drive and see if we can find any footprints coming from the grass onto the gravel. If we find them at all, they'll be just above the place where the car left the road. Yeah, there was no sign of a struggle where the body was found. You think he was attacked in the car, sir? That's beginning to look like it, yes. Where is the car, if it comes to that? Well, the chief constable told me it was picked up in a lane about two miles from the village. They're supposed to be bringing it along. Ah, that'll be it, I think. Uh, go and tell the driver to stop there, Totty. I don't want these tracks confused. Yes, sir. Uh, and have a look on the road and uh, see how far it corresponds with the marks on the drive. Right, sir. Yeah, it's lucky it rained in the night. Kept the marks nice and clear. Well, come on, Fellaby. Let's follow these tracks and see where they lead. Well, Totty, any luck? It's the same car, sir, no doubt about it. There's a chip out of one of the tire treads, plain as anything it is. Did you find any footprints in the car? No, but there's a deep scratch on the boot. Here, look. Hmm... Yes, the car's closed now, but my theory is that at the time of the murder, it was open. Somebody jumped on the back and made that scratch. Yeah. Look, the hood's been closed so clumsily that all the straps are hanging loose. Mm, and the clips in the hood haven't met. I think you've got it, sir. As I see it, the murderer put the cloth round the victim's neck at the point where the car left the drive. That would account for us going onto the grass verge. Yes. Then whoever killed the doctor drove it back onto the gravel where that patch of oil is that you noticed, Totty. Yeah. Whoever it was took out a cigarette. And broke it and threw it away? That's right. Took out another and lit it after two attempts, your two spent matches. And then drove the car to the place where it was found. The question is, why on earth did the murderer leave Amersham's body in Priory Fields when he could have taken it in the car and disposed of it? Or at any rate, removed it from the scene of the murder. Didn't the chief constable say something about the local coppers having seen the car pass? Yes, at half past two. But the hood was up there and he didn't see the driver. But it did establish the time. Now, Amersham left Mark's Priory around midnight. He was killed within two minutes of leaving and dragged over to where he was found. Here, let's have another look at the car. The dashboard clock's been smashed. And there's some mud scratches on the windscreen. Now, when the cloth went round his neck, he must have thrown his foot up to get a purchase. Those are his footprints you can see on the windscreen. There's a deep mark on the carpet just here, like a heel print. Yes, that's where he was pulled out of the car. Let's go back and look at that oil patch again. Yes, I thought so. Look, there's a long mark in the grass. It leads straight to the bushes where the body was found. Yeah, that's that then. No, I think it's about time to put in an appearance at Mark's Priory. Come on, you two. Come on. Yeah, come on, Brooks. We've seen all there is to see. We'd better get back to her ladyship. Hmm. Beautiful room, this. You can have it. Too drafty. You have no soul, Totty. No feeling for antiquity. I like comfort, that's all, Ferriby, and comfort don't go with all this stonework and armor. Fair gives me the creep. Don't talk nonsense. Oh, I asked that old butler chap, uh, what's his name? Kelber. Kelber, to send those two footmen here. Go and see if they're outside. Okay, sir. Yeah, now we here. Come in, will you, both of you. Now, come over here where I can see you. Ah, I've seen you before, haven't I, Gilda? Yeah. How long have you been here? Eight years. 
You were here in the days of the late Lord Lebanon. Yes, sir. A footman? Yes, sir. Got an account at the London and Provincial Bank, haven't you? Oh, that's very clever of you to find out. Yeah, I have. Very unusual, isn't it, for a footman to have an account at the London Bank? Well, some of us are thrifty. A pretty substantial balance, I hope. Three or four thousand pounds? Oh. oh well, I've speculated rather wisely. What's your salary here? It's quite a good one. All right, Gilda. Now, your name's Brooks. Yeah. An American citizen, too? Yeah. But I haven't got a bank account. Some of us American citizens have lost a lot of money lately. You've been here very long? Six years. As a footman? Sure. Why is a man like you in service? Well, I guess I'm naturally servile. What's that scar on your face? Huh? Oh, uh, that was done a few years ago. I got in a little rough house. Were you a footman then? I guess I was. Uh, I'd like to talk to you later. Sure. Does that apply to me also, Captain? No. Do you know this house very well? Every inch of it. Well, Lady Lebanon said I might see over it. Perhaps you could show me around. Yeah. If I can spare the time. I think we can arrange that. All right, you can go, both of you. Okay, okay. If they're footmen, I'm... Ah, here's old Kelva now. Have you all you require, Inspector? Yes, thank you, Kelva. Tell me, what do they do, those two men? Uh, they wait on her ladyship, on his lordship, and on Miss Grace. Oh, is that the lady I saw on the lawn? Yes. Uh, ask her if she would mind seeing me, will you, Fenneman? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Kelva, you heard nothing last night? No, sir. No scream or shout or anything? No, sir. You remember the night the chauffeur Stud was killed? Yes, sir. I remember it. You heard nothing then? Uh, no, sir. If you remember, I told you when you were here at the time. That is her ladyship's desk. Yes, I know. To your knowledge, were there any visitors here uh, in this room last night? No, sir. None of the servants, for instance, told you about uh, somebody calling quite late? No, sir. Will that be all, sir? Uh, for the moment, yes. Very good, sir. Totte, how often must I tell you not to do that? Shh. Look, coming down the stairs, Lady Macbeth herself. Oh, yes. Good afternoon, Lady Lebanon. Ah, Mr. Tanner, isn't it? That's right. Uh, this is my assistant, Sergeant Totte. Oh, yes. Tell me, Inspector, will you finish your inquiries today? I don't think so. I have booked rooms for you at the White Hart. Oh, thank you. I had already booked them. Oh. You told me I might look over the house. Of course. I'll ring for Brooks. He will show you around the house. But the man appears to have been killed in the park. The man? Dr. Amersham. Yes, he was killed in the park. Well, this house is in the park. It's quite possible somebody may have heard something. It would be interesting to find out. Very. You rang, my lady? Oh, Brooks, show Mr. Tanner over the house, will you? Sure, my lady. You will excuse me, Lady Lebanon? Certainly. Come along, Sergeant. Now, I can get rid of that car. Fire's burning nicely. There. That will soon be gone. Oh, Kelva, come in here a moment, will you? Yes, my lady. Shut the door. When are those detectives going? They gave me the impression they wouldn't be leaving for some considerable time. Where is Miss Crane? Uh, she was on the lawn, I understand. One of the gentlemen went out to bring her in. One of the police officers? Yes, my lady. The young-looking one. Ask her to be good enough to come to me. Yes, my lady. If your ladyship will pardon me, I did wish to speak to you on rather an unpleasant matter. Oh? Unpleasant for me, that is to say. Well... Tomorrow is the end of the month, and I would like your ladyship, with all due respect, to accept my notice. 
soon notice. Why? Your ladyship is aware of the very distressing happenings, uh, sensational, if I may call them so, that have brought us a great deal of undesirable publicity. That is hardly any affair of yours, Calvert. Uh, pardon me, my lady. In all the years of my service, I've never had my name associated with matters which were... Your ladyship will pardon me if I describe them as being of vulgar public interest. Tell me, Calva, in what way do these affairs affect you? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, look askance at an upper servant who has figured even indirectly in a murder case. Uh, two murder cases, my lady. Very well, Calva. I presume you would like to leave at the end of next month. If your ladyship pleases. I suppose Brooks and Gilda have something to do with this. I'm almost reconciled, or, or shall I say hardened, to these two persons. If they are rude to you. Oh, I assure your ladyship that they've always been most polite and with the limited means at their disposal obliging. I assure your ladyship that I have no criticism to offer. Very well, Calva. Now go and find Miss Traden for me. Very good, my lady. Oh, I... Beg your pardon, my lord. All right, all right. Ah, oh, Willie, I wanted to see you. Oh, I was just going down to the village. That can wait. Come here. What is it, then? Why did you go to London this morning? Because I damned well wanted to. Willie. Oh, sorry, Mother, but really, you treat me as if I were a baby. You went to Scotland Yard. Now, that was very tiresome of you, Willie. Why did you go... There are things happening in this place that are getting on my nerves. I mean, I'm not a child. If there is anything the police should know, you may be sure they will know it without your help. It was extraordinarily stupid of you, and it hurt me very much. As for Dr. Amisham... Yes. Now, what do you think about that, then? I am not going to discuss it with you. Did you tell the police anything about him? I told them he was a queer bird, and I didn't understand him. I told them there was a lot of things I didn't understand in this house. I don't understand Gilder. I don't understand Brooks. are the most extraordinary pair. Are we to have all that again? Wish to God I'd never come back from India. Now, listen. You will not go to London again unless you ask me. And you are not to speak to the police about anything that happens in this house. You understand? Yes, Mother. I would like you to try to conduct yourself with a little more dignity. Policemen and people of that sort are not the kind of men that the 19th Viscount Lebanon can make friends of, you know. I don't know. They're as good as I am. All this family nonsense. You know, that fellow Gildo came up to Scotland Yard. He did it on my instructions. Is that sufficient? Yes, Mother. Very well. Where is Isla? Saw her outside. She was talking to one of those fellows. Which fellows? One of those detectives. As a matter of fact, I saw him in Scotland Yard this morning. Quite a gentleman, he seems. Hmm. Oh, I want you to sign some checks while you're here. Blanks again? I will fill them up. Oh, isn't it rather stupid? You never give me a check to sign with any figures on it. I do feel I ought to know something about what's sign going on. Sign four, please. All right. That will be sufficient. One. Two. Three. Four. Thank you. And please be careful not to bluff them. Mother, I don't know anything about business, but this is a terribly dangerous method. What are these for? Excuse me, my lady. Oh, did you find Miss Crane, Calva? Yes, my lady, but she was talking rather confidentially to the young policeman, and I didn't like to interrupt her. Tell Miss Crane I wish to see her at once, please, whether she is talking or not. Yes, my lady. Mother... What are we going to do about Isla? I don't wish to discuss Isla. You don't want to discuss her, but you want me to marry her, so I should have thought I was entitled to discuss her, however odd she is. Odd? What do you mean? Well, of course, she's very sweet and agreeable and all that, and she is a sort of relation, but I'm not in love with her, and I shall never be. What did you mean by odd? Well, she is. Walking in her sleep, frightened of her own shadow, jumps when you talk to her. Well, she's very highly strung, that's all. Well, I think she's odd. Did you want me, Lady Leavenworth? Yes, I, I do. You can go, Willie. You've been talking to that fellow, Isla. Who does he think murdered poor old Anderson? Willie, you can go. Hmm. Seems to be the only thing I can do in this house. Now, Isla... 
What is the matter with you? Nothing. Well, that is, I... I opened the drawer of your desk this morning and I found a little red scarf there with a, a metal tag on it. Why did you open the drawer of my desk? I wanted the checkbook. Why do you keep that scarf there? My dear child, you're dreaming. Which drawer? This one? Yeah, there's nothing there. You mustn't let these things get on your nerves. These things? How can you speak so lightly about it? A man killed like a brute? I hated him. I loathed him. He was always so beastly with me, but nevertheless... I... You mean he made love to you? Amersham? I can't go on staying here. I can't do it. I sent your mother her quarterly check on Monday. I had such a charming letter from her this morning. She said how wonderful it was to feel safe and secure after the hard times she'd been through. You know I wouldn't be here a day if it wasn't for her. She doesn't know what I'm doing. She'd rather starve. Don't be a little fool. I am doing you a very great service. When you are Lady Lebanon, you will find me very broad-minded about your married life. Very broad-minded. You understand that? And now, about that young policeman. I hope you weren't in this state of nerves when you were talking to him. No, of course I wasn't. He's very charming. I'm sure he is. He talks very pleasantly. What is his name? John Ferraby. Ferraby? One of the Somerset Ferrabys? Lord Lesserfield's family? Hmm. The man who put the leopards in his quarterings. Quite without authority. I believe he does come from Somerset. Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't know him, Isla. But, of course, you mustn't speak to him about, uh, well, Amersham. If he asks you questions... He hasn't asked me anything. We were talking about people we knew. But Mr. Tanner will ask me questions. What am I to tell him? My dear, you will tell him just what it is necessary he should know. Uh, oh, I, I, I beg your pardon. Oh, don't go, Mr. Ferraby. My niece was just telling me you are related to the lesser fields. Uh, oh, well, yes. Yes, he is a sort of relation of mine. Oh, very, very distant. One doesn't worry about that sort of thing when one has to earn a living. Ah, you should. It's the finest thing in the world to be a member, even a cadet member of a great family. To know that your stock has continued in authority through the ages and will go on through thousands of years. <coughs> Tell me, does Lord Lesserfield still quarter the leopards? Uh, quarter the... Hmm. Oh, oh, in his coat of arms. Uh, yes, yes, I believe he does. Now, that is very wrong of him. Very wrong. I don't think well of him for that. <laughs> Good Lord. She belongs to the Middle Ages. No, she belongs to this age. Quartering and coats of arms. I thought that stuff was dead. Miss Crane, do you mind if I ask you a question? I told Lady Lebanon that you didn't ask me any questions. And I'm letting you down. Well, it's, it's quite a friendly question. Well? Why are you so nervous? Am I? Yes, you are. All the time you seem to be looking around as though you expected something horrible to appear over your shoulder. <laughs> I I'm afraid of the police. But why? No. It's what happened last night I'm afraid of, really. Yes, I understand that. But you've been like this for a long time, haven't you? Who told you? Haven't you? Miss Crane, I wonder if I could be of any service to you at all. I wish I could. Do you really? I do indeed. I suppose you want me to confide in you officially. Well, I ought to say yes. My job is to worm out every little secret you've got, but well, I'd hate myself if I did it. Well, I, I have no secrets. Do you know, you're, you're not my idea of a policeman. Of oh, that may be rude or complimentary. I think I'd rather it were rude. And, and Sergeant Totty isn't my idea of a sergeant. Sergeant Totty's a very brave fellow. He got his promotion for tackling two armed burglars single-handed. Really? Mr. Ferraby, what do you mean when you, you say that you'd like to be of service to me? What, what could you do for me? Well, well, I could probably take away the cause of your fear. You're not really frightened of the police, are you? Of you? Well, I wasn't thinking as an individual, but as part of the machine. The coffee won't be afraid of me. Why not? 
I don't know. I, I, I suppose you could be, but you're much too sensible. Now, you're not really afraid of me, are you? No. Nor of the police. Nor of anything. What is it? There's someone on the stairs. Oh, I'll go and see. No. Well, there's nobody there. Are all you people afraid of being spied on? When Lord Lebanon came to Scotland Yard, he had the same fear. Miss Crane, there's something in this house that's got you all down. What is it? Come away from that desk, please. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. Was there something there? No. Well, what could there be? <laughs> what a fool I am. Why, I don't wonder you think I'm a nervous wreck. Tell me, is Mr. Tanner very clever? Best detective at Scotland Yard, I should think. He's got an uncanny instinct for the truth. I, I wonder... Do you think he suspects anybody? Everybody, I should imagine. Listen, uh, suppose someone knew who committed this horrible murder and, and didn't tell the police. Is that an offense? I mean, would it be a crime? Yes. Yes, the person who knew might be charged with being an accessory. Oh, my God. Any man or woman who knows anything ought to tell. Has Inspector Tanner questioned you? No. It might be easier to tell me. Uh, I don't know. Why should I know? You think because I'm jumpy. Well, well, don't these things get on your nerves? What, cases like this? Yes. Well, no. Rather unfortunate if they did, wouldn't it? They really don't matter to you? This case matters. Why? Oh, well, it, well, it does a lot. Uh, I suppose you've got a, a very matter-of-fact name for this dreadful thing. Case number six or something like that. No. To me, it's the case of the frightened lady. You mean me? Yes. Naturally, I'm frightened. My nerves aren't like yours. Something's burning. A, a, a piece of cloth. Anybody dropped a cigarette on the carpet? I, I don't know, have they? Well, it, it seems to come from the fireplace. Yes. Yes, somebody's been burning stuff here. A piece of cloth. Look, you can still see the fiber. You can smell it now, can't you? No. Yes, I, I don't know. Hello? What are you burning? What's this in the grate, Totty? Well, looks like a bit of linen. I'll poke it out of this. No, no, don't touch it. Do you see that little bit of metal where the corner was? It's melting, but you can see it. Yes. Yes, I see it. Where's Tanner? Still upstairs somewhere. Who put that on the fire? Do you know, Miss? No. Uh, put what on the fire? It couldn't have been there long. The flame only just have reached it when I smelt it burning. Ever seen a rig cloth about this house with a little metal tag in the corner? No! I, I never saw anything of the kind, ever. Well, well, well. She's very emphatic. I'd better see if I can find her. Much too emphatic. Hello? Someone else has smelt something. Is there something burning here? Have you put anything in this stove, Kevra? Uh, no, sir. I never replenish the fires. I know, but do you put anything on them? No, sir. Is there anything I can get for you, sir? No, no. Nice old house, this. Have you been here long? Eighteen months, sir, but I'm leaving next month. To better yourself? It would hardly be respectful to her ladyship to say I was. But I don't like this part of the country... To be perfectly frank with you, sir, it hardly adds to my prestige to be associated with this crime. Naturally. Nice lot of servants here? Oh, yes, sir. Two fine, strapping footmen. As you say, sir, they are very strapping. Good servants, I suppose? Uh, well, yes, I have very little to do with them. How long have they been here? They were before my time, sir. Good fellows in the servants' hall? They never come to the servants' hall, sir. They go on duty when we are locked up. Oh, I, I see. When you are locked up. <laughs> Sounds as if you got into a bit of trouble. Oh, no, sir. The servants' quarters are in the east wing. From eight o'clock, we are not in this part of the house at all. Oh, I see. That's funny. You mean you couldn't get here if you wanted? Exactly, sir. You get many people here at nights? I'm not able to tell you that, sir. I've got an idea that Dr. Amersham used to call here a lot. I believe he did, sir. But I never saw him here at night. I suppose you've heard all sorts of funny noises, haven't you? No, I haven't, sir. Ever come down in the morning and saw signs of a barney? I beg your pardon. Any signs of a lot of people being here, having a thick night, illicit recreation? Well, sir, 
It's, it's hardly becoming in me to discuss my employer's affairs, but there was one morning. Oh? Well, I'll tell you the truth, sir. It looked as though there'd been a free fight. Some mirrors were broken and a chair smashed and wine glasses thrown about the floor. And Gilda, the footman, had a black eye. And I'm told that I've only got the word of poor Mr. Studd to go on. That's the chauffeur who was killed? Yes, poor fellow. I'm told that Dr. Amersham was rather the worse for wear the next day. There is certainly something happening in this house, sir, which I cannot fathom. His lordship is treated as though he had no existence. His wishes are ignored. In my opinion, he is nothing better in this house than a prisoner. Oh. They never let him out of their sight. I have had instructions. Instructions I very much resent, though they have been given to me by her ladyship. I have to listen to any telephone call he makes. Yes. If he has a servant he trusts, that servant is discharged. The only man with whom he was friendly was Stud, who would have done anything for him. Stud was murdered. I've never expressed my suspicions before, and I trust Mr. Totty, or should I say Sergeant? Sergeant. I trust this will go no further. There is something in this house, some dreadful force that is beginning to get on my nerves. I would gladly sacrifice a month's salary to be able to leave tonight. Oh, I, I, I didn't know anyone was in here. Anything wrong, miss? No. No. I, I, I just remembered a book I wanted. You look very white. Do I? Do you want me, miss? N no, Gilda, I, I don't want you. Oh, I thought I heard you call out. I didn't speak. Would you go, please? I... I don't want to, I tell you. Right, thank you, Brooks. Hello. What's the matter with Miss Crane, Totty? She came flying in here as if somebody was after her, and then this bird came in. You know, you look ill, young lady. You want to see a doctor. I don't want to see a doctor. I I'm all right now. I, I was rather upset, but that's understandable, isn't it? Did Gilda frighten you? No. Nothing frightened me, really. I see. Well, Gilda, we don't want you for the moment, understand? Okay, Gav. Okay. Odd, isn't it? Very odd. Did Ferriby find you, by the way? No. Something we wanted to show you. Oh, blast. Here's her ladyship. It'll keep. No, Willie, you are not to go down to the village. Oh, very well, mother. Well, Mr. Tanner? Has Brooks shown you over the house? Every room except one, Lady Lebanon. The lumber room on the first floor. The lumber room? One of the best positions in the house. It's a queer place for a lumber room. Well, really, it's a store where I keep one or two valuables. Your man has the key of it? No. It was the room where my husband died. It hasn't been opened since that day. Oh, I say, Mother, well, I'm sure I've seen it open. You are quite mistaken, Willie. That room has never been open, and you've never seen it open. Well, I'd like to see it open. I'm afraid you can't. I'm afraid I must insist. Well, there's nothing there but a few pictures. Nevertheless... I should have imagined that the scope of your inquiry lay outside this house. The scope of my inquiry lies just where I wish it to lie, Lady Lebanon. Honestly, Mother, I do think he's right. Will you be quiet, please? Oh, very well. It's obvious I'm in the way here. Yeah. You realize, of course, that I can get a search warrant. It would be outrageous if you did. No magistrate in this county would grant it. Excuse me, sir. Well, Sergeant? I'd like to ask this lady a question. Who burned a scarf in that stove this afternoon? A scarf? A scarf with a little metal tag in the corner. I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. You can still smell it. The ashes are still there. Yes. I can see the metal tag melting on the coal. Well... If something has been burnt, I haven't the least idea who burnt it or what it was. Uh, I'm afraid uh, I'm responsible, my lady. Uh, yeah, I found some odd bits and ends of stuff lying on the carpet and I put them into the stove. Oh, of course. I was cutting out a doll's dress for the village bazaar. Do you remember, Isla? Yes. It was very foolish of you to put those pieces into the fire, Gilda. Yeah, I'm sorry, my lady. Oh, there you are, sir. I was looking for you. Uh, Totty's told me all about it. Thank you, Ferriby. Oh. Uh, take Miss Crane out, will you? I want to talk to Lady Lebanon. Uh, certainly, sir. Uh, come along, Miss Crane. You look as if some fresh air would do you good. Well, yes, I, uh, I think it would. There's another thing I'd like to know. Well, perhaps I'll find it out for you. All right, Gilda, you may go. 
Follow that man, Totty, and keep your eye on him. It'll be a pleasure. Do I understand you have something to ask me? Yes, about the murder of Dr. Lester Amersham. I think I've told you everything I know. I don't think so, Lady Lebanon. When did you last see Dr. Amersham alive? I didn't see him this morning. Well, that I realize. He wasn't alive this morning. Now, the medical evidence is that he was killed last night, probably about midnight. When did you last see him alive? Yesterday morning. Oh, oh it may have been the day before. He was here at 11 last night, probably until within a few minutes of his death. He was here in this room, talking to you. You have been questioning my servant. Naturally. Well, I think it would have been more proper if you had come to me first. Well, I have come to you, and you've told me it was yesterday morning you saw him, or it may have been the day before. Now, here's a man murdered. It's rather an impressive fact. I don't follow you. Well, if you had a friend who soon after you saw him met with a fatal accident, wouldn't you say immediately, why, I was only speaking to him an hour before. Dr. Amersham was not a friend. He was a very self-willed man who saw nobody's point of view but his own. So the fact that he was murdered within a few hundred yards of this room really doesn't matter. That is a little insolent, Mr. Tanner. You may call it what you like, but doesn't it strike you, Lady Lebanon, that your own attitude is peculiar? I won't say arrogant. Look, I am a detective officer investigating the murder of Dr. Amersham. You tell me you can't remember when you saw him last, although he was with you up to a few moments of his death. You suggest that you can't fix the time because he was not a friend of yours, but just a self-willed man. If he wasn't a friend, what was he doing here at 11? He came to see me as a doctor. At your request? No. He dropped in. At 11 o'clock at night? I had a touch of neuritis in my arm. But you didn't send for him? No. He just guessed you had neuritis and drove down from London in his car to treat you. Did he write a prescription? That is a matter which concerns me. He left you at 12 and drove down the long avenue. That's what you call it, isn't it? Halfway down, somebody jumped on the back of his car and strangled him as he sat at the wheel. I know nothing whatever about that. The car from which he was evidently dragged was found abandoned at the other side of the village. Oh, really? I'm not interested. Lady Lebanon, you've known this man for years. He was a constant visitor, your own doctor and friend... And you're not interested in his brutal murder? Well, I'm terribly sorry, of course. It, well, it was an awful thing to have happened. Well, I'm glad you think that. What did Dr. Amersham know? I don't understand you. Your last words to the doctor as he left the door were these. Tell them if you dare, and don't forget that you're as deeply in it as anybody. You've always wanted to handle Willie's money. Well, they may not be the exact words, but they are the sense of the words. What was he deeply in? What did you dare him to tell? My maid told you, of course. An untrustworthy girl to whom I gave notice this morning. If you listen to discharged servants, Mr. Tanner... I listen to anybody. That's my job. How long was your husband, the late Lord Lebanon, ill before he died? Fifteen years. Who attended him? Dr. Amersham. Although he was ill so long, he died rather suddenly, didn't he? I've got the particulars of the certificate here. It's signed by Lester Amersham, MB, MRCP, MRCS. Now, during his illness, you administered your husband's affairs, uh, you and Dr. Amersham. Yes. Why did you marry again? That isn't true. You married Lester Charles Amersham at the Petersfield Parish Church three months after your husband's death. Why did you keep the marriage secret? Who told you? Somerset House told me. Well? It was forced on me. He blackmailed me into marriage. Oh, how? He blackmailed me. That's enough. Well, what hold did he have on you? Had you broken the law? I know that he had. He was a thief and a forger. And he was kicked out of the army. He was here last night at 12. He threatened you and was killed a few minutes later. And you're not very interested. Why should I be? I'm glad he... You're glad he's dead? And then you suddenly remembered something. And you weren't so glad. That's absurd. Now, as to your first husband, Mrs. Amersham... I shall be glad if you will call me Lady Lebanon. 
who saw the late Lord Lebanon after his death? Dr. Amersham. Did you? No. Did anybody else? Gilda and Brooks. Nobody else? No. They did everything. No outsider was called in. I see. And the doctor signed the certificate. Ah, this morning, my interest in this case was academic. Now, I'm very interested in you and in this house. And in the room which you say is never opened. Have you got the key? I've got an idea. I may be wrong. That Dr. Amersham's hold over you had something to do with that locked room. Now, am I right? No. It had something to do with my past. It took an effort to say that. But it isn't true. You're one of those people one reads about. Blood proud. Oh, by the way, you must be a Lebanon yourself. How wonderful of you to realize that. Yes, I married my cousin. I go back in direct line to the fourth baron. Amazing. The family has come from most ancient times, Mr. Tanner. Before there was a history of England, there was a history of the Lebanons. And it will go on. It must go on. It would be wicked if the line were broken. Amazing. You said that before, Mr. Tanner. Well, it's getting late. I don't think I can do very much more tonight. I have a few inquiries to make in the village. Perhaps if you come tomorrow, we'll show you our mysterious room. Goodbye, then, Mr. Tanner. I'll collect the sergeants. It's getting dusk. I'd rather not walk across the priory field in the dark. Are you going, Mr. Tanner? Mr. Tanner is staying at the White Park. Oh, Kelda, will you put this into the safe? Yes, my lady. Don't go tonight. For God's sake, don't go. Have you got a car, Mr. Tanner? I've decided not to go just yet, Lady Lebanon. I hope you don't mind. I see. No doubt you know what you are doing. cold in here. Shall I put some coal on, my lord? Yes, would you please, Sergeant? Yes, get drafty, these old houses. I wish we had central heating, but Mother won't hear of it. She's furious at your staying tonight. She went for me and said I was responsible, which of course I wasn't. But I'm very glad you are, all the same. Thank you, Lord Lebanon. Oh, by the way, where's Miss Crane? Oh, she's gone to bed, I think. She's not terribly sociable. I'm going to have a very dull time when I'm married. She's awfully kind and all that, but honestly, we have nothing in common. I'll, I'll tell you who else are, are sick about your staying. Uh, Gilda and Brooke. Uh, if you must hang about, Gilda, you can make yourself useful and bring us some drinks. Uh, what would you like, my lord? A whiskey and soda? Yes. Uh, should I bring one for you, Mr. Tanner? Yes, please. And me, if you don't mind. Okay, Sergeant. Lord Lebanon... Do you remember telling me this morning that you hoped to be alive to see me if I came to Mark's Priory? Now, what did you mean by that? Have you had any sort of threat, or has anybody attempted to hurt you? No, not directly, but there was a jamboree here one night. Somebody smashed the furniture, broke up the glass. Yes, I, I know about that. Oh, when was this? Some time ago. It was Kelber who told me about it. The place looked as if there'd been a pretty wild party, didn't it? <laughs> I wish there were a few wild parties... This place is like a mausoleum. And after the wonderful time I had in India. You know, I've hardly spoken to a girl since I've been back. Except Isla. Oh, by the way, have you got a portrait of your father? Hmm? No. And funnily enough, there isn't one in the house. Really? I came across a snapshot taken in the grounds. He was in his invalid chair. It must have been taken a couple of years before he died. Mother snatched it out of my hand and burned it. That was an odd thing to do, wasn't it? No, my mother does do odd things at times. Have they ever kept you out of the way? Mm -hmm. I mean, have you ever had a feeling of being kept out of the way while something was on? Sometimes, yes. And, and I'll tell you how they keep me out of the way. I was in here after dinner one night and uh, Gilda brought me a whiskey and soda. Now, I remember drinking it and the next thing I remember was waking up in my room in the dark. The door was locked. I tried to get out. I, I had a splitting headache. And when I came round and they came up to me, they said, 
And I'd fainted. Well, I never fainted in my life. That was the night of the party. They tried to tidy up before I got down, but they couldn't hide it all. There you are. Did they explain what had happened? Not a word. Why aren't you in bed, Willie? Really? Where is Gilda? Oh, I've sent him for a drink, Mother. I'm afraid we're being a nuisance to you, Lady Lebanon. I'm afraid you are, Mr. Tanner. You would have been so much more comfortable at the White Hart. Where is Mr. Farabee? I hope he's been sensible and gone to the inn. Oh, Farabee's making a few inquiries in the village. He'll be back very soon. Here's your drinks. How often have I told you to bring in the decanter and the cipher? Willie, damn it all, Mother. It isn't civilized. Have you discovered anything new, Mr. Tanner? No, nothing at all. Willie, I think you should go to bed. All right, Mother, in a few minutes. Come with me, Gilda. There's something wrong with one of the library windows. Shut the door, Gilda. Do you think we can get rid of these men? I'm afraid not. And Brooks is getting cold feet. Says he's going to quit. Now, these texts, they're frightening him. Do they frighten you? I'm frightened of nothing, ma'am. I'm in it now, and I'll go through with it. Tell Brooks there'll be a thousand pounds for him if we get this thing over without discovery. You think we will? We must. Now, listen. What I want you to do is this. I say, Tanner, would you mind tasting this whiskey? Oh, of course. Ugh. I've tasted yes. stuff like that before. Bitter? Yes. Does yours taste like that? No. Oh. But I'm not drinking this. Let's see what it does to the flowers. They must be planning something for tonight, and they want me out of the way. I wonder what they're going to do to you. They'll do nothing to us. Don't be too sure. Amersham was confident, and look what happened to him. Well, I suppose I'd better get off to bed. Go with him, Totty, and see him safely to his room. Right. Lead on, my lord. Oh, there you are, mother. Good night, Willie. Good night. You know your rooms, Mr. Tanner? Yes, thank you. I suppose you'll be waiting up for Mr. Faraday? Yes. Well, good night. I'll leave you to lock up, Gilda. Yes, my lady. Oh, by the way, Mr. Tanner... If you want to get into the grounds during the night, there's a small door here into the rose garden. I'll show you. Oh, thank you. Hey, hey, Brooks. Yeah? He didn't drink that stuff. Well, sure he didn't drink it. You made it too strong. I told you he'd taste it. Oh, he's getting wise to it. Has he been talking? Yeah, somebody told him about the rough house and Tanner questioned the boy. He knew he'd been doped. Well, that's serious. Did you talk to her? Yeah, there's nothing to worry about. Says you. There's a hell of a lot to worry about. I don't like these English cops. They're getting wise to what's been happening here. I'm getting scared. If the truth comes out, we might get a life out. Shh. Here's the sergeant coming back. Hello, the brothers Mick and Muck. Is there anything I can do for you, sir? No, thank you. I suppose you'll be up all night. Well, if you're going to be up all night, sir, we'll be up all night. Now bring the tray with you, Brooks. Okay. Ah, well, I could do with a nice cup, eh? Oh, Mr. Totty. Oh, uh, uh, me lady. Mr. Tanner has gone into the garden. I do hope you'll be comfortable. Thank you very kindly. Uh, Mr. Totty, I was rather rude to you this evening. Think nothing of it. I'm very sorry, but I was a little distrait. It's the weather. Oh, yes, I suppose so. Uh, you are a sergeant, aren't you? Uh, that's right. Will you forgive me if I ask you whether you receive a very large salary? I mean, yours must be a very important job. Well, uh, it's important, but they try to crab it. To... Oh, yes, <laughs> to disparage it. Uh, yes. I should like to know just what is happening and what the police think about this case. I suppose there are things arising every few minutes. Clues or whatever you call them. Oh, yes, I've had a few myself. Have you? Well, uh, in a way. I suppose when you make a new discovery, you tell Mr. Tanner. Naturally. He was very curious. Rather stupidly so, I thought, about that room I didn't want him to see. Do you remember? Yes. 
Perhaps he's not quite as clever as you are. Well, uh, I wouldn't altogether say that. Suppose you went to him and said, I've seen inside this room, and there is nothing there but a few old pictures. Now, that would satisfy him, wouldn't it? It would save me a lot of bother. I dare say it would. One feels so helpless against trained and skillful men from Scotland Yard. Naturally, they see something suspicious in the most innocent actions. And it is nice to know that one has a friend at court. Well, good night, Sergeant Totty. Good night, milady. Uh, one moment. You've left your money behind. I don't remember leaving any money behind. Better take it, milady. You never know when you may want it. I was hoping you might want it. After all, 200 pounds. It's rather a pity. You never said a truer word. It is rather a pity. What's rather a pity? That I don't want a couple of hundred pounds. <laughs> she doesn't want that room open. I never imagined she did. And she offered you money? She left it behind. I called her back and gave it to her. And what did she say? Well, what could she say? She doesn't want that room opened. Well, we'll open it tomorrow. All right, Toddy, let's relax for a moment. What's your theory? They're using this place as headquarters for a gang. Oh, nonsense. What do they want a gang for when they have all the picking in the world? Lebanon paid over 300,000 pounds in death duties. It costs them a bit to die, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, hello, Ferebe. Well, you were quite right about Amersham. He's got a fire reputation in the village. He's been paying alimony to quite a number of unofficial wives. I saw one of them tonight. You know, that man had everything except taste. Uh, do you want particulars? No, no, they'll do in the morning. I wonder if she knew. Who? Oh, nothing. Uh, help yourself to a drink, Phoebe. Uh, uh, no, thanks. I suppose Miss Crane has gone to bed. She has, old man. Oh. Mm. This is a horrible place, isn't it? I don't know, boy. I've seen worse. Do you remember that night we spent at the cat's meat shop waiting for Harry the Fiddler? Oh, yes. Called lover duck. Cats used to follow me about for weeks after. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I prefer almost anywhere to this place. The whole house seems full of ghosts. Quiet. Look. It's Miss Crane. Walking in her sleep again. The cloth is here. In this drawer. It ought to be burnt. Here, I say. Shh. Where's the cloth? It ought to be burnt. You killed him with that. I saw you come into the house with it in your hand. Where is that cloth? It was here. It must be burnt. I saw it in your hand. Who, who is it? It's Lady Lebanon. Just a minute. Is anything the matter? No. Do you always sleep with that light on? Yes, lately. It's very bad for you. I loathe this room. Why, you've never said so before. It's got secret doors, hasn't it? I heard Mr. Tanner talking about it. Where are they? The man who planned this room, Kersey Lebanon was his name, was rather eccentric. He never saw anybody. They used to pass his meals through a panel. Isla... You must wake up. I want to talk to you. I'm so awfully sleepy. Why did you lock the door? You walked in your sleep again tonight. Did I? Oh, I wish I didn't. I never did that before. Before what? Before that terrible night. When the furniture was broken and Dr. Hammersham. Oh, I thought he was killed. If you hadn't come down, you'd have seen nothing. What time is it? Just after two. Haven't you been to bed? No. Isla, anything may happen tomorrow. I may be... Listen, I want you to marry Willie. Do you hear me? Well, 
Today. Today? But we couldn't marry at such short notice. I've had the license here for a week. Why today? Willie is the last of the Lebanons, the last link in the chain. He's a weak link. Oh, there was another weak link, Jeffrey Lebanon. He married his cousin Jane Sycamore. She left him at the altar, but she had several children. How dreadful. No. Jane was the greatest of the Lebanon women. You realize you are a Lebanon? Whatever happens, your children will be Lebanons. When you are married to Willie, they will bear the Lebanon name and the line will go on. If you find your married life with Willie impossible, you will find me very understanding. No, I can't do you it. You not only can do it. There's somebody in the corridor. It's Gilda, I think. He has been outside your door all the evening. These men are getting out of control. I may not hold them after tonight. That is another reason. Gilda must not know you are going to be married. That is the one thing he must not know. You understand? Now, go to sleep now. And remember what I've said. damn ways into this room. Shh. Now she's dead asleep. Well, if you touch her, she'll wake, and if she wakes, she'll raise hell. Quiet. Now she's right out. Yeah, I think she's doped. Hey, come on. Help me get this mug round her. Yeah, yeah. Now that's it. Where are you gonna take her? To my room. Does Lady L know? Not to hell with her. I'm gonna have my way tonight. Look, if there's any trouble tonight, by God, I'll shoot. I'm not gonna take any more risks. Hey, my gun's gone. You were a fool to have a gun on you. You sure you had it? Yeah, I had it all right. Oh. Yeah. All the world knew you had it. Look, I warned you about that. Now, come on, help me lift her. Get over my shoulder. That's it. Yeah. I'll carry her out. You stay here, straight in the bed. Yeah, okay. I swear I had that gun on me. Who put that light up? Gilder? Is that you? Well, put on the light. Put it. It's nearly a quarter to three. Uh, it's getting cold in this room, eh, Toddy? I'll say it is. Where are those footmen? Oh, I haven't seen him for nearly an hour. Where's Therabee? He's in the grounds. I let him out through the garden door just before I went to bed. Better him than me. I'm glad he's not sitting up. I don't want to talk about Miss Crane all night. Who's it? Oh, it's you, Gilda. What's the matter? Oh, could you come, sir? It's Brooks. There's been an attempt on him. What? Well, someone tried to strangle him with this red scarf. Good God. Where is he? In Miss Crane's room. I rushed in and fell over him. Miss Crane, she's gone. Oh, where's she? Well, she's somewhere in the house. Very likely she changed her room. She, she was rather nervous tonight. Totty, go and look for her. Okay, sir. Come on, Gilda. I'm no oh. funny business. Well, what's all the excitement? There's been an attempt on Brooks' life and Miss Crane's missing. Go after Totty and Gilda. They're looking for her. All right. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, my lord. Well, that's all right. I said, did, did you hear anything? Where's my mother? In her room, I should imagine. What did you hear? Mm. Oh, a sort of choking noise. Somebody else was attacked tonight, weren't they? I believe so. I know. I wish it didn't happen. You know, Brooks wasn't a bad fellow. Oh, he's not dead. Not? No. Oh, I'm so glad. Inspector... Don't you think it's about time this line was wiped out? This line? I don't understand what you mean. This sort of thing has been happening for heaven knows how many years. The Lebanons have always been like that. My father was like that. He was 15 years in that room. Mad as a hatter. Yes, I guess that. But he never strangled anybody. The other first time I saw it done was in Pune. A little chap slipped up behind a big man and put a cloth over his neck. And... By God, he was dead. 
fascinating. I tried it on a, an Indian girl. She went out like that. Extraordinary, isn't it? Yes, very. You, um, see, this scarf. I've got dozens of them. I brought them back from India. I'm not a big fellow, but I'm terribly strong. You feel my arm. Mm, quite a muscle. Yes, people would never dream it about me. They say, oh, look at that little whippersnapper. Of course, they made an awful fuss about this Indian girl. The fellows in the regiment didn't realize I had the strength to do it. It was tremendous surprise to them. And these babu people had to be squared, and Mother sent Amisham to bring me home. You know those two fellows? Well, they used to look after my father. Of course, they're not real footmen. Yes, I guess that. They sort of... Uh, well, they look after me. You understand? Yes, I understand. You know that room my mother wouldn't show you? Well, that's all padded, you know, rubber cushions all around the walls. I have to go there when I realize things. When you get a little tiresome. When I realize things, I know what I'm saying. You know, when I'm quite well, I'm mad. I don't realize anything. It's only when I get excited that my brain gets clear. Don't touch me. <laughs> I want a light. Come on. Be the perfect host. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Thank you. My mother has been marvelous. She's been administering my father's estate when it should have been under commission. Whatever that means, you know more about the law than I do. And she'd have got into awful trouble. Why were you so unkind to Stud? Stud? The chauffeur. Oh, yes, I'm terribly sorry about that. He's a good fellow. But I'm afraid of Indians. Why? Well, some of them tried to kill me. They were very angry about this Eurasian girl. Poor old Stud. He didn't know about this beastly ball at the village. And I, I saw this Indian and I was horribly frightened. I'll show you something. You swear you won't tell anybody. I swear. Look. A gun. The first one I've ever been able to get. I took it out of Brooke's pocket. It was rather clever, wasn't it? I've always wanted one. You can't strangle yourself, you know. It's rather difficult, and they look so ugly. Sometimes I think that the whole line ought to be wiped out. All their escutcheons and their shields. Carry on the line. That's what Mother's always saying. Isn't it ridiculous? What? Uh... Whom do you mean? Me? Why do you say that? Well, I've got a boy about your age. You don't like me, do you? Yes, I do. I'm a very good friend of yours. No, you're not. I was very nice to you at Scotland Yard. So you were. Yes. Clever of me to go up there, wasn't it? I mean, that was the last thing you'd expect. The very last. I wonder where Gilda put her. Who? Isla. She was looking awfully like that Indian girl this afternoon. I went up behind her and put my arms around her. Didn't you hear her run down the stairs? She... she knows about me. That's why she's frightened. She came downstairs the night I smashed up this place. Well, I don't remember doing it, but I suppose I must have done it. I nearly got the Amersham that night. And last night... When I did get him, she saw me coming back into the house. I'm terribly strong. You wouldn't think so, would you? Oh, yes, I would. The first time I saw you, I thought, this fellow's pretty powerful. Did you really? Yeah, smart, aren't you? I say, I've worried them tonight by not drinking that bromide. You know, there are lots of ways of getting out of that room of mine. They don't know, but I do. I fooled them lots of nights. Yes, I expect you fooled them pretty often. <laughs> Well, I'm going to bed. You're not going to bed. You're pretending you're not scared, but you are. I frighten people. Well, I'm not frightened. Now, be sensible and give me that gun. Why do you want to fool about with a thing like that? Well, there are lots of things I could do with this gun. I could end the line with it. Willie, what are you doing? 
Give me that gun. No, I won't. I've always wanted one. I've asked you dozens of times. Give it to me. I've told him. I've told him everything. Give it to me. No. No. Let me have that. No. No. What is it? What happened? All over, I'm afraid, Miss Crane. Well? He's dead, poor Lana. What a tragedy. Dead. Ten centuries of Lebanon's and no one left to carry on the name. A thousand years of being great. Gone out like a candle in the wind. The Case of the Frightened Lady by Edgar Wallace, adapted for radio by Cynthia Pugh, the part of Lady Lebanon was played by Valerie White. Chief Inspector Tanner by Simon Lack, Lord Lebanon by William Eagle, Elsa Crane by Bethel Calder, Sergeant Totty, Louis Stringer, Sergeant Featherby, Michael Spice, Gilder, Anthony Hall, Brooks, Warren Stanhope, Briggs, Will Layton, and Kelber, James Thomason. The program, which was recorded, was produced by Martin C. Webster, and it was the second hearing of Saturday's broadcast. Radio 4. And now this afternoon, a chance to hear this week's Saturday Night Theatre from Manchester. Taxi! Taxi! Hardman Crescent, Victoria Park, please. If we can get through the floods. The rubber dinky and oars will be better in some parts today. Oh, that bad, is it? Even worse in the south, according to the evening news. Here, see for yourself. Thanks. Got it, really, on account of that Manchester copper. You know, the uh, police inspector. Oh, yeah. No wonder he was suspended, pending his trial. Working on a drugs case, he was. He'd just come back from Germany when he stopped in the street by one of his superiors. And surprise, surprise, in his briefcase, if I find 8,000 in German marks. <laughs> you don't need to be a genius to find the right answer. We find the defendant, John Christopher Rourke, not guilty. We present Brian Truman, Jane Knowles, and Geoffrey Banks in The Dark Windows of a Room by William Keenan. A first production from the drama suite of New Broadcasting House, Manchester. Among those making guest appearances for the occasion are Violet Carson, Nigel Davenport, Brian Forbes, Wilfred Pickles, Philip Jenkinson and Billy Whitelaw. The Dark Windows of a Room. I said you don't have to be a genius to find the right answer, do you? Uh, no. No, but he claims the money was planted. A backhander? A bribe? That's what it was. It's the old, old story. The police stop a thief, find the boot of his car full of loot, and what does the thief say? What does the thief say? He says, I don't understand it. That isn't mine. I just don't know how it got there, officer. I think the inspector was telling the truth. Well, you're on your own there, mate. You hear a lot when you're driving a taxi, and I've been told that this inspector fellow... Rourke. Rourke. That's him. His divisional officers didn't lose much time in suspending him from the force pending further inquiries. Johnny Rourke was a bit too clever by half. Clever? What do you mean, clever? Oh, 
one of these bright young ones straight from university. They walk up beat for a few nights and then they promote them up to inspector. <laughs> I say walk. If any, when did you last see a copper on a beat? All hiding round corners in cars. The other night in Piccadilly Gardens, a gang of six yobbos set on a bloke, put the boot in, not a copper in sight. A few of us on the rank went in with tire levers or else the fellow would have been dead. Up comes a panda car when it's all over. Well, I'd agree with you about needing more men on the beat. Aye, but some real big beefy lads. Brawn, not university brains. Here, I'll tell you something more about Inspector John Rook. He studied history. Henry VIII. <laughs> what do you make of that? Broadens the mind. So does driving a taxi, but that doesn't make me a policeman. Ah, oh, but Elizabethan England was a police state, and the Tudors had one of the finest spy systems in the world. You seem a bit of an historian yourself. I studied the period for 14 years. You a teacher, then? No. Oh, do you see that bloody fool come right across me? Oh, I might have known. Woman driver. Oh, I agree with the fact that women don't have many accidents. They just cause them. You know, you're belting along a straight road, then a woman suddenly appears from a side street. You swerve, miss her, and hit a bleeding lamppost. You can drop me at the next corner. Right. In the news, uh, early edition, it said the jury was out considering the verdict. What have they got to consider? Whether the money was planted or not. Well, that shouldn't take them long to decide. Well, they say we've got the finest justice in the world. <laughs> That's what the lawyers say. Wasn't always without fear or favour, though. Well, this do you? Yeah, sure. I'd wait till it eases up a bit. Look at that. It's like someone's thrown a bucket of water on the windscreen. You were saying about uh, British justice in the old days, hmm? Oh, well, Tudor judges hanged and quartered many a man just because he wanted to worship the same way his father did. And all those secret panels and priest hiding holes in the stately homes of England. Well, they just got to show that Tudor justice was hardly the finest or the fairest. <laughs> you should have been a history teacher. Yeah, maybe you're right. By the way, didn't I pick you up near the Crown Court? Yes. You weren't at the trial by any chance? I was. You're a lawyer then? No, I'm not a lawyer. Now, wait a minute. You know a lot about history. You're... Yes, yes, I'm John Rourke. And just for the record, the jury gave me the benefit of the doubt. I don't care what you heard. Inspector Rourke isn't a crook. And he's going to prove it. How? Well, first by finding a phone and going back to the beginning. Here, what do I owe you? Oh, nothing. It'll teach me to button up my big mouth. Station. Extension 350, please. One moment, sir. Norris. Chief Inspector, this is John Rourke. Rourke? The jury found me not guilty. Uh, so we just heard. You seem disappointed. Why should I be disappointed? Oh, some people are, I understand. Very disappointed. Just hope you're not one of them. If I had been, I would have slammed the phone down on you. Oh, that's true. Well, what can I do for you? Meet me in a quiet pub. You must be joking. Our faces are too well known. <sighs> All right, then. What time would you be passing the Central Library on your way home? In about half an hour. Well, if you see a rather bedraggled individual standing in the rain, you might give him a lift. Jump in. soaked to the skin. Mm. Sorry, I'm ten minutes later than planned. It's good of you to stick your neck out, Frank. Even though I arrested you with the money in your briefcase, I don't think you were being bribed. Well, now the court bit's over, you want to tell me how the money came to be there? <laughs> well, it was planted. In my years in the force, John, I've rarely met a more dedicated detective. You came straight from university, plunged into police work, and every spare minute you were studying police procedure, law books, or researching Tudor history. Yeah. Just before you were arrested, I was planning to send you on an ATW course. A what? Attitudes to work course. <laughs> now, in the modern world, everyone is so busy and immersed in what he's doing that he's hardly time to sit down and think. Many are too involved in their work and may have their priorities wrong. The course 
makes them think things out. Whether they're giving off time to their families, their hobbies. Everything has to be balanced. And you thought with me something was a little bit uh, out of balance? I thought you could do with a girlfriend, a hobby, or both, yes. What I'm also trying to say is that somebody who was conscientious enough to be working too hard would scarcely take 8,000 marks to hush something up. Well, uh, thanks for your confidence in me. What are your plans? Well, four months waiting for trial gave me time for a personal attitude to work course. I obviously stumbled on something that somebody thought was worth that amount of guilt to keep the lid on. And it worked beautifully. I'm out of the force, off the case, and four months have passed placidly by. But you're going to try to pick up the scent? Smell would be a better word. The whole thing stinks. Yep. I'm going to clear my name if it takes me from now to eternity. Take care. Remember, you're not reinstated. Once suspended, it takes time. And there are a lot of villains who'd love to get their hands on you in a dark alley. Well, then I'll just have to take that risk. Look, why not emigrate to Australia and start a new life in the sun? Because I'm innocent. If I emigrate, everyone will assume I'm running away. With the final proof for some people that I was guilty. Got off scot-free. We only live once. I want to be able to walk around with my head up and my chin out. I want proof of innocence that's so conclusive, Frank, I can get back on the force. Well, it's up to you. You could try sounding a little more encouraging. You said yourself, we only live once. And I think a lifetime's too short for what you're trying to do. You mean there isn't much hope of ever getting back on the force? I mean just that. Now, what would you do if you were me? I'd go to Australia and teach history. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I'll do that after I've cleared my name. What the hell's up with him? It's the bus driver's way of telling you he'd like us to move off, I think. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the Club Crazy Horse. Oh, Mr. Rock. Surprised to see me, Harry. I saw the verdict in the late editions. <clears throat> well, then, what'll you have, Mr. Rock? Same I was having the last time I was here, the night they picked me up outside. Do you remember what I was drinking? Please ask me the same question. Uh, you were drinking red wine. It was a new bottle we were trying, a French claret. You liked it. How many did I have? Uh, three glasses, Mr. Rock. Hmm. Oh, pour me a glass of red wine, then, Harry. One red wine, sir. <laughs> oh, you know, at lunchtime, this is getting more popular than the scotch. One for yourself? Oh, thanks, Mr. Rock. Cheers. Cheers. Well, have mine later if you don't mind, sir. <laughs> Tell me, Harry, where did I put my briefcase when I came in that night? You stood at the bar and put it by your feet. On your left, I think. Correct. I went to the gents once. Left the briefcase, as you say. Four months now, I've been remembering who was at the bar. There was a slim blonde, about mid-twenties. Big Irishman over the other side there. A fellow with a bowler and a rolled umbrella. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, that be Hilda, Paddy Dooley, and Mr. Charles Vickers, the accountant. Uh, Mr. Vickers comes in every night for a quick one and then goes for his train. Mm. Well, in fact, he leaves at exactly seven minutes past six in order to get his 23 minutes past train. Mm. Well, I was picked up just before 6.30. I visited the gents just before leaving, so Mr. Vickers must already have left. Unless he was late that night. Oh, Mr. Vickers has never been late, Mr. Rourke. Not in all the time he's been coming here. Huh. That leaves Paddy, Dooley and Hilda. Did either of them go near my briefcase? Not that I can remember, Mr. Rourke. Uh, Hilda was stood nearest to it. She was just on your left. In fact, I thought at first she might be trying to pick you up. <laughs> Couldn't help wondering what her reaction would be if she found out you were a detective inspector. Mm. Where can I find Hilda? Don't know much about her. She's German, I know that much. And from bits of conversation I overheard, I gather she was a student here. Studying what, Harry? Club life in England? <laughs> oh, good question, sir. She came in quite a bit. Seems strange, that, if she were studying over here. You said came in quite a bit. You mean she hasn't been in lately? Well, that's the funny thing about it, Mr. Rourke. I don't recollect her coming in here since that night. And now, at ten to six, here is the Northern News, read by Geoffrey Wheeler. At Manchester Crown Court today, John Rook, an inspector with Manchester Police C Division, was found not guilty on a charge of bribery and corruption. Inspector Rook, who resides in Victoria Park, has stated on several occasions since his arrest that Mrs. Lee of number 37 Victoria Park does the best casserole of braised neck with carrots and onions known to her lodger. <laughs> By far the best. Well, even without such compliments, it's grand to have you back, John. Even after all the publicity, Mrs. Lee, 
I make up my own mind about folks. Oh. Most people still seem to think I'm guilty. Well, I don't think what they choose to think. The Summers is never content unless they can think the worst. And I didn't need that jury to tell me you'd never do out that's wrong, John Rook. Oh, I'm glad I heard it all the same. Now, are you ready for trifle, or a mite more of that casserole before you get down to trifle? Oh, Mrs. Lee, I couldn't eat another second helping. There's nothing gives a woman who fancies herself as a cook greater pleasure than seeing somebody with a good appetite wolf it down. Oh, did I wolf it down, then? Well, let me put it this way. You get it as though you were in need of a good meal. You seem to have lost a bit of weight. Well, prison remand food wasn't up to your standards, Mrs. Lee. Ah, well, it'll put a bit of the weight back and keep out the cold. Oh, by the way, while you were, uh, while you weren't here... You mean while I was inside? Well, I was trying to avoid that unpleasant word. Oh, I don't mind. Well, while you were uh, waiting trial, that book you sent for came. Uh, oh, uh, Professor Scarsbrick's Biography of Henry VIII. Yes, that's him. His face was on the cover. Oh, good. You see, it's been opened. Postman rang the bell. He seemed a bit embarrassed. Yeah, must have thought I was smuggling more marks in. Yes, well, they had a cheek to open. It's all the same. But I, I sent for another book, too. Um, R.H. Benson, Come Rack, Come Rope. Yes, there is another parcel in your room, John. That was intact. Thanks, Mrs. Lee. You're a treasure. Next time I get bribed, I'll cut you in for 50%. <laughs> That'll be the day. You're as likely to take a bribe as to go and hit old ladies over the head to steal their handbags. I think I'll nominate you as the best, most trusting landlady in the world, Mrs. Lee. Hey. You know what I'm thinking? Hmm? I think we ought to have a little celebration. <laughs> Why not? Let's see what's on at the pictures. Well, we can do that later, but first we'll have a glass of wine. I got a bottle of hot for Christmas, and this is as good a time as any to open it. You'll find it in the sideboard there, together with the bottle oh, opener. OK. Not too much now. Oh, all right. <laughs> there we are. One for you. And one for me. There you are. You've filled my glass more than you have your own. Well, you put more food on my plate than you do on your own. Cheers. To your future, love. Mm. Bleak as it may seem. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, sorry to ring you at home, Chief Inspector. Like hell you are. But I'd prefer you to ring here, Rourke, than the office. What can I do for you? I'm anxious to catch up with a German girl called Hilda. She was next to me in the bar the night I was arrested. You're telling me nothing new, Rourke. Do you know where I could find her? No. I've been looking for her for four months. Her full name is Hilda Schiller. Schiller. How do you spell that? S-C-H-I-L-L-E-R. What have you got on her? Well, she's been here about 18 months, supposedly studying English literature at Manchester University. Why supposedly? Because for the last nine months, she hardly attended one lecture, but she frequented most of the night spots of the city. Mm. Any in particular? The one you've just visited, the Crazy Horse. Mm. And then there's uh, Champ's Delight mm. and Mr. Pips. She painted the town red, sometimes in the company of an American. And but... don't ask me which American would be trying to trace him for the last four months, also without success. You don't mind if I go over the same ground? Mm. You have nothing to lose. But, but be careful. Oh, thanks for the concern. Oh, and there was one other spot she often used to go in, uh, the junction. That's that place that, like an old railway station, with lamps signals the lot, uh, even steam trains. Oh, it's a long time since I had a ride on a steam train. Aye, well, don't get too nostalgic. And, John, keep your eyes open. <laughs> Welcome to the Junction Club, sir. Have your companion? I'm on my own. Oh, very good, sir. Seem quiet tonight. Apart from the silly sound effects. Oh, well, it's a little early. In about two hours, it'll be bursting at the seams. Ah, you can cross the track to the bar. Now the gate is open, sir. Oh. Don't I need a signalling lamp? <laughs> no signalling lamp, sir. But we do have flags on the bar, like the train guards used to wave. Uh, what'll it be, sir? Glass of red wine. Would, uh, would you be taking it to the dining car? What? The dining car, sir. It's the main floor space, sir. God. What's this supposed to be? The water tower? Well, it, uh, it does tend to be a little overdone, <laughs> the railway thing. Do you know, the waiters have to serve the food as if they were swaying about on a moving train. <laughs> well, all the more reason to stay here. Swaying waiters might turn my stomach over. 
French or Spanish red wine, sir? What else is on the label? Nothing. It's, uh, it's all plonked from the barrel. Rough. I'd recommend the white. I'll take your recommendation, then. Are you uh, having one with me? Yeah, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll make it a beer. One white plonk, not as rough. Cheers. I was uh, wondering who this place appeals to. Oh, younger set mostly. Uh, we also get some Americans from the base at Burwell. Oh. Do you ever have an American coming in with a German girl called Hilda? So that was her name, Hilda. Some kind of student she was supposed to be. Hilda Schiller. Yes, yes, I, I think I do remember him calling her Hilda. Why did you say that was her name? I don't know. She hasn't been here for a long time. And uh, she and her American boyfriend were regulars? Yes. How regular? Hey, uh, are you a policeman or something? Oh, I'm looking for her, if that's what you mean. Three times a week. They used to go on from here to another club, Mr. Pips. Why don't you try there? Over to the right, up the fire escape. First door on the right as you turn the corner. Thanks. My name's John Rourke. Ah, yes, the couple got off scot-free. The jury found me not guilty. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't intend to sound so blunt. That's okay. Half the city's convinced I'm guilty. To be candid, I was one of them. Yes. Well, for your information, I'm still trying to find how those marks got into my briefcase. For your information, Rourke, I didn't put them there. I never thought you did. I'm looking for one of your customers, a German girl. Hilda Schiller. A German girl used to come in regularly, yes. With an American? That's right, the flyer from the U.S. base in Burwall. Do you know his name? Your police colleagues have already asked for the same questions. I tell you what I told them. Neither have been in for months, I'm glad. I didn't let the look of them. I was on the verge of banning them from the club anyway. Why? I got the feeling they were looking the place over. They were about to start something. Don't ask me what, because I don't know. It was just something I felt in my water. And what did you say the girl's name was? <laughs> you too. I don't get it. What about me? You're the second person tonight to use the past tense talking about the girl. The name's Hilda. Hilda Schiller. Is that the guy walking down the side street? That's him. He was asking about Hilda Schiller? That's the name, all right. Let's go. What's the total damage? Oh, I'm afraid you'll have to ask the doctor, Mr. Rourke. But I can say you've been very fortunate. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, at this moment, with uh, every bit of me coming apart from every other bit, it's difficult to imagine my good fortune, sister. There's someone to see you, so I'll give you a sedative afterwards. Uh -huh. Good evening, John. How are you feeling? Oh, could be worse, so they say. Yeah. Uh... The doctor's orders are that Mr. Roark must be kept quiet, so it'd be better if he didn't stay too long, please. All right, very good, sister. Ah, ward to myself, I see. Aye, and the uniformed policeman outside the door. What? Calm down. Remember the doctor's orders. Look, am I right in thinking that policeman isn't there <coughs> entirely for my protection? You are. I see, he's trying to be kept quiet. And then you waltz in and tell me I'm virtually under arrest after somebody's tried to kill me. Well... Frankly, it's enough to upset a saint. I'm talking to you now as a <coughs> friend, John. I thought it would be better coming from me. Oh, uh -huh. speak friend. Look, let's skip the irony, shall we? <sighs> there are some people who think that this attempt on your life could have been faked. Uh, all right, all right. So I hired somebody to try and run over me with a car. Even that doesn't warrant a policeman outside the ward door. It isn't only that. Isn't it? 
Well, for a person who's supposed to be kept quiet, it's more than enough for me. John, they'll leave you alone until the doctor says you're fit to be questioned. <coughs> Maybe tomorrow, the day after, or a week hence. But whenever it is, do you want to be questioned officially by whoever's given the case? Or would you like me to put you in the picture right now? Yeah, well, I'm still suffering from shock and it's easy to take advantage of me. Oh, well, of course, if that's what you think, there's no more to be said. I'll leave you in peace. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That was no fake accident. Strengthens my faith in guardian angels. Aye. Well, you were inches from eternity, all right. A woman said you moved at the very last second. The car caught you right side, sent you spinning onto the bonnet of a parked car and sideways onto its windscreen. The doctor tells me you've escaped with a broken arm, dislocated shoulder, and that you have severe bruising on buttock and shoulder of right side, together with scalp lacerations from broken windscreen. I remember walking between cars parked on each side of that narrow road by Richard Strict. <coughs> the engine. There wasn't even time to turn round. Still don't know what made me jump out the way. John, most of the night you'd been going round the clubs asking about a German girl called Hilda Schiller. Right, ever since you gave me a name. In fact, I went straight out looking for her. I said I would. Don't you remember warning me to be careful? Hmm. I, uh, I'd be grateful if you didn't tell them you got a name from me, John. What's going on? Exactly 11 minutes before someone tried to run you down, a body was found floating in the ship canal. Whose body? The body of the girl you'd spent most of the night asking about. A German student called Hilda Schiller. Good morning, Mr. Rourke. And did you sleep well? Oh. <coughs> I think you gave me enough to put eight elephants to sleep, sister. Oh, you were very upset when your friend left. He said so himself. Oh, <laughs> He said I was upset, did he? Yes, and suggested you needed extra sedation. I think a good nightcap was the word he used. Is he a very close friend? I don't have many close friends. He's a colleague. Oh, oh, I see. I, uh, I graduated and went straight into the police force. There's a lot to study. Every few months I seem to be learning a new job with different responsibilities. I see from your notes that you aren't married. But haven't you a girlfriend? No. Oh, a handsome fellow like you, now why not? Oh, oh, marriage doesn't appeal to me. Or perhaps the right person hasn't come along. <laughs> perhaps I spent far too much time trying to be the perfect policeman. <laughs> Look where that's landed me. Oh, what the hell am I going on about? I'm sorry for being so maudlin. Ah, now don't apologise. It's the effect of being in hospital. Patients often talk like that. They feel better afterwards. <laughs> like confession. As a wee girl in Ireland, I was taught the expression, confession is good for the soul. <coughs> now, let me have a look at those bruises before you get dressed. Get dressed? Well, your friend is here again. Colleague, not friend, sister. The next colleague is that. Morning, John. Yeah. I understand you're feeling a little better this morning. Oh, yeah? Who told you that? Well, the doctor thinks that if you wanted to, it would be all right to have a short journey by car. To the cells, you mean? No, no, John. Just a matter of routine identification. Why? You caught the driver of the car that hit me? No. Have you found the car? Not yet. Well, where does this uh, routine identification fit in? We want you to identify the body of Hilda Schiller. Why me? You saw her in the club just before your arrest. Oh, great. Great. I'm still suffering physically from being hit by a car and still in a state of shock. You show me a dead body that's been in the water for some time, another setback. And then while I'm still disturbed, you start throwing questions, hoping I'll eventually make a statement that incriminates me. Oh, nothing of the kind. Oh, yeah, I've yeah, sure. I've just seen the doctor, Chief Inspector Norris. I understand he told you that Mr. Rourke should not get out of bed today. Huh? In fact, in his opinion, Mr. Rourke should not move from this bed for the next three days. Well, uh, he did agree that if Mr. Rourke wanted to get up... Uh... At your insistence, the doctor reluctantly said that if Mr. Rourke insisted on discharging himself, we, the hospital, can do nothing about it. And by getting out of bed and going with you, Mr. Rourke would be discharging himself. Did you tell Mr. Rourke just that, Chief Inspector? Uh, not exactly. I merely asked if he would accompany us to help us with the matter of an identification, sister. Mr. Rourke, you don't need to go. You're not fit to go. Now, Chief Inspector, if you put any further pressure on my patient, 
I will make an official complaint to the Home Office. Now, there's no need to take such drastic steps, sister. I'll uh, leave your patient in peace. Now, everyone hold their horses. Thanks, sister, for getting your Irish paddy up and putting Chief Inspector Norris in his place, but I'm quite prepared to go along with him. I want to show my willingness to cooperate. Uh, make a note of how uh, cooperative I'm being while the sister helps me to get dressed, Norris. Helps you, indeed. I'll do no such thing. If you're going to discharge yourself, then you'll dress yourself as well. Uh, and what's so important that it can't wait a few more days? A specially conducted tour of a mortuary. Is that the woman you saw in the bar just before your arrest? God. How long has she been in the water? Is that the woman? Well, from what's left of her, it looks like it. But you're not sure? How could anybody be? It looks like her, you said? Yes. All right, you can put it back. We're getting further identification, and we're sent for a dental record. Well, now I've cooperated with your request, Chief Inspector, I'm going to refuse to accompany you anywhere else. In other words, you can go to blazes or arrest me. And if you do arrest me, when your case falls apart, as it will, I'll sue for false arrest. Good morning and goodbye. Now, wait a minute, John. I'm only doing my duty. Yes, that's what the axeman sent to the Queen he was executing. I was also about to say that having brought you here, the least I can do is buy you a coffee and take you back to your flat. <laughs> Beware Greeks bearing gifts. Don't you trust me? No. I had to convince myself you were innocent, John. Uh -huh. And are you convinced? Oh, come on. Let's have that coffee. Yours is milk but no sugar. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, there's a quiet table over here. Well, I should give up sugar to what they say dairy produce is even worse. Butter and eggs, I read, were the killers. Look, I'm sure you didn't invite me for a coffee so you could discuss the merits of the English breakfast. No, I, I didn't. As a matter of fact, there were one or two things I wanted to discuss with you. And uh, thanks for cooperating in identifying the late Miss Schiller. Uh -huh. You were right. I was trying shock tactics to see how you reacted. Quite sure you're satisfied? Yes, I'm satisfied. Mm. You ought to be. But one of the points I want to talk to you about is what happened in Hamburg. What do you mean? Well, I read your report, but was there anything you left out? Such as? You should know better than me, John. Well, I don't, and if you're trying to imply I deliberately covered something up, you're way out, Chief Inspector. I just want you to tell me all you remember about it, starting at the very beginning. Well, I went over to Hamburg to pick up a merchant navy officer on a grievous bodily harm charge, Ben Hallett. Case mm -hmm. comes up in the Crown Court in a few weeks' time. What happened? Oh, nothing happened. It's just routine. I went and collected him from the Hamburg police. When we got back here, I told him about the allegations made against him by the victim. Was he surprised? Well, not surprised. Seemed relieved. As much as I admitted it by saying it was nothing more than a barroom brawl. I told him the injuries to the man he'd attacked were more than a barroom brawl. He said he had it coming to him. I remember the exact words because I tried to find out why he had it coming to him, but... Uh, Hallett wasn't giving any more away. So I formally charged him. Mm -hmm. When we searched him, we found he was in possession of cannabis. So we added another charge. Mm. And two days later, you were found with the German marks in your briefcase. Could be just a coincidence. You think so? No. No, I don't. I think there is some connection, but... I've racked my brains to find it. But what happened the following day? The one before you were arrested? Nothing. It was my day off. What did you do when you day off? Uh, well, I read a book written by an Elizabethan, John Gerard. Mm -hmm. That was in the morning. And uh, in the afternoon, I went to visit an Elizabethan manor house, Bramborne, uh, doing a report on it for a preservation society. Bramborne Manor? Yeah. You seem surprised. Yeah. Isn't that near the American air base at Burwell? Well, it's about five miles away, but what's the connection? We well, think it was an American who hit you. The woman witness said it was a big American car. And one of the passengers seemed to be in uniform. We're checking all the cars at Burble Base. I still don't see the tie-up between the airbase and the manor. Who owns the manor now? Mm, no one. Last owner was Ralph Fitzhugh. He was hanged outside his own front door for having a mass set in the house. Mm, how long ago was that? All of 360 years ago. No one's lived at Brambourne since 1939. The place has gradually crumbled. No, I'm, I'm wrong. Uh... The War Department took the place over together with the airbase. Yeah, that's right. They let the uh, they let the Americans have it. I think they used it as an officer's mess for a while. Mm -hmm. They did plan to repair and restore it. Yeah, the Americans, that is. Uh, and then the squadron moved to another base, and the new commander found a mess nearer the airfield. There's something about the place that started my copper six cents working overtime. 
Ramborn Manor. You know, John, the name cropped up too many times. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, I don't know. I was hoping your historical researchers could have enlightened me. Do you, uh, you want another coffee? Uh, no, thanks. And gazing into your cup like it was a crystal ball. I was just thinking, it is uh, strange that the manor was the last place I visited before those marks were found in my briefcase. I'll tell you something else. I searched that manor and its grounds with a squad of policemen and dogs for three days. There's nothing there. What makes you smile? So did Persuivance. Well, who were they? Persuivance, so uh, sort of private enterprise policeman, bounty hunter, and freebooter roll into one. Never heard of them. Ah, well, for the solution to most problems, it's necessary to go back into history. What, like Northern Ireland, you mean? Well, like most political problems. Well, how can it help us in this case? Well, something you said gave me an idea. Started me thinking along very strange lines. Could lead nowhere. First of all, I'd like to get back to my flat and see if Weston can give me any clues. Who? William Weston. He was an Elizabethan. It's for you, Mr. Rook. What is? You have a visitor, a lady. What the hell can that be? Oh, he gets hard at coming these stairs every day. <laughs> Mr. Rook, I see you've been keeping a secret. A secret? Well, and who might this foreign girl be who's come round to see you that you haven't been letting on about? But... Go put a tie on, look your best, eh? I haven't got a foreign girlfriend. I haven't got a girlfriend. Full stop. Well, she seemed to know you. Is Mr. Rook in, she asked? Knew you? Knew you lived here? Mm. I can't wait to know who my mysterious foreign female visitor is. I'm not putting a tie on, Mrs. Lee. Have it your own way, then. I think she must be German. German? Well, she speaks very good English with just a slight accent. And then her name? What name? Schiller, she said. Miss Schiller. Ah, Constable Harris. Yes, Chief Inspector? You're quite literate, aren't you? How do you mean? You spend a great deal of your time sitting on your... Backside, doing crosswords, don't you? I do the occasional crossword. Then it must take you a hell of a long time to complete it. That occasional crossword for all occasions? Well, it's not as bad as that, Chief Inspector. Yes, well, this is what I want you to find out. Learn all you can about poor Sweevents. Then find out if any of them had any connection with the American Air Base and Burwald. Eh? You heard. Just pretend you're doing your crossword. But I... I don't, don't tell me you don't know what a poor Sweevent is. Well, I would say its root is pro, forth, and sequi follow. Uh, onwards follow, or something like that. Wait a minute, I just remembered there's an inferior officer of the College of Heralds. He's a poor Sweden. I don't think it's that one. Well, it could also be connected with the verb pursue. Aye, well, go and pursue the matter then. And don't come back until you can tell me all about it, Harris. I'll start by talking to the head librarian at the Central Library. Uh, before you go, you can let me have the list of items we found on the dead Schiller girl. Oh, very good, sir. It's right here on my desk. Where on your desk? It was under my paper. I'd folded it in half to do the crossword. Miss Schiller, did you say? That is correct, Mr. Rourke. You have the advantage of me, Miss Schiller. I don't remember having met you before. I understand you knew my sister. My sister Hilda, who was recently found murdered. You have been asking about her. Now, just you come and sit down, Lord. Push a chair near the fire, Father, Mr. Rose. She yes. looks like a drowned rat. I've been walking around since late last night. You take your coat off and I'll hang it up by the kitchen radiator. And I'll bring your towel to dry your hair. Oh, thank you. You flew into Manchester? Yes. The German police broke the news to us in the early hours of the morning. I dressed and took the first plane here. I just cannot believe it. A good hot cup of tea. That's what you need. <laughs> Your English and your tea. <laughs> I, I think you want to know why I was looking for your sister. Please, yes. Well, I used to be a police detective inspector in this city. Till one night German money was found in my briefcase and I was accused of corruption. The other day a jury found me not guilty but the smear is still there. Well, I want to clear my name by finding out why those marks were planted on me. I understand. But what has this to do with my sister, Hilda? I suspect it was your sister who put the marks in my briefcase. Oh, it seems to get worse and worse. The more I learn, the more terrible this thing seems to be. What can you tell me about your sister? What do you want to know? Everything you can remember. I can see her face as a little girl. 
She was always mischievous, always busy, always so happy. When did things start going wrong? Not until she went to the university. She wanted to take a degree and teach backward children. At first she was doing quite well. But then she mixes with bad people. How did you know they were bad? By their way of life. To use an old-fashioned phrase, their lack of morals. I found Hilda was living with one of them. That was the beginning of it all. At first she argued it was love and idealized her relationship. For him it was a convenient, temporary satisfaction. Inevitably, he moved into another casual relationship and left Hilda's flat. She was shattered. I suspect my sister turned to drugs. About this time, she started an affair with an American airman who had served in Vietnam and other areas in Southeast Asia. He frightened me. You met him? Twice only. I tried to keep in regular contact with Hilda, yet I had the feeling she didn't want me to meet him. But once he came to her flat while I was there. What was he like, this American? A short man. His eyes seemed to rove all over you. He made you feel uncomfortable. Hilda made excuses for him. She said he'd flown many missions in Vietnam and had been living on his nerves. It could have been that. But I think it was something much deeper. Was he a pilot? I'm not quite sure. I think so. Do you know why your sister came to England? No. I don't know why or how she managed to get into an English university with her poor results. Yeah. But one thing I am sure about, he was behind it. He wanted her over here. The exchange scheme she came under was incidental. Ah, uh, here's your cup of tea, love. Oh. You take milk and sugar. Oh, black, please. You don't have black tea in England. That's for coffee. <laughs> You've had a shop, love, and something hot and sweet is what you get for shop. Here now. Oh, thank you. Here's yours, Mr. Rourke. Oh, thanks. You, young lady, you look fair, don't you? I still cannot believe she was murdered. Do you know, I came here with the idea of avenging her death. I thought it was you, Mr. Rock. Oh. But you have too kind a face for a killer. The way people live is written on their faces. Now, drink up your tea, love. Oh, please call me Anna. Well, Anna, you can get your feet up and have a rest, love, and I'll stay with you. Mr. Rourke can be doing some reading in his own room. Oh, uh, message understood, Mrs. Lee. And we'll have steak, dumplings and chips for tea. I'll call you when it's ready, Mr. Rourke. Can I help you at all, Mrs. Lee? Oh, you've wakened up. How are you feeling? Much better, thank you, Mrs. Lee. Good. Yes, yeah, you can be warm in these plates, if you will. The chips are nearly ready, and then you can call Mr. Rourke. Well, these plates? Yes, those are the ones. I put them on this plate rack above the grill. Uh, is Mr. Rourke upstairs? Yes, his room's first left at the top of the stairs. All the best to knock on his door, because sometimes he gets so burst in the book, he wouldn't be in the bottom door. Coming. I'm famished. Oh, sorry. I thought it was Mrs. Lee. She asked me to tell you that the meal is almost ready. Thank you. What a lot of books you have. Aha. Uh -huh. Come and see my etchings. Oh. <laughs> They're quite safe with me and my arm in a sling. Uh, not to mention the tightly bound rib cage. Your etchings. I understand that English joke. <laughs> You're very attractive when you smile, Anna. Please, Mr. Rock. I know you mean to be kind. I also know I have a plain face and I feel very spinsterish and schoolteacherish at times. Well, you said yourself the way people live's written on their faces. Yours is a kind, dedicated face. Thank you. I'm very happy with my work. Teaching handicapped children? Yes. I think the secret of happiness is giving yourself to others without expecting any thanks. <laughs> Strange that two sisters should seem to be so different. I am to blame as much as anyone for Hilda. Our father died seven months after Hilda was born. Our mother died four years ago, being ill for many months. Uh. I wondered all the way here in the plane how much more time I should have given to Hilda instead of to my studies. It must have been a very bad time for her. Perhaps it might have been better to... To have what? Oh, to have married and stayed on the farm. There was a young man who wanted to marry me, but I am sure he proposed out of sympathy. He was a good person with a very strong sense of duty. And you turned him down? He's now happily married to a very attractive girl who has turned out to be a good wife and mother. Why are you looking at me like that? I was wondering why you have your hair swept back so severely. I don't understand your question, Mr. Rock. 
It is obviously so much neater and tidier this way. Oh, of course. I tell you all this about me, but you say nothing. Oh, well, like you, I've been busy studying, and like you, I had someone in my hometown I might have married. But you didn't? No. Now, she's a good wife and mother, too. She married the local doctor. Policeman's lot is not a happy one. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rock, for your efforts to cheer me up and get me out of my sadness. My motive was purely selfish, Anna. I asked you questions about your sister to get all the information I could to help clear my name and to find your sister's killer. I see you read poetry. I browse. Ah, oh, Wordsworth. I once had to copy a poem of his when I was learning English. Ah, oh, this is it. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, so is it now I am a man, so be it when I shall grow old, or let me die. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. Your English verse is so beautiful, the rhythm so regular that it flows like a stream. How do you call unstressed followed by stress? Um... Iambic. Ah, yes. It is the rhythm, not the rhyme, that matters most. Quite right. You see, I try to learn my English well, especially the poetry. <laughs> Back in history, some of your great adventurers and swordsmen were poets, were they not? Uh, they were. You have a bookmark in what now? Ah, a northern vigil. Uh, read me a short verse, please. Uh, well, reading aloud is hardly my forte. I will close my eyes, draw a circle in the air with my finger, and then point to some verse, yes? Uh, Mrs. Lee doesn't like to keep a meal waiting, Anna, and you'll oh, be ready. You are embarrassed. No. Then half a minute's delay while you read a short verse will not upset Mrs. Lee. Please. All right. I close my eyes, turn my finger in the air like so. There. Well, let me see what you've chosen. The windows of my room are dark with bitter frost. The stillness aches with doom of something loved and lost. I was thinking of choosing something light and happy. But I feel the dark windows of a room are more fitting, more appropriate. I should be in mourning for Hilda, or something loved and lost. You can't blame yourself for her death. But I was her sister. If I had given her more time, if, if I had talked to her more, listened to her problems, who knows? Oh, if I had my time with her over again, how different it would be. Anna, I'll find who killed her if it takes ten years. Isn't that a form of revenge? Wanting her murderer caught and punished? Justice is a better word. A bleak consolation, I know. Oh, forgive me. I'm too concerned with myself and my own feelings. I think of Hilda, not of you, and how, because of all this, you lose your job, your good name. You're almost killed, and... Oh. I have a drawer full of men's large white handkerchiefs. Ideal for wiping away tears. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there. That's it, Anna. Put your head on my poor bandaged shoulder and have a good cry. <laughs> But Mrs. Lee will have a meal going cold. Mrs. Lee would be the first to agree that you'll feel a lot better after a good cry. Is it better for those cooks, Rob? Oh, here you are, Mrs. Lee. Thank you. Oh, dear. I'll answer it. Do you manage another sandwich, Rob? 224 2987. Is that you, Rock? Yes. I've had young Constable Harris in the Central Library all afternoon looking up for Sweevens. Oh, congratulations, Inspector. I never realised you were so concerned with improving the minds of your detectives. I've been waiting for Harris to return, and I'm still no wiser, Rourke. In fact, I think you've been leading me up the garden path, or into a medieval maze. I also think you know more than you've been telling me, so I'll get your coat and hat on. I'm sending Harris round to collect you. Then you can explain to me just where Persuivance fit in. You'd better get yourself a warrant. I'll do just that if you like. Because I won't be coming in voluntarily. As you wish, Rourke. Look, you know you can't arrest me. All right. A 
jury finds you not guilty of taking a backhander in marks, but then the girl connected with it dies, and now... What now? After visiting me the other night, you went to the junction. Well, I said I did. You had a nice long chat with the bomb. I asked him about Hilda Schiller, and he told me they got quite a few Americans from the base at Burwold, and that she sometimes came in with one of them. What else did he say? He recommended the white wine. Did you threaten him? Threaten him? Why should I? That's what we'd like to know, Rock. You see... After you'd had your glass of wine and bought him a beer, you did buy him a beer, didn't you? Your information is correct. I did buy him a beer and I did have a glass of wine, white as recommended. And afterwards you left? Yes. He did too. He followed you out. He's never been seen since. Harris is on his way to collect you, Rock. Damn. Damn the lot of them. Anything the matter? I'm going out. Not in the car, John, and you with an arm in a sling. Oh, I know. I wonder if Anna can drive me. I have no English license and insurance, but I drive. Well, I'm insured for any driver, and what's driving without a license anyway at this stage of the game? I want to find your sister's American friend. This very minute, Mr. Roy? Yes, there's someone coming I don't particularly want to see. My car may be difficult to start. It's been in the garage several months while I was... While Mr. Roke was away on business. No, look, I can see to the pots, and I'll tell the gentleman what's coming that you've just popped round the corner. In fact, I'll make him a cup of tea while he sits and waits for you to come back. <laughs> That'd be most helpful. Come on, Anna. I saw the sign, Bovold. We'll stop at the first pub and ask there. Keep to the left. I'll look out for it. Here's a table. What do you have, Anna? I don't know. I drink very little. Anything will do for me. I'll get you a sherry. Yes, sir. Uh, medium sherry and a pint of best mild. It's lovely tonight, the beer. Wonderful condition. There's your sherry. Uh -huh. Still use the old pumps, I see. Oh, yes. Gives a better top to the pint. You, uh... You seem to get plenty of Americans here from the base. Oh, they like the beer, too. Did one of them, uh, used to come in with a German girl? You don't mean the... The girl was found murdered? Yes. You a copper? Yes. Oh, you look like one to me. I can usually spot one a mile off. We're looking for the American. I saw a lot of people, including some other Americans. Seems to have done a disappearing act two days ago. Had something on the slate with me, too. Old money all round, did Max Venner. Yeah. So did his co-pilot. He's vanished, too. Oh, have you nothing small, Miss Barnot, sir? I'm, I'm a bit short of change tonight. Uh, sorry, I haven't. Just manage it, I think. Thank you, sir. Oh, want a tray for that? Oh, thanks. I can manage. There we are. One sherry, medium dry. Thank you. <clears throat> Something behind me seems to be fascinating you. It's the barman. I was watching him as he was serving you. He kept glancing to his left. Now he's gone over to speak to the two alert-looking men whose attention he was trying to catch. I, I think the two men are coming over to us. Good evening. Uh, do you mind if we sit at this table with you? I'm already sitting at this table. To what do we owe the pleasure? Uh, my name is Marshal Dean, and this is my partner, Dick Cohen. Mm -hmm. We hear you were asking for Maxie and his co-pilot, Stan. Can you tell us why? Now, to use a, an English police phrase, I want them to help me in my inquiries. Oh, likewise. Now, we're Air Force Police. Mm -hmm. You look uh, very well groomed for Air Force Police. I'd say more like a pair of FBI men. <laughs> and I'd say you look like the English cop who was accused of corruption. Oh, for Air Force Police, you're very well informed. And this is Hilda Schiller's sister. We've had a tale on her ever since she got off the plane. My word, you have done your homework. If you do find anything of interest, uh, call us, huh? Here's the number. It's manned day and night. We have a big organization behind us and taxpayers' money to spend. You didn't, by any chance, convert any of that taxpayers' money into German marks, say, £8,000 worth. We like your English sense of humor, John. But don't try it on Max or Stan. 
In their off-duty moments, they've been involved in at least six killings. Well, if you'll excuse us, gentlemen, we must be on our way. Well, we'll be around. A comforting thought. Good night, Marshal. Good night, Dick. Good night to you, Anna, John. There was something disconcerting about those two Americans. Well, they meant to be disconcerting. They don't seem to have followed us out. Most probably they've got radio cars all around the area, complete with submachine guns. Who do you think they are? <laughs> well, Air Force police. That's for sure. Glad oh. to meet you, dear old lady. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Rock. <laughs> I'm flattered you remember me. Well, anyone as interested in old buildings as you and I can never forget them. Let me introduce a friend of mine, Miss Anna Schiller. How do you do? Oh, now, please do come inside. Oh, what a lovely old world room. Yes, I was born in this cottage, you know. I've got a ghost upstairs. Really? I've often woken to see strange lights above my bed. And then a figure nine. Sometimes I see a man's face. <laughs> <laughs> what I came to see you about, Mrs. Hughes, was the manor. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I read your article on its preservation. I thought it admirable. Oh, good. I wondered if you knew anything about its recent history. You know, since it was taken over by the Americans. Oh, during the war, you mean? Yes. Well, there used to be a most charming commander. Unfortunately, he was planning to put cocktail bars in it for the officer's mess. And then he and his squadron moved on, and the other commander decided against it. In some ways, it was a good thing, and in other ways, bad. How do you mean? Well, if the Americans had gone ahead with their cocktail bar, etc., they would also have restored the hall at the same time. You know how thorough these Americans are. And it would virtually have been as good as new. Most people were happy when the scheme was dropped. Most local people, that is. Now... One American who was very keen on completing the scheme was a most charming and cultured man. I think he was in their Air Force intelligence section. He, too, was an historian, a uh, professor at one of the Midwestern universities, as I recall it. Now, he wrote a pamphlet about the manor, which really should have been made into a book. You know how difficult things were during the war, and it was finally stenciled or something like that. There used to be a copy of it at the base, though. I understand it's been lost. Um, though I did hear there was another... You can't remember the name of this, Professor. Oh, yes, I can. Um, Martindale. James Martindale. Martindale. I'll make a note. Well, if you've no objections, I think I'll take Miss Schiller up to the manor house. What, at this time of night? Oh, there's a moon. Well, if you can follow the overgrown path opposite my front door, that'll take you right to it. Nobody uses it at night, you know, not even courting couples. Thank you once again for your help, Mrs. Hughes. Always a pleasure to see you, Mr. Rock. I do hope you'll find time to address our society one day. As soon as I've cleared up one or two things, I'd be delighted. Well, you know where I am, call in any time. And a friend of Mr. Rock's is always welcome here, Anna. Thank you. I am fascinated by your old English houses and ghost stories. Do you think you'll be all right going up to the manor in the dark? Is there a ghost there as well? <laughs> well, none that is recorded. But the last male member of the family was hanged outside the front door. Yeri, I think, is the English word. I, I am quite nervous. Oh, what was that, Mr. Rock? Some animal. Mrs. Hughes was right. This path's quite overgrown. We should be coming into a clearing soon. It was the tilting green. On this branch. Oh, yes. How beautiful the moonlight. Just look at the roof. It must be freezing. Hamlet could appear at one of those black staring windows and give a tortured soliloquy. Yeah, well, I want to take a look inside. Oh, dear. Frightened again? Scared to death, but enjoying every minute of it. Will you take the torch? Yes, please. Oh, there's something over there. I'll point the torch at it. There, there's something glistened in that undergrowth. Mm. Branches have been broken down as if a tractor's been through. <clears throat> That's better. Now, shine the torch on the ground. That's it. 
Hey. These are tracks. Car tracks. Keep close to me. You don't need to tell me that, Mr. Rock. But suppose there is someone in there. With your injuries, you have only one arm. Ah, but you've got a stiletto in your handbag. How do you know that? I looked in while you were asleep this afternoon. You have no business to go in my handbag. It is, how do you say, bad form, bad manners. So is carrying a dagger, Anna. I bought it in an antique shop here in England. What for? To revenge my sister. Yeah. I thought as much. There is something ahead of us. I think you'd better let me have the torch and stay here. I'd rather face whatever it is with you than stay here on my own. All right. It's like someone's been making ready for a big fire. We call it a bonfire. They've certainly stacked a lot of large branches. Oh, with your injuries, you should not be doing this. I must keep the light still. I'm not lifting, I'm just dragging them to one side. We have an expression about not being able to see the wood for the trees. That's better. Oh, through the gap you've made, there's the reflection again. A dark... Car bodywork. That's what's reflecting. I think I can squeeze through the gap I've made. Have you hurt yourself? Uh, it's just the ribs the car dented. This car, in fact. Pass me the torch. There's something in the front seat. Oh. Is he dead? He's dead, all right. Stay there. Half the back of his head's blown off. Do you know him? The barman at the junction. He went missing after I spoke to him the other night. Oh, I thought I saw something move. Well, it wouldn't be him. Beyond the car. Oh. Oh. Excuse me. You've 60 seconds to come out with your arms above your head. 16, 15. Behind you, Mr. Rock! 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. Oh. What have you done to him? Grab the woman. Okay, ladies, stop struggling. You two carry him out. You killed him. You killed him. Hey, she's got a dagger. Well, grab hold of her, one of you. Oh, oh she stopped. Uh, after Colin hits you, if she didn't try running him through with a dagger. Yeah, serves you right for playing gangsters in an English wood. Use an antique English stiletto for that special occasion. Well, fortunately, Cohen was wearing a thick coat. He'll be fine. Well, in that case, perhaps he'll carry on. I can't say I'm entirely convinced by her explanations. Well, we were staking out the wood. We found the car earlier today. You walked in. Now, it isn't easy to flush people out of a wood at night. So we used the tannoy to distract you and moved in. We hoped you'd still be listening to it, wondering how much time you had left. Yeah, it was. Where am I now? The Air Force base. Oh, you're not going to tell me you're Air Force police again. <laughs> no, John. And not FBI. We're from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Uh, another for you? No, thanks. Now, drugs is the name of the game. How did I get into it? Oh, we've been watching Max and his friends for three years. He'd been smuggling in heroin from Southeast Asia. We put a stop to that by getting him posted to Germany. Or, we thought we did. Max's syndicate had other plans. They worked out another route across Europe with Turkish-grown poppies. It was processed in Marseille, moved to the Germany. you with 8,000 pounds in German marks, which puts you out of circulation for a time. But a jury finds you not guilty. And you start asking questions. But uh, they'd already prepared for that. Oh, sure. By killing Miss Schiller's sister. They reckon, and rightly, that you'd work it out that she had dropped the money in your briefcase. So, with two million dollars at stake, they decided not to take any chances. Two million dollars? Oh, it could be more. That's the minimum value we put in the package they've got into England, ready to ship or fly out to the States. Uh, we want to get our hands on that heroin. And to knock out the number one man in England. I, uh, I think I might be able to find it. Huh? Say that again? I think I can help. But first, I need your organization. 
You name it. I need an open line and equipment to take wire pictures. Oh, we have them already. And then you need a professor of history called James Martindale, who was at a, a Midwestern university. Oh, well, how long ago? Can't say, but he was over here during the war. Well, then he could be dead or retired. Uh, could be. But I know he wrote a pamphlet about the manor while he was over here. So? So we need to find out where he is now, get his pamphlet, and wire it over. I'll put agents onto it right away. Fine. Sir, it's Agent Wright reporting from New York. Uh, thank you. I'll take it. Uh, yeah, is that you, Wright? Yeah, we traced Professor Martindale. He's uh -huh. living in San Francisco doing research on the early settlers. Uh. Uh, Agent Inkerman of our West Coast Bureau has made telephone contact with the professor, and he's on his way to meet him. Oh, good. He has a copy of the pamphlet he wrote on Bramborn Manor while he was at Burwold Air Base. We should be wiring it to you inside the... Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Oh, we should have your information for you very shortly. Now, John, can you tell me what it's all about? It's about an act of parliament made in the 27th year of Queen Elizabeth I in the year 1585. It uh, made it high treason for a priest ordained after the Queen's accession to be in England. And the same act made it a felony punishable by death to harbour a priest. So... If any Catholic wanted his sacraments, he had to have a good place in which to hide a priest and the utensils for saying mass, which yeah. is how the secret panels and the priest's hiding holes came to be in some of the stately homes of England. John, are you trying to say that we're looking for a secret panel? Yes, Marshal. We are, Marshal. Well, for God's sake, let's get on with it. <laughs> Not so easily done. Various people have been searching for them for nearly 400 years. But with modern equipment... Oh, I've tried it. No two hiding holes are the same. They were made by night, only the workmen and the owner knew the secret. When the owner was driven out, or uh, imprisoned or hanged, the secret usually died with him. Sometimes today they come to light when extensive alterations are being carried out, like I suspect the base commander was doing at Burwold Manor during the war. Uh. You see, I think that Professor Martindale realized the discovery and wrote about it. The pamphlet, or anyway, one of them was kept in the base library. Max or someone read it, decided it would be the ideal place for the drugs, and destroyed the pamphlet so that no one else would see it. So we sit back and wait for the pamphlet to be transmitted. Oh, it's coming now. I never thought I'd be looking for secret hiding holes in the damp and cold of first light. Mm. Underneath the fireplace. At least that's what Martindale says here. Yeah, sure. Uh, the stone on the inside of the fireplace on the left-hand side can be pushed in. Mm -hmm. It's not big enough to allow anyone through, but it releases a stone at the base that can be pulled forward. The hole made is just big enough for a man to get through. Okay, fellas, let's try it. Now, that's the first one. But where's the second stone? Yeah, uh, this one. Sure, but it can't possibly move the way it says. Oh, come on, let's try it. Genius. The other moves, too. <laughs> the guy designed this would have been a million-dollar architect in the States today. <laughs> hey, there is a hole. Finally, see what's down there. Okay. Here we go. And these guys must have been thinner in the olden days. Oh. Oh. Pass me a torch. It's quite dark inside. Yes. How big? It's big enough to hold a couple of men. Could they stand up in there? Easily. Now, is there room to sleep? Yeah, but there's nobody here. You've been disappointed, Rook. Yeah. Did you expect to find Max and his buddy in there? Uh, call it more than a possibility. Well, without that information, we would never have gotten this far. Hey, I found something. Well, what is it? A package in waterproof covering. 
Hand it up. Okay, I've got it. Now, let's take a look. Uh, anyone got uh, anything sharp? Uh, uh, your antique stiletto, Anna. I have it in my bag. Uh, may I borrow it, Miss Schiller? Certainly. Great heroin. The best. Okay, finally, put it back. Put it back? A fortune in heroin? Well, suppose something happens to it. We found heroin before, only for it to vanish again. Yeah, I want Max as well. But maybe I shouldn't be risking so much heroin, so we'll make up a package. But you've got to have a good bait for the really big fish. What big fish? The number one guy in Britain who's causing us so many headaches. For two million dollars, someone is going to try and get other stuff. Mm. Do you have any suspects? Yeah. Everyone Max has ever spoken to. I suspect the publican who talked to you and then tipped us off. He used to give Max credit. I suspect the lady president of the local historical society you saw last night. Oh. Max had tea and cakes for the last week. He was obviously after something. I suspect every man, woman, or child who ever passed the time of day with Max. These drug syndicates have a fantastic network of operators. The pay is great, but once you become redundant, they bury you. Like Hilda. Yeah, I like Hilda. I like the barman. Like a few thousand more who are no longer useful and might be able to point a finger at someone else in the organization. A quick assassination and the leak is sealed. It hasn't even become a leak. Not very nice people. People I don't mind waiting about to catch, no matter how long it takes. So let's take it out. Cohen, how is it your end? It's all quiet since the, uh, the pub closed. How long ago? About an hour. Uh, wait a minute. The front door is opening. Yeah, it's difficult picking up radio transmission in a wood. You can hear those damn receivers a mile away. Who's going to walk into a wood when it's crackling with more two-way radios than twigs? Yeah, well, we ought to spread out more. Maybe keep out of the wood altogether. It's the publican who's coming out the front door. He is walking his dog. What direction is he taking? He's going towards the path. If he's got a dog, I'd better get my men out of the wood. Finally, move back. We'll take up positions outside, out of hearing distance. Publican is now turning away from Path. It looks as if he's returning to the pub. All right, Cohen. Stay in position. I'll be coming to move you out in a few minutes. All you need is artillery, and you can have a full-scale battle. Look, you've got too many men and you're making too much noise. I can't take any chances. That's exactly what you are doing. Get rid of all the radios and have one man at a time lying low. Damn radio receiver of yours is as good as a loudspeaker. Suspect has oh. crossed road to cottage of woman Hughes. She is a door. Both suspects are now engaged in conversation. Yeah, most probably about the weather. Talking about the weather, it's starting to rain again. Yeah... As soon as it's opening time, you'll be one stakeout man less. He'll be having a hot rum. On one condition only. You tell no one, absolutely no one, about finding the heroin. Oh, yes. Not a soul. Oh, see what I mean about the rain? Do turn your collar up, Marshal. You American agents always look the part with upturned collars. I wonder what Anna's doing now. Anna, yeah. We have her room at the inn bugged, if you what? really want to know. What do you suspect her? She's Hilda's sister. She's met Oh, Max. come on, you can't... English police car has drawn up with the Burwood Arms. Uh, no. No, it's not stopping. It's going on towards the base. Police car has halted not far from me. Occupant now approaching through wood. Yeah. I can see it for myself. Hey, it's Chief Inspector Norris. He's probably looking for me to tell me I'm back in the force. Don't go out to him. Oh, come on. Surely you don't suspect a Chief Inspector. Hey. 
He's going towards the manor, right enough. To the east wing. To the fireplace. He's hit him over the head. Taking no chances. Hope he's good at unarmed combat. Norris was a marine commando. <laughs> See what I mean? Okay. Hold it. Freeze. We're federal agents. Show me your authority for going round in this country with guns. Oh. And for attacking police officers in the course of their duty. You were going towards the fireplace. Do you deny it? Of course I was. Call off these bloodthirsty Apaches. You haven't said why you were going towards the fireplace, Frank. Because I wanted to take a good look at it, that's why. I've had Constable Harris off crosswords. He hasn't put pen to one for 24 hours. He's been finding out about priests' hiding holes. He tells me that we're often under the fireplace. Oh. Are you okay, by the oh, I feel I want to double up again. He caught me high and low like an axe. When someone hits me on the head and knocks me flat on my face in the mud, what does he expect? Yeah. I saw a pub up the road. I think I'll go there and get cleaned up. Brook? Yes? I want a word with you. You better come along, too. Ah, that's better. Very kind of you to let me use your room, Miss Schiller. How did you get so... so muddied? Well, I met some American Indians in the wood doing a war dance. I wouldn't say too much about them at the moment. Oh, why not? And what precisely are you doing up there uh, on a chair? Got it. Looking for a bug. An electronic one. Yeah, seems to have killed it off. They got the room bugged, in case Anna was involved. But they cannot think I killed my own sister. Oh, they're nothing if not thorough. Over-conscientious. Uh, like ants all over the place with radios. They'll be suspecting the residents of Buckingham Palace next. Though they're damned efficient, I'll give them that, these Federals. One of their brass hats has been in contact with the Home Office, who in turn have been in communication with the Chief. You're reinstated, John. Uh. But uh, I'm in trouble. You? I. It's that forthright Irish sister whose motherly instincts you brought out. She's complained to the Home Office about me bringing pressure to bear on a sick patient in order to make him leave hospital against medical advice. <laughs> I have to go before the Chief Constable. Oh, quite right, too. Disgusting tactics. Anybody who didn't know what you were up to would have been confessing to all sorts of crimes they hadn't committed. Well, you'd better be my chief witness and say you volunteered, or else your life as a detective under me will be a misery. <laughs> now then, to get back to business. They found the heroine... But Max and his pal are still running around loose, and so is the top man in England. I suppose they'll be staying up all night watching for someone to claim the heroine. Another storm brewing by the sound of it. We'll uh, make ourselves comfortable down in the bar, I think. That's, uh, two pints and a sherry. Nasty night out. Ah, uh, it is. Good cosy enough in here. I'll, uh, I'll bring them over. Thanks. Ah. You're looking thoughtful, Rock. Am I? What happened to you this afternoon? Oh, I went to the local library and then to a local resident for a pamphlet. Oh, what about secret panels? Yep. And what did you find? Nothing. Just had some kind of nagging suspicion at the back of my mind. Uh, the sherry is uh, for the lady, is it? That's right. Uh, and uh, a bitter for you. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, uh, and some nuts too, please. <clears throat> Look, I'll come back with you and uh, I'll get them. I think the Chief Inspector wants to ask a few questions in private. Yes, it is the general impression. Cheers. Cheers. The Chief Inspector was right. You are, how do you say, the mind thinking of something else? Oh, uh, far away. Uh, distant. Distant, yes. I keep thinking about Gerard. Gerard? John Gerard. He's a priest who escaped from the Tower of London. Was he hid in a hiding hole for several days or even weeks? The man who built them was Nicholas Owen. Nicholas? Saint Nicholas? Named after him. Saint himself, no. It was Father Gerard's companion. What did Gerard said about him? I made a note of it this afternoon. Oh, here it is. Here. Uh, Gerard said of Nicholas, who was also known as Little John because of his small stature, he was the immediate occasion of saving the lives of many hundreds of persons. You made a lot of notes. Quite neat. I can read them nearly all. He, that is Nicholas, is it? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Never made two same, so if one discovered, did not endanger others. Cecil had him tortured. Cecil? Robert Cecil, the Queen's Minister. Cecil had him tortured. Died without revealing secrets of hiding holes. Poor man. Oh, no. 
He's happy to die, Marty. Well, on the other side of the page, you have written something else that I cannot read. B -O -T. It looks like boats. Say that again. Boats? That's it. Well, where are we going? Back to Burwell's Manor. <laughs> okay, okay. So all I said was, I find your English police method sort of quaint. He kicked me when it hurts. That's what? He kicked me. Sure, Max. You just keep talking. Well, of course I kicked him. He had a gun. I hadn't. And he was about to use it on Rourke. Well, this beer's gone a bit flat in the meantime, but uh, thanks for your help, Chief Inspector. Your health. Well, when I saw your boat out of here, followed by Miss Shiver... Ooh, I... bolt. That was the missing word I wanted. I remembered another technique the Elizabethan builders used. They made the priest hole, as it's called, but not only that. When a priest hole was discovered, the searchers generally found it empty. And why? Because there was often another hiding place behind it, or, or even under it. Right. A bolt hole. So, Max, Benner and Stan here, they were inside that bolt hole all the time we were searching? Even when I was inside of that fireplace? Yep. They were holed up there, thinking all they had to do was to sit it out until you and your... Uh, Posse rode away. But the package, two millions worth. Now, why leave all that heroin behind? Well, Maxie, why? Well, it took us by surprise, that's why. We was in the priest hole when we heard someone come. We put out our torch. It's dark. And Stan here, he fumbles. It's just time to get ourselves in the bolt hole. But not your precious package of drugs. Quite a game of <laughs> cat and mouse, eh, Marshal? You, Dick Coyne, and Mr. Vinely waiting on the outside while your quarry are holed up on the inside. Ah, too true. Only we didn't know, John, and so about an hour ago, I called my men back from the stake out. Not too far back, though, I'm glad to say. Manchester C Division isn't used to dealing with the Max Venners of this world. Still, we're learning. Ah, which reminds me, I want names from you, Maxie boy. Don't we all? Ah, but I have a way with me, Chief Inspector, for all our wild Apache games. But uh, words this time, rather than deeds. Uh, Max, how would you like it if I cable stateside and have it put around that you've been sitting here, English pub style with us, and have been cooperating with the Bureau, and that I'm sending you back to be released? You'll be dead before I arrive, and you know it. Yeah, so it found. Better start naming names. The manager's office is this way. Come in. Just stay as you are, please, sir. He's going to his draw. Oh, I'll take him. You're all right, Chief Inspector. I got winged on the top of my right arm. Take him down to the patrol car. And then drive me to hospital. Well, well. If it isn't my old friend, Chief Inspector of Police, who makes my patients leave hospital when they should be in bed. Ah, he's all right now. In fact, he brought me here. And because of you, I have to appear in front of the Chief Constable. Oh, so, my tough detective. You're ready to apologise. Who told you that? Um... The doctor says you're first to have an anti-tetanus injection before he looks at your wound. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Roark. How hello. are you? A lot better, it seems. Ah, it's all cleared up, sister. Uh, and he'd have been just as happy to pin it on you. Oh, I don't think so. Well, now, will you turn over for your injection, Chief Inspector? Now, the sight of a needle has always made me feel a bit off, sister, so go oh, easy. Oh, now, I always find the biggest and the toughest of them faint away at the sight of a little tiny needle. <laughs> All over. Well, I hope they keep you in. I've got to give you a few more injections. Now, Mr. Rourke, would you like a nice cup of tea? Well, thanks all the same, sister, but I want to catch a girl before she boards a plane. Oh, I see. Just a moment, Rourke. First of all, will you now, kindly... Now, Chief Inspector, we can't have shouting in this hospital or you'll get another jab. So just compose yourself until the doctor comes and forget about giving orders. No. And you, John Rourke, outside. I don't want you disturbing the patient. Off you go. We shall have blown away. Will Mr. Sean Penas, a passenger of the Dublin, please go to the information desk. And will Miss Anna Schiller, passenger of the Dusseldorf, go to the information desk. 
My heart leaps up when I behold... John! You haven't finished the verse. A rainbow in the sky. And I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. The dark windows of my room seem much more cheerful when you're about. Mine too. Have you got to take this plane? I have a seat booked, but... Mrs. Lee may have a meal waiting. In that case, I cannot let Mrs. Lee down. She doesn't like good food going cold. I'm, uh, I'm due for some leave. I am fascinated by your stately homes. We could tour them together. You look shocked. Together? I'm afraid... <sighs> that you wouldn't go touring with a fellow unless there'd been the blessings of nuptials and he'd taken you for better or worse until death do his part. Well, you know, having a touring honeymoon of England used to be the done thing. You're teasing me now. No. We have an English expression. What expression? And many a true word is spoken in jest. It's the only way to overcome that terrible English reserve that foreigners don't like. But you can have a formal proposal if you like. What girl doesn't deep down want a formal proposal? But that... Is currently appearing in alphabetical order at the Mayfair Theatre London. This drama, set in the 1970s, is all about the investigation of a murder. Excuse me. Um, uh, yes, madam? Well, do you think I could see somebody in charge? Well, uh, depends what the problem is. It's my daughter. She didn't come home last night. Oh, yes. How old is she? Nearly 21. Hmm. Does she have a boyfriend? Yes, and he's very concerned as well. Hmm. She isn't with him? Oh, no. I see. What's her name? Julia. Surname? Marsden. And when did you last see your daughter, Mrs. Marsden? Well, I suppose it was the day before yesterday. And that'll be Wednesday? Yes. So she hasn't been home for two nights? No. You see, she's a student nurse, yeah. and this week she's on the early shift. She starts work at seven o'clock, so I don't see her in the mornings. So she was home on Wednesday night? Yes. And she didn't say anything that might suggest she wouldn't be coming home last night? Oh, no, of course not. Didn't have an argument, did you? No. Uh, nor with Mr. Marsden? My husband's dead. Uh, you see, the problem is your daughter's of age. Unless she breaks the law, there's nothing we can do to bring her back. Uh, not if she doesn't want to come. But she hasn't left home. She hasn't taken any of her clothes. And we haven't had an argument. We get on well together. Mm. She's happy in her job. She's happy with her boyfriend. Uh, look, Mrs. Martin, you see, even in a small town like this, lots of young people go missing. <laughs> Uh, most of them turn up against safe and sound. Believe me, there's nothing to worry about. But Julia wouldn't run off. She doesn't have reason to. Uh, look, um, have you phoned the hospital? What? The hospital where Julia works. Have you phoned to see if she's turned up for work oh, this morning? Well, no. <laughs> well, I think you should do that, don't you? I mean, she could be trying to phone you at this very moment with some sort of explanation. Here, you ring the hospital. Did I tell you it's my birthday today? No. I'm 43. Happy birthday. Thanks. Doing anything special tonight, then? No. I might go down to the social club for a few beers. That'll be about it. Do you want to come? No, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> How long have you been in the force? Nearly 20 years. Ten as detective sergeant. I'm still dreaming of making D.I. Uh, why not? I've been passed over too many times, that's why not. It would require an act of considerable merit on my part for my name ever to be taken seriously again at a promotion board. <sighs> oh, I don't know. Been blokes waiting longer than you who've made it. Yeah, but my face doesn't fit anymore. It certainly doesn't fit with people like Armstrong. No. What I want now is, is a job as an advisor with some security firm. You know, sort of thing. Something at twice my present salary, plus expenses, and a firm's car. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't? 
Burgess. Yeah. What? Well, I don't want to see her. How old is she? Yeah, and how long has she been missing? One night. Does she know there's nothing we can do to bring her back? Yeah. Oh, all right, I'll have a word with her. Put her in one of the interview rooms with a cup of tea and a policewoman. Okay, you better bring it in. What's up? A distraught mother who's mislaid her daughter. She's having a nervous breakdown all over the duty, Sergeant. What are you gonna do? Have a word with her. Reassure her. You know, the usual cobblers. Oh, there's a photograph. Perhaps you'd like to file it when the sergeant brings it in. Well, seems she came prepared for the worst. Well, they always do, don't they? Mrs. Marsden? Hmm? Yes? I'm Detective Sergeant Burgess. Oh? I've just had a word with the duty sergeant, and, uh, well, whereas I fully appreciate how you must be feeling, there's very little we can do at the moment. But why not? Well, I'm sure the sergeant has already explained most of the reasons to you. Yes, but my daughter hasn't run away. She hasn't taken any of her things with her. Have you checked thoroughly? Well, of course I have. I mean really thoroughly. It's not unknown for someone to leave home and not take their clothes with them. I mean, they're bulky things. Difficult to get out of the house undetected if you want to leave quietly. The sort of thing you want to check on are articles like bank deposit, passbook, valuable jewellery, <laughs> checkbook. Things you wouldn't immediately notice were missing. No, but look, Sergeant, I know you probably think I'm just being an hysterical mother, but I know Julia hasn't run away from home. We get on very well together. She's studying to be a nurse. It's a job she loves. And her final exams are in a few weeks' time. If she just wouldn't run away with that about to happen, whatever else was going on in her life. I gather she hasn't gone into work today. No. <laughs> I'm <laughs> terrified something awful has happened to her. Please, <laughs> Mrs. Marsden. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. That's all right. Did your daughter go into work yesterday? Yes. Her ward sister said she went off duty at three yesterday afternoon, just as usual. Were you expecting her to come straight home? No, she, she was to meet her boyfriend. I think they were going shopping and then on to the cinema. Only she wasn't there when they went to collect her. Where were they supposed to meet? Oh, I don't know. You'll have to ask him. OK. What's his name? Uh, Raymond Taylor. I, I gave his address to the sergeant. Right. Now, Mrs. Marsden, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll have a word with Mr. Taylor and see if he can shed any light on where your daughter might have gone. It's possible she may have confided in him. I'll also see our patrol cars are given her a photograph. And if she's spotted, we'll ask her to get in touch with you. But I'm afraid after that it's her decision. You do understand that? Yes. But I've got this terrible feeling that she's dead. Now, that's silly. Is it? I don't think so. Aren't you still looking for that man? Who? Oh, you know. That man, the murderer. Oh, you mean the one they call Slippery Sam? Yes. You can forget about him. Well, you never caught him. I know. But we have every reason to believe the man responsible has left the area. Well, how can you know? Because I'm part of the team still working on the case. And let me tell you that via reports, interviews, forensic information, I know as much about that bloke as it's possible to know without actually meeting him. Believe me, Mrs. Marsden, he's gone. But he's already killed three women. The last one was five months ago. You have no need to worry about Slippery Sam. But why do you call him that? Well, that was the press. You know them, they like to put a handle on everything. And much to our embarrassment, we nearly grabbed him a couple of times. But he was lucky. He managed to slip away. I see. I don't worry about it, Mrs. Marsden. I'm sure Julia will turn up. All right? Thank you. I'll get a car to take you home. A policewoman can stay with you for a bit if you want. OK. Yes. Oh, don't worry. We'll be in touch soon. How did it go? Oh, I can't stand women crying. Were you able to reassure her? Oh, I doubt it. I think she's convinced Slippery Sam's got hold of her. Hello? 
Carpool, this is Sergeant Burgess. Can you arrange for a vehicle to take a Mrs. Marsden home? Yeah. She's in interview room two. OK. Uh, try and be quick about it. She's in a bit of a state. She is. Is this the uh, daughter? Yeah. Not a bad looker. A sort of slippery salmon, like. Don't you start. Sorry. Do you want any action taken on this girl? Why not? We haven't got much else to do. Right. I'll get the photograph distributed then. Yeah. Might as well have a wheel with a boyfriend too. Shall I come along? Well, if you fancy the exercise. Mm. Oh, hello, Mum. Yes, yes, I'm afraid we're still in bed. Mm. Pardon? Are you all right? Are you sure? Yes, yeah, what's the matter? Oh, come on, Mum, tell me. Please. All right, let me talk to Malcolm. I'll ring you back in a few minutes. Are you on your own? Why not ask Mrs. Fletcher to come in and keep you company? I'll call back in a little while. What was that about? Oh, I don't know. Well, what did she say? Nothing very much. She was crying. She's always bloody crying. Oh, don't start, Malcolm, please. It's true, though. All right, I know it's true, but this time she sounded really unhappy. She wants me to go up there. Oh, no. This happens nearly every bloody school holiday. You don't have to come. Well, I know, but it would be nice to spend the remainder of half term with you. I'm sorry. I suppose the reason for the tears was your bloody father again. Isn't it always? Why does he always have to go off on the razzle during school well, holidays? Why don't you ask him? Perhaps I might. <sighs> hmm. But she sounded... She really sounded unhappy. Yes. Oh, I suppose you'd better go. I think I should. I'll ring the station and see what time the trains are. Well, don't you want me to come with you? Of course I do. You know I don't cope very well with her on my own. Mm. But you don't have to come if you don't want to. Yeah, well, we'll take the car. I think it should be able to wheeze its way up there one more time. I never liked this new estate much. Why not? I don't know. It's sort of missing. Seems sort of bare. Not quite finished. How do you mean? I don't know. Perhaps it's because there aren't any trees. My wife spent nearly two years trying to persuade me to buy a house up here. I reckon you were wise not to. I sometimes wonder. She'd no sooner stop pestering me about the house than she up and left. Good morning, sir. Raymond Taylor? Yes. I'm Detective Sergeant Burgess. This is Detective Constable Bailey. We did phone, sir. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Come in. Sorry about the mess. Uh, if you throw that stuff on the floor, you can sit down there. Well, I don't know whether you've spoken to Mrs. Marsden this morning, but I've already explained to her that there's very little we can do about her daughter's disappearance. Yes, she told me. The only reason I'm here now is to try and get a better picture of what might have happened. I gather you were planning to meet Julia yesterday afternoon. That's right. And what time was that? It was supposed to be about half past three, but I had trouble with my car. I couldn't get it started. So what time did you turn up? Not until about ten past four. Where were you planning to meet? I was collecting her from the hospital. Were you surprised she hadn't waited? Well, very surprised. I mean, the car I've got is an old bagger. I'm always having trouble with it. <laughs> Nowadays, I'm more often late than early. Her mother said you were going shopping together. Yes, that's right. Well, there's no chance she might have gone off by herself. You know, frighten the shops might close or something. Oh, I doubt it. We're supposed to be going over to Birmingham. Well, perhaps she just got fed up waiting. She's not like that. <laughs> she knows if I'm late, there's a good reason. We've been going out for two years now. She knows I never keep her hanging around on purpose. When you found she'd gone, did you go into the hospital and see if she left a message? Well, no. <laughs> you see, I didn't actually go to the hospital itself. Sir? I haven't explained this very well. You know there's a new one-way system just been introduced around the hospital? Yes. Well... I've not really sorted it out yet. 
And if you miss the turn off to Birmingham, you have to go all the way round before you can turn off again. So where did you arrange to meet her? On the corner of Fitzgerald Road. Which end? Um, at the junction with Chandos Road. That's a fair old walk, in it? Well, I suppose it is. Well, it's just that it's easier for me. What would Julia have been wearing? Sorry? What was she likely to be wearing yesterday afternoon? I mean, would she have changed or would she have met you in her uniform? Oh, well, she usually changes if we're going out somewhere. So she would have taken clothes into work with her? I suppose so. Well, I've never really thought about it. Hmm. I suppose you've no idea where she is. No. I'd tell her mother if I did. And you didn't have an argument with her yesterday afternoon? Well, of course I didn't. I didn't see her. Not even when you got to Birmingham? You didn't leave her there, did you? No. Okay. Don't look so worried. You don't think I've done anything to her? I doubt it. How does she get on with her mother? Fine. Argue much? Well, Julia never mentioned it if she did. And she has not said anything to you in the recent past that might suggest she wanted to leave home? No. Even if it was only to go off for a few days by herself? She just isn't the sort of person who would do that. Not without saying something first. She's to consider it. And why should she want to leave home anyway? Well, ask her when we find her. Until then, thanks very much for your help. Well, what happens now? We'll keep an eye open for her. Don't worry. We'll let you know as soon as we learn something. Well, isn't there anything else you can do? I'm afraid not, sir. Do you want to stop for lunch? I don't think so. I'd rather keep going. You know, it amazes me how that marriage manages to stagger on. Well, this time I'm going to find out why it does. I mean, this must be the fourth time in a year this has happened. Mum can't go on like this. Neither can we. Mm. I wonder why he stays. What do you mean? Well, if he can still pull the birds with the ease he seems to, why doesn't he shove off altogether? I don't know. I can't believe he even likes her very much now. He always comes back. Only because she's stupid enough to forgive him. I don't know why she doesn't kick him out of it. She could hardly be worse off than she is now. Burgess. Oh, hello, Mrs Marsden. Have you? Was there anything missing? I see. Hang on, I'll just make a note. Jeans. Navy blue polo neck sweater. Plim soles. And what? A black duffel coat. Nothing else. None of her personal effect. I see. What about her uniform? Yeah. Okay. Well, many thanks, Miss... Sure, don't worry. We'll be in touch as soon as we learn anything. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Marsden. Yeah. Goodbye. God, that woman does go on. Oh, you can't blame her. That still doesn't make it any easier to put up with. Is uh, this what you might be wearing? Yeah. Black duffel coat, navy blue pullover, jeans and plimsolls. That'll make her really conspicuous. Especially the jeans and plimsolls. No personal effects missing. No. So let's hope she hurries up back. Well, if this is accurate, I think it unlikely Sam's got hold of her. Where is it? Sighting of the said villain. Where? Madrid. <laughs> Where did that come from? It was with the Interpol stuff coming this morning. He gets around, doesn't he? The last place was Geneva. Do you, uh, think the super will let us check it out? You must be joking. He wouldn't sanction a trip for you to put flowers on your mother's grave on your day off. Yeah, could be right. Come on, let's go and have something to eat. I'll treat you to lunch down at the Swan. Oh, birthday lunch. Why not? We could try their real ale. It's supposed to be quite good. Oh, bugger it. If it's the D.I. complaining about you were spelling again, you'll be buying the lunch. Burgess. Yeah? Where? Walton Woods. Have you told the heavy brigade? What about Mr Armstrong? Right. No, I'm going straight up there. Now what? Someone's found a body at Walton Woods. It's cold. Why do these sort of things always happen just when you're about to go to lunch? If this is Sam's handiwork, you'll be bloody glad you missed it. <sighs> Sutton? Yeah, Skip? Is the dock here yet? Yeah, he's up at the site. What's he like? As usual. Well, that's something to look forward to. The control van's been quick in getting here. Then our Lord and Master is in residence. We need not fear anything, except his breath. I don't think I've ever got that close to Armstrong. You're very wise. His breath's so bad, you wish he had a simple case of halitosis. 
Why does Armstrong cause you so much needle? He just gets up my nose. Do you know, he once called me an incompetent snotbag. He calls everybody that. It's part of his childish job. I know, but when he said it to me, he meant it. You're too sensitive. I'm not. It's not without reason he keeps blocking my promotion. He meant it all right. And it wasn't until he started doing that I realised how bloody ambitious I was. Uh, well, Collar Sam, they'll probably make you chief superintendent. Collar him and I'll expect to be made bloody king. Hello, Doc. You don't look too cheerful. Neither will you be when you see the state the body's in. That bad, eh? That bad. Have you finished with it? Yes. Do you mind if we have a look? If you want. You were right. It is bad. Is it a sum killing? Without considerably more work, I can't tell you anything for certain. But I think so. Head bashed in. Badly mutilated face and chest. Plus strangulation. That's my boy. She been raped. Yes. How long she been dead? Difficult to tell at the moment. It's such a cold night, it's affected the decomposition. But I think between 24 and 36 hours. Any ID? Not yet. Could it be her? You saw the face. How can I possibly tell? Have a good look. If it is her, we can get things moving much faster. I realise that, but I can't help you. Who is she? Julia Marsden. She went missing yesterday. I can't say if it's the same person. OK, Doc. Thanks. Oh, one thing. Any of her clothing left? The remains of a pair of jeans, blue pullover, not much else. What about a black duffel coat? Not that I've seen. OK. Perhaps you'd care to tell Superintendent Armstrong that I finished. Sure. That the sooner he gets the body to the lab, the sooner he'll have my report. I'll do that. And thanks for your help, Doc. That's all right. She was in a mess, wasn't she? They all are. Is this the first of Sam's work you've seen? Yeah. Let's hope it's the last. Hello, Mum. Jenny. Oh, it's really nice to see you, love. I'm so glad you could come. Hello, Maureen. Hello, Malcolm. Oh, you don't know how pleased I am you could both come. Come in, come in. Come into the sitting room. Uh, would you like some tea? That would be nice. Shall I make it? No, you sit down. I'd rather make it. It gives me something to do. Well, all right, then. Do you know where everything is? I should do. I've been here often enough. Is he all right? Of course. Only he seemed a bit strange. <laughs> oh, Malcolm's fine. You know what he's like. Don't worry about him. He's just a bit tired after the drive. Anyway, we're not here to discuss him. I know. And I'm sorry the way I phoned up this morning. Oh, it's all right, Mum. Don't you worry about it. I felt so unhappy. What's happened? The usual. Dad? Yes. I haven't seen him since Thursday evening. Do you know where he is? I've no idea. That's what's so worrying. I usually know what he's up to. How do you mean? Well, you know what he's like when he meets someone he takes a fancy to. Starts taking extra trouble about the way he looks, always changing his underwear. Shaves twice a day, that sort of thing. That's usually followed by him staying out half the night, having to entertain clients, as he calls it. <sighs> then the inevitable trip that necessitates him having to go away for the weekend. <laughs> I mean, it's pathetic to see him at work. It sounds bloody insulting. You're probably right. But anyway, this time there hasn't been anything. No hints, nothing. I've not got the faintest idea where he is. Have you tried to phone him at work? Well, that's the first thing I did, but he isn't there. The person I spoke to said he was on leave. And they didn't know where he'd gone? No. Have you spoken to the police? <laughs> what could I say? My husband's gone on holiday and hasn't bothered to tell me where. <laughs> they just laughed. It's possible he's had an accident. The police could at least check the hospitals for you. Oh, don't say that, Jenny. I think you should consider it. Kettle's on. Thank you. Well... This time, that bastard of a father of mine has gone off without saying anything. That's nothing new. But Mum's got absolutely no idea where he's gone. I think we should phone the police. Why? He might have had an accident. Forget about it. He'll turn up when he's good and ready. He always does. I don't think we should bother the police, Jenny. I'll phone the hospital in a little while. Anyway, from the amount of police activity we saw as we drove into town, I doubt whether they give much consideration to looking for some overgrown schoolboy on the razzle. Oh, shut up, Malcolm. What do you mean? It's nothing. It's just that we saw a lot of police cars in a field as we came off the motorway. Oh, what were they doing? I don't know. It was probably nothing important. 
Well, it's nice to get a bit of warm. Any tea going? You must be joking. This is Armstrong's control van. Vitriol's the only thing that's proved here. Where have you two been? I told you. I beg your pardon, sir. We took your bloody time getting here. Oh, sorry. We were having a word with the doctor. Has he finished? Yes. He said you can move the body as soon as you like. I wish that quack would report directly to me. I'll tell him for future references. Don't you bother. I'll tell him yourself. Anyway, what do you have to say? Nothing much. Although he did reluctantly say he thought Sam was responsible. Ah. So, he's back. I'm with a vengeance, it seems. Yeah, only this time we're going to collar him, and before he needs to kill again. It's possible we might have a slight edge on him this time. Yeah? How come? Well, this could be his victim. What makes you think that? Well, it's as much a feeling as anything. Well, this girl was reported missing this morning. She's a student nurse at the local hospital. So? Well, she doesn't fit in the usual pattern of girls that abscond. She's got a fairly stable home, very much involved in her job, got a regular boyfriend, all that sort of thing. Yeah. In fact, on the surface of it, she's got no reason to leave home at all. Neither has she taken any personal possessions with her. You check this out? As far as I can. Mm. Have you seen the body? Yeah, but the face is too bashed about to identify her. Yeah. All right. Well, mark her up as a possibility. Talk to the parents again. There's only a mother. Well, then talk to her. You, Bailey, find out who a doctor and dentist are and get on to the hospital where she works. It's likely they'll at least know the colour of her blood, if nothing else. Right, sir. Burgess, go careful when you talk to the mother. We've had enough trouble with the bloody press without them accusing us of terrifying respectable old ladies into believing their daughters are dead. There's still every possibility she's alive and well and making her way straight towards Piccadilly Circus. Where is she? She'll be all right, although she's a bit exhausted. I don't think she slept at all last night. Do you want a hand? No, I'm nearly finished. There's no need to dry up. Just let the stuff drain. I thought I might ring the doctor. At least he can give her something to help her sleep. Yeah. Oh, I hate that man. My bloody father. If only he knew the pain he caused. I must admit I'm a bit surprised she still reacts like this. I mean, this must be the fourth time he's gone off for a dirty weekend in a year. I know. But it's a bit different this time. There was none of the usual build-up. He's just upped and gone. Do you think he's left her? Oh, I don't know. Mum's convinced herself he hasn't. It amazes me how I can still pull the birds at his age. He may be 52, but as you well know, he looks ten years younger. And he could charm the knickers off a nun if he wanted. I'm going to phone the doctor. All right, hey. And when he gets here... I suggest you ask him for something for yourself. Mm. Oh? Mm. oh, I'm tired. Mm. Yes? Mr. Armstrong gone? About an hour ago. I think he said he was going back to the Nick. Oh, I'm hungry. Right. Oh, I could That's do with something as well. I think yes. we're still wanted here. Well, I'm okay. certainly not. Perhaps we could slip out for a bit. Pubs are open. That's not a bad idea. I'll have a word with the DI. I reckon he heard you. Thank yes? Yes, go. Just have Mr. Armstrong on the phone. He wants you back at the nick at once. What's so? We've just identified the victim. Who is it? Seems you're right. It's Julia Marsden. So get your ass back there quick and take Bailey with you. You wanted to see me, sir? Yes, come in. I suppose you've heard. I have. Here's a pathologist's report. Makes much the same reading as the other Sam murders. Have you told the girl's mother yet? Not yet. I've sent a car to fetch her. When I spoke to Mrs. Marsden this morning, I asked her to check to see whether any of Julia's clothes were missing. And? Well, apart from jeans and a pullover, there was a black duffel coat. I wondered if it had been found. Hmm. Hang on. Hello. Mrs. Armstrong, did you find a black duffel coat this afternoon? Yeah. Can you check the list, then? I suppose it could be at the hospital. Well, it isn't. This is the contents of a locker. Uniform, shoes, towel, a couple of magazines. Yeah? Ah, are you sure? Ta. No duffel coat. Hardly something you'd miss. <laughs> you don't know the snot bags are up there this afternoon. Some of them wouldn't notice a steamroller parked in Westminster Abbey. Look, Burgess, I know we've not got on too well in the past, but I'm prepared to forget about that. You responded well when Julia Marsden was reported missing. He looks good in a report when it's seen we've taken action from the very beginning. Keeps the press happy. Helps remove some of the tarnish from our somewhat green image. Right? Yes, sir. I gather you've already had a word with a boyfriend. I don't think we've anything to worry about there. Good. Now, look, I want you to lead one of the teams on this case. 
Select your own men if you want. But I want results. If Sam's on our patch this time, I want him. I don't want the press rechristening him Slippery Slippery Sam. Understood. Yes? But don't you let me down, Burgess. I'm putting my faith in you. You screw up on me and there'll be trouble. You work well and I'll make sure the right people hear about it. Because if we grab Sam, there'll be a lot of promotion handed out. You may well see Detective Inspector yet. I'll look forward to it. Good. And one more thing, don't forget I'm in charge of this case. As if I would. You're only leading your team. You get your nose stuck into something, you let me know. You try and rush off on your own glory hunting, and I'll crush you. The glory's to be spread around on this case, not hogged. Understood? Of course. Good. Then we'll get on fine. Right, you let me know who you want in your team and I'll OK it. Right? Sure. There's a briefing tomorrow morning at nine. Should you have any bright thoughts during the night, let me hear them then. What are you looking at? There's a police car pulled up along the road. They're not coming here, are they? No. Oh, thank God for that. I don't think I could stand any more today. Where have they gone? Over there. See where the whole light's just gone off. Oh. A hell of a lot of police activity for such a piddling little town. You're not worried about the car, are you? Well, as long as they don't look too close. And do you know who lives over there? I think it's Mrs. Marsden's house. Well, you seem pleased with yourself. I am. I've just been having words with Armstrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah? He wants me to lead one of the teams on this sum killing. You're joking. I'm not. Suddenly, he loves me. But why the change of art on his part? This morning you were saying he hated your guts. He still does. But he liked the way I followed things up on Julia Marsden. I mean, I could have just shoved the report into a drawer. Everybody else would have. Hey, but you only went to see the boyfriend to get out of the office. He doesn't know that, does he? You jammy beggar. Yeah, well... All right, it was a bit of luck. But that's how most things happen, isn't it? And it's certainly a bit of luck I intend to take advantage of. Especially as Armstrong reckons there could be a lot of promotion handed out to the team of breaks this case. I must admit it would be very nice to be a D.I. But, uh, I thought you were going into the, uh, Bogart business. I'm serious. This could be our big chance. Yeah, it could be. Aren't you getting a bit carried away? Why? Well, we'd just be one team among many. What if Armstrong gives us the bum end of the case? There's not much chance for us if we spend all our time sweeping up after everyone else. Armstrong's desperate to break this case. It's been hanging over him for a year. So? So we'll be open to all suggestions. So what are you planning to wow him with? Remember the interview with the boyfriend? Yeah. Do you remember he was supposed to be meeting her on the corner of Fitzgerald and Chandler's Road, and that he was late? So? Well, he gave the impression that Julia was the sort of woman who would have waited patiently for him. But she didn't. She went off. Yes, but after waiting how long? He was 40 minutes late. She could have waited anything up to a couple of minutes before he arrived. And you're hoping someone might have seen her? That's it. But more important, that someone might have seen Sam pick her up on that corner. After all, she got into the car somewhere. Yeah, that's true. So what I'm going to suggest to Armstrong in the morning is that my team knocks on the door of every house in the Fitzgerald Chandler's Road area. Some nosy parker might have seen what went on. You reckon Armstrong will let you handle it? Why not? Someone will have to. Why not the bloke who suggested it? Uh, what time's the briefing tomorrow? Nine o'clock. God, it's been a long day. Mm. How long do you think we'll have to stay? I don't know. I suppose we can't stay longer than Sunday. Mm. Depends what happens. Hey, just think. At this very moment, your dad is probably shacked up in some hotel, humping his current bird without a care in the world. Mm. Well, let's hope he stays with her this time. Do you think your mum will take him back? I don't know. She's pretty hurt. I think she realises things can't go on like this. Mm. Let's just hope he writes soon so we can all get on with our lives again. Mm. I'm going to sleep. You feel all right? Mm. Gin and Valium are certainly a very good mix. Good night. Burgess? Yeah. 
How many men will you need for this house-to-house thing of yours? As many men as you can spare. Uh, the way things are going, you might be working alone. Yeah. I'll need every man I can get hold of to search those woods again. The duffel coat's definitely missing. Mrs Marsden's convinced it is, so I suppose we've got to do something about it. <laughs> Did I have a session with her? Talk about crying. She went on and on. I had to get a bloody doctor to her in the end. Where is she now? They're taking her into hospital, women's medical. <laughs> There's a bloody irony. Mm. It's the ward her daughter was working on. <laughs> Hope to God nobody tells her. The coat into the hospital, is it? No. I had a team in there this morning taking the locker room to pieces and another lot interviewing this stuff. Are you going to get any outside help in? You must be joking. This is a local affair. I want it kept that way. So every man's going to have to work twice as hard as usual. Oh, that's something to look forward to. Should you work three times as hard as usual, Bailey, you should just about turn in a reasonable day's work. All right? Give me five minutes, Burgess. I'll come back to you on how many men you can have. Right, sir. What did I say? Too much. Armstrong doesn't like silly remarks, as you'd have thought you'd learn that by now. Obviously not. Well, there's one thing I have. What? You were right about his breath. Oh, shut up. Find me a road map. I want to work out how we're going to approach this house to house thing. What's the matter? I feel rather strange. How do you mean? Sort of light-headed. Oh, that's probably the side effects of the drugs you took. Oh. Would you like some more tea? Uh, no, I don't think so. Has the postman been? Um, I don't know. Yeah, he passed a few minutes ago. Oh, perhaps there'll be something in the second post. Yes. Actually... I think I'll go and lie down. Can you manage? Of course I can. I'm not an invalid. I'm sorry. Well, if she's going to behave like that, I hope we hear something soon. So do I. I assume we're not going back tonight. I certainly can't. Well, I'm not leaving you here alone. I'll give Charlie a ring, say we can't make it. I'm sorry. Oh, it doesn't matter. Here, see what's on at the local flea pit. Perhaps you can persuade your mother to go out for the evening. I doubt it. Oh, no. What's the matter? Have you seen the headlines? No. There's been a murder. <laughs> Come on, love. What? Why are you... It's Julia. She's been murdered. Who's she? Mrs Marsden's daughter. Across the road? Yes. Julia's dead and I knew her. I knew her. Oh. What a turn. Oh. Bloody hell. This brass monkey weather out there. How's it going? We're on both sides of Chandas Road. Move the lads into Merritt Street. Good. Any houses you didn't get an answer from? No, there was someone in all of them. The other good thing about that road is that the houses are all owner-occupied. So the people who aren't at home will get to hear about what we're after. Might get a call later on. Let's hope so. How's it going along here? Not so good. Sixteen houses with no one at home, which includes the two on the corner. If anyone saw Julia hanging about, it would be someone in either of those houses. Well, let's hope the occupiers haven't gone away. I don't think so. There's milk on both doorsteps. What sort of reaction are you getting? Quite strong. A lot of people are very angry. I suppose it's not surprising. It is Sam's fourth. And they're bloody scared. I've actually had three women open their doors on the chain. <laughs> New York star living comes to this great little town of Wallingbridge. Who knows? They'll be issuing us with guns next. Who would give a burke like you a gun? Why not? I've been on the gun course. I've got a distinction, as a matter of fact. You've done the gun course? Yeah. About 18 months ago. I haven't. There you are, then. There you are what? They realise my potential. Potential what? I reckon they want to get rid of you. How come? The only time you'll get a gun is when they send you up against a raving psycho, and he'll probably blow your bloody head off before you can get it out of your pocket. Now, that's not a very nice thing to say. Well, what do you expect? I'm jealous. I want to know why I haven't been on a gun course. Perhaps because you didn't apply. You could be right. <laughs> now. But seriously, do you think they'll issue guns? What, for Sam? No, he only strangles women. They'll get Armstrong to breathe on him if he comes to the showdown. <laughs> hey, up. What? Woman, just got into number three. Come on.
Yes. Good morning, madam. I'm Detective Sergeant Burgess. This is Detective Constable Bailey. <clears throat> We're making inquiries concerning the death of Julia Marsden. Julia Marsden? Do I know her? That's what we're hoping to find out. Mm, you'd better come in. Thank you. Oh, would you mind wiping your feet thoroughly? I've just had the whole carpet shampooed. Oh. Sorry. Thank you. If you would like to come this way. Now, Julia Marsden. Uh, this is a photograph of her. Mm, no, I don't know her. Now think carefully. You didn't by any chance see this person standing on the corner of Fitzgerald Road on Wednesday afternoon? No. You're quite sure? Positive. Although, now you come to mention it, I do recall a young woman. But it wasn't the girl in the photograph. What time was that? Oh, about a quarter to four. In fact, I remember her quite distinctly. And why is that? Oh, she looked so cold. As though she'd been waiting some time. I felt quite sorry for her. In fact, I must have stared because she noticed me looking and smiled. It was quite a charming smile. But you don't recognise the photograph as being the same girl you saw waiting? Oh, no. The girl in the photograph is far less attractive. Do you remember what she was wearing? No. Oh, yes. I recall she was wearing plimsolls. I remember that quite distinctly as I consider them totally unsuitable footwear for such a cold day. That's all? You can't remember anything else she was wearing? Yes, I can. A duffel coat. I recall a duffel coat. I remember that because I thought the duffel coat so sensible and the plimsoll so foolish. Can you remember the colour? No. I, I think it was dark. Possibly dark blue or black. I can't remember for certain. But you're sure about the time you saw her? Oh, yes. Uh, how can you be so certain? Well, when I got in, I unpacked my shopping and made myself a cup of tea. I then took the tea upstairs to my bedroom and switched my radio on. And? Listen to the four o'clock news. Did you see the girl again? As a matter of fact, I did. When I was closing my curtains. When was that? It was after the news. Why is the time so important? The young lady in the photograph and the girl you saw waiting outside could well be the same person. Oh, I don't think so. The photographs can be deceptive. Why are you so interested in this person? Because she's been murdered. Good heavens. Well, that's absolutely dreadful. When you saw her from the bedroom window, was she still alone? Yes. No, as a matter of fact, a car pulled up. I remember now. She walked over to the car, smiling. It was the same smile she'd given me. Such a pretty smile. But then she looked surprised and uh, spoke for a minute or two to the driver. Did she get into the car? Yes, she did. And can you remember anything about the car? Oh, yes. It was a dark blue Cortina estate. You're that sure? Without a doubt. How come? My son-in-law has exactly the same make of car. I see. Look, uh, Mrs... Uh... Meadows. Yeah, Mrs Meadows. I think we should start getting some of this down on paper. Would you have any objection to coming down to the station to make a statement? Well, um, I don't think so. Mrs Meadows, I'm Superintendent Armstrong. How do you do? Sorry I've kept you waiting so long, but I've been studying your statement. It's a very interesting document. You're a very observant woman. Thank you. Uh, there are just one or two things I'd like to go over with you again. And now... You still maintain that the girl you saw getting into the car and the young lady in the photograph are not the same person? Without a doubt. Then perhaps you'd like to look at these. Story them carefully. Now, do any of these photographs look like the girl you saw? Um, yes, that one. Hmm. Any of the others? Um, uh, that one too. Thank you. And what about these other photographs? They're not of the same person, are they? No. Fortunately for us, you've recognised the two photographs we wanted you to. They're Julia Marsden. The others are just there to confuse. But the two I've chosen are nothing like the first photograph that was shown to me. Ah, that was a studio portrait. They tend to flatter. But uh, there's no doubt in your mind that these two photographs are of the person you saw getting into the car. None. Good. Now, there's your identification of the car... You were so sure it was a blue Cortina estate? There's no doubt in my mind at all. Do you know much about cars? Absolutely nothing. If I were to show you some photographs of current popular cars, would you be able to name them? I very much doubt it. 
Then why are you so sure it was a blue Cortina estate? As I explained to your sergeant, my son-in-law drives one. Perhaps you'd like to have a look at these. Is there a Cortina estate amongst those photographs? Oh, dear. That one and that one. Thank you. It's a great pity you seem to doubt my word. Oh, not at all. It's just that we must confirm that you're not mistaken. I really am mistaken. I'm beginning to believe it, Mrs. Matters. Would you like to test my ability as to whether I can recognise the colour blue? I don't think so. Now, you say in your statement that you noticed a sticker in the back window of the car. That is correct. What did the sticker say? Oh, really, this is becoming ridiculous, Superintendent. I've already told the sergeant all this. I realise that, and I, I must ask you to bear with me for just a little longer. <laughs> You're a very important witness. Uh, but before we can act on your information, we must make doubly sure we have everything crystal clear. Hmm? Now, what did the sticker say? Well, I don't actually remember it verbatim, but the gist of it was that the owner of the car thought that the local grammar school should not go comprehensive. Are you sure about that? I certainly am, as it's a statement I'm in total agreement with. I see. Only a fool would want such a fine school to go comprehensive. Did you notice anything else about the car? Were there any dents or scratches? No. Mm, and you didn't notice any parts of the registration number? No. Not even the year letter? I would have told you if I had. Uh, right. One last question, Mrs Meadows. The driver of the car, did you see him? Not really. I caught a glimpse of his profile. Do you think you'd recognise him again? I can't really say. It was just a glimpse. Well, it's possible if I were to see him in similar circumstances, I might just recognise him. But I'm not certain. OK, Mrs Meadows, thank you very much. There's just one more thing I'd like you to do before we take you home. In the next room, we have some photographs that I'd like you to look at. It's just possible you might recognise one of them as the driver. If you wouldn't mind. Of course not. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you think I could telephone my husband? Uh, of course. There's a phone next door. Oh, I've met some self-opinionated old bitches in my time, but she takes bloody first prize. But is she right? Mm, I think so. Or at least I'm confident enough to act on it. You've done well, Burgess. Bloody well. Thank you, sir. Now, I want one of you to get on to DVLC at Swansea and get them to provide me with a list of all blue Ford Cortinas registered in this area. How uh, can you be certain it's a local car, sir? The sticker. The grammar school this year is totally a local matter. The chances of an out-of-town car carrying such a thing are almost nil. It also seems from the way Julia reacted to the car, she must have known the driver. Hmm. Anyway, get onto that list immediately. I want it today, if possible. Right, sir. Uh, what about the team searching for the duffel coat? Have uh, they found anything yet? No. And I'm almost hoping they don't now, because if it's not in the wood, there's a good chance it'll be in the murderer's car. Are you awake, Mum? Yes. I've made some tea. Oh, that's nice. How do you feel now? Much better. Good. Did I hear you crying? That was this morning. You've been asleep all day. Have I? Oh, dear. And there's nothing to worry about. That was me just being silly. What was the matter? It was just something I read in the paper. You and Malcolm are all right, aren't you? Of course. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. Oh, it's just that I find Malcolm a bit difficult to understand. He's a bit brusque at times, but he's very caring in his own way. Does he love you? I think so. But you don't want to worry about us. Oh, you know me, I always worry too much. What does Malcolm think about your dad? Well, he's not very pleased about the way he behaves, but that's only because it upsets me so much. And he certainly doesn't understand why you put up with it. Come to that, neither do I. Your dad's a strange man. He's like a little boy in many ways. How long has he been carrying on like this? Oh, I suppose for about five years. As long as that? It is a long time, isn't it? 
Oh, maybe it wasn't as bad as this to begin with. Why do you think he started? Lots of reasons, I suppose. I think he realised he was beginning to get old. He wanted some sort of fling before he was past it. I didn't blame him. I often felt like that myself. Did you do anything about it? Well, once. I'm pleased to hear it. The thing is that when your dad started, he found there were far more women available than he'd ever dreamed possible. And it must have gone to his head. Did you consider leaving him? Not then. Because in the early days, he was discreet. Oddly enough, I wasn't even jealous. I didn't feel threatened because he was having a little bit on the side. Then about 18 months ago, he took up steady with someone. We even talked about a divorce. And then she chucked him over. I think it upset him a good deal. Because that's when he started behaving really badly. Oh, I suppose I should have told him to go. Why didn't you? I don't know. I think I was scared of being alone. Do you still love him? Not really. But we've been married for nearly 30 years. It's a long time. <laughs> a lot of habit to throw away. But surely you realize it's getting out of hand now. I know. This is the fourth time in 12 months he's gone off like this. I realize that. But this is the first time he's actually gone without letting me know what was happening. And I'm worried about him. Do you think he's left you? I'm sure he would have said. I can't believe he'd go off without a word. If he comes back, are you going to let him stay? Yes. Why? Because he can't go on like this for much longer. The years are beginning to catch up with him. He'll have to stop soon. And then we'll be back together. I'd much rather enter old age with him than by myself. I'm... so scared of being alone, Jenny. But that's pathetic, Mum. Don't you think I realise that? How do you spell necessity? You must ask me that twice a week. I keep forgetting, you know I've got no head for words. Just write need instead. I can't put that. My bloody reports are short enough as it is. I mean, necessity has a certain ring about it. Needs a nothing word. I thought you said you had O-level English. I didn't say that. Then what have you got? Well, sort of doubtful CSE. Here you are. Necessity. Don't lose it. Any sign of that list from Swansea? No, sir. I doubt if it'll come tonight. Lazy bastards probably knock off at five. You might as well push off home as well. Right. Do they find the duffel coat, sir? No. It'll be a new development if Sam started nicking things from his victims. Hmm. I'll see. I'm off, then. Good night. Good night, sir. Cheerless bastard. For God's sake, Malcolm, stop staring out of the window. People are still leaving floral tributes at Mrs. Marsden's place. So what? It's the only way they've got of showing they care. They should save on the weeds and just leave them money. When Mrs. Marsden comes home from hospital and sees her front garden full of flowers, it will say considerably more than a pile of little envelopes containing money. Hmm? Oh, you're so cynical at times. The woman has just had her only daughter murdered. If you can only make snide remarks about it, I suggest you shut up. I'm sorry. Oh, so am I. It's not only Mum being so unhappy that's depressing me. It's the whole atmosphere of this town. Well, having a murderer on the loose doesn't help much. It's not even that. I never liked the place, not even when I was a child. I think we should get Mum away from here for a while. If I can persuade her, how would you feel about letting her come to stay with us? Ah. Oh, I wouldn't mind. 
Well, as long as she's prepared to share the spare bedroom with the junk. I don't think that'll bother her. But more important, are you up to coping with her? I'll certainly be able to cope with her much better at home. Right, invite her. Ask her tomorrow, see what she says. All right. Sorry I'm late. I overslept. Yeah, you weren't the only one. Oh, well, uh, this is just the right. Oh, good. Let's hope it contains all we want. Have you seen Mr Armstrong this morning? Uh, I passed by muttering something about a press conference. Oh, that'll set him up nicely for the day. Why does he hate the press so much? Because he's a good, honest, no-nonsense fascist. He thinks there's only one way to run the world, his way, with no questions asked. Journalists sometimes spoil that illusion. Ah. Oh, on computer, readouts, neat. Well, I'm more concerned about the work that thing means. How many Cortina estates are there in this area? I don't know. Though it doesn't seem to be as many as I thought to be. Is there a briefing this morning? Yeah, the DI's taken it. Well, I think we can give that a miss. We've got enough to do sorting this thing out. How are you going to divide it up? By area is the most obvious way. Get a couple of the... Hang on. What's up? What's Mrs Marsden's address? Um, 29 Bridge Road. Well, well, well. There's a bit of luck. What? One of the characters listed here lives in Bridge Road. And what was it Mrs Meadows said? Julia approached the car as though she knew the driver. Dear. Ah, oh, it's not going to be that easy, is it? It could be. It just could be. Oh, I know there was a reason why I woke up smiling this morning. I think that is definitely an address we'll check out ourselves. Right. Let's get the rest of this list divided up, collect ourselves a couple of uniform lads, and we'll be off. This is it. Bridge Road. Drive past the house. I want to have a look first. Right. You two in the back, take your helmets off. I don't want to advertise the fact with you. And there's the car. The house looks quiet. Well, we'll be expecting a mad axeman dancing naked on the lawn. Pull over. Right. We have a neat little semi-detached house. While the detective constable and myself are knocking on the front door, I want you two to slip quietly around the back, just in case this is Sam's address and he tries to make a bolt for it. OK? Well, the stick is where it's supposed to be. Mm. That's a good beginning. Yes? Is John Arnold Maitland in the house? No. Are you sure? Of course I am. He's my husband. May we come in? Who are you? Police. What on earth? This is Detective oh, Constable understood. Bailey. Do you mind if he has a look upstairs? What for? Don't worry, he isn't going to steal anything. Go careful. Right. What is it you want? Just a word with your husband. I told you, he isn't at home. What's in here? But it, it's the sitting room, but... Have a look. If you must. And that uh, room? The kitchen. Do you mind if I let a couple of my friends in? Tell me what it is you want, please. Did you check the shed? Yes, sir. Nothing. Good. You wait here. Do you have the right to charge into my house like this? I was under the impression you invited but it. Not to rampage around it. Don't worry, we won't do any damage. Perhaps we could go into the sitting room. <laughs> I shall see that your superior hears about this. What's your name? Burgess. Can you prove that? Certainly. What is it you want? Where's your husband, Mrs. Maitland? He isn't here. I know that, so where is he? Away? Where? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not sure. He, he travels around so much. Is he usually away over weekends? Oh, sometimes. He's a very busy man. And you don't know where he's gone? Not for certain. Well, he, he usually rings me to say where he's staying. But he hasn't let you know this time. Not yet. Well, it's already Sunday. He can't think much of That's you. That's none of your business. Possibly not. How long has he been away? <laughs> he, he went up on Thursday. Do you know when he's coming back? I'm not sure. Next week sometime. There's no one upstairs, Skip. OK. What's all this about? I'm sure you're not allowed to come into people's homes and behave the way you have. You invited but us. But why do you want to see my husband? Has he done something wrong? We're not sure. We're conducting certain inquiries, and we would just like to talk to him. Well, why won't you tell me what it's about? Because we feel we should discuss the matter with him first. <sighs> then I've nothing more to say to you. Is the Blue Cortina estate parked outside your husband's? What of it? Does he own the car, or is it his firm's? I'm not saying anything else to you unless you prove you have the right to behave in the way you have. All right. I'll get a warrant. So please leave now. As you wish. And I tell you here and now, Detective Sergeant Burgess, I have every intention of reporting your behaviour. You have that right, madam. Go on, Bailey. Well, I screwed that up, didn't I? 
Armstrong will have my guts when he hears about this. Well, I suppose it was a bit rash charging in like that. I was so sure Sam would be there, you know what I mean? Had this very strong feeling. Well, you were wrong. That still remains to be seen. Did you look around when you were upstairs? Yeah. No duffel coat? Uh, I didn't see one. Well, there's got to be something I can give to Armstrong before that woman puts her foot in it. What about the car? Perhaps there's someone there. How do you suggest we get inside it? Or oh, it could take it down the car pound. What is it? Four years old. There's bound to be something wrong with it. Oh, it's parked round the wrong way for a start. Oh, I bet they really missed you when you left traffic division. Come on, let's get back to the nick and see what the others have come up with. Mum! We're home! Oh, thank God for that! What's the matter? I'm so glad you're back. What's happened? The police have been here. What did they want? To talk to John. It was awful. They stormed in here like a gang of hooligans. Did they say why they wanted to talk to Dad? Well, they wouldn't tell me anything. They just wanted to know where he was and when he'd be back. What did you tell them? I said he was away on business. Well, that wasn't very sensible. Well, what else could I tell them? I don't know where he is. Should have told them the truth. They weren't here. The sergeant in charge was like a stormtrooper. He didn't give me a chance to think. Well, you shouldn't have lied to him, though. I don't care. I'm going to report that man. He had no right to behave the way he did. It was awful. Oh, oh try and, try and oh, calm down, did please, you have to go out this morning? I'm sorry. We didn't know this would happen. Look, uh, how long ago were the police here? Oh, I don't know. An hour, perhaps two. Did they say they were coming back? They didn't say anything. What shall we do? Don't know. I suppose the best thing to do is just sit tight, oh. see if they come back again. Oh, well, that's very useful. What else can we do? I don't see any point in ringing them. If they wouldn't tell Mum what this is about, they're hardly going to tell me. I want to report that, Sergeant Burgess. I think we should wait. It's pointless aggravating them till we know what it's about. I shall remember this the next time you lecture me on personal freedom and civil oh, liberties. God. Can't you see the effect this has had on Mum? I know, but I still think we should wait. Burgess? Yeah? You sure? Okay, cheers. Records have got nothing on Maitland. What were you hoping for? Anything to justify what I did this morning. Mind you, the way the reports are going on these other cars, you may not need to. That's what I'm hoping for. We've been bloody lucky, you know. How many cars have they found with stickers? Just two. Well, that doesn't matter anymore. All the drivers interviewed so far have good, checkable alibis, and that's how I like it. Maitland is still suspect number one. Mm. With only one more car to clear, I'm hoping it'll remain that way. Burgess. Yeah? You're absolutely sure? Great stuff. Let me have your report as soon as possible. That's it. Our man. This is Burgess, sir. Do you think I could have a word with you? Yes, very important. Thank you, sir. So you reckon this bloke is Sam? I think there's a good chance he is. And you think his wife doesn't know where he is? She says he's away on business, but I think it's just bluff. Mm-hmm. So what do you want to do? Well, I think we should find out what his car can tell us. Right. We'll also need a warrant. She wasn't any too cooperative when I saw her this morning. Well, I'll arrange that. I think I'd also like to have a word with him myself. A bit of rank might add some weight to the occasion. It might also soften it up a bit. Oh, dear. Come on, Mum. It could be anybody. You can't live in fear of the doorbell for the rest of your life. It is the police. Oh. Seem to have come in force this time. Three cars out there. <laughs> Stay where you are. I'll let them in. Try not to get too upset, Mum. It might not be anything. I can't believe he's done anything wrong. Yes. Certainly nothing Three, that would justify well. all this. Let's hope it's all a mistake. This <laughs> way. It's Detective Superintendent Armstrong and uh, Sergeant Burgess. Good afternoon, madam. You are Mrs. Maitland? Yes. I'm the officer in charge of the investigation into the death of Julia Marsden. Oh, no. And I have reason to believe your husband, John Arnold Maitland, is involved. Right. Well, that's it for the moment. I told you I didn't know anything. But now we've got that fact on paper. Are you the sergeant who came this morning? Yes. I hope you realise you terrified my mother half to death. I'm sorry about that, but it was necessary that I gain quick access to the house. 
However much you may dislike the idea, your father is the main suspect in a murder inquiry. I can't believe it. Until we find evidence to the contrary, I'm afraid it's true. Do you realise Mum has no idea where Dad is? So I gather. And did you also hear he's probably gone off for a dirty weekend? For the umpteenth time this I year? I believe it's the fourth time in twelve months. Dad doesn't have time to be slippery, Sam. Not with the sort of life he leads. He may well combine business with pleasure. Sam has killed four times in the last twelve months. I hope for your sake that the dates of his absences don't match the dates of the murders. Can I have a word, Skip? Excuse me. Well, fingerprint boys think they've got a match. Julia Marsden? Yes. They're positive? Oh, yes. Their smugness confirms it. Careful with that car! Forensic have still got to examine it! Burgess. Chief. I've got one more job for you here. Now what? The state Mrs. Maitland's in, I didn't get much sense out of her, which means you two are gonna have to go through Maitland's things. Diaries, papers, anything that might establish where he was at the time of the other Sam killings. Right. Anything that looks at all interesting, bring it down to the nick. We'll sort it out there. <laughs> Look at the street. Neighbours hanging out of the windows. Right mess they made of getting Dad's car onto the transporter. Ridiculous. I wish I could smile. Are those two policemen still in Mum's room? Yes. They said they'd be there for a while. Where's she gone? She's lying down in our room. I don't think she'll ever recover from this. Well, we'll take her home with us as soon as possible. Get her away from this house. Oh, Malcolm. You don't think Dad's a murderer? I find it difficult to believe. Surely, when you're as disturbed as the murderer must be, you... You can't just hide it like that. Oh, God, I'm so unhappy. Oh. Well, let's hope they find him soon. We'll get things sorted out. It's amazing how much junk you can pour into one of these little writing desks. Yeah, well, at least he's neat. Let's hope he's methodical as well. Are you listing the stuff you're dumping in that sack? Of course I am. What's that supposed to be? One diary. Then why have you written one dairy? Can't you spell at all? Oh, don't start. I'm tired. It's been a bloody long day. For all of us, mate. Yeah, but you enjoy this sort of thing. I mean, going through a bloke's personal papers is hardly a bundle of laughs, is it? It's part of the job. But it's a part of the job I don't like. Just as I don't like looking at the bashed-in face of the young women. You'll get used to it. But I don't want to. Come in. I can't sleep. Come in, Mum. We can't either. Wondering where he might be. Trying to remember whether he mentioned anywhere before he went off. When did you last see him? Thursday evening. He popped in for a little while, fiddled about in the bedroom, then went out again. And didn't come back? No. Didn't you say he started his leave Wednesday evening? Yes. And he was out all day Thursday? That's right. You've no idea where? I thought he'd gone to work. He left at his usual time. Did he take the car on Thursday? Yes. Uh, and when he was here, did he seem himself? What do you mean? Well, did he seem excited or agitated? Don't know. I didn't say much to him. What are you getting at? Oh, nothing, really. I was just wondering where he was on Thursday, that's all. You don't think he killed that girl? <sighs> of course I don't. Then why are you asking me all these questions? I've had questions all afternoon from the police. I'm sick to death of being interrogated. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it to sound like that. John hasn't done anything wrong. He's just gone away for a little while. Yeah, of course he has, Mum. And why have you started calling me Mum? You've always called me Maureen before. She just came out. I suppose it's just a feeling of solidarity. Well, stop it. I don't want your support if you think my husband's a murderer. I don't think that. Come on, Mum. We're on your side. You don't need to fight us. How do I know? How can I tell what you're really thinking? Look. I think you should get away from this house. I'll phone the police tomorrow morning and see if you can come home with us. Mm. I don't want it. It would be better for you. It would get you right away from everything, give you a chance to rest. I'm staying here. This is my home. And I'm not running away from it. No one's asking you to run away. Just come home with us for a few days' rest. I don't want to. And if you think my husband's a murderer, I don't want you here either. Yeah. Yeah, sure, I understand, Mr. Freeman. Sure. Well, there's no doubt. 
Okay. Many thanks for your help. Goodbye. Bloody hell. Yeah, what? That was Maitland's employer. He confirms the diary entries as correct. The week of the first killing, Maitland was in Edinburgh on some course. The week of the third killing, he was in Spain on holiday with his wife. Oh. And to cap it all, Maitland hasn't run off. He's only on bloody leave. Due back a week today. Seems we've boobed again. <laughs> we've boobed? What was Armstrong doing with Mrs. Maitland for two hours? These are the sort of questions he should have been asking her. Well, he said she couldn't remember anything. God, am I fed up with this. Bloody fed up. So we can't nail him for the other murders, so what? He murdered Julia Marsden. We found her fingerprints in his car, and we have an independent witness to say she saw Julia getting into the car half an hour before she was murdered. What more do we want? Continuity, mate. The one consistent factor that's come out of this case, as the pathologist will remind you, is that all four women have been murdered by the same hand. If Maitland didn't kill the first one, he didn't kill any of them. He couldn't have. Then how did her fingerprints get into his car? I don't know. Anyway, let's continue sorting through this lot. We might discover some delightful morsel of information. Malcolm! Malcolm! What's the matter? Look at our car! What's the matter with it? It doesn't look right, does it? It certainly doesn't. Oh, no. Who the... Who the hell could have done that? It's not bloody fair. They were four new tyres. Hardly. Oh, they certainly had a fair bit of wear left in them. Oh, do you know how much they're going to cost to replace? I know. More than we can afford. Exactly. Well, to be honest, Malcolm, I half expected it. But why our car? Oh, don't be so naive. The relations of men who are suspected of strangling women are as unpopular as the men themselves. I hope you're as philosophical when the bank manager asks us why we're overdrawn at the end of the month. We'll see. I hope so. But there's one thing I do know. What's that? Don't replace those tyres until we're ready to leave. Yeah, what do you make of this? What? Look at the last four check stubs. Passport, Swan and Edgar, foils... Selfridges. Look at the date. Last Thursday. Maitland must have been in London on Thursday. And if he was in London, he couldn't have been here murdering Julia Marsden, could he? Well, it would be rather difficult. That's it, then. Conclusive proof. Oh, I suppose I'd better go and see Armstrong. Tell him the good news. I knew my becoming a DI was only a bloody dream. But while I'm in with him, you better get on to the passport office. Make sure Michael renewed his passport personally and not be post. Right. Well, Burgess, seems you've got yourself a bum suspect. What are you going to do about it? There are still the fingerprints in the car. You've got to find out how they got there. I don't think you're going to do that until you find Maitland, old son. There's no news of him. Not a whisper. Ugh. Now you've landed me with the unpleasant task of telling the Chief Constable that Maitland's in the clear. Can't you wait? What for? You seem to have conclusive proof Maitland couldn't possibly have committed any of the murders. No point in sticking my neck out by delaying things, is there? After all, nationwide murder hunt. Very expensive. I see no point in continuing to waste the taxpayers' money and looking for an innocent man. <laughs> Look, I want to have another word with Mrs. Maitland. I'm sure there's something she hasn't I'm told sure us. I'm sure many things she hasn't told us. But it doesn't seem to matter now, does it? Well, there are still the fingerprints. Plus the fact that someone had tried to wipe the passenger side of Maitland's car clean. There must have been a reason for that. You're a desperate man, Burgess. Well, what do you want? Well, can't you give me a couple of hours? Just let me talk to his wife again. I don't know. Your early promise has somewhat withered. Two hours. That's all I'm asking for. All right, then, two hours. Not a second more. And you let me know of any developments, any little thing at all. I promise. Ah, oh, it's you again. Good morning, sir. Is Mrs. Maitland in? Yes. Have you seen what some job's done to my car? I did notice. I suppose you're going to say there's nothing you can do about it? Oh, there's a great deal I can do about it. But I'll just give you a friendly warning and tell you to put your car in order as soon as possible. I'm sure you realise four defective tyres means four separate endorsements. Thanks a lot. Don't mention it, sir. Now, if I might come in and speak to your mother-in-law. Good morning, Mrs. Maitland. I'm happy to say I've uh, got some good news. You found John? Not yet. But she'll be pleased to hear we've established that he couldn't have killed Julia Marsden or any of the other women. Oh, thank God for that. We've discovered he was in London on Thursday. 
There's no way he could have got back here in time. You don't know how relieved I am. But we still have one problem. Who? Oh? Julia Marsden's fingerprints were found in your husband's car. Well, that's not surprising. He knew her. He could have given her a lift any time. We know she travelled in the car the day she died. How can you possibly know that? Because our forensic department says so, and they're not often wrong. They also say there's no doubt your husband's car was used by the murderer. The thing we now have to establish is, who was the driver? But how would they have got hold of the car? Well, it's possible Mr Maitland might have lent his car to a friend on Thursday. Well, I don't know, he could have. Hang on, though. If he did that, how would he have got to London? John wouldn't have taken the car to London. How do you know? He hated driving, and he certainly wouldn't use the car if there was a good train service. So where was the car on Thursday? I don't know. I suppose he took it to the station and left it there. Oh, I wish you told me this at our first meeting. I didn't know where he was on Thursday. Did he have anywhere specially parked his car? How do you mean? Well, it's all double yellow lines round there. He couldn't just park it outside the station. He would have got towed away. Well, well, he probably put it in the car park. That waste piece of ground near the station. Mm, I suppose so. He's certainly parked it there before. You sure? Of course I am. Thank you. Shouldn't you tell Armstrong what we're up to? He can get stuffed. I want to see what we turn up at the car park before I say anything to him. He won't like it. Then he'll have to lump it. When I told him the Maitland thing had collapsed, his whole manner changed. The bastard's only had for himself. He's not interested in supporting his officers. He only wants the glory they earn for him. He's still the super. So what? I'm only a fragile detective constable. Then you've got nothing to lose. But I can still be crushed from a great height. They certainly stacked the cars in this place. Do you notice they've all got their ignition keys in? I did. What do you two want? Police. Oh, yeah. When you find any nicked cars here, they've got nothing to do with me. We only park them. Who are you? The manager. What's your name? Glenn Woods. Are you here all the time? Usually. Were you here last Thursday? I should think so. You better know so, mate. Yeah, I was here. So what? I'm interested in a blue Cortina estate that was parked here all day Thursday. <laughs> How am I supposed to remember a car as common as that? This one was special. It got borrowed during the day. Oh, not from my side. This one did. And the bloke that borrowed it took a girl for a ride. So? And then he killed her. Remember anything now? No one took a car from this site. Have it your own way. Perhaps we should take you down the nick. You might remember better there. Uh, there's no need for that. I want to help. I'm pleased to hear it. All these cars have got their ignition keys in. Why? Well, look around you. There's no other way we get 100 cars on this site. We've got to pack them in as tight as we can. If the first car in wants to be first out, we've got to move a few to get at it. How close an eye do you keep on them? I noticed you too, didn't I? So how did the car I'm interested in get off? Well, I know the car left the site, and I know it was brought back. Who bothered it? Look, uh, you put me in a bit of a spot. I'll kick your bloody face in if you don't tell me. Well, I don't want to drop me, mate, see Look, it? jerk, this is murder. It's not a case of nicking tyres or swapping engines. It's the big one. So if you don't open your gob and tell me who bothered the car, I'll book you for obstruction, OK? All right, all right. Good. Look, this job doesn't pay very much. I mean, I'm all right. But the blokes who actually park the cars don't do well at all. So, to earn a bit extra cash, they clean customers' cars. So? Well, there's no water on the site. You've got to wash the car before you can polish it, you know. So where do you take them? The car wash in Craig Street. I, I mean, it's all legit, nothing on the hand. The customers are grateful. Who took the Cortina out on Thursday? Oh, I'm not sure. I'll ask you one more time. Well, I think it was Charlie. What's his surname? Brown. Oh. On his straight up Charlie Brown. And which one is Charlie Brown? He's not here today. Where is he? Uh, I suppose he's at home. He's sick. He hasn't been in since Friday. All right, Len. Where does he live? Uh, I don't know offhand, uh, you... but I think I've got his address in the hut. You better have. Lead on, Len. We're right behind you. Oh, it's a miserable hole. I don't reckon this staircase has seen a paintbrush this century. We'll complain to the landlord later. This is his room. OK. Ready when you are. We'll take it nice and gently this time. What do you want? Are you Charles Brown? Yes. Do you mind if we have a word with you? Who are you? Police. Oh. <coughs> do you work at the car park near the station? <coughs> well, I'm up to it, but it's... 
What is to call for me at the moment? The wind fair whips across that place. This can't be him, can it? He's a bloody good actor if it is. How old are you, Pop? Sixty-eight. With Bernard. Look, what's all this about? Were you at work last Thursday? I think so. Did you by any chance take a blue Cortina estate to the car wash in Craig Street that day? <laughs> no, sir. Leon doesn't let me do things like that. He doesn't trust me, you see. Did you see such a car being taken off the site? No, well, well, I... I wasn't feeling too good, you see, and I... I spent the day trying to keep warm. <laughs> do you ever do any car cleaning? Not really. This is much this time of the year anyway, and, well, Len hugs what bit there is. That doesn't surprise me. Come on, let's go and get him. Yeah, you get back to bed, Pop. What the hell is all this about? This is Alpha One to control. Over. Control. Over. This is Sergeant Burgess. Priority. I want the nearest cars to go to the station car park and apprehend the manager, Leonard Woods. Repeat, Leonard Woods. Arresting officers are to approach with extreme caution, man believed to be highly dangerous. I am proceeding to car park myself and will prefer charges on arrival. Over and out. But don't just sit there, Bailey. Get a bloody move on. Control to Alpha One. Over. Alpha One, over. Leonard Woods has absconded driving a dark maroon Jaguar. Registration number as yet unknown. Alpha 5 and Delta 3 are in pursuit. Last report states Jaguar joined M1 at Junction 15 and is heading south. Over. Put out a general call and alert the motorway police. If you need clearance, see Superintendent Armstrong. I'm coming in. Over and out. Well, that's it. They won't get him now till he reaches London. What a bloody shambles. Back to the nick. Yeah, only nice and slowly. I think I can wait a little while before I have to see Armstrong's face. Bailey. Yeah, uh, just a moment. It's for you. Who is it? Radio room. Burgess? Yeah? Where? Oh, that's something. OK, keep me in touch. Cheers. Our cars have had to drop out of the chase. They couldn't keep up with him. The motorway police have had to take over surveillance. Oh, that'll please our boys. At least he won't get away this time. Burgess? Yes, sir. Right away. Armstrong. Come in, Burgess. Sit down. So you found Slippery Sam? I hope so. So do I, lad. Why didn't you tell me what you were up to? Well, there wasn't time. Things moved quickly. I would say from what I've heard, they moved a bit too quickly for you. I don't think so. Well, if you proceeded with a little more care, this character wouldn't be driving 7,000 quids with a stolen car. And being chased by police from three counties. So I slipped up, made a mistake. But don't you forget, I found Sam. And you wanted to keep all the credit for yourself. I did warn you about that at the very beginning. The glory was to be shared. But you decided to be greedy. You wanted to make the arrest personally. But instead we had to sit back and wait for this car to run out of petrol. Or motorway. There's no way you can stop a car that's travelling at 130 miles an hour. Our lads are blowing cylinder heads all over the place just trying to keep up with him. The way things are going, they won't get him till he reaches London. Well, that doesn't matter. They'll bring him back. It's not the same, is it? If you remember, I also said that I didn't want help. I wanted the arrest on my patch. I wanted a quiet case. That's because I wanted the glory for our division. You wanted the glory for your bloody self. Yes, you blow your top, lad. You've nothing to lose. You're finished, anyway. What do you mean, finished? It was my bloody brain work that identified the bastard. Oh, that'll go in your report, don't worry. In fact, you get glowing words all the way, but you won't get any promotion. Detective Sergeant, you're finished. That's not fair. Now look, lad, you can't take orders, you don't fit in. That's always been your trouble. You've always robbed everybody up the wrong way. Robbed you up the bloody wrong way, you mean? If you're not prepared to kiss you as stinking feet, you don't get anywhere in this division. If you don't compromise, you don't get anywhere in life. I'm top boy. You're nothing. The basic facts that you've never learnt is that my whims are more important than your desires. 
Armstrong. Yes. When? I see. Thanks. They've got him. At least, what's left of him is crushed. Is he dead? Yes. Should you wish to transfer to another division, I won't block or comment on your application. This would be a good time to do it, lad. I suggest you take my advice, because I don't want you around me. Have you finished? You can go. Oh, two things that might interest you. What? We found the remains of the duffel coat. Woods had tried to burn it behind the shed he used as an office. I wonder why he took it. Well, we'll never know. Thanks to you, will we? And, er, uh, this has just come through from the Rome police. It's about Maitland. Apparently he's on holiday there with a girlfriend. He had no idea what was going on until he saw an English newspaper a couple of hours ago. So he went and saw the local police to try and find out what was happening. Is he coming back? Yeah. When he's completed his holiday. There's no rush. Does his wife know where he is? No. I thought you could pop in and tell her. Thank you. Make it your last duty on this case. Nice city, Rome. So I'm told. When's he coming back? Next week. Apparently he isn't alone. He wants to finish his holiday. You're not going to sit around waiting for him, are you? No. Even I realise it's all over. He doesn't care anything about me. Come back with us, Mum. All right. For a little while. As long as you like. Can we leave today? Of course. I'll go and pack. she be all right? Who knows? Oh, better hurry those new tyres along. You do that. Do you realise the only person who hasn't been touched by any of this is Dad? I know. Even that policeman seemed a bit cut up about something. But good old Dad just drifts along unhindered. Oh, my father. In the investigation of a murder by Eric Sayward, Detective Sergeant Burgess was played by Roger Hume, Detective Constable Bailey by Terry Malloy, Detective Superintendent Armstrong by Geoffrey Matthews, Jenny by Elizabeth Cassidy, Malcolm by Sean Barrett, and Mum by Isan Churchman. With Hilda Schroeder as Mrs Marsden, Peggy Ashby as Mrs Meadows, Michael Irwin as Raymond, Leonard Dixon as the Doctor, Earl Cameron as Charlie, Arnold Peters as Len Woods, and Hedley Necklaus as the desk sergeant Ralph Lawton and the radio operator. The investigation of a murder was directed by Roger Pine. Afternoon Theatre. This afternoon, if you have stereo equipment and live in London, the southeast of England or the Midlands, you'll be able to hear this play in stereo. The play is called The Ringer by Edgar Wallace. This was the turning point in Edgar Wallace's meteoric career from newspaper boy to writer of best-selling fiction. Adapted from his novel of 1925, The Gaunt Stranger, it scored an immediate success at the Wyndham's Theatre, London, in 1926. In the broadcast, we star Bill Fraser as Sam Hackett, Alan Wheatley as Morris Meister, and Fraser Carr as Dr. Lomond. The stereo adaptation is by Raymond Rakes. The Ringer. The fog was so thick in Deptford that night that they were forced to feel their way by railing and wall. Flanders Lane, Deptford a place where police went in couples. Sounds of 1925, when a gaunt stranger haunted the riverside of Deptford, a man wanted for murder, and under cover of fog, escaped justice and fled the country.
the night the ringer got away. And some months later, the Australian police reported that the body of a drowned man taken out of Sydney Harbour was almost certainly the ringer. Almost certainly, because the ringer could ring changes on himself, and no one was absolutely sure, or absolutely safe. And soon there were other sounds, sounds that brought the ringer too near for comfort. A plane flying through the mist which shrouded the countryside between Hatfield and Wellin, just outside London, and coming into land. And then a cablegram to Scotland Yard. Very urgent. Stop. Australian police report Ringer left Sydney by plane and is believed to be making for London. Message ends. Sounds that bring the Ringer too near for comfort. Bliss? Inspector Bliss, are you deaf? Hmm? Huh? Oh, no, not deaf. Busy. It's not my office anyway. You answer that thing. Thank you very much. Hello? Uh, is that Scotland Yard? Yes. This is the assistant commissioner's room. Uh, is the assistant commissioner there? No, he's not here at the moment. Uh, well, it's very urgent. I suppose he's heard the ringers back in London, eh? You must ask him that. Uh, yes, but if the ringers back, I mean, it's pretty serious, huh? I shall ring back. Will you please tell the assistant commissioner the ringers back? Yes, yes, I'll tell him. You'll ring back. <laughs> Why is the assistant commissioner holding this inquiry anyway, Wembury? Surely you're now, Bliss. Oh, you've been away, haven't you? Yes, in America. I wish I'd never come back. I've had a soft job there. Yes, well, the chief had the ringer case in hand, but he's away ill. So Colonel Walford's taking it for him. Well, Walford's about as much knowledge of the job as my foot. Oh, I see. And that's why he's sent for all you people from Deptford, where the ringer used to operate from. Deptford. There's you, Wembury, and your police surgeon. What's his name? Lerman, Dr. Lerman. Yeah, that's the fellow. He's got a hell of a nerve. He tried to teach me my job earlier on this morning. But why on earth has Walter fetched him up from Deptford? He's damn clever at cross-examination. The day we had Predo the Poisoner up here at the yard, Lerman put him through it. What do you mean, put him through it? He well, questioned him in this very room. And he gave himself away. Yeah, anyone could have done that, even you. You're damned offensive, Bliss, but I suppose you can't <laughs> help it. So now we're to have all the brains from Deptford just because... Because I... Deptford, my division, happens to be the one place the ringer... The is... ringer. Why not call him Henry Arthur Milton and have done with it? <sighs> and now we've got this letter from an old lag in Maidstone prison who says he can recognize Henry Arthur Milton. Ah, Sam Hackett, you mean? Yeah. He comes from Deptford, too. <laughs> he would. Well, suppose he does recognize Henry Arthur Milton, or pretends he does. Who else is going to identify him? You, for one, Inspector Bliss. Not me? I never saw the swine. He had his back to me the day I went to pinch him. I just laid my hands on him when there I was, on the ground with four inches of good knife in me. No, who else has seen him? Mm, Morris Meister? Meister, eh? That shady solicitor from... Uh, no, he's from Deptford, too, isn't he? I'm afraid so. He's got a house and offices there, in Flanders Lane. Oh, I bet Meister never saw Henry Arthur Milton plainly in his life. Too full of dope, for one thing. Yes? Is that Inspector Bliss? Yeah. The man who wrote us from Maidstone Prison has arrived. I told him to send him straight up. Yeah. Keep him till I come. I shan't be long. Right, right, sir. Walford sending Hackett straight up. You'd better show him in, Wembury. Thank you very much. Yes, I remember Sam Hackett. Five... Six years ago, I got him 18 months at the London Sessions for housebreaking. He's a born liar. What was his last sentence? Three years. He served his full term, too. He tried to escape. Not been out long. <laughs> oh, this'll be him now. Hello, Sam. Hello, Mr. Wembry. You're looking bright and healthy. How's all the family? Ah, uh, there isn't a family, Sam. Oh, well, you policemen get about, too. <laughs> Why did you try to escape, you fool? You'd have been out before this. Well, a man's a fool to go to stir, but he ain't no fool trying to get away, believe me. Morning, sir. Morning. You remember Mr. Bliss? Bliss? Yeah. You've changed a bit, ain't you? Now, hack it, will you? Now, you've lost a lot of your hair, eh? You shut your ugly mouth. Ah, uh, yeah, that's more like you. Talking about illegitimate children, 
How are now you? Now, listen to me. You behave yourself. To America, eh, you bless? Is that why you've changed? Oh, I wouldn't have known you. Is <laughs> Hackett oh. here? Ah, yes. Come on, up to the desk, Hackett. This is Colonel Walford. Morning, sir. Nice pitch you've got here, sir. All made out of thieving and murdering. Yes, well, Mr. Hackett, we had a letter from you when you were in prison. Right, sir. Now, where is it? Oh, here it is. Ah, yes. Dear sir, this comes hoping to find you well and all kind friends at Scotland Yard. Ah, when I wrote that, I didn't know that Blessia was back. There's a lot of talk about the ringer down here, him that was drowned. Drowned? What? Oh, yes. Him that was drowned, drowned in Australia. Uh, dear sir, I can tell you a lot about him now that he's departed this life. Rip. What? I put that to know, sir. R.I.P. I see, yeah. As I once see him, though only for a second, and I knew where he lodged. Is that true? Yes, sir. I lodged in the same house. Then you know what he looks like. What he did look like, sir, he's dead. No, he isn't. What's that? That doesn't matter. Not dead? The ringer alive. Good morning. Thank you very much. What do you know about him? Uh, nothing. Now, look, I'll tell you the truth, sir, without any madam whatsoever. Without any what? Madam. Telling the tale, sir. Oh. Nosing on a dead man's one thing, nosing on a live ringer's another. I know a bit about the ringer, not much, but a bit. And I'm not going to tell that bit. And why? Because I just came out of stir, and Meister's given me a job down at his house in Deptford. Aim, aim his valet now, you see. Yes, yes, we know Morris Meister has been very good to you, but if you can help us, well, we may be able to help you. If I'm dead, can you help me get alive? I don't know who's on the ringer. He's a bit too hot for me. I don't believe you know anything. What you believe don't interest me, Bliss. Now, come on. If you know anything, tell the commissioner. What are you afraid of? What you're afraid of? He nearly got you once. What? Ah, that don't make you laugh. Shut up, Hackett. I'm very sorry, sir. I think I'd come up here this morning under what is termed a misapprehension. Goodbye, everybody. Now, here, wait. Now, uh, let him go. Let him go. The door, Wembry. Morning's up. Morning, Bliss. We'll meet at the assizes as usual. Morning, Mr. Wembry. This way, Sam. Horace, make a... Now... Uh, he never saw the ringer, sir. I don't agree, Bliss. His whole attitude shows that he has. Wembry, is Morris Meister here yet? Oh, yes, sir. He's been in the waiting room some little time. Bring him in. Yes, sir. Morris Meister of Flanders Lane, Deptford, eh? I wonder Wembry hasn't caught that man. He's the biggest fence in London. Uh, it's difficult. Search warrants aren't issued against solicitors, except on definite complaints. Yeah. And Meister was a big man once, before he came to live in Deptford. He's still one of the best art critics we've got, and <laughs> he plays the piano like a master. Yeah, it's a pity he seems to have gone all to pieces since Gwenda Milton's death. Gwenda Milton, yes. Milton? Shh, here he is. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Meister. I think there must be some mistake. I thought I was going to see the chief constable. Uh, yes, but I'm afraid he's ill. I'm taking his place. Uh, let me relieve you of your hat and stick. Uh, mm -hmm. There, we'll put them on my desk. Uh, do sit down. Thank you. Uh, shut the door, Wembry. Yes. I was asked to call at 12 o'clock. It is now 12.49. And I gather that while I've been waiting, you've interviewed a servant of mine, Hackett. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. Yes, well, you may like to know that I have a case to defend at the Greenwich Police Court. God knows what will happen to the poor devil if I'm not there. Your colleague's face is vaguely familiar. My name is Bliss. Oh. oh I'm sorry. I thought I knew you. It's a little unusual, is it not, to summon an officer of the Royal Courts of Justice to Scotland Yard? Now, Mr. Meister, I'm going to speak very frankly. That is why I brought you here. Brought is not a word I like, Mr... Walford. Uh, Mr. Walford. Colonel Walford. I'm sorry, Colonel Walford. As to frankness, you cannot be too frank with me. Thank you. Now, Mr. Meister, you are a lawyer with a large clientele in Deptford. Yes. There isn't a thief in South London who doesn't know Mr. Meister of Flanders Lane. You're famous both as a defender of hopeless cases and um, as a philanthropist. Thank you. A man commits a burglary and gets away with it. Later, he is arrested. None of the stolen property is found. He is apparently penniless. Yet you not only defend him personally in the police court and through eminent counsel at the Old Bailey, but during the time the man is in prison, you support his relatives. Mere humanity. Oh, yes, I'm sure of that. Now, Mr. Meister, I'm not going to suggest that somebody who has access to the prisoner in a professional capacity 
has learnt where the proceeds of the robbery are hidden and has acted as his agent. I am glad you do not say that, Colonel Watford. Oh, Walford? No, uh, Colonel Walford. If you had said that, I should have been extremely... I'm not insisting on it, I tell you. The money comes from somewhere, Meister. I am not curious. But sometimes you don't support your clients with money. You take their relatives into your employment. I help them in one way or another. When a convict has a pretty sister, for example, you find it convenient to employ her. You have a girl secretary now, a Miss Mary Lenley. Yes, Miss Lenley is outside waiting for me in the car now, if you wish to speak to her. Not just for the moment. Now, Miss Lenley's brother, Johnny Lenley, went to prison for three years on information supplied to the police by you. Which was my duty as a citizen. Quite so. But two years ago... Miss Lenley had a predecessor, a girl who was subsequently found drowned. You heard me? Yes, I heard you. Oh, it was a tragedy. I don't like even to think about it. The girl's name was Gwenda Milton. Gwenda Milton, yes. The sister of Henry Arthur Milton, otherwise known as the Ringer, the most brilliant criminal we have on our records, and the most dangerous. And never caught, Colonel. Never caught. The ringer left his sister in your care. Whether he trusted you with his money, I don't know. But he trusted you with his sister. But I treated her well. Was it my fault that she died? Did I throw her into the river? Be reasonable, Colonel. Why did she end her life? But how should I know? I never dreamt she was in any kind of trouble. And yet you made all the arrangements for her at the nursing home. That is a lie. That didn't come out of the inquest. Nobody knows but Scotland Yard and Henry Arthur Milton. But how can he know? He's dead. He died in Australia. The ringer is alive. He's here. Here? Are you serious? Absolutely. I tell you, he's alive and here in London. But that can't be true. He wouldn't dare come here with a life sentence hanging over him. He's here and I've sent for you to warn you. But why warn me? As I said, he had a sister. Well? And he had a friend who betrayed him. But his sister was merely a client of mine. Can't you tell me that? Yes. And as for Henry Arthur Milton, I never saw him in my life. I don't even know what he looks like. I knew the girl he used to run around with. An American girl. She was crazy about him. Where is she? Where she is, he is. She is in London. In this very building, at this very moment. Here? The ringer wouldn't dare. If you know he's in London, why don't you take him, huh? What are you for? To protect people. Can't you get in touch with him? Can't you tell him that I know nothing about his sister? That I looked after her, was like a father to her. You, Inspector Wembury. Yes, Mr. Martin? You're in charge of the debtor division. You know I had nothing to do with this girl's debt. I know nothing about it. The only thing I do know is that if anything happens to Mary Lindy... I'll... Don't you threaten me, Alan Wembury, just because you see more of my secretary, Miss Lenley, than is good for Listen her. Listen to me, Mr. Meister. I've given you your warning. From now on, your house in Deptford will be under observation. You'll arrange that, Inspector Wembury? Yes, sir. And Mr. Meister. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, what did you say your name was? Bliss. Central Inspector Bliss. Yes. I was only going to suggest that you let some of your clients know your house is now under observation. The last person they'll want to see is a police officer. Have bars put on your windows, don't admit anybody after dark, and never leave the house by night except with a police escort. Yes, Inspector Bliss, I think I'll put Mr. Meister in your charge. Right, Watch over him like a father. <laughs> I will, sir. Colonel Walford, the day you take the ringer, I'll give a thousand pounds to the police orphanage. We don't want money so badly as that. Well, Mr. Meister, I think that is all. It's uh, not my business to pass judgment on any man, but it's a dangerous game you're playing. Your profession gives you an advantage over other receivers. Receiver? I think you hardly realize what you are saying. Indeed I do. Good morning. You'll be sorry for that statement, Colonel. May I have my hat? Uh, oh, thank you. Look at the time. Five minutes to one. Hear me, I shall miss that train to Southampton. I thought you said Greenwich. What? Uh, yes, yes, Greenwich. This way, Mr. Meister. You're forgetting your stick, Mr. Meister. Oh, a sword stick, eh? You seem to be looking after yourself pretty well. 
Well, with so many police officers about, uh, my stick, thank you. G good morning. He scarcely remembered leaving the assistant commissioner's office, but walked down the corridors and out into the yard like a man in a dream. Morris, there you are at last. Is anything wrong? 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 No, nothing is wrong. Why? Get into the car, then. Yes, yes. What is the matter, Morris? Yes, of course, Mary, we ought to be getting home. You want to go back to Deptford? Yes, back to Deptford. Oh, driver, straight back to Flanders Lane, please. Very good, miss. Was it something awful, Morris? Awful? No, no, a lie, that's all. Tried to scare me. <laughs> he thought they'd rattle me. That man, Bliss, was there. You know, the fellow you told me about. Yes. I can't quite place him, Mary. Did your... Did young Wembury tell you anything about him? Only what I told you. But he comes from America, too, you mean? Uh, yes. Hmm. Did you see Hackett? Oh, yes, he came out about 20 minutes before you did. Got on a tram. He'll be home before us, I expect, with all this traffic. I wish I'd seen him before he left. I wonder what they asked him about. If you'll excuse me, Mary, I think I'll just take a sniff of my white powder. Oh, hmm? Morris, I wish you wouldn't. Why not? Hmm. Ah, that's better. That's much better. <laughs> the young Remory was there, of course, yes. Yeah. Do you know, Mary, he threatened me? Oh, surely not. Alan threatened yes, you. Yes, he did. I took no notice, of course. Oh, Morris, while you were in there and I was waiting, I bought an early edition of the evening paper. Look. Hmm? Prison riot, life of deputy governor in danger. Well, what about it? It was at the prison my brother Johnny's in. I'm a bit worried. He's always so impetuous. You... I don't think he's done anything stupid, and, and... Of course, there are no names here. There never are. But I hope Johnny wasn't involved. It would mean the loss of his mark. Loss of his... He'd have to serve his full sentence. Oh, no. Another two years. I couldn't bear it. Mary, dear, I, I want to talk to you. You know, I'm sometimes terribly lonely in my house in Flanders Lane. I, I was wondering if you would sometimes spend a few of your evenings with me? I'm sorry, Morris, but that just wouldn't be possible. That sounds very ungrateful, I know, after all you've done for me, but people would talk, and I, I am your secretary. Well, won't you come to supper one night and, and try me, hmm? I'd play the piano for you. It bores me to be always playing to myself. <sighs> Don't you think you could come up just one evening? Uh, I I'll think about it. Oh, thank you, my dear. Well, I wonder who is on the rack at this moment. You mean at Scotland Yard? Yes, I give a lot of money to know just what is happening in room C2 at this very moment. <laughs> and who is the unfortunate soul facing the Inquisitor? I'll not be in the way, will I, Colonel? Not at all. Come along in, Dr. Lomond. It was good of you to come up from Deptford with Inspector Wimbury. But how can I be of help to the three of you? Cross-examination, Doctor. We remember your success with Prido. Oh, poor old Prido. I wish I didn't know so much about criminology. Mm -hmm. As an amateur? Uh, yes, as an amateur, Bliss. But we get there sometimes, eh, Wembry? Oh, you mustn't mind, Inspector Bliss. He doesn't like Scotsman. I wish I was wearing my kilt. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, Colonel, who am I to cross-examine this time? A lady. I want you to find out something about her husband. Would she know? Do wives know anything about their husbands? I'm oh. not so sure that he is her husband. Ah, then she would know. She'd know at any rate if it was somebody else's husband. <laughs> Who is she? Uh, what is her real name, Wembry? Cora Milton. She was born Cora Ann Barford. Cora Ann. Cora Ann. That's a coincidence. Why? I was hearing a lot about her, Cora Ann, a few months ago. That's not surprising, considering her reputation. Oh, what exactly do you want to know? I'll tell you. This girl is now the wife of a particularly dangerous criminal, Henry Arthur Milton, more commonly known as the Ringer. The Ringer? What does that mean? He's a man who rings the changes. But in Milton's case, he rings the changes on himself. Oh, I see. 
or don't, I see. In Deptford, they swear he can change the colour of his eyes. That's the kind of thing they would say in Deptford. <laughs> Bliss is at it again. No, there's no joke in it, Lomond. This man is brilliant. Colonel, there isn't such a thing as a brilliant criminal. All criminals are daft. That doctrine has been inculcated in me from a bairn. Oh, hi. Toots, toots. I will ignore that. What is he like? Can I see his photograph? I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, now, here's his record. Hey, you don't want me, sir. I've got some real work to do. No, but I shall want to see you later, please. Yes, right. Uh, doctor, here's a job after your own heart. A man with your wisdom ought to catch the ringer in a week. You know, sometimes I think it's folly to be wise. What do you mean by that? Well, when ignorance is bliss. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, Doctor... Um, the uh, history of this man is a most peculiar one and will interest you. Eh? I have it all here in his file. Uh, in the first place, he's never been in our hands. The man is an assassin, but so far as we know, he's never gained a penny by any of the murders of which we suspect him. We know almost for certain that during the war he was an officer in the Flying Corps, a solitary man with only one friend, a lad who was afterward shot on an ill-founded charge of cowardice made by his colonel, Chaffris Wisman. Mm. Now, three months after the war ended, Chaffris Wisman was stabbed to death in his flat. Ah. We suspect, well, indeed we are certain, that the murderer was the ringer who had disappeared immediately after the armistice was signed. Didn't even wait to draw his gratuity. He was no Scotsman. <laughs> he was never photographed in any of the regimental groups. We have only one drawing of him, made by a steward on a boat plying between Seattle and Vancouver. And it was on this boat that Milton was married. He's married, eh? Yes, there was a girl on the ship, a fugitive from American justice. She must have confided in Milton that she would be arrested on her arrival in Vancouver for he persuaded the captain to marry them. Mm. She became a British subject and defeated the extradition law. It was a foolish, <laughs> quixotic thing to do. Ah, then he must be a Scotsman. <laughs> and he's really a terror, eh? If people knew for sure this man was in England, there would be trouble. He killed old Overtone, who ran a South American agency of a very unpleasant character. He killed Adaman, the moneylender, the man who ran the Flotsam Club, for the same reason. And Morris Meister, by the way was in the house when that murder was committed. Milton left his sister in Meister's charge when he had to fly the country over the Ataman affair. He didn't know that Meister was giving us information about his movements. But he knows now. He knows, yes. Our information is that he was in Australia eight months ago and that he is now in England. And if he is, he has come back with only one object, to settle with Meister in his own peculiar way. Meister was his solicitor, and he was always running around with Gwenda Milton. Uh, Gwenda Milton? Yes, the ringer's sister. Aye. You say you have a picture of him? A pencil sketch only. Wembury, where is it? It's in the file, sir. Uh, yes, here it is. You're, you're, you're joking. Why, I know this man. What? what? Oh, lordy, lordy, lordy. You know him, surely not. Oh, I, I don't say I know him, but, but I've met him in Port Said about three months ago. I was staying at one of the hotels when I heard that there was a poor European who was very sick in some filthy caravansary in the native quarter. Naturally, I went over and saw him. Uh, he was very sick. In fact, I thought he was going to peg out. And it was this gentleman. He'd come ashore from an Australian ship. By God, that's our man, sir. Did he recover? Oh, I don't know. He was delirious when I saw him. That's where I heard the name's Cora Ann. I saw him twice. Uh, would he be the ringer? Ah, no, it's, it's not possible. It almost seems like it. I have an idea that he's not dead. Now, you may be useful, Doctor. If there is one person who knows where the ringer is to be found, it is Mrs. Milton. Cora Ann. Yes. Yeah. Doctor, I've already told you how impressed I was with your cross-examination of Predo. I want you now to try your hand on this lady. Oh, I... uh, bring her up, Wembury. Straight away, sir. Now, here are the ascertainable facts about her movements. She returned to this country from Genoa on a British passport three weeks ago. She's staying at the Carlton. A uh, British passport, you say. Is she married? Oh, there's no doubt about that, I think. Uh, well, if... My Egyptian friend is the ringer. I know quite a lot about this lady. He was rather talkative in his delirium. And I'm beginning to remember some of the things he told me. Now, let me think. Cora Ann. Cora Ann. Orchids. Hmm? I've got it. Thanks a lot. 
And two more men to meet. Well, well. Good morning, Mrs. Milton. I asked you to come because I rather wanted my friend Dr. Lohman here hey. to have a little talk with you. Why, isn't that nice? I'm just crazy to talk to somebody here in London. Oh, you haven't been long in London, Mrs. Milton. You've been abroad, haven't you? I certainly have, all abroad. And how did you leave your husband? Oh, say, Mr. Wimber, who is this Dr. Lohman? He's the police surgeon in my division. You don't say. Well, you know, Doctor, I won't see my husband again. I thought everybody had read in the newspapers. Poor Arthur was drowned in Sydney Harbour. You don't see. Oh, I'm sorry if it's a painful subject, but you see, your husband left this country hurriedly too, or is it three? Three. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Wembry. Three years ago. When did you see him last? Uh, two, or is it three? Uh, thank you, Mr. Wembry. Three years ago. Now, Cora Ann. Listen, I got a handle to my name, Doctor. May I turn it and find out what tune you play? <laughs> now, I'll sit here if the Colonel will allow me. Now, carry on, Doctor Lemon, please. And Mrs. Milton will sit here beside me and sit you down. Oh, very well. You uh, see from this note here, you saw your husband in Sydney. Well, what's it good at asking me if you know? Uh, you were in Sydney three months after we reached there. You called yourself Mrs. Jackson and you registered at the Harbour Hotel. And whilst you were there, you were in communication with your husband. I never saw him, I tell you. Uh, no, you never saw him. I guessed that. He telephoned. You asked him to meet you. Or didn't you? I'm not quite sure. You don't want to tell me, eh? I suspect you were scared that there was somebody trailing you. Scared that uh, you might lead the police to him. Scared? Where'd you get that word? Nothing would scare Arthur Milton. Anyway... He's dead. And now has nothing to be scared about if he was a Presbyterian. <laughs> Let's bring him to life, shall we? Come up, Henry Arthur Milton, who left Melbourne on the steamship Themistocles on the anniversary of his wedding and left with another woman. Oh, that's a damn lie. There never was another woman. <sighs> oh, listen. You put a raw one over there. I'm a fool to get sore with you. I don't know anything. That's all. And I needn't answer a single question. I know the law in England. I'm going. Uh, Wembry, open the door for Mrs. Milton. Yes, Doctor. It is Mrs. Milton, isn't it? Say, what do you mean? Oh, I thought it might be one of those artistic marriages that are so popular with the leisure classes. You may be a hell of a big doctor, but your diagnosis is all wrong. Really? Married and everything? Uh-huh. First in the ship by Captain and that's legal, and that it's in Paul's Church, Deadford. To make sure, a girl can't be too careful. St. Paul's, where is that, Wembry? Close to Morris Meister's place. Meister? Do you know Meister? Is he still in that large old house in Deadford? Yes, he is. You know Deadford, Mrs. Nilda? Well, sure, Deadford's a kind of hometown to me. Next to an ash pit, I don't know any place I'd hate worse to be found dead in. Folks over home talk about Limehouse and Whitechapel. <laughs> They're garden cities compared with that hell shoot. But I was married there. By a real reverend gentleman. Married, eh? Liars and married men have very short memories. He forgot to send you your favorite orchids. What do you mean? Oh, he always sent you orchids on the anniversary of your wedding. Even when he was hiding in Australia. But this year, he didn't. Mm. I suppose he forgot. Or possibly he had other uses for orchids. You think so? That's the kind of thought a man like you would have. Worth the thought of nobody but me. The only thing that hurt him was that I couldn't be with him. Once when I was in Melbourne, he risked everything just to see me and Colin. So he was in Melbourne when you were there, but he did not send you your orchids. Orchids? What do I want with orchids? Well, I knew when they didn't come. That he had left Australia. That's why you came away in such a hurry. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. <coughs> I'm beginning to believe that you're in love with your husband. Was I? I kind of liked him. Well... That is about all, I guess. Uh, you're not going to arrest me or anything. You're at liberty to go just when you wish, Mrs. Milton. Fine. Well, good morning, everybody. Or is it Switch afternoon forth. now? Send Inspector Bliss here to my room, please, at once. Love is blind. You met him and you didn't recognize him. And do you think you'd know him if you saw him, Dr. Smarty? Uh, you want us to believe that he was so well disguised that he could venture abroad in Collins Street in daylight. Oh, no, Koran. <laughs> it won't do, it won't do. On Collins Street? He'd walk on Regent Street in daylight or moonlight. There, if he felt that way, he'd come right here to Scotland Yard and never turn a hair. <laughs> it's the sort of fool thing he would do. 
You sent for me. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, I did not mean you it. You sent for oh. me? Uh, yes, one minute, please. What's the matter, Mrs. Milton? Oh, what is it, Mrs. Milton? We're scared you. Oh. She'll tell us everything in a minute, Colonel. Well, I, oh, well, I, oh, oh, give me a glass of water, please. Water, yes. She's frightened of something. Uh, perhaps I was responsible. Uh, uh, give me that glass, Wembley. There you are. Uh, uh, try a drop of this. Sorry it isn't whiskey, uh. but it may help pull you around. <laughs> Thank you. Better now? Yeah, I'm fine. Well, I guess that lets me out. Quite sure? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm not going to faint. Arthur just hated women who faint. Uh, Mrs. Milton, why were you so distressed? Did you see something? See something? Yeah. Well, I tell you, it was this drawing of Arthur on your desk. I just caught a glimpse of it. and Well, it kind of gave me a shock. <laughs> you see, as I told you, I, I kind of liked Arthur. Uh, Wimbry? Yes, sir? Get Mrs. Milton a taxi. Taxi at once. Oh, there's nothing to be afraid of, Mrs. Milton. You're at Scotland Yard. Oh, aren't you all perfect gentlemen? Roast a woman's soul out of her and then send her home in a taxi when she's got a car of her own. Ah, uh, and say, don't be so damn sure there's nothing to be afraid of at Scotland Yard. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The sounds that brought the ringer too near for comfort. Here was a mystery that was never solved until that night of horror when the ringer came again to Morris Meister's house in Flanders Lane. Is that you, Mr. Wembley? Yes, sir. Do you bring the doctor with you? Yes, we're both here, but for God's sake, let us in, Sam. Ben, my hell idea. Dirty night for the dogs, eh? <laughs> Come in. Ah, oh, this is a new stunt, isn't it, Sam? Bringing up the police station for the divisional surgeon. Aye. Why didn't you send for Meister's own doctor? I didn't know who his doctor was. And he's been in a terrible state all day. Listen to him. Banging away on the pianoforte. It's all dopey, like he can't hear nothing, he can't see nothing, he puts the wind up me, he does. Uh, musical with it, that's oh, bad. I like a bit of music myself, but the tunes he plays gives you the creeps. Ask him. Says he's lonely without that secretary of his. Miss Lennon? Yeah, she's been away in the country all day, and this is what happens. He's all right when she stays on a bit in the evenings, but that isn't very often. Uh, well, I'll step in and see him. Do what I can for him, eh? You were afraid you'd be suspected if he died, eh? Mm, that's the worst of having a bad record, Hackett. That's right, Mr. Wembley, but I got a good job here. Oh, and forget my man art. Would you care to have something to drink, sir? Uh, not just now, Sam. It's all on the house, sir. Nice little stuff around here. All this cut glass and the silver and all. Mm. It'd sell well. Yeah, what would I get for this lot? About three years. Oh, yeah, Mr. Wembley. Can I ask you something? Yes. Go on, Sam. What's Bliss doing on your manor? My manor? Yeah, your district, yeah. Mr. Bliss? Here? Ah. Well, I didn't know that. Are you sure, Sam? I couldn't make any mistake about a mug like that. He's been hanging about here ever since I've been here. Hmm, why? I don't know. I found him hiding upstairs yesterday. Mr. Bliss? I said to him, what are you doing all up here? I said. And what did he say? What did he say? Yes, what did he say? Nothing. A chatty sort of fellow. Ah, here's Dr. Lohman back. Is he all right, Doctor? Uh, Meister? Oh, Lord, yes. Oh, what a lad. Mm. Is this the poison that's killing him? Ah, uh, that's not poison, it's scotch. No, the stuff that's settling Meister is... cocaine, Wembry, the white powder. May I offer you a drink of some whiskey, Doctor? Uh, hello, what are you, a factotum? No, sir. I'm an Englishman. And proud of it, eh? No, no scotch for the moment. This is a queer kind of a house, Wembry. Yes, and some queer things have happened in these rooms, I should imagine. Yeah, have you noticed these panels, huh, on the walls? They're holler. It's more like a rabbit warren than a house. I'll tell you something, Governor. There's more than one way into this house. 
There's a muddy creek down by the river, and I believe they can get in from there. It's sort of secret passage. No, well, it's not so secret now, is it? <laughs> Tell me, Hackett, have they put the window bars in yet? Yeah, they have. Yeah, what are they for? To keep the ringer out. The ringer? Is that what them bars are for? Yeah, I'm through with this job. I wondered why old Meister wanted me to sleep in. No, you're afraid of the ringer, are you? Oh. Uh, what's your name? Hackett, sir. Samuel Hackett. Samuel would you like to make an honest five pounds? Just put it straight in my hand. I'm from Aberdeen. Oh. I pay in results. <laughs> uh, tell me something about the ringer. Something I don't know. I know, yes, sir. I want to give you a word of advice. I wouldn't nose on the ringer if I was you. He's a killer. A killer, is he? I wonder, would he kill a doctor? He ain't a particular bloke, sir. Doctor. Lawyer. Aye. Uh, perhaps that's why Meister has this sword stick of his handy here in the hall. I say, Lomond, I don't think we'd better touch anything. Meister may raise a kick. What's that? What? I thought to hear. Samuel, who else is in this house beside you and Meister? Nobody. The old cook's ill. Who gets Meister's breakfast? I do. A biscuit and a corkscrew. Uh, Samuel, what's above here? The lumber room. Ah. What's up, Doctor? I thought, what, what? that distant bell I hear. Ah, no, nothing. He'll knock it. You ain't off putting the wind up me. Ah, must know. Meister started to play again. Yeah. Ah, that's a bit better tuned, too, isn't it? The doctor's done him good. So we'd better be going back to the station. Show us that, Sam. Ah, this way, please, and you'll need your Macintoshes. Oh, we only need thunder and lightning to make it a... Dirty night. Good night, Sam. Uh, be good. And if you can't be good, be caddy. Anyone about? Who? Oh. God, Jesus. Johnny Lenley. How did you get in? Through the front door. You opened it. Here, here. Oh, it's all right. I'll close it now. So I was right about that way in. Well, I heard the secret panel. Lord love a duck, I never expected to see you, Johnny. Not so much of the Johnny. Give me a line. Here you are. Some of Meister's best fags, too. <laughs> How long have you been out? Only this morning. Where was you? The scrubs? I didn't see you there. I was on the moor. Over the Alps, eh? You look well. Go blimey, dark boy. Must be a, a blooming holiday. <laughs> you can have mine next, Lord. What are you doing here? Some sort of flunky? Certainly not. I am a personal servant. A friend of Meister's. Friend of that kind of bloke. <laughs> Why, look, when Meister goes past the zoo, all the snakes get up and touch their hats to him. But do you know who else is working here? My sister, yes, she told me. Says he's been kind to her. That's why I've come to see him. One of the reasons. Sam, uh, this kindness business... Uh, What's the idea? Well, I've only been working here for Meister a short time, but you're a man of the world, Johnny. You ever seen a weasel be kind to a rabbit? Oh, well, that's it, is it? I thought so. I'll go in and see him now. Give him a bit of a surprise. Morris. Morris, Meister. Johnny! I... I can't believe it. <laughs> You're seeing me, all right. Oh, I thought you... Uh, about uh, two years too soon, eh? My dear fellow, this is really amazing. Have a drink. No, thanks. Amazing, amazing. How did you get your ticket? Oh, don't tell me that you were the brave fellow in that prison riot that saved the deputy governor's life. I'm afraid so. And they've remitted my sentence. I'm out on ticket of leave. Well done, well done. Never mind about that. I've seen Mary this morning. Oh, that's why she didn't come to work here today. I thought she'd gone into the country. Why did you stop Mary's allowance? Because, my dear fellow, I can't afford to be charitable. I left you the greater part of 600 pounds. Well, my dear fellow, there was your defense. I know the fee. Why did you stop her allowance? 
Now, why did I? I was worried about her, a girl living alone, no work to do. I thought it would be better to give her some employment. Kept her mind occupied, you understand? I've always taken a fatherly interest in Mary. Keep your fatherly paws to yourself when you're with her, will you, Morris? My dear fellow, John... And listen, if there's been any monkey business, as there was with Gwenda Milton... I'll take that nine o'clock walk for you. What? From the cell to the gallows. <laughs> what a very picturesque way of putting things. Melodramatic, hmm? But you won't walk for me. I shall read the account in bed. I always read those accounts in bed. They soothe me. Ever go to the cinema, Johnny? Listen to this. The condemned man spent a restless night and scarcely touched his breakfast. He walked with a firm step to the scaffold and made no statement. A vulgar end to a life that began with so much promise. Hanged men look very ugly. I've told you, Morris. Any monkey business and I'll get you even before the ringer does. The ringer? You have that illusion too. How amusing. The ringer. Here am I, alive and free. And the ringer, where is he? <laughs> that sounds almost poetical. Dead at the bottom of Sydney Harbour. Or hiding in some unpleasantly hot little town. A hunted dog. He's in London. And you know it. As near to you as that man I saw just now outside your barred windows. Isn't this beautiful? Is there a woman in the world who can exalt the heart and soul of a man as this does? Is there a woman worth one divine harmony of the master? Was Gwenda Milton? To hell with Gwenda Milton and Gwenda Milton's brother, alive or dead. Don't mouth her name at me. Ah, why do you annoy me, my dear Johnny? I've no quarrel with you. Now, what is it you want? I want some money, for one thing. What will you give me for this? This emerald. Where did you get that? I collected it on my way here. It was left with a friend of mine. That's all I have for my three years. The man who was working with me got away with the rest of it. Well, that was lucky for him, wasn't it? Very lucky, or it would have been if he'd got away with it. What do you mean? He didn't get away with what? it. What? He hid it. He told me before I sent him off to South Africa. You know that empty house of mine in Camden Crescent? Yes. Well, he planted the stuff behind the cistern on the roof, and it's still there now. What rotten trick are you at? No rotten trick, I assure you. Well, you've been to prison, and what have you got for it, hmm? There's good stuff behind that tank, and you've paid for it. Thank God I have. That house in Camden Crescent is still mine. I can give you the key. Get the stuff tonight. Well, think about it. But if you're trying to put me away... My dear Johnny, I'm trying to do you a good turn. What's the number of the house? I've forgotten. Uh, here's the key. Uh, number 57. Uh, you'd better take this card as well. Now, there you are, my dear boy. We'll meet again soon. Hmm? Mr. Meister, sir, come round. Ah, and here's Hackett come to see you up. Sir, sir, there's a party at the front door to see you. Me? Who is it? Told me not to give any name. This party said, just say I'm from the ringer. What? The party's a lady. Oh, a lady. Uh, well, uh, show her in, Hackett, and show Johnny Lindley out. Yeah, Governor, I can't stand this place. I'm giving you me notice. Oh, go to hell. And the next time I'm pinched, I'm going to get me another lawyer. The next time you're pinched, you'll get seven years. That's why I'm going to change me lawyer. I knew a man like you who thought he was clever. He asked me to defend him at the session. Don't call that clever. Defend him? I'd see him dead first. He'd be better off. Come on, Johnny, and we'll send the lady in. Uh, hey, he's in here, missus, if you can. Help. Thanks a lot. Why, it's Cora Ann. Mrs. Arthur Milton, to you. You're prettier than ever. Come and sit down, my dear. Hmm? Ah. And where is your dear husband? I suppose you think that because you're alive, he's dead. Did it take you long to think that out? So this is the abode of love. I never knew Gwenda. I wish to God I had. How oh, Arthur worshipped that sister of his. 
If only he trusted me with her as he trusted you. Well, I heard about her suicide. Poor kid. When I was on my way to Australia, I flew back from Genoa by plane. Oh, but why didn't you wire me if I'd only known? Meister, you're a poultry liar. What? Now, now listen. I know something. Why don't you go away? Out of the country. Go somewhere where you can't be found. Take another name. You're a rich man. You can afford to give up this hole. You're trying to frighten me out of England. <gasps> He'll get you, Meister. That's what I'm afraid of. That is what I lie in bed and think about. And it's awful, awful. My dear little girl, don't worry about me. <sighs> you say, if I could lift my finger to save you from hell, I wouldn't. It's Arthur I want to save, not you. Get out of the country. Get away. Give him a chance to forget that he wants to kill you. Oh, how ingenious. He dare not come back himself, and he sent you to England to get me on the run. Oh, if you're killed, you'll be killed here. Here in this room where you broke the heart of his sister, you fool. Not such a fool, my dear, that I'd walk into a trap. Suppose this man is alive. In London, I'm safe. In the Argentine, he'd be waiting for me. And if I went to Australia, he'd be waiting for me. And if I stepped ashore in Cape Town... No, no, little Cora Anne. You can't catch me. Very well, Meister. Then perhaps you'll see me to the door. Of course, my dear. I only hope the rain has stopped. No, I've got my car outside. Oh, you seem to be well protected here, at least. These bolts. No, one can't be too careful. No, don't come out. You'll only get wet. Goodbye. Good night. Mr. Meister? Yes? Yes, who is it? Central Inspector Bliss of Scotland Yard. Uh... Everything all right here, Mr. Meister? Yes, yes, quite all right. Now, has Miss Lemley's brother, John Lemley, been here tonight? Yes. Is there anything wrong? No, no, no. I thought I saw him leave, but I didn't see him arrive. Really? And why are you interested, Mr. Bliss? <laughs> Just looking after you like a father, Mr. Meister. Uh, good night. Yes, yes, coming, coming. Where's Hackett got to not answering the phone? Hello, yes. Boris, it's Mary here. Mary Lenley. Oh, yes, Mary, my dear. I've missed you all day. I understand you've seen your brother. Yes, he's terribly suspicious. Suspicious? Well, I wish he had something to be suspicious about. Oh, Boris, I shan't be able to stay tomorrow evening... But that's what I'm ringing for. Oh, now, about. don't be silly. You can't have your life governed and directed by Johnny. Besides, he looks like being in prison again soon. What is... What do you mean? Well, Johnny is... He's really rather a naughty boy. I've tried to hide things from you, but it's been awfully difficult. Hide things from me? What things? Well, I don't want to tell you. Boris, I... you must. Well, what do you think the young fool's done, hmm? Only put his name to a check for 400 pounds... Uh, I've, got, I've got the check here. Oh, can't you destroy it? Well, well yeah, yes, I suppose I could, but, but I'm a lawyer, Mary. I don't like destroying evidence, and Johnny's been here to see me tonight, and he's been very vindictive. If only in self-defense, I, I feel I've got to keep this thing. Now, look, Mary, are you there? Yes, Morris. Well, I, I want to talk to you about Johnny and, 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 and everything. I, I can't now on the phone. I, I'm being overheard. Hmm? Now, come around to supper tonight, the way I told you. Yes, you know I can't. But why not? Uh, the last time I came, you were impossible. And people are talking about Gwenda Milton. All right. If you don't want to come, don't. Why the hell should I worry my head about Johnny? Why should I? Oh, Morris, please, don't be unreasonable. If you really want... I don't care whether you do or whether you don't. So I'm not going on my knees for you or any other woman. Now go away and live in the country, Mary. But Johnny won't go with you, believe me. Morris, all right, I'll come tonight. You know I will. What time? Well, come about uh, 11. All right, Morris, I will. And if you want a chaperone, Mary, bring the ring up. No, Morris, don't. Goodbye. Goodbye. New Cross, one, two, double eight.
New Cross 1288. Hello, Flanders Lane Police Station, Sergeant Carter here. Yeah? Oh, good evening. Is Inspector Wembury there? Uh, who's speaking, please? Uh, Mr. Morris Meister. Yes, Master. Wembury here. Ah, uh, Mr. Wembury. Have a man on the roof of 57 Camden Crescent tonight. What time? Nine. Yes, about nine. Sergeant Carter? Yes, sir. Put a man on the roof of 57 Camden Crescent right away. Very good, sir. Sergeant Brown? Yes, sir. Put a man on the roof of 57 Camden Crescent. I get moving. I'll go myself, sir. Oh, what's all that in need of expecting a burglary? Yes. One of Meister's dirtier tricks. Mm, what is it? Somebody you want out of the way. Somebody I can't warn. Mm. Oh, that job's done. A dirty night for roof work. <sighs> What's the weather doing outside, Sergeant? Drizzling. <sighs> Wind's dropped, so it'll be a fight between the fog and the rain. Charge them both, for God's sake, Sergeant Carter. <laughs> <sighs> you don't like London, Doctor. What a country. What a climate. Fog and rain. <sighs> there are moments when I regret leaving India and travelling home from Gibraltar with a member of the government. <laughs> Bliss <sighs> says you won't stick it for a year. Bliss? <laughs> he hopes so. I tell you, I'm staying till the ring is caught. Bliss doesn't like me. I don't know why. Do you know anybody he does like? Except Bliss. Do you know Bliss very well? No, not very well. I never met him until he returned from America. Good evening, all. Oh, well, talk of the devil. Good evening, Mr. Bliss. Uh, uh, Sergeant Carter. That's right, sir. I want a gun. I beg your pardon. I want an automatic well, that's right, Sergeant. Central Inspector Bliss from Scotland Yard wants an automatic. What do you want it for, Bliss? Going ratting? Yes, but you needn't be afraid, Wembury. Well, here's the gun. Uh, thanks. What do you want it for, Bliss? What's that got to do with you? Quite a lot. This is my division. Any reason why I shouldn't have it? No. Right. Well, I'll see you later, then. I should sign for it, though. Oh... Uh... Y yes, of course. You seem to have forgotten the routine, Bliss. Well, I've been away from this damn country, you know that. Uh, sign me, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Bliss. Oh, good evening, Professor. Have you caught the ringer yet? No, not yet, but I dare say I could put my hand on him. You think so? You've got a theory, eh? A conviction. A very strong conviction. <laughs> you take a tip from me. Leave police work to policemen. Arthur Milton's a dangerous man. Is it good weather for flying? But rotten, a fog of... Uh, what do I know about flying weather? Have you seen his wife lately? No, have you? No, and I, I don't even know who she's living with. Mr. Central Detective Inspector Bliss, do you realize you're speaking of a particular friend of mine? Oh, she's caught you too, has she? My God, she does find them. Maybe you've never heard of a woman having a disinterested friend. <laughs> Good Lord, yes, there's a fool born every minute. <laughs> Cynical swine. Uh, Wembury, you're a bit of a sentimental Johnny, too, aren't you? That's my weakness. That girl, Lenley, she's in uh, Meister's office, isn't she? Oh, you found that out, have you? You have the makings of a detective in you. Sweet on her, they tell me. Do they? Have you ever been in love, Bliss? Me? No woman can make a fool of me. It takes a clever woman to improve on God's handiwork. What are you doing down here, anyway? I am doing your job. Isn't he up? Peach. <laughs> it's, uh, it's curious that the inspector doesn't know station routine, isn't it? Sir? Everything about Mr. Bliss is curious, Sergeant. Bliss. Where the hell he got his name from, I'd like to know. Uh, perhaps it was his Excuse mother's. Excuse me. Yes, what is it? My name's Lenley. I've got to report here. Ah, uh, that's right, yes. Uh, well, come to the desk. <clears throat> Good evening, Lenley. Good evening, Inspector Wembley. I heard you were on. Yes. Here are my papers, Sergeant. A convict on license. Your sister was glad to see you? Yes. I'd like to find a job for you. And I think I can. <laughs> Prisoner's Aid Society. No, thanks. Where are you going tonight? Up west. Why do you want to know? Oh, I don't wish to know particularly. Sergeant, how far is it from this police station to Camden Crescent? Uh, not too many to walk, sir. Hmm. They're not very far, is it, from Camden Crescent... To this police station? No, sir. Then I thought of taking a stroll up west myself. Will you come along and have a bit of dinner with me? Sorry. I'm going to meet somebody. Everything okay, Sergeant? Yes, all in order. The same address? Yes, that's right. Same address. Good night, uh, Sergeant. Lenley. 
Yes. Good night, then, if I don't see you again. God, what a young fool. I think, Carter, and I'd better take a stroll round in the direction of Oh, good evening, Doctor. <laughs> good Mr. Evening. Meister. The man of medicine and the man of law. Hmm? <laughs> this is almost a historic meeting. What well, the devil are you doing out on a night like this? Ah, you wouldn't know, Wembley. Why should you? But the doctor here will understand. I was escorted through the foggy streets. Doctor, <laughs> damn funny. Maestro of Flanders Lane with a police escort. <laughs> Rich. You can't say anything, you know, Maestro. You better go back to your house. No, not yet. Not yet, Wembley. I, I, I've got a little supper party tonight, but that's later on. In the meantime... <laughs> I can't stand my house, that's the truth. Hackett cleared out and left me alone. And I began to hear noises, you know, little creaking, stealthy sort of noises. You've heard them when you're alone in the house. Windows that rattle as if somebody's trying to get in. Hands feeling along the panels in the wall. And feet soft. Stocking feet crossing the floor overhead. I, I'm lonely in that house, Doctor. Lonely and afraid. Oh, here, here, here. What to, is all this? Anything wrong, sir? I, there is. Uh, take his stick, sir. I'm right. afraid. Oh, sword stick, eh? What's the matter with him, Lamar? Nice chock full of morphine. Help me, Sergeant, to get him into the next room. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. I'll give him an injection, but he ought to leave Deptford. The ringer's getting on top of him. I know. I know. Say, is Dr. Holman here? Oh, one moment, madam. I'll see. Uh, excuse me, Inspector. Yes? There's a lady out here asking to see Dr. Lohman. Sure in. Why, it's Mrs. Milton. Evening, Mr. Wembry. Is uh, Dr. Lohman not about? He'll be here in a minute. Oh, so this is a police station. <gasps> My idea, hell, only not so bright. Say, Mr. Wembry, everyone's in uniform. Where's your fancy dress? I keep that for wearing at parties. Uh, he'll be all right soon, Sergeant Carter's with Dr. him. Dr. Lohman. Why, look who's here. Cora Ann. Now listen, Doctor, only my best friends call me Cora Ann. And that's just what I'd like to be. <laughs> So what can I do for you now, lady? Well, I thought perhaps as I had to be in this part of London tonight, uh, you might like to take me out for a meal. Why, I'd love to, Cora, but... Uh... But, but, you're a butter, eh? Listen, Scotty, you won't have to pay for the dinner. That's certainly an inducement. <laughs> and I need to talk to you urgently. About your late husband. Oh, forget that widow stuff. He's alive. I know. And I've got work to do. Work? I know the work. You're trying to hang Arthur Milton. That's your idea, work. All right, then. You won't dine with me, Dr. Lohman. And I don't like your Highland manners. You may have saved me a little money, but you might have saved yourself a whole lot of trouble. What do you mean, Lassie? I'm going to be frank with you, Doctor. I have a kind of hunch there is only one man in God's wide world that will ever catch Arthur Milton. And that man is you. I might have been able to stop you if you'd come out to dinner with me tonight. But now... What now, lady? Oh, I think I'll go and have supper and a music lesson at the same time. I have a friend who plays the piano very, very well. That sounds like a threat to me. Doctor, I wish you wouldn't make love to the ringer's wife. What do you mean? I mean... I don't want two tragedies on my mind. <laughs> ah, Sergeant Carter. How's Mr. Meister now? He's all right, sir. Hello, they picked up an enemy, sir. Let, let's see him outside now. Oh. Well, bring him in, Sergeant Brown. Well, up to the desk, that's it. <clears throat> Acting on information, I was on duty of the roof of 57 Camden Crescent, and I saw this man come up through the attic trap door. I kept him under observation and saw him searching behind a cistern. I then arrested him. And what is the charge? I charge him with being on enclosed premises for the purpose of committing a felony. What's in that bag? Uh, nothing. Well, Lenley? Thank you, Wembry. If I had had the brains of a mat, I shouldn't be here. 
But thank you, Walsey. Well, what else have you to say, Lenny? I went after the stuff I got my three for. I was told it was planted behind that system. And I went to get it. And it wasn't there. That's all. Who was the snout, Wembry? <laughs> all right, you needn't tell me, because I know. Look after my sister, Wembry. She'll want some looking after, and I'd sooner trust well, you. Than... hello, it's Johnny. Hello. You have been getting into trouble again, Johnny, have you? What's the charge? You know damn well what the charge is. What a misfortune, Sergeant. Anything he wants, let him have it at my expense. Morris, thank you for the key, but there was no swag behind that cistern. Key? Cistern? Swag? I don't know what you're talking about, I my came boy. Out too soon for you. It interfered with your, your little scheme. Oh, really, I must you protest. Swine! <laughs> No! Look! I've got you by the throat, my stuff! Let me go! Let me go! No! He's trying to kill me! Let me get out of him, Wimbery! You look after my sir! Come on! Come on! I've got you, Lenny! Stop struggling, will you? Handcuffs quickly! Right. Is Meister hurt, Dr. Lohman? Uh, hurt, yes. Uh, but he'll be all right, Mr. Bless. I wish to God I'd killed him. Don't be so damned selfish, Lenley. Fog's blowing up from the river. Quite thick outside now. Is that half past ten already, Carter? Yes, it must be. Uh, station clock's slow again. Hmm. Seen any more of Mr. Bliss? Yes, sir. He came in again for a few minutes. Wanted to see that man in the cells, uh, Lenley. Hmm. I let him have the key. Oh, he didn't stay long? Oh, no, sir. About five minutes. Hmm. Any messages? Only one. From Atkins. Well, the man who took my step back to his house. What has he got to say? Oh, nothing new. He's watching the house. I turn it to call up every hour. Hmm. Oh, by the way, sir, did you see this? It was amongst Lenny's papers. I only found it after you have gone. Here is the key. You can go in when you like. Number 57. This is Master's writing. Oh, I don't know how it'll affect the charge against Lenny. Carter, that lets him out. The Master must have been very drunk to have written this. What's the law? Well, Johnny Lenny went there at Meister's invitation. Can't be burglary, can it? Meister's the landlord. Was there a key? Uh, yes, sir, here it is. Meister's name on the label. Got him. I'm glad Lenley's inside, though. Whenever I saw murder in a man's eyes, it was in his. I suppose Lenley isn't the ringer. Ah, oh, don't be silly. How can he be? Oh, Wimbery! Oh, Wimbery! Anything wrong, Lerman? Uh, what cell did you put Lenley in? Uh, number eight, the far end. The door's wide open. It's empty. Yeah, what's that? Here, let me have a look. Are you sure it was number eight? Yes, it was eight, all right. By God, Lerman, he'll be after Meister. Two of my men, quick, in here. You and you. Oh, He's got away, all right. The door into the yard's open. Yes. I'll phone him at once. Umber, please. Treasury of 5,000. Treasury 5,000. Scotland Yard. Give me the night officer. Night officer speaking. Inspector Wembury here, Flanders Lane, Deptford. Take this for all stations. Arrest and detain John Lenley, L-E-N-L-E-Y, -E -E who escaped tonight from Flanders Lane Police Station whilst under detention. Age 27, height 5 feet 10, dark, Wearing a... Blue shirt. Blue shirt suit. He's a convict on license. Sort that out, will you? Right, sir. Thank you. Now, my two men. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, get your bicycle and go round toward patrols. Lenny's got away. Can you describe the man? Oh, I can, yes, sir. But he won't be easy in all this fog. Now, you, I want you to go to Malthus Mansions. Lenny lives there with his sister. Don't alarm the young lady, do you understand? Yes, sir. If you find him, bring him in. Very good, sir. Oh, Lomond. How the devil did he get away? No, you've got but one theory. If you put Detective Inspector Bliss on the job, he'll get away easily right, enough. Right. 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 Me in. Hello, hello. More trouble? What a night. Oh, it's you, Sam. Uh, now, what's the trouble? Good evening, Mr. Wembry. Look what they've done to me. Why don't you stop him handing me down? What's the trouble, Sergeant Brown? No, I saw this man on Deptford Broadway and asked him uh, what he had in his bag. You was exceeding your duty, my man. Take him off, Mr. Wembry. He refused to open the bag. Naturally. And tried to run away. That is a lie. Shut up, Haggard. I then took him into custody. What's in the bag? Oh, no, I, I want to tell you about that bag. To tell you the truth... 
I found it. It was laying against a wall. And I says to myself, I wonder what there is. Just like that. And what did the bag say? Hey. All right, Sergeant Brown, open it up. Hello, what's that? God bless my soul if it isn't old Mr. Meister's teapot. I was only cleaning it yesterday. What coincidence? But not that he'll ever feel the loss of it. He don't drink tea. Meister's cash box. And inside? Well, what of money? Bad luck, Hackett. Rank bad luck. Now, good luck, I call it. I ought to get a reward for this. Here, count them notes. I know what you coppers are. If they ain't counted, you'll be buying a new suit next week. All right, Sergeant Brown, charge him. I charge this man with being in unlawful possession of property believed to be stolen. Search him, Sergeant. Sir. All right. Come on, my lad. No, well, here. <laughs> You'll have to marry me now. Name? Samuel Cuthbert Ackett. Address? Buckingham Palace. No address. What was your last job? Chambermaid. Here, Mr. Wembry, do you know what I to give me for four days' work? Ten bob. That's sweating. Besides, I wouldn't go back into that house, not if you was to give me a million pounds. It's haunted, I call it. Haunted? Yes. Hello? I was in Meister's room. Yes, Sergeant Carvey. And I was just coming away yeah. with the stuff when I heard the distant alarm oh. ring. A secret panel open. Oh, I see. And a cold hand yes, touched me. Clammy. Like a dead man's hand. Well, I jumped from the window and got out on the leads. Yeah, it's Atkins, sir, the man at Meister's house. He says he can't make Meister here. Meister's in his room with the piano, but the door's locked. All right, let me speak to him. Hello, Atkins. Mr. Wember is speaking. Oh, yes, sir. Are you in the house? No, sir, I can't get in. Can't you make him here? I can't get any answer at all. You're quite sure he's in the house? Oh, quite sure, sir. I think I should tell you, sir, the ringer's been seen in Deptford tonight. I'll come along right away. The ringer's in Deptford. Oh, I don't know how much of your cold hand is cold feet, Hackett, oh. but you're coming along now to Meister's house. No, sir, no, sir, no, for God's Yes, sake. with Dr. Lomond and me. Come on, Lomond. I am with you, Mr. Membry. The Scotsman's night out. <laughs> Good luck, sir. Thank you, Carter. I may need it. Hello. Yes, yes, that's what I'm here for. What? You lost a dog? Uh, a, a Pekingese, eh? Yeah, a gentleman dog answers to the name of Fluff. One black ear. <laughs> Is that you, Doctor? I just about Wembley. <coughs> what a fearful hole. Well, where am I? I wish I knew for sure. Sam, where are we? Oh, we're in Flanders Lane, all right. God, what's that? Mind where you're going. <laughs> Part of the road's up. Can't you see the red light? Well, I've been seeing the red light all evening. Road up, eh? Yes, <coughs> this is Flanders Lane, all right. <coughs> its other name is Little Well. That's him who's going to get the ring I can see nobody. Ah, they're sitting on their doorsteps watching us. What a night for the ringer. Pass the fly, Doctor! In the sky to get the ringer! How the devil can they see? They got rat's eyes. Hark at the rustle of them. They're having a joke with us. Is it like this all the way, I wonder? <laughs> Who are you? Oh, I'm a night watchman. Roads up, you see. Oh, this is a horrid place, Flanders Lane. Always screaming, shouting, blue murdered. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, they're like beasts down in them cellars. Uh, some of them never comes out. Uh, and she's been hanging about all night. Uh, the lady. Well, what lady? Oh, I thought she was a ghost. Uh, you see ghosts here and here and... Here she is again. Don't go any further, for God's sake. It's Koran. Where are you? Over here. They're dead, they're dead. I want to save you. Please, go back. Go back. Trying to scare us, Koran. Koran! Where the devil she got to know? Anyway, this is it. That's the street lamp outside Meister's house. And it's all right, you can hear the piano. That you, Atkins? Yes, sir. He's starting to play again. Meister! Meister! No. 
won't answer, you see. Break in the door. No, no, wait a minute, sir. I can open it. You got a knife. Get easy. Now, let's get in, Governor, under this perishing fog. Blackens, you feel stand by this door. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. Now we'll go over and see. Meister. Meister. Uh, let me come and look at Hey, wake up. There you are, what I tell you, he's all right. He ain't dead. Is he alive, Loman? Aye, uh, he's alive all right, but doped up to the eyes. Uh, dead to the world, sir. eh? Thank God, he gave me a turn. I never thought I'd be glad to see him breathing. See if you can wake him, Doctor. Uh, yeah. Have you tried burning his ears? That'll do, Hackett. <laughs> Come over here and tell me whereabouts in this room you were when you felt the hand. Oh, that's easy, Mr. Wembry. There's a secret panel round about here. And it must have opened. Uh, look at this. Hmm? Remarkably like supper for two. <laughs> Champagne. <laughs> he was expecting somebody, Wembry. Yes, he certainly was. I wonder who. A woman. Why? Don't men drink champagne? Uh, but they seldom eat liqueur chocolates. At least not really nice men. <laughs> You're becoming a detective in spite of yourself, Doctor. <laughs> Meister may have queer friends. Or the supper party may have been for your friend Mrs. Milton. Cora Ann. Ah, good Lord, no. She's not the sort of woman who would sell her immortal soul for liqueur chocolates. Well, who was it for, then? Lomond. You don't think he expected Mary? Mary Lenley? Hmm... I'd give a hundred pounds to search this safe of his. Now, what good would it do? I bet there's enough in this safe to send him down for ten years. Ah, but we'd never be able to get a search warrant. You don't want a warrant, you want a key. <laughs> Now's your time. I can't do that. It's against regulations. Suffering snakes, regulations. Uh, I, look, time? look, I'm not, look. Uh, Master's waking. What's, what's the time? Just gone eleven. Oh, eleven. Is she here yet? Is who here? She said she come. She promised faithfully. Eleven o'clock. If she tries to fool me... Who is the she, Meister? We're curious. Uh, nobody you know. Hmm? A lady who was keeping me company. Give me a drink. Tell them the ringer's here. Meister, the ringer's here. In Deptford. Here, the ringer. <laughs> I'm not afraid. I've always got my stick. Look up, Governor. He's dangerous with that. Is that Hackett? He can go. Uh, you hear what he says? He's withdrew the charge. Dirty thief. Bit the hand that fed him. I like his idea of feeding margarine and rice pudding. Try to understand what we're saying, Meister. The ringer has been seen in Deptford tonight. Ringers here, eh? I don't believe it. Clear out, sir. I've got a friend coming to see me. Your friend has a poor chance of getting in. All the doors of this room are fastened and so is the window. Constable Atkins is on duty at that door over there. Sir? And the ringers here, eh? That's good. That's the best thing I've heard for a long time. Gentlemen, you take wine with me? I give you a toast with musical honors. To a beautiful ghost, Gwenda Milton. Ran to Mary. Where's Mary? Shh, Mary. That bell means somebody's trying to get into this room. Don't worry, I've got a gun. Atkins, sir. Is your door locked? Yes, sir. Keys in my pocket. Field? Yes, sir. Stand by, Hackett. I've never done nothing. No, I've got him fast, sir. Now, don't you dare move, Hackett. No fear. I'll tell you what is moving. The secret panel. All right, Hackett. Turn out the lights. Where are you, Meister? No! 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 The ringers come for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's for Gwenda. <laughs> Stand by the door, Atkins. Yes, uh, put up the lights again. Who was it that screamed? Put up the lights, you damn fool. All right, Atkins. Put on the lights again. <sighs> Wembley. Look, 
Meister. God. Murdered. With part of his own sword stick through his heart. But how? But the woman will come into the room, sir. The one will scream. But was it a woman who screamed? What the hell do you mean? No woman had the strength to strike that blow. Yes, I can see from the window. The fog's clearing a bit. But, Mary, we've been here nearly two hours now. Oh, you must be tired, Alan. I am a bit. But we've nearly finished the search of the house. Alan, you're sure you understand why I have to do it? Yes, Mary, dear. I've told you I understand. Now, you must go to bed. It's one o'clock. But before you go, will you give me your word of honour? My word of honour? Yes, that you don't know where your brother Johnny is at this moment. I promise you I haven't seen him. I don't know where he is. Thank you. Good night. And you will let me help you, won't you, Mary? Don't be sentimental, Alan. It doesn't suit you. I'm sorry. Good night. And you're rather a dear, aren't you? No, I think I'm a damn fool. Good night. (coughs) Ah, Atkins. Uh, Have you finished the search? Yes, sir. Master was a fence, all right. As if I didn't know. Atkins, is your relief here? Yes, sir. At yeah, long last. All right, you can go. Good night, Atkins. Good night, sir. Oh, good night, Doctor Lemon. Good night, laddie. Yeah, what's the matter, Wembley boy? You look worried about something. Is it about Miss Lenley? Yes. I've just been talking to her on the phone. And, of course, it was she who came into this room at that awkward moment. Lomond, I'm going to take a risk and tell you something. There's no reason why I shouldn't, because this blasted business has altered all the ringer stuff. What happened tonight, two hours ago, may mean ruin for me as a police officer, but... Well, yes, it was Mary Lenley. So I supposed. She came to get a check that Meister told her young Lenley had forged for 400 pounds. Pure invention on Meister's part. And she got into the room? Yes, by the secret passage. Both she and her brother knew of it. She's heartbroken. Poor kid. Still, my boy, a happy ending and all that sort of thing. Happy ending? You're an optimist, Doctor. I am. I never lose hope. Any news of young Lenley? That laugh we heard... That wasn't Lenley. There's no mystery about the laugh. It's one of the Flanders lame people going home tight in the fog. The police on duty outside the house saw and heard him. It sounded in the house. Well, the ringer's work's done. There's no danger to anyone else now. There's always danger enough. Well, that blight is free. What's that noise? In the room above. Sounds like somebody moving about. There's nobody in the house. Except the fellow on duty outside this door. Field? Yes, sir. No, 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 people upstairs. Well, not that I know of, sir. Anybody here? Just wait here, Field. I'll go and see. So, you're on duty in this house? Yes, Doctor. But I'll be popping off in a few minutes. I was just going down to the end of the street to meet my relief. Uh, nasty sort of job. Well, uh, yes, a dry sort of job. Mm. It's all rain again soon. If this fog clears, which I doubt. Oh, I don't know what the weather's coming to. <clears throat> that bird that died, sir. He was killed? Yes, I know. I expect he's got a fine cellar. <clears throat> oh, you know what solicitors are. <laughs> Nubbins do good for them. And as I said before, <laughs> this is a very dry job, sir. Aye, I heard you. No, oh, I ought to have been off duty at 12. <laughs> now it's nearly two. These Scotland Yard people never have any consideration for a uniform man. All right, Field. You can go down now. Thank you, sir. There was a window open upstairs. A cat must have got in. Oh, I see. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You look rather scared, Wembry. What's the matter? (laughs) Yes, I feel rather scared. This place stinks of death. You saw something or or somebody upstairs? You're a thought reader, aren't you? Uh, In a way, yes. (laughs) At this moment, you're thinking of Central Inspector Bliss. How did you... Yes? 
Excuse me, sir. Oh, Field, it's you again. Uh, it's just been reported to me that a man has been seen getting over the wall. How long ago? Uh, about a minute ago. Uh, was that a cat? You didn't see him? Uh, no, sir. Uh, excuse me, sir. My relief's overdue. No, all right, all right. You can go. Thank you, sir. Yeah. What do you make of that? It may have been one of the reporters. I'd sit on a grave to get a story. Listen. There it is again. That's not a cat, Wembley. Damn the cat! <laughs> I don't know what it is. And I am not going up to sea. Doctor, I'm sick and tired of the case. Heartily sick of it. I uh, so am I. <sighs> Well, I'm going home to bed. Have a drink before you go. Ah, a scotch. <laughs> I don't mind if I do. You know, Doctor, I don't hate the ringer as much as I should. Ah, there are no really bad men who are all bad, except Meister. Just as there are no really good men who are all good. <laughs> I want to tell you something, Lerman. I know the ringer. You know him? Really? Yes. Well... And I'm damn glad he killed Meister. Aye, well, let's drink to that. Uh, tell me, Wembry, uh, did Meister get Mary Lynn? No, thank God. Oh, thank God, indeed. But it was only by luck that she was saved. Loman, uh, I can tell you who is the ringer. You can tell me, eh? Well, then, who is the ringer? I can answer that. Yes, come in, Bliss. The door's wide open. You are the ringer, Dr. Loman. Bliss, what the hell Stand are you... still, Loman. And not so much of the Bliss. I want you, Henry Arthur Milton. I've got him covered, Wembry. You search him. All right. Bliss, eh? It doesn't fit you. You're the fellow who said I knifed you when you tried to arrest me three years ago. So you did? That's a lie. I never carry a knife. You know that. I know I've got you, ringer. That's all I know. Came from Port Side, did you? Attended a sick man there. You thought your woman knew I suspected you when she was scared that day at Scotland Yard. You flatter yourself, my dear fellow. That woman, who happens to be my wife, was scared not because she saw you, but because she recognized me. Ah, that Port Side story was good. You did see a sick man there. Dr. Lomond, a drug addict who'd been lost to sight for years and sunk down to native level. He died, and you took his name and papers. I also nursed him and paid for his funeral. And that's not all. You tried to make people suspicious of me. You've got a cheek. It was you who let Lindley out of the cell. Guilty. It was the best thing I ever did. Uh, clever. I hand it to you. Got your job as a police surgeon by smooching a cabinet minister you met on the boat, didn't you? Smooging's the sort of vulgar word I'd expect you to use, Bliss. Yes, I was lucky to get the post... But then I was for four years as a medical student in my youth, Edinburgh. <laughs> I present you with that information for your... Well, case. I've got you, and I charge you with the willful murder of Morris Meister. Look at this. Did you leave the front door open when you came in? Just I am in charge of this case, Wembry. When I want your advice, I'll ask you for it. Oh, what? What's going on? I told you, Arthur. Oh, all right, Mrs. Milton. Oh. That'll do. That will do. Cora, have a heart, please. Come on, come on. Did you hear what I said? Oh, one minute. Cora, Anne, you haven't forgotten. No. You promised me something, remember? Yes, Arthur. Now, look, what's the idea? You come away from him now. You, you want to take him and shut him away like a wild animal behind bars, like a beast. And you think I'll let you do it? You think I'll stand right here and watch him slip into a living grave and not save There's him from it? There's nothing you can do now. Oh, isn't there? And I'll show you what I can do. <laughs> You little brute! Give me that gun! Ah, I've got it! Blank, say! Look out, Bliss! My God, the ring is gone! She's fooled us! After him, Wembury! Take a look, the blasted thing from my side! Smash the panel! The key's on the other side! Laugh, will you, my lady? By God! I'll give you something to laugh at! But Wembury! Send that copper outside up! Oh, clever, aren't you, Mr. Bliss? But the ringer's got you where he wants you. You think so? You think There's so? There's my car waiting for him outside, and a plane on an airfield ten miles out. And he's not afraid to go up in the fog. Don't you worry, Mrs. Milton. I've got you and where you... You are, he'll be. And you'll stay here under lock and key until you are wanted. And this time, the key goes into my pocket. Officer! Officer! I'm Inspector Bliss from the yard! <laughs>
Laura Ann. Oh, Arthur. Oh, I heard the warning bell. I was frightened you'd come back too soon. Quick, before they come back. I've got the car down on the riverside. This passage leads straight there. Arthur. Listen. We've beaten them once again. Do you love me? Cora Ann. No man saw the ringer again that night or for the many nights which followed. That was The Ringer by Edgar Wallace, adapted for stereo by Raymond Rakes. The part of the gaunt stranger who told the story was played by David Davis. Samuel Hackett by Bill Fraser, Morris Meister by Alan Wheatley, and Dr. Lomond by Fraser Carr. Inspector Wembry was played by Alexander John, Inspector Bliss by Geoffrey Collins, and Colonel Walford by Peter Williams. Mary Lenley was played by Kate Binchy, Cora Ann Milton, the ringer's wife, by Sandra Clark, and John Lenley by John... Saturday Night Theatre. With Intent, the novel by Lawrence Henderson... Dramatized for radio by Susan Ashman and Felix Felton, who plays Detective Sergeant Milton. With intent. Nasty night, Constable. Oh, you're right, Mr. Lloyd. Only fit for stray cats and policemen. Why don't you come inside and have a cup of tea? And miss all the burglars? Well, there won't be many about on a night like this. Well, not that they've any sense. Some of them haven't, though. You sure you won't come in? Oh, better not, Mr. Lloyd. Thank you all the same. Good night, then, Constable. Good night. Well, who's this joker, I wonder? Hey, steady there, you young maniac! Good Lord! All right in there? Are you all right, young'un? Here, what are you doing? Don't point that thing at me! Desk sergeant here. What? Constable Tom's shot in the face. Where are you? Corner of Legume Street. Yes, I know. By the railway bridge. Oh, we're straight there. Portion. Yes, sergeant. Get a car quick. Somebody's shot Tom's. Constable Tom's? Why on earth should anyone want to do that? We'll find out. Hurry up. The first thing is to get there. Here he is, Sergeant. Just as he fell. I, uh, I thought we'd better not move him. Oh, my God. Steady, lad. Point blank range, eh? Did you see it, Mr... Uh, uh, Lloyd. No, but I heard it. I live at that house on the corner. Oh, yes. I, I just said goodnight to the constable, as I usually do. Then I heard this car and then the shot. Who fired it? Well, the, the young man in the car, I suppose. I looked out of the window and he was walking away towards the railway bridge. Did you see his face? No. He never looked back. Oh, well, we'll come to that. Uh, you're on the telephone. Oh, yes. My wife has phoned for an ambulance already. Well done. Uh, Porson, you'd better go to Mr. Lloyd's house and ask if you can call Detective Superintendent Davis. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Lloyd, you don't mind coming along to the station, do you? We must get all the facts as quick as we can. Please, um, sit down, Mr. Lloyd. Uh, thank you. I am Detective Superintendent Davis. This is Detective Sergeant Milton, who will be directly in charge of the case. Good evening, Sergeant. Oh, oh, good morning, rather. How do you do, Mr. Lloyd? I've had a word with Sergeant Newcomb, who came out in the police car when you phoned in. But Milton and I are CID. We'd like to hear your story direct. I know you want to get back home, so I'll keep this as short as possible. Is there any news of the constable? We don't know. He's in the operating theater now. It's thanks to you he's got any chance at all. Oh, well, uh, cigarette? Uh, no, thank you. Well, it must have been about half past two. I I'm a very bad sleeper, and I heard the constable, as I do most nights. Mm -hmm. I felt 
particularly sorry for him tonight. It was so bitterly cold. In, in fact, I tried to tempt him in for a cup of tea, but he wouldn't hear of it. Then, some minutes later, I heard the screech of a car at the corner. There was a bump, and, and it stopped. I heard the constable walk over to it, and then there was the explosion, the shot. You knew it was a shot? I guessed it was. I, I never thought of it as being anything else. So then I went to the window. What exactly could you see? Everything. Mine's a corner house, and there's a street lamp just outside. The car was at an angle with its two front wheels off the pavement, as if it had been trying to corner too quickly. Mm-hmm. The driver's door was open, and, and I saw the back of a man moving away towards the railway line. And uh, the constable? He was lying on the pavement, not more than a foot from the car. The man was making for the railway bridge. That's how I saw him. There's a light on the steps there. Did you see his face? No, only his back. He was a young man. Well, at least he walked like one. Taller than me, about five foot nine, I should say. He wore um, a suede jacket with a fur collar. One of those, I, th I think they call them, motoring coats. Yes. Anything else? Yes. As he passed directly under the lamp, I saw that he had white hair. You're sure of that? Yes. I realize it's important, but I'm quite sure. It was so startling. And there was one curious thing. Yes? He never looked back. He'd shot a policeman and left him for dead for all he knew, but he wasn't perturbed. He never even glanced back to see if anyone was after him. Was he um, holding anything? Well, some sort of stick, it looked like. It must have been about 18 inches long. It was a gun, I suppose. Well, by that time, my wife had woken up, so I asked her to phone the police and get an ambulance, and I went out to the constable. Oh, you did very well, Mr. Lloyd. You're, uh, you're quite sure about this white hair? Absolutely. I even wondered if it was some sort of wig or disguise. But it looked too flat, too sleek for that. There was one other thing. Yeah? But I, I know you only want facts. Go on. He had an air about him, a sort of disdain. He wasn't in a hurry. He didn't seem to care whether he was seen or not. What I mean is, he didn't look the sort of man who would be interested in disguise. Was there anything else, anything special about the way he walked, for instance? No, I can't say there was. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Lloyd. I'm very grateful to you. I won't keep you any longer. <coughs> See Sergeant Newcomb at the desk and you'll arrange for a car to take you home. Thank you. Or if anything else does occur to you, no matter how trivial, get in touch with me at once. Uh, Sergeant, see that Mr. Lloyd gets a car home, will you? If you want me, I'll be in here with Milton. Certainly, Superintendent. Good night, Mr. Lloyd. Good night. Well, Arthur, any ideas? Uh, I wish I had. What cases has Tom's been involved in? Small stuff, mostly drunks, a few fights. The biggest pitch he made was on a break-in, and that was some kids. There's no one who'd set this up for him. Well, someone did. Who's at the hospital? Pawson. And Newcomb sent a policewoman, Christine Wren, to see Tom's his wife. <sighs> Two years to go to retirement. A gentleman as you're ever likely to meet in our profession. The village Bobby who helped kids across the road. <laughs> Whoever did this, I want him. We all want him. All right. Let's get down to work, then. Come in. Oh, morning, Arthur. I've done two lists, sir. This one covers all known albino criminals, and this one... Uh, excuse me. Anyone ever arrested by Toms with their brothers, fathers, and known friends? Well, there's nothing very promising in either. I was afraid of that. Well, at least we've got something on the car. It belongs to a doctor. It was stolen seven weeks ago from a car park in Sutton. The plates are false and the license is a forgery. A good one. Professional? Very. And yet, the car stalled because the driver didn't change down to the corner doesn't make sense for a car to be duffed up by a pro and then driven by a beginner. Yeah. Anything in the car? Oh, no, the doctor's gloves, no drugs or anything like that. Mm. <sighs> the worst ones are the ones you can't understand. Who would want to do this to Tom's? Davis? Oh, hello, Watson. How is he? Good. What? Oh, God, no. All right, Watson. Yes. You stay there for the moment. That was Pawson from the hospital. 
Toms will live if he comes out with a shock, okay? They've... They've had to remove both his eyes. Oh, no. Milton, I want this bastard. Mm. Oh, before you came in, I was speaking to Mr. Miller. He was asking if I needed any help. Oh, they want to bring in the glamour boys. Mm, an offer, Arthur, just an offer. Tom's was our man, sir. Let's keep it in the family, eh? It'll be a flog. A lot of it'll fall on you. Yes, sir. I thanked Mr. Miller and told him we had everything in hand. We have. And we'd better have. Wouldn't be much of a mark to fall down on this one. No. Well, Tom should be able to talk in a day or two. Oh, and I'll have a word with Glenton, the ballistics man. He might be able to tell us something. Must have been a shotgun. But it doesn't make sense, though. What doesn't? Well, I've seen a few shotguns. At close range, they tear you apart. Yes, I'm with you, Arthur. But Tom's is on top of him. He might have got hold of the gun. Then the main charge would have gone past him. Newcomb didn't see any sign of it on the houses, nor did Lloyd. I asked him. Yes, I think you've got something there. I can't see that it gets us anywhere, but it's worth bearing in mind. I'll ask Glenton about it. I've read reports of the injuries, Superintendent. The tattooing would be consistent with unburned particles of powder driven into the skin by great force. His face was terribly scorched. The amount of powder burning would indicate a shotgun cartridge. I have a witness to the man carrying a long-handled gun. It sounds like a shotgun. Hmm, very likely. But perhaps you're not aware of this. When a shotgun is fired, the shot doesn't spread out immediately. For the first five or six feet, it travels as a solid column of lead. If such a charge had been fired point-blank at Constable Toms, it would have smashed into him with the force of a cannonball. But according to the doctors, all the damage to Toms was done by powder burns. Mm, at short range, that can be damn near as dangerous. The gas is generated by the discharge of a shotgun cartridge reached several hundred degrees centigrade. It was that heat which blinded your constable. It could be as powerful as, say, half a dozen blow lamps. In other words, the shot had been removed. Mm, so it would seem. And another puzzling thing. How was the powder kept in place? A piece of felt, anything, would have the force of a bullet at that range. There used to be an old circus trick of firing a candle through a plank door. Uh, what do you think happened then? Well, I can't say. Possibly a thin skin of candle grease across the powder that would hold it in place and completely disintegrate on firing. But again, what's the point? Was he just trying to frighten someone? This uh, trick with the candle grease, would many people know about it? Well, it's not hard to think out. Practically anyone who uses a shotgun in the normal run of things would know about it. Wildfowlers, gamekeepers, farmers, anyone like that. Have you ever heard of a man being blinded with a shotgun in this way? Well, not at this range. I should be very interested to hear what your man was up to when you catch him. I'm obliged to you, Mr. Glenton. I'll let you know. Well, I'd better get along to the hospital now and see how our chap's making out. Oh, sister, I'm Superintendent Davis. Could I have a word with Constable Toms? The doctor has instructed he must be kept very quiet. It's just a few questions. You wait here, Arthur. All right, sir. Hello, Toms. It's Davis here. Hello. Don't move, old man. I mustn't be long. Just tell me what happened. Take your time. Uh, I hardly saw him. I thought he was a drunk. He hit the curb and the engine stopped. Yes. I walked up to the car. There was only one man. Very young. When I got near, he opened the window. Uh, near side. I got up to the car and, and he shot me. Did he say anything? No. Did you? No. Did he threaten you with a gun? Uh, I, I didn't know it was a gun. I, I thought it was a stick. Uh, he, he didn't wave it about. He just pointed it at me. What did it look like? Young. Nineteen, twenty, something like that. He had a thin, refined sort of face. Good looking. Large eyes. What color? Uh, I don't know. What about his hair? It was fair. Like it is on some girls. Very fair. It wasn't white? No. You're sure? 
I've been thinking about it a lot. Yes, yes, of course. Have you any idea at all why he should have shot you? No. Well, I'm going now, men. Be sensible and do what they tell you. I'll be back when you're feeling stronger. Anything, sir? No more than men already, Arthur. It was a young man with very fair hair. So fair that it looks white under a sodium lamp. The light on that bridge is a sodium lamp. So he's not an albino? No. I doubt if he's known either. Toms had never seen him before. And I doubt if he'd ever seen Toms. A nutcase? Probably. But he'd still have a reason. He shot him for a reason. He wasn't carrying a gun for nothing. The gun's the clue. Oh, why? It's not usual. Well, they're easy enough to get hold of. Yes, but not to carry about. A tearaway would saw the barrel off. You're not that cattle with a gun unless you've used it before for shooting duck or something. Refined. Eh? Tom said he had a refined face. A pretty boy with hair like a girl, very refined. You reckon he's landed gentry as well? It's possible. Oh, anything's possible. He's certainly not a professional. And knowing what he isn't makes it harder. Snout sounded good on this, or turning over Doss houses. He's probably tucked up at home with respectable parents who'd give him the top brick off the chimney. That's the old story. I'm going back to the station, so I may as well drop you off at the dog track. Sir? Show your face around the bookies. They've got their ears to the ground. It all helps. Station, Sergeant. Uh, uh, no, madam. No trace of your little dog yet. Uh, oh, yes. We'll ring you the first moment with any news. Uh, uh, yes, madam, with every available man on the job. Certainly, madam. Oh, hello, Henry. Oh, Mr. Davis wants you. Uh, what about? I don't know. Station, Sergeant. Oh, what's the address, sir? Oh, come in, Arthur. We were just oh, talking about you. Oh. oh, you know Sergeant Lefever? Fingerprints, isn't it? I've seen the sergeant in court. I wanted you to hear this. Sergeant Lefever's brought down his report on the car. If you can call it that. Whoever duffed this car knew what he was doing. There's nothing on the wheel, gear stick handles, and I mean nothing, not a smear. Not even a hair or fibre caught at the seat edges. Professional. Oh, very. Takes patience to go over a car like that. Except on the inside edge of the door, by the lock, just where the tongue comes out. There was a tiny spot of oil, and he put his fingers across it. You've got a print. Not a full one, that's the trouble. It's a partial. Very clear what there is of it, but he wouldn't stand up in court. All the same, I'm certain it's a second finger of a man called Harry Carter. Old friend of yours, isn't he, Arthur? I know him. I was telling the sergeant before you came in that Carter doesn't fit in with any of this. He's not a pretty boy with white hair. He's been out of trouble for a long time now. I'm sure it's his print. It's a bit of a turn-up. So we have to box Trevor here, Arthur. One partial print isn't evidence. And this joker knows his way around. You know him better than anyone. You've knocked him off, haven't you? Do you want first crack at him? Well, I'd like to think about it, sir. He owns a couple of shops and lives above them, doesn't he? He used to. He knows a bit about cars, too. Oh, ask Newcomb. He might know something. I think he rates a visit. All right, sir. Got a moment, Henry? Sure. Harry Carter. Yeah? What? The fingerprint chap says he's found a parcel on the car. Well, that doesn't make sense. He's been out for years. I thought he'd had enough. He doesn't circulate. <coughs> Married with a kid and settled down. The only thing that makes sense, Henry, is that Carter got hold of this car for someone else, duffed it up for a job and then dumped it. Yeah. You can have him in? Or else have a go at his shops? With nothing to back it up. He'll just tell us to get knotted. Do you reckon this bloke, uh, the fever? He knows his job. Done anything about a warrant? Um, not yet, sir. Well, move yourself, or the beetle will be off to their country seats. Let your wife know you'll be late. Sir? Uh, We're going in at midnight. Don't want to frighten his customers, do we? There's his two shops, sir, just on the corner of Walworth Road. Pull in, driver. Those two? Yes, sir. Oh, he's doing all right. Is there a back way? Well, sort of. There's a yard in line with all the others. Will you take that, Spencer? Yes, sir. How do we get in? Well, there's a street door by the far shop shutter. There is another staircase inside, but it only comes down into the first shop, sir. Come on, then. <sighs> oh. 
again. Who the hell's there? Come on, open up. Christ, it's the Lord. Oh, come on. What the hell do you want? I am Detective Superintendent Davis. Maybe you are, but I still want to know what you want. It would be better if we came inside. Oh, no, it wouldn't. Well, you know me, don't you, Sally? I ought to. Detective Sergeant Milton. I'm a big girl now. So show me a warrant or shove off. Oh, there you are, then. Now, be a good girl and let us in. Now, look, just a minute. Oh, you no. Can't... Either you open this door or we break the chain. Who the hell do you think you're talking to? To a citizen who should have nothing to hide. Now stop playing about and take off this chain. I can't with your bloody foot there, can I? Come on, then, you great clumsy clodhoppers. place. Well, are you going to start by having the sideboard out? Or do you want the lavatory first? Is your husband in? No. Where is he? Why? Oh, come off it, Sally. We're only doing our job. I've got a right to know what all this is about. Harry's been out of trouble for years. Then he's got nothing to worry about. Looking up old friends is part of the routine. You know that. Routine. Sounds like it with him. Superintendent, is he? Very trivial, I'm sure, to bring him and the rest of you round at this time of night. There's nothing trivial about it. Constable? Sir? There's a staircase at the other end of the corridor. Go out to the yard, search it, and the garage. Once you're satisfied there's no one there, tell the other constable to come up here. Yes, sir. Anyone else besides you? My daughter's in bed. Get you're... her up. I'm going to ring my solicitor. Ring who you like once you've got your daughter up. Who the hell do you think you are? Mom, what's the matter? Oh, it's the police, love. Don't be frightened. I'll come back with you. I want this room gone over, Milton. Yes, sir. And I mean gone over. I know what you mean, sir. You soft on her or something? She's not bent, never has been. Huh? What's she doing with Carter, then? Walking in her sleep? He's lucky in his wife, that's all. Ah, get on with it. And don't forget, I want a really thorough job. We are not doing very well, are we, Arthur? No. Found nothing and don't even know where Carter's gone. Out on a job for all we know. I doubt that. Why should she make such a big secret of it, then? She just feels stroppy. <laughs> We've put him away twice. He's been out nine years and they're doing all right. She isn't going to help anyone in that. Hmm. All right, Arthur. Go and see her. Tell her what a bastard I am. Soap her up a bit. See what you can get. Okay. Sally, can I come in? Can't stop you, can I? Don't you ever get sick of pushing people around in your lousy job? Sally, I came to tell you why we're looking for Harry. Do you want your daughter to hear this? We've got no secrets in this family, mister. All right, Jill, all right. What's it all about? You read about Police Constable Toms. <gasps> oh, not that. Not Harry. No, I don't think so either, but this is where it all leads to. Oh, God. You're mad. You're bloody raving mad. Perhaps. He's got something to tell us, and if he does tell us, he'll be all right. It's different this time. A decent man with a wife and family got shot in the face. If you can't understand... Arthur, come out here. We've got something. All right, sir. Did you get anything? Well, I just explained why we wanted him. <sighs> Let us stew a minute. Have a look at these. Car keys. Messes of them. On individual rings. Oh. Where were they? In the garden. Back of the garage and hole under the dustbin. They never learn, do they? I'll go and see his wife again. Here, take the keys with you. What are they? Car keys, Sally. Out of your garden. They can't be. Under the dustbin. Our dustbin's on a paving stone. And under that is a hole. Oh, oh the bloody fool. Oh, why should he do it, Mr. Milton? Where's the sense? Oh, none, Sally, there never is. It can't be true. I, I would have known something. You're not here all the time. Where do you go tonight? 
The dogs. Too late for that. What does he do then? Gambling clubs. Using what for money? He wins. He's won over a thousand pounds, hasn't he, Mum? <laughs> What's the number of his car? Find out. It's a cream and maroon Cresta. Three four four A Y M. Mum. Harry bought it. Out of his winnings. We all went to Alicante in it. You can't miss it. It's got GB plates on the back. Mum! Oh, God. I really thought he'd stopped. We had everything. What a bloody fool he's made of me. Any luck, Arthur? He's up west, punting. That's where she thought the money came from. Oh, did she? Well, we found something else. See the marking on those orange crates? They're part of a lorry load knocked off in Hornsey last week. Any log books? No, but the gear's all here. Pens, ink remover, outline stamps. No log books, no licenses. You want jam on it. You'd be right might believe them lying about. He won't be hard to pick up. He's in a Cresta, 344-AYN. I want him brought in. Get on to Newcomb. Any charge? To assist us in our inquiries. Uh, come down, Mrs. Carter, will you? We're taking one or two things away. We have to give you a receipt. Have a chair, Harry. I've been looking forward to seeing you. Have it yourself, Milton. I'm not staying. Oh, don't be like that. It's clean. Won't make a mark on that 80 guinea suit you happen to be wearing. But this is a dead liberty, Milton. I get knocked off in the street like some drunk. That big Burke won't let me near a phone. You know, my wife, Milton, should go bloody raving mad. Ah, uh, shut up and sit down. No. We turned your drum over tonight, Harry. We found enough car keys under your dustbin to fill Wembley Stadium and three gross of oranges knocked off in Hornsey last week. Oh, your wife's dead worried about you, all right. The way she carried on tonight, you'll be better off inside. Oh, my God. A greedy little man, that's what you are, Harry. A load of rubbish. And I don't know what you're talking about. A bloke comes up to me with a load of oranges, gives me the moody, shows me the papers. How do I know what's bent? Oh, save your breath. Right now I care about only one thing. A copper got shot in the face and blinded. Tom's? You're mad. We found the car. We examined it carefully. Very, very carefully. And you know what we found, don't you, Harry? We got your print. For God's sake, I had nothing to do with Tom's. I was miles away. Shut up. I know you duffed that car, and I want to know who for. It was nothing to do with it. This was some kid, a nutcase. I'm going to have that name, and I don't care how I get it. I've been through your file pretty carefully. You only deal with the big boys, don't you, Harry? Now, I've got three names here. If you really aren't going to say anything, what are we going to do? What do you mean? Well, the only thing we can do. Knock over all three and spread the word that Harry gave us the nod. What? None of them will be very happy, will they? Milton, for God's sake, they'll do my family. You know them better than I do. All right, then. Between you and me, I've been punting. I got on a bad streak. You know what it's like. You have to play yourself out of it. You need capital. Don't tell me about your sad little life, Harry. Just tell me who the car was for. Where the hell did I leave that prince? The car, Harry, the car. This kid came in right in my shop. I nearly had heart failure. In front of all my customers, he came right out and asked me for the keys. He had all the right names, but he didn't have the money, so I phoned through. The keys were on my desk and he scarpered. The boys went round to the lock-up, but he'd had it away. What was his name? I don't know. What did he look like? Well, like it says in the papers. A kid. Twenty, twenty-one. About my height, but skinny. A pretty boy with his hair like a girl. How did he know the car was in a lock-up? Well, I don't know, do I? Who was it for? I've told you all I know. None of them knew this kid. They can't lead it to him. You're lying. They knew him all right, even if you didn't. That's why you didn't phone us. They told you to lay off. They're a heavy mob, and you're frightened of them. I want that name. It's one of the three I've got here. It's up to you. And what happens to me? I don't know, Harry. But I'll tell you this. Whatever happens to you will be a damn sight harder if I get nothing than if I do. Now, can't you keep me out of it? We'll see. Now, you've got to promise me. You can't let him have a go at my wife. Well, it's not just me. You're wasting time. The name. Griffin. Griffin? Oh. You're in deep, aren't you? Give us a fag for God's sake. Here you are. Sir. Now, you wait here a minute. Did he cough, Arthur? He did. 
What do you use on him? Thumb screws? Only my spare set. <laughs> oh, go and scowl at him for a few minutes, Henry. I want to have a word with Mr. Davis. Well, there'll be no one on the desk. I'll be here. I'll speak to him on the phone. Okay. Mr. Davis's office. Yes? Sergeant Milton, sir. I've had a go at Carter. Any luck? Yes, he duffed the car, and the boy came round and said he'd been told to pick it up. Carter says his mob knew nothing about him. He's lying. Yes, he is. Which mob? Griffin's. <sighs> Could he be lying about that? I don't think so. To be asking for trouble. What made him cough? I said we'd put the word around. Come on, kid, this way. Oh, excuse me, sir. Christine Wren's just bringing in a girl, a junkie by the looks of it. There you are, kid. Sit yourself down there. I'll soon see to you. Oh, that's it. Not to worry. Oh. Where did you find her? Gino's. She tried to sell me some purple hearts. You can book her on that. But she's uh, got a story that ties in with the Tom's business. What do you mean? She's lost her bloke. He was going to pinch a car from his boss and take her north and marry her. He never turned up. She was expecting him the night Tom's was blinded. Who was his boss? Griffin. It fits. I got it fits. What else did she say? Not much. I told her I was a policewoman and she passed out. You won't get much more out of her tonight. Come to that, you look pretty washed out yourself. I am. Go and see Davis and I'll phone the hospital. All right. Then I'm going home before I spend the night in one of Newcomb's cells. Morning, Arthur. Good morning, sir. Ah, you haven't lost your touch. You did a very good job on Carter last night. Oh, I knew him. Have you um, ever had anything to do with Griffin? I know about him, sir. Yes, he'll be a bit before your time as a straight villain, though. Hasn't been taken for years. The right bastard, by all accounts. Oh, is that all right? Now, here's his file. You have a couple of hours to read it. Rape, assault, armed robbery, the lot. The only thing he's never been done for is riding a bicycle without lights. <laughs> So, what about this girl Chris Wren brought in? She was in a bit of a mess. Nothing to what she got up to later. Oh? Started tearing the cell to pieces. Had to be carted off to hospital. She's on dexamphetamine. Lives on it by the number we found in her handbag. I see. There were also two or three dress bills in the name of Gloria Lamar. Oh. Not of useless junk and more to the point, a street photographer's photograph on which we could just make out a number in the name Porth Call. Oh. We put a message through to the Porth Call police. Do you want me to see her, sir? No, and no, I'm leaving over Christine Wren. First track, anyway. What I want you to do is have a word with that bum boy of Griffin's at the Laguna Club. Oh, Topper Martin. Yeah, that's the joker. We well, like old times. Yes? Telex message from Porth Court, sir. Oh, thank you, Porson. And uh, find Christine Wren for me, will you? Yes, sir. Oh, she's got a record. Drugs? Thieving. Your 128 stroke 12 photo name is... Elizabeth Janice Jenkins, date of birth, 10th of June, 49. Need care and protection, 64. Shoplifting, 65. Probation, second conviction, theft, 65. Six months approved school. Absconded, whereabouts unknown. Inskip inspector. Ah, Christine, we found out a little more about your girl. Her name isn't Gloria Lamar. Right. Uh, take this telex along with you. Yeah. Don't show her straight off. It'd be better if she came to you. But if you have to, throw it in off the cuff. I'll do my best. I don't have to tell you how much we're depending on this. As soon as you have something, ring through. I'll do all I can. I'll be waiting. How are you feeling? How do you think? You're in good hands here. Would you like a cigarette? Oh, don't mind. What are you going to do? We could contact your family for you. Oh, they don't want to know. Is there anyone else? No, not now. You're very young. You could start again. It'd be stupid to ruin your life over one man. It's my life. Look, you're not stupid. You know what drugs do. You're attractive and you've lived off men. Do you think they'll want you once it starts to show in your face? <clears throat> Might as well put my head in a gas oven, then. You could. But get it straight who it is that'll make you do it. People like your friend Tom and Griffin. Do you like being used by men? <sighs> Should have stayed at home, singing hymns. What are you going to do? What can I do? She left me behind. For Griffin. We can protect you. No. Oh. <laughs> do you know what they did the last time they sorted a girl out? 
He used to laugh about it. They went into this pub where she was and sat looking at her. She was scared to go out. She knew they'd kick her all over the place if they caught her in the street. So she just sat there. Finally, they got fed up, poured a bottle of brandy in a pint glass. Then they moved off as if they were leaving. And as they passed her, they poured the brandy over her and dropped a match on her. Burned half her face away. And they laughed about it. Mm. They laughed about it. How did you get mixed up with people like this? Oh, I was in Wales at school and this fella Glynn <sighs> wouldn't leave me alone. Used to hang round the school, my house as well. Write me notes, fills most of it. Then his wife had a go at me and I thought, right, you stupid cow, I'll show you. I said to him one night, I'm off to London. Come in or not? He came. How long were you with him? Three months. Got a job in a plastic factory. What happened? No, oh, it's that bloody bed sitter. He expected me to sit there all day waiting for him and then cook for him on that crummy gas ring and then get on the bed with him. He's always trying to get me to do things his wife wouldn't. <laughs> That's why he came away with me, I suppose. How did you meet Griffin? Through Barney. Barney? I'd started hanging around the cafe in the daytime and this old eye tie that runs it asked me if I fancied working there in the lunch hour. Oh, I never told Glynn. <laughs> He'd have wanted some of the money. Barney used to come in. He was a big guy. The others were a bit careful of him. I went out with him and... Well, so it all started. He worked for Griffin. And Glynn? Oh, he didn't like that, did he? Tried to knock me about. Spiteful bastard. I got Barney to see to him. And that was that. Then he told me to go up to Griffin's. And where does the blonde boy come in, the, the one with the car? Tom. Oh, he, he was around. I'd seen him up at Griffin's gambling parties, bringing people in. Then one day, oh, I had this hangover. But it, it wasn't just that. I, I felt... D depressed? Mm, like doing myself in. He came and talked to me. It was just what I needed. Some of my own age. He gave me some pills and... All of a sudden, I felt marvellous. Then he took me up to Chelsea and we walked along the river. It was great. You saw a lot of him? All the time. Did he work? He sold pills, drifted about. He did all right. Did you know his name? No, <laughs> he never told me. Not his last name. Oh, he was a funny bloke. I mean, he was different. How? Oh, he was clever, educated. You ought to see some of the books he read. Did he take drugs? Not many, just a pill now and then. He never touched the hard stuff. He sold it. Where did he get it from? I don't know. Do you know where he came from? North. <laughs> At least that's what he said. He didn't speak like he came from the North. He came to London to go to college. Where? A big place, um, near Tottenham Court Road. London University? I don't know. Why was Griffin after him? Oh, money, I suppose. I think he held on to some of Griffin's money. I do know he got money from some of the people who went to Griffin's parties. Blackmail? Don't know. He said we'd go back to where he lived. That's why we needed the car. Why the car that Carter was holding? Well, he thought it was funny to go in one of Griffin's cars, but he needed a safe one, too, you see. And Carter wouldn't report his stolen money. I see. And you knew about this car, where it was? Barney had told me about Carter when I first knew him, how he always had one there, ready for... Griffin. Well, that's how they know it was me. They'll sort me out like they sorted the other girl out, and I... I don't want half a face. What have you been doing since? Walking. About. Sleeping. Different room every night. Trying to find him. Did you know he had a gun? No. He had all sorts of things hidden all over the place. He was clever. What sort of things? All sorts of things. Kept his drugs in a cemetery. What? Straight up. He had to get some in Harry a couple of weeks ago, and I went with him. It was ages on the tube. Where was it? Uh, Ealing. 
Well, that's where we got off the tube. I, I don't know the name of the cemetery. You know where it is? I know the way. I've uh, been back there. Thought I might see him. Do you know which grave? <laughs> I'm rabbiting like a good un, aren't I? Look, you can only be on one side or the other. Your choice has been made for you, hasn't it? <laughs> oh, what the hell, anyway? He... He wouldn't let me go with him to the grave. He told me to stay on the bench. Oh, but of course I looked. <laughs> he took some flowers. I'll say that for him. So he went in with the flowers and came back with drugs? That's right. Was it a big cemetery? Yes, I suppose so. Well, there were five roads off in all directions and then the others going off them. Which one did he go along? The middle one. And after that? You got this path on the right. Different from the others. It's not tar, it's sand and stones. And the grave is there? Well, that's when he told me to stay behind, but... I crept up and had a peep. Saw him bending over this grave. What was he doing? Putting flowers on it. Did you see which grave it was? No, not exactly. It's about the third of the way along. Do you remember which row? Yes. I remember it was about the fourth row. And when he came back, he had the drugs with him? I told you. I will go up there and wait for him. I don't know. It's not up to me. What... What will happen when I go to, to court? Will you be there? Yes, I'll be there. There's no need for you to worry. You've been a great help and we'll remember that. Don't suppose I'll ever see him again. Funny. One minute you're all making plans, ready to spend your life with someone. And then suddenly it's all over. He's gone. Well, that wasn't your fault. He wasn't what you thought he was. You're well rid of him. Hello, Arthur. What have you been up to? Calling on one of Griffin's henchmen, Topper Martin at the Laguna. Oh, yeah. I didn't get anything. But I tell you what, Henry, you know that dirty bookshop Griffin's got on the corner of Old Compton Street? Well? I saw an old friend of yours outside there, Pinky Price. Yeah, that little rat. <laughs> Looks like he's working for Griffin. He was touting. He scarpered when he saw me, but I'd know that old prune anywhere. I'll just drop you the word in case you're thinking of using him. Thanks. Now I'll drop you one. Davis wants you. Uh. Christine's got a line on your geezer. He peddles drugs and keeps him in a cemetery. Oh, well. Uh, Ealing. Porson's out there already. Davis will give you the gen. Don't keep him waiting. He's fretting to get off to head office. Oh, one other thing. This bloke of yours used to be at London University. Go on to what the slag told, Chris. Oh, did he now? Yes? Oh, come in, Arthur. Well, things are moving. Have you heard? Yes, Newcomb said Porson's gone out to Ealing on a tip from Chris. Mm, that's right. They found the grave. All sorts of stuff. He's a cunning bastard. The turf on the grave hinges back. There was an airtight box in a hole underneath, full of little plastic containers. Oh. I've told Porson to send him to the lab. I want you to get out there, straight away. Who's the divisional inspector, sir? Gray, Inspector Gray. Gray. Look, Arthur, I'm off to HQ. I may be tied up there till pretty late. I'd like a couple of hours at home tonight, if I can. When you finish the deal, link all round. We'll have a talk there. Yes, very good, sir. Off again. Ealing. Horston's on to something. Don't forget about Pinky Price. It'll be a pleasure. Same again, Pinky. Look, I, I've got nothing for you, Mr. Newcomb. None of the boys knows this geezer. Pretty boy with blonde hair. But he's a queer out at Greenwich, goes round the clubs, dyes his hair every bleeding colour. But he was in Lumber last Thursday. Oh, I'd stake me arms on it not being any of the boys. Oh, there's a few who'd put a boot on a copper, but blind him? Oh, what about Griffin? Griffin? What's Griffin got to do with it? He don't even know Tom's. What's he been doing? Oh, well, no, I don't, I don't even see him. No, this isn't Griffin, Mr. Newcomb. Oh, he's capable of it, all right, but he don't use kids. If Griffin did do anyone, he'd make a real job of it. He'd kill him. Griffin knows this kid, all right. He's been looking for him. Why? Well, does it matter? I mean, it could be anything. Talked out of turn. 
clashed a bouncer up at Griffin's gaming room? Oh, and of course, Griffin would let some kid he's never seen before stick him with a stumer check. Oh, he must do it all the time. Well, I'm only trying to help. What's all the act for, Pinky? Someone been putting their thumb in your ear? If I knew anything, I'd tell you, Mr. Newton. You know that. How long have you worked for Griffin's? Me? Oh, Compton Street. That bookshop is Griffin's. Now, uh, listen, Mr. Newcomb, I'm an old man. I was working with this, uh, Chopper Martin. It's the old game. I'll listen a bit before I take you down. It had nothing to do with Griffin's dirty books. Oh, you know how it goes. You wait till some Burke's looking at the pictures in the window, and you ask him if he wants a private show. We were only lifting it off some dirty-minded gitsy. Serves him right. Of course, you, you need a lot of new faces. That's why Topper wrote me in. Yeah. Why run, then? Well, we've all got our pride, Mr. Newcomb. If I have to root behind a few dustbins now and then, I don't want anyone to see me at it, do I? All right, Pinky, I'll wear it for now. But don't get ambitious, will you? Me, Mr. Newcomb? Stay in your own league, Pinky. Sit yourself down, Arthur. Thank you, sir. Sorry, I haven't a cigarette in the house. Always smoke a pipe myself. Oh. Well, now, you've been a busy boy, I hear. Have you had a lab check yet? Yes, sir. 700 tablets, mostly amphetamine, some files of LSD and a small quantity of cocaine and heroin. You've done very well. Oh, it's Pawson, really, sir. Yes, he's a good lad. Now then, where do we go from there? Well, I think we might get somewhere on the grave itself. It's 14 years old and a D number. That means it's a private grave. Whose? It's a woman, Selina Brockhaus. She died at the age of 36 after a car smash in the Brompton Road. I've got a copy of the death certificate. So, that was 14 years ago. Now this comedian uses her grave to keep his rubbish in. Probably because it looked neglected. Now, it's all water under the bridge, Arthur. She had a son, sir, Thomas Derrick. Oh? Oh. How old? Eight when she died, so he'd be 22 now. It could be, Arthur. It could very well be. Of course, it might be a right frost, but it's worth pursuing. You bet. The only bloody line we've got. He'll be back for his drugs. And you want to wait for him? Yes, it could be an awful long wait. Too long. But we, uh, we could flush him. Could we, sir? Yes, what I had in mind was a release to the press. I see. A word to one of Newcomb's mates ought to do it. Something about the bird coming up in court. You know, something like, um, the police asked that Jenkins, otherwise Gloria Lamar, be detained in custody, as they believe she could assist them in inquiries of a serious nature. We'll get that in tomorrow's evening editions. Yes, but uh, what if he goes there tomorrow night? What then? Well, I I got this map from the Borough Surveyor. Oh. Now, I think we can forget the main gates. They'll be locked and they're nine feet high with spikes on top. There are well-lit roads on three sides. Mm -hmm. That's where I think you'll come in. On the corner by the recreation field. Uh -huh. The wall's quite low there. And there are marks on top as if someone's used it already. Where's the grave? There, sir. The eighth plot from the end of this row. Yes, I see. No trees or shrubs or anything near it. Well, there is this hut, sir, 20 yards away. It's a sort of potting shed the gardeners use. All right. There's your observation post. But you've got no lights. I thought you might have a word with Central, sir. I'm told they've got this gadget from a submarine. Well, the one they use for observing brothels. Yes. <laughs> Does everybody know about that thing? <laughs> All right, Arthur, I'll set it up with Central. You've uh, you've had the course, haven't you? Sir? Pistol. I want you armed. Well, I shouldn't think he'll be bringing his gun with him, sir. Maybe not, but I don't want any encores. If anyone gets a bullet through them, make sure it's the other fellow. I want him all in one piece, though. Oh, and the car. Pick the crew you want, so long as it's on the roster. Yes, sir. Good luck. And as a matter of fact, you can wish me luck as well. I have an interesting little appointment of my own. Oh, who is, sir? Griffin. Griffin? Hmm. He's asked me to call round and have a little chat. <laughs> Your visit to Top of Martin seems to have had its effect after all. Detective Superintendent Davis. All right. Get out. Well? Well, Griffin? Get on with it. I've had a man shot. Constable Toms. You'll have heard of it. Well? was done by a friend of yours. Talk sense. Well, it's only the two of us here. Don't get worried. Who's worried? He'll know all about you, Griffin, this fellow. He knocked up a scrubber of yours. Gloria Lamar. 
And you didn't like it. <laughs> you wouldn't, would you? What the bloody hell do you want, David? His name. Why don't you ask this Lamar tart? You've had your hands out for him, but I want him more than you do, Griffin. And I'm going to have him. I don't have to worry then, do What's I? What's his name? Don't tell me there's honor among thieves. You're getting on my way. What's the matter, Griffin? You wouldn't think twice about booting his head in. Why not give the name? I'll give you what I've always given coppers. Nothing. No one's too big, you know, Griffin. You're getting an old man like me. You might want to go somewhere quiet one of these days. You might want us to leave you alone. Why don't you start crawling around the room and have done with it? You've tried everything else. What are you frightened of? Your pension. You're going to dock it or something if you don't bring him in. Oh, for God's sake, Griffin, what sort of rubbish are you made of? He's done it once for no reason. He's going to do it again to anyone, to a man with a family, to a woman, a kid, someone decent. Oh, someone decent. And who the hell's that? The public. The people everyone else lives on. The people who make things, work all day, week in, week out, pay mortgages, raise their kids. Oh, that lot. The little people. Go down Dean Street, Davids, and you'll see them queuing up for the strip clubs. They can't wait to see things like that Lamar scrubber stand up and take their clothes off. The public. You rang? Of course I rang you, cow. Our guest is going. Give him his halo. Why the hell does this poor girl put up with you? <laughs> She's my daughter. Or so she says. Nice night we've chosen. Mm. Nothing like a cosy cemetery to make the most of a thunderstorm. Shall I call up the car, Sergeant? No, I'll do it, Pawson. Purple three to bandit four. Over. Bandit four here. I'm hearing you loud and clear. Over. There's a hell of a lot of interference. It's a storm, Sergeant. Build up a static. I know what it is. Anything to report? Nothing inside. All right. Over and out. Oh, what's up, lad? Sorry, Sarge, I've got a cramp. Oh, God. Uh, get up on your toes and push your weight down on them. That does it sometimes. Oh, that's a bit better. Yeah. Could be a copper. How long have we been here? Oh, it's ten to twelve. Purple three. Purple three, which is bandit four. A man has passed the cemetery gate. He's on foot. Uh, alone? Yes. Uh. He's wearing an oil skin and a cap. Looking about the street. He's moving out of range of the street lamp. He's gone. Right, stand for. Keep listening. Here he comes. Yes. He's our man, all right. There, you see? He's using a torch to find the grave. Wait till he's turned the turf back. Then we've got him red-handed. No! He's seen us! Stop there! Stop! Or we'll fire! Help! Sarge, you hurt? My ankle, I caught it. I'm too tight. Never mind me. After him. He's making for the wall. After him! Where am I? In the patrol car, Sergeant. On your way to hospital with Pawson, poor devil. What happened? He... he got a over. Oh, I caught his coat. Pawson? Did he shoot you? No. I caught my arm on the spike. He's in a bad way, Sergeant. Torn it right up to the elbow. And the man? Wriggled out of his coat and was over the wall like an eel. But uh, I heard two shots. And they were at me. Oh. I was making on him a bit, and he turned and loosed off. Then I threw my truncheon at him, and he was round the corner. The driver had turned the car around by then, but he just vanished. There was a footpath through to a car park, but there was no car, and we'd have heard it. A bicycle. 
That's what he used a bloody bicycle. We've alerted the hospital, Sergeant. We're expecting you both. Oh, I don't need a hospital. It's my ankle, that's all. You don't look too good, sir, if you don't mind me saying so. No, I expect I'll look a damn side worse when I've seen Mr. Davis in the morning. And there's your friend, Sergeant. Third bed. He can go home. Thank you, Doctor. Morning, Henry. God, you look awful. I wish people would stop saying that. I can't even get my shoe on because of this idiotic bandage. But have you seen Parson? Yes. He looks like he'll be all right. You've heard all about it, I suppose. <laughs> I heard a bit. Um, how's Mr. Davis? He's not happy. <laughs> no. It'll never be forgotten, will it, the ricket I've made of this lot? Oh, Davis okayed it. A fat lot of difference that'll make. Well, get up, then. I've got better things to do than to listen to you being sorry for yourself. Thanks for collecting me, anyway. Well, be your age. You've got a face like a ferret with a mange. Let me out at the corner and I'll bloody walk. No 18 pence, that's your trouble. What do you expect, a round of applause? You take a patrol car, Pawson, trick binoculars, personal radios and God knows what else and you screw it. The one way he has to go if he runs and you leave it open. Didn't even think of that, did you, big head? You enjoying this? Well, someone ought to tell you. Davis won't. What's the point? I'm a Charlie, all right. I had all the time in the world and I muffed it. He had me over. You still don't get it, do you? Huh? I told him myself what that bird said, but you wouldn't listen. You had to go airing off to the boneyard. What the hell are you talking about? The school, the college, the bloody university. God almighty. A single phone call. That's better. What a bloody fool. That's right. Where are you driving, Henry? What the hell do you think? Station. I'm clocking off. Let me out. I'm going home for another suit. Something for calling on professors. <laughs> Keen, aren't you? I'm Detective Sergeant Milton, Mr. Grimaldi, and I understand that you can help me with some inquiries I'm making. Yes. I'm sure you won't mind my asking, but I believe the plainclothes policemen carry cards of identity with them. <sighs> Thank you. Now, how can I assist your inquiry, Sergeant Milton? I understand that Thomas Derrick Brockhouse was a student of yours. Yes, that's correct. When did you last see him? Well, he left oh, some months ago. I've not seen him since. Have you any idea where he went? It's very important that we make contact with him. Why? We make inquiries for a number of reasons, Mr. Cromaldi. Did Mr. Brockhouse finish his course with you? As I'm sure you're already aware, Sergeant Milton, Mr. Brockhouse was sent down from this university. I didn't know that. Not from the dean's office. They only said that you would tell me anything I wished to know. Uh, why was he sent down? His work was not satisfactory. Would you mind telling me why? Sergeant... A university is thought of by those who don't enter one as a rather cloistered establishment. A place of dreamers, a place of quiet study. Would you think of a university as such a place as that? Oh, yes, I suppose I would. In fact, a university is a pressure chamber. Bright little boys and girls come along every year in all shapes and sizes from all sorts of places with all sorts of ideas. But there is always one thing they never think of, never dream could possibly happen. Failure. Yeah. They've never failed before. They've got used to success. But when they get here, they find that to be intelligent is commonplace. To be the best among the best is a challenge they've never had to face. It's not at all rare, Sergeant, for students to commit suicide if they fail in their degree. And Brockhouse? I thought you only wanted to trace Mr. Brockhouse's whereabouts. I also want to know anything else I can about him. Uh, would you say he was one of those who was not clever enough? No, I wouldn't say that. He was very intelligent. It was his concentration that was at fault. He wasn't interested in taking his degree. It was not what he was looking for. What was he looking for? Something in which he could see some point. He was unable to find it. Well, I, I don't understand this. Uh, do you mean he didn't know what he wanted to do for a living when he left here? What gives point to your life, Sergeant? Well... No, 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 allow me. You believe in your job. There are times you no doubt dislike it. Mm. You believe in your family. You have friends. You have remembered moments of happiness. All these things give point to your life. 
Thomas Brockhouse had none of these things. None of them? None. Well, didn't he have a family? He was an emotional pauper. I doubt if you can envisage what that means. He remembered his mother. He knew that she'd been killed by his father, and not in a dramatic way, so that his father could be punished by law, itself a parent figure. His father had not been punished at all. The only one who'd been punished was Tom himself. It's easier, of course, if you believe in God. Uh, but, but he didn't. No. His intelligence didn't allow him to believe in God. And from his studies, he took the knowledge that he was a minuscule speck clinging like a cheese worm to the outer crust of a minor planet. Since he knew that, and that after death there was nothing, what does it matter how one lives? Oh, what's the point, in fact? That's right, Sergeant. What is the point? <laughs> Do you think he's mad? No, though you might persuade a psychiatrist to say so if he happens to hold a certain theory. He's simply a badly flawed human being. He has no creative instincts. He despises creation or anything connected with it. Happiness, regard of others, codes of morality. Why did he leave you? I thought I told you. You told me he was unsatisfactory, but you also said he was very intelligent. That doesn't sound as if he failed any examinations. <laughs> you really are a detective, aren't you, Sergeant? I apologize for forgetting that. So there was some trouble. A girl student was found in his room. Well, that isn't unusual, of course. It's taken for granted nowadays that sort of thing happens. But in this case, a blind eye could not be turned. He'd gone berserk. She was on the floor and he was kicking her when the others came in to find out what the noise was about. And when they pulled him away from her, he tried to attack them with a knife. Was he charged? No. Why not? We prefer to deal with our own problems in our own way, if we can. No one was injured. And the girl? She was more shocked than anything else. Uh, what was her name? I don't think I can tell you that. Why not? Well, she begged us not to inform the police at the time. To do so now would be a breach of confidence. I'm not trying to be obstructive. The girl's no longer in the country. In any case, how could she help you? Well, no one knows until we've asked her. I gave my word. Ah, uh, all right. Uh, where did Brockhouse live? He had lodgings, a room. He left that when he left the university. To go where? Well, there must be some sort of address. He must have come from somewhere. Well, there is the address from his enrollment, somewhere north. Perhaps the bursar's office? Well, thank you, Mr. Grimaldi. I'm sorry to have kept you so long. It's been a fascinating experience, Sergeant. Mr. Davis, can I have a word with you, sir? I'm just going out. It's rather important. I'm late already. Write a report. Well, it's a bit complicated. I said a report. If you want me, Newcomb, you know where I'll be. <sighs> ah, well. What have you been up to? I saw Brockhouse's old teacher. He knew him pretty well. He says he's a nice fella, likes hurting people, knocks girls about and sticks knives in people. An emotional pauper. How much? That's college chat for a right bastard. Mm. Do they know where he is? Where he came from, Shropshire. He's a country boy. Why wouldn't Davis listen? He must have knocked you off his list after last night. Yeah. Well, where's he gone? See, Pawson. What's up? How is he? Oh, I don't know. But it can't be all that good. Tom's isn't too good either. Some kind of complications. Oh, God, no one. What's the trouble? I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Well, thanks for cheering me up. God, how I hate writing reports. I've read your report, Milton. Yes, sir. This address you've got in Shropshire, is that where you think he's hiding? No, I don't think so. He turned up in Ealing the same night that report appeared in the evening papers. So he must be in London or very near to it. I expect he's got a room somewhere. No, sir, I've been thinking about that shotgun. He seems pretty used to guns, much more than a city boy is likely to be. But if he came from a farm... Then that's where he first used them, and if he did, then somebody's likely to remember. All right, I'll put it through. But I don't want you messing about on spec. Go up tomorrow, stay overnight, and come back the day after and report. Yes, sir. Make sure you do. Uh, what about Tom, sir? Not too good. Pawson's lucky, though. They've saved his arm. Saved it? I didn't know. Yes, it looked like amputation. Oh, oh it's my fault. I, I should have been quicker. I, I took it for granted he'd come without trouble. I should have reckoned with him having another gun. All right, Arthur. It's all true. I'm not pleased about it, nor is Mr. Miller. It's a mark against you. You know what that means. But bear this in mind. If you had been quicker and crowded him, he's likely to have used his gun sooner than he did. Pawson could be dead, and so could you. 
Oh, I suppose that's true. And stop thinking about it. Nothing you can do now. Get up to Shropshire and bring me back a lead. Sergeant Milden? That's right. Oh, Wilson, Detective Constable. I'm your detail. Uh, you want to go out to Mr. Mitchell's place at Tinnelthrop? Could you please? You know the Mitchells? Oh, not personally, though I have an uncle and aunt living near. They're big farmers, grow wheat and barley. Good people. Well, the old man, anyway. Very good farmer. Very respected man. Shall I uh, come in with you? No, you stay in the car. I'm not expecting any trouble, but if you do hear a shot, call up your station before you do anything. Take a chair, Sergeant Wilson. Thank you, sir. I believe you have a grandson, Thomas Derrick Brockhouse. Is he staying with you? No. Why do you ask? I understand that you might be reluctant to tell me anything which you feel might harm him. Who understands anything? I'm 74 years old, and I understand less now than I did 50 years ago. Have you any children, Sergeant? No. Are you a religious man? Not particularly. No one seems to be these days. It was all so different when I was young. You think about the past a lot when you get old. I miss my children, Tom and Selina. They were lovely children. Now they're both gone. Dead and buried. I knew about your daughter. I didn't know you had a son. He was killed in the war at Salerno. He's buried there. That is why Selina called her son Tom. Thomas Derrick. Her husband tried to persuade her against it. Do you know where her husband is now? Somewhere in Cape Town, I believe. Would you know if he corresponds with his son? He does not. Three months after my daughter's death in 1952, he married a girl 18 years younger than himself. A girl who'd caused my daughter some unhappiness. And your grandson knew this? Yes. I adopted the boy when he was 14. Yeah. Was he a happy boy? I believe so. He enjoyed the country. He was very fond of shooting. But he was too dreamy for a farmer. He was always a bright boy, a quick learner, and ingratiating. In that, he was similar to his father, who was always very plausible. Did you know he took drugs? No. You don't seem very surprised. I've had a feeling for some time that things weren't right. He changed when he went to London. Uh, when he was last here, five weeks ago, he looked very tired and said he'd had a lot of studying to do for an examination. I didn't wholly believe him. After he'd gone, I went up to his room. It is something I'd never done before. I wanted to see if his shotgun was still there. And was it? Yes. But his father once brought a Luger pistol home from Italy as a souvenir from the war. That was gone. Did you ever suspect that your grandson could have been involved in a serious crime in the shooting of Constable Toms? Not till yesterday. Then I found these newspaper cuttings. They refer to the incident you mentioned. There are other things, pictures. I'll have to take these with me, sir. And the shotgun. I understand that. One other thing I'd like to ask you. You've obviously used shotguns a lot yourself. Have you ever heard of anyone removing the shot from a cartridge? Ten years ago, after a shooting party was made up to clear off pests from some of the adjoining land, one of the local lads who fancied himself as a marksman had his gun loaded with shotless cartridges. It was a joke. Yes? The lad fired his first barrel at close range, and of course his target flew off. He guessed what had happened. He was furious and threw the gun wide. 
the second barrel fired. He blinded his younger brother. Your grandson knew? He saw it happen. Uh, have you a photograph of your grandson? Uh, that's him on the mantelpiece as a boy, before he went to London. Yes. Have you any idea where he could be now? You don't know. We'll find him eventually. It would be better for everyone if we could find him soon. When you find him, what will you do? Arrest him. If he comes quietly, he'll be all right. We wouldn't set about him for the sake of it. I would. If it was one of mine. He wrote to me earlier this week. Here is the address. 17 Courtfield Terrace, London, W12. You did well, Arthur. A lot better than I thought you would. I admit that. Oh, luck, really, sir. The old man was brooding about it and ready to unload when I arrived. So this is the gun, eh? On any other case, it would be enough. More than enough. He might break. <laughs> I've spent the best part of three hours with him, up to about ten minutes before you got here. What, Blockhouse? Yes, we brought him in at nine this morning. Got straight onto it after you phoned the address through. He didn't have this Luger, his grandfather says he took. He had nothing. No drugs, guns, knives, or dirty photographs. Just a lot of books. And there's nothing wrong with them, either. A dictionary of philosophy, Da Vinci sketchbooks, motivation of commerce, psychology of the crowd. <laughs> Intelligent bastard, isn't he? I can't see these connecting up with any university course. So what, Arthur? It's not a crime not to go to college or to allow your grandfather to believe that you are. Once more, he's been reading the laws of evidence. And he knows all he has to do is to sit there and say nothing. And we've got to prove every damn thing we say he did. Can I see him, sir? Oh, why not? Show him the gun. You never know your luck. But we can't keep him much longer. Not if he goes on like he has been. When you've had your chat, let him go. I'll have a man waiting for him. Your name is Thomas Derrick Brockhouse, is that right? Who are you? Detective Sergeant Milton. Yes, Detective Sergeant Milton. I am Thomas Derrick Brockhouse. I've now been here for three hours and 25 minutes. And I wish either to be allowed to contact my solicitor or to know the details of any charge that is being made against me. Oh, been messing you about, have they, lad? Asking a lot of silly questions. You have to make allowances, lad. Not all of us are up to talking with a bright lad like you. Now, I came to talk to you about this gun. Now, don't be frightened to look at it. No harm in owning a shotgun, especially in your own home county. It's nice up there, isn't it? Go on, pick it up. We know it's yours. Must be quite a few days since you've handled it. How long since you've done any shooting? I have now been here three hours and 27 minutes, and I'm still awaiting details of a charge or an opportunity to telephone my solicitor. You know, your grandfather's a fine old man. It's a long time since I've met anyone with as much character. You can see it all in his face. It's all there. I've now been here... Now, your face. That's an interesting face. You're a bit of an actor, aren't you, lad? Put on the face you think people would like to see. But, of course, I'm a professional. Not bright or anything like that, but experienced. I've now been here. I see a lot of faces. Been looking at them for years. Angry faces, frightened faces, all sorts. I know the face of innocence, for example. It isn't yours. Innocence isn't unconcerned. Not in a police station, it isn't. It's bewilderment, confusion. It's out of its depth. A bit pathetic, innocence is. You would never stand for being pathetic, would you, lad? I've been here for three hours and a half. Nothing now. like a talking clock at all. Now, calculation is something else. You can always tell when someone's been calculating, reading up the laws of evidence, for example, like a shark lawyer. An innocent man would never do that probably have no idea what the laws of evidence are. You get what I'm talking about, don't you, lad? A clever chap like you will get my point right away, and not being innocent, you wouldn't want to answer. As I've been here for over three and a half hours, and no one has told me of any charge, I assume I have not been arrested. I was asked to come here to assist inquiries. Having done so, I'm going home. Unless there is a charge. No. No charge. How could we have any evidence for a charge? 
Then why was I brought here? We wanted to meet you, talk to you, see what you looked like. We get curious, too. We wanted to see what kind of a human being you are. And now, of course, we know. Milton, come here. Sir? Bad news from the hospital. Who, sir? Tom's sudden relapse. He's not blind anymore. He's dead. Stop. You hear that, Brockhouse? Tom's is dead. Dead, dead. Steady, steady, Arthur. I've now been here well over three and a half hours and still no charge has been made. I've been most patient. And now, if you have no objection, I'm going home. Hello, Arthur. Well, hello, Mr. Davis. Something wrong, sir? Oh, no. No, nothing. Nothing at all. I've just come from the Director of Public Prosecutions. We haven't a case. A large scotch, please. Oh, and a pint, I suppose. Oh, thank you, sir. No case? It stands up to me. <laughs> Not to them, it doesn't. Don't forget, this crap hound hasn't got any form to start with. He's a baby-faced student with a spotless reputation who lost his mother at the age of eight. You'll have the jury ready to give him a pound out of the poor box for a start. Oh, thanks. Thank you. But, sir, the evidence... Evidence? What evidence? Tom's can't identify him now. Lloyd only saw his back and thought his hair was white. Carter and the girl would be picked to pieces in the box. We've got the bullets from the cemetery. <laughs> yes, but we've still got to prove we had the gun at the time. I bet he's got rid of it. We can't put the old man in the box. All that prosy bastard you saw. Grimaldi, well, he made sense. Yeah, not to a jury, he wouldn't. Pawson can't identify our man from the cemetery. And so on and so on. Uh, so he just walks away. Until the next time. There's always a next time. I'm not so sure. Damn it, he... He murders Toms, he cripples Pawson, he does God knows what else, and he gets away with it. He's laughing at us. Keep your voice down. I know how you feel, Arthur. I've seen it before. Good men being eaten away. Remember what you are. You're a policeman, not a judge or a jury or an executioner. If you can't take a man within the law, you've got to grit your teeth and wear it. Now, don't do anything silly, Arthur. Still eating your heart out, Arthur? Oh, hello, Henry. Two points. Henry, what would you do if you left the force? Hmm? <laughs> Keep a pub. Oh, I wouldn't be any good at that. No, you wouldn't. You've got the face of an undertaker. You'd remind the poor passers of what they're coming to a boozer to forget. Oh, thanks. Ah, uh, stop altering. Oh, thanks. What's it all about? They say we haven't got a case. I know. I'm going to have him, Henry. And if I can't do it as a copper, I'm going to jack it in. You're after a bleeding nut. Why stop at Brockhouse? Why not get on your white horse about Griffin? He knocks people over there every other day. Well, they're a load of rubbish anyway. Griffin does what we ought to do but can't keep the weeds down. But Brockhouse, he's special. I want him. You think you're the only one? Who else? Me. And what are you going to do about it? Where do Griffin's layabouts hang out at night? I'm not having any truck with that scum. Who said you were? Or me. Now get that wallop in. I'll tell you what's going to happen to Brockhouse. We're going to 75 Glenmore Drive. Well, what happens there? Get the beer in. Mr. Newcomb. Get up, Pinky, and put your knife away before I have you for possession of an offensive weapon. Mm -hmm. Arthur, I think you know Mr. Pinky Price, tout, twister, and general piece of rubbish. I do. You shouldn't have come here, Mr. Newcomb. Straight up, you shouldn't. I never done you any harm, and I'm an old Get man. Get stuffed and stop I... whining, and I'll take you out of here with me hand on your collar. Take me? What the hell for? What's the going price to Brockhouse? What do you mean? Cut it out, Pinky, or I really will take you in. Griffin wants him. He can't find him. How much is he paying? Oh. Half a ton for anyone who sees him. Mm. <laughs> you know what that means. You might be lucky to see ten or even five. Yeah, but you, you want him for Tom's, don't you? Leastways, your boss does. Who says so? Oh, I get it. You can't hang it on him. Hey, Mr. Newcomb. Shut your face and get your coat on. Where's the nearest phone box? Uh, up around the corner. I'll get through to Griffin himself. Tell him I see Brock out while I was visiting a mate. How about that? 17 Courtfield Terrace. 
It's off Wood Lane. You got a sixpence? There you are. And a fiver to go with it. Oh, that ain't necessary. I, I don't want no money from you. I always pay for what I want, and I don't owe any favours. Now go and find that phone box. We'll be watching. Arthur. Yes, Mr. Davis. Two things. Had a look at the society pages in the press this morning? Uh, no, sir. Griffin's doing all right. Mm -hmm. Opened a big new club last night. Look, there he is. Film actresses all around him. Oh. Quite a success, apparently. We had to put extra men on to handle the traffic. Oh. Oh, and um, I've had a call from the Port of London police. They want someone to go down there. I think you might like to go yourself. Oh, what's the trouble, sir? They took a body from the water at Wapping Old Stairs early this morning. A young man, badly beaten up, and then flung in to drown. No papers or anything else to identify him. I ain't seen to that. Curiously, though, they overlooked one thing. The inside of the leather belt holding up his trousers. There was a name there in indelible pencil. Brock House. <laughs> In With Intent, the novel by Lawrence Henderson, dramatized by Felix Felton and Susan Ashman, Detective Sergeant Milton was played by Felix Felton, Detective Superintendent Davis by Hector Ross, and Sergeant Newcomb by Alan Dudley. The rest of the cast was as follows. Constable Pawson, Sean Arnold, Constable Toms, Godfrey Kenton, Mr. Lloyd, James Thomason, Harry Carter, Wilfred Carter, Sally Carter, Sonia Fraser, Christine Wren, Patricia Gallimore, Liz Jenkins, Jan Edwards, Pinky Price, Malcolm Hayes, Griffin, Brian Haynes, Mr. Grimaldi, John Brining, Mr. Mitchell, Austin Trevor, Thomas Derek Brockhouse, Brian Hewlett. The play was produced by Betty Davis. <laughs>